Book One From the Creation to the Dispersion of Mankind. Chapter One. Chapter One of a Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book One. Chapter 1. The Creation. Genesis 1 and 2. B.C. 4004. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. With these simple but sublime words commences the history contained in the scriptures of the Old Testament, teaching us that the universe did not exist from all eternity, but owed its origin to the creative act of God. To us this truth appears so elementary and self-evident that we can hardly appreciate the dim and uncertain notions on this point which the best and wisest of the heathen possessed certain it is however they were very much in the dark respecting the origin of the world some philosophers held that it existed from all eternity others taught that there are two independent causes the one light the other darkness and that out of the unending struggle between them the universe had its origin. Others imagined that all the marvelous order and harmony we see around us was the result of chance. Others again conceived that the world was an emanation from deity, and a part of deity. Distinct from all these guesses and conceptions is the declaration of the scripture narrative. It affirms that the world is not eternal, that it had its origin with time and in time, that it owed its beginning neither to chance nor necessity, but the creative will of a personal God, infinitely exalted above it, the maker and sustainer of all things. Compare John 1, 1 to 3, Romans eleven thirty six, First Corinthians 8, 6, Colossians 1, 15 and 16, Hebrews 1, 2 and 3. The creation, however, of the present order of things was not instantaneous, but progressive, and took place in six days, or vast periods of time. On the first day light was created, and divided from the darkness. On the second, the firmament, or atmosphere, encircling the globe. On the third, a separation was made between the water and the land, and the surface of the earth was covered with vegetation, with the herb yielding seed, and the tree yielding fruit after its kind. On the fourth, the sun, moon, and stars were bidden to give light upon the earth, and to be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years. On the fifth, animal life appeared in its lowest forms. The waters brought forth the various marine tribes after their kind, and this was succeeded by the creation of every winged fowl. The sixth day was marked by the production of land animals, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth, which, like all the preceding products of creative power, received the divine approval, and were pronounced to be very good. But the work of creation was not yet complete. A being higher than any yet created was to be called into existence. Accordingly, said God, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over every living thing, and over all the earth, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Then, having seen that all things he had made were very good, God ended his work and rested on the seventh day, sanctifying it as a day of rest for man. Genesis 1, 2-26 The language here employed in reference to the creation of man deserves attention. It teaches us that man did not, as some have taught, slowly emerge by his own efforts from a brutish state. Unlike other created objects, he was originally made in the image and after the likeness of God, endowed not only with a body, but also with an immortal soul. He was to combine intellectual power with liberty of will and the faculty of conscience. And as he was great himself, so also was the work to which he was called. He was to be universal dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. As God's vice-regent, 
he was to exercise lordship over nature and guide it towards its destined perfection genesis one twenty six but though the first man adam was endued with those high prerogatives he was not destined to attain immediately to the end for which he was created his activity was to commence in a particular spot and thence to extend in all directions until all the earth was subdued and moulded to the will of its creator the almighty therefore planted a garden in a region of the east corresponding probably to the high tableland of the modern armenia and watered by four streams of two of these pison and gihon the situation is absolutely unknown the others were the tigris and euphrates here then in a spot endued with everything pleasant to the sight and good for food man's work was to commence action and not contemplation only was essential to his nature hence a charge was given to him to dress and keep the garden nor amidst everything to gratify his senses and supply material for his understanding and reflections was he left alone responsible being bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh was created a helpmeet for him the lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon adam and taking one of his ribs he made thereof a woman and brought her unto him and eve the mother of all flesh one with himself in nature and in origin was united to him in holy bonds which he who thus instituted them in paradise afterwards adorned and hallowed with his own presence and first miracle at cana of galilee john two one ephesians five twenty three to thirty three End of Book One, Chapter One. Book One, Chapter Two of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book One. Chapter 2 The Fall, Genesis 3, B.C. 4004 Of the life of the first human pair in paradise we are told but little. We know, however, that it was not only a state of innocence and therefore of happiness, but also, like all human life since, of probation. Besides the charge to dress and keep the fair enclosure in which they had been placed, our first parents received but one additional command. It was couched in negative terms, and forbade in the most distinct and solemn manner possible the eating of the fruit of a mysterious tree growing in the midst of the garden, and called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Of the fruit of every other tree they might eat freely. Of the fruit of this tree the Almighty said to them, Ye shall not eat, for in the day ye eat thereof ye shall surely die. In this single prohibition lay the test of their loyal obedience to their Creator. On it depended their innocence, and their happiness temporal and eternal. How long they were faithful and obedient we are not told, but whether the period was long or short, certain it is that it came to a close. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil implies that evil was already present in God's world, and therefore in part prepares us for the dark shadow that now gathers round the sacred page. The creation of man had been watched by a supernatural being of infinite subtlety and malignity, the enemy of god and of all goodness respecting this mysterious being though the sacred narrative does not gratify our curiosity with any lengthened details yet to his existence and his unceasing hostility to man it bears direct and explicit testimony the name under which the supernatural tempter appears in the earliest and latest portions of the bible is the same compare genesis three one with two corinthians eleven three revelation twelve nine and twenty two and though but seldom mentioned in the old testament job one and two first chronicles twenty one one zechariah three one and two the same attributes are uniformly ascribed to him created originally good like all the works of god he abode not in the truth john eight forty four but rebelled against his maker and fell from his high estate. First Timothy 3, 6, and henceforth at the head of numerous other spirits. Matthew fifteen forty one, 
whom he had dragged down with him in his fall. 2 Peter 2.4 and Jude 6. He arrayed himself in conscious hostility to the Supreme. This being then here called the serpent, in other places Satan, i.e. the enemy, and the devil, i.e. the slanderer, approached the woman as being the weaker vessel for the purpose of seducing her, and so her husband, from their allegiance to their creator. With affected solicitude he began by inquiring, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? To this the woman replied by repeating the divine prohibition respecting the fruit of one particular tree. Thereupon the tempter proceeded to declare that the penalty of death would not follow the eating of this fruit, nay, that the Almighty knew that in the day they ate thereof, her eyes and those of her husband would be open, and they would become as gods, knowing good and evil. A more subtle scheme for shaking her allegiance to the Almighty and her confidence in his goodness and his love could not have been devised. A prohibition hitherto regarded as a solemn but merciful warning was now invested with an arbitrary character and a selfish motive. In mere envy, so the tempter affirmed, the Almighty had denounced an impossible penalty. What she had been taught to observe as the condition of innocence and happiness was nothing more than the expedient of one, who grudged his creatures their rightful advancement lest they should approach too nearly to himself. The idea of an envious God, of a hard task master, was thus instilled into the mind of Eve, sapping the foundations of all real faith and trust, and rendering the more irresistible the temptation to disobey the command of him, who had thus enviously set these bounds to her free will. In an evil hour she believed the tempter's words, and seeing that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Thus the fell counsels of the tempter were accomplished. Through want of faith in God's word, through a longing for independence, through a vain desire to become gods unto themselves, our first parents were beguiled into sin, and when their eyes were open, instead of greater happiness, they now experienced the strange and hitherto unknown consciousness of shame and degradation and unmeetness for god's presence genesis three one through seven brief in summary as is the information here given us respecting the enigma of enigmas the origin of evil it is yet of unspeakable importance for it teaches us that sin is not a part of man's nature but the fault and corruption of it that it did not spring from his nature, but by an inevitable necessity, but in consequence of his yielding to the seductions of a powerful and malignant foe. He did not, like his tempter, choose sin for its own sake, but was beguiled into it. Hence, though he became liable to all the penal consequences of his disobedience, though his being was poisoned with sin, yet it was not converted into sin. He did not lose all remembrance of his former state of purity and innocence, the shame which overwhelmed him and made him hide himself from the presence of God, testified to his consciousness of transgression, and in this sense of guilt lay the possibility of his restoration. For now the sacred narrative, while it refuses to gratify our curiosity respecting a subject which doubtless passes our understanding, proceeds to do what is for us of far greater practical importance, namely, to place the inroad of sin in immediate connection with the divine counsels of redemption. We learn that God in infinite mercy now intervened between his creatures and their tempter. For them, indeed, it remained to taste the bitter fruits of their disobedience and mistrust. Eve was informed that sorrow and pain must henceforth be the condition of her existence. In sorrow should she bring forth children her desire should be to her husband, and he should rule over her. Genesis 3.16 Adam learnt that with himself henceforth nature too must undergo a change. Thorns and thistles must grow upon the face of the earth. Toil must be the price of his existence, and his end the silence of the grave. For dust he was, and unto dust he must return. Even thus, however, justice was tempered with sweet mercy, and love mingled blessings with the bitterness of man's cup. If pain and multiplied sorrow was to be woman's lot, 
yet through pain she was to know a mysterious joy and her anguish should be no more remembered when she knew that a man was born into the world and if grievous toil and irksome labor were to be the conditions of man's existence yet in the provision of these effectual antidotes to idleness and many other sins was truest mercy but these gracious purposes extended only to man they temper not the judgment denounced on his seducer utterly cursed was he above all cattle and above every beast of the field the very creature over whom he had seemed to triumph should prove his ultimate conqueror i will put enmity said the almighty to the tempter between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel in these words we trace the first distinct promise of man's ultimate redemption the state of degradation into which he had suffered himself to be seduced was not to last for ever in conformity with the divine equity the deceiver was to be judged by the deceived the conqueror was to be overcome by the conquered man not give himself up to despair there was still room for hope in infinite mercy the almighty had espoused his cause and he would himself provide a remedy for his fall we need not venture on any profitless speculations touching the precise amount of hope the early generations of the human family were likely to have derived from this first gospel this first promise of a saviour in terms it was undoubtedly indefinite neither the time nor the method nor the precise mediating cause of man's deliverance was made known it was not revealed whether the promised seed should be one or many the collective race or a single deliverer on these points greater light was to be shed as time rolled on and many things were to be revealed which now man could not comprehend but of the final victory and of its certainty direct and explicit assurance was given since religion cannot so much as exist without hope the earliest intimation of prophecy was adapted to the support of that essential feeling in the heart of man it was clearly a promise of relief an antidote to perfect despair it contained the prediction that some one should be born of the seed of the woman who should bruise the head of the tempter by whom therefore the penal effects of man's transgression should be in some way reversed with all its uncertainty as to the mode in which this end should be effected the promise had within it a principle of hope and encouragement and the materials of a religious trust fit it to keep man still looking to his maker in the encouraging assurance thus given to adam in this first promise of a saviour sacred history finds its definite starting point and the old testament becomes a true introduction to the new because it reveals the several steps whereby the divine wisdom provided for its fulfillment from first to last sacred history is instinct with life and hope it ever points onward to the future its keynote is ever preparation for the coming of him who is to be the true seed of the woman in whom the father counseled before the world to gather together in one all things both which are on heaven and which are on earth ephesians one ten and philippians two nine and ten end of book one chapter two book one chapter three of a class book of old testament history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a class book of old testament history by george frederick mcclear book one chapter three the flood genesis four through nine b c four thousand and four to two thousand three hundred and forty eight though thus assured of ultimate restoration the first man as a fallen being could not be permitted to remain in the region which had been the scene of his trial and his failure he might take of the fruit of another tree that grew in the midst of the garden the tree of life and eat and live forever and thus prevent the possibility of his recovery accordingly he was sent forth from the garden at the east of which were stationed cherubim a particular order in all probability of angels compare with exodus twenty five seventeen through twenty two and see ezekiel one five and revelation four six while a flaming sword which turned every way guarded the approach to the tree of life 
thus driven forth from eden and recommencing under new and altered circumstances their course of probation adam and eve in due time became the parents of two sons cain gotten or acquired and abel breath transitoriness from their earliest years the most opposite tendencies distinguished the brothers the mysterious rite of sacrifice which meets us at the very threshold of sacred history and which it is supposed not without probability the almighty himself instituted when he made for the first pair coats of skins and clothed them genesis three twenty one became the occasion of a fatal quarrel between them cain brought of the fruit of the ground abel of the firstlings of his flock an offering unto the lord the offering of abel was accepted that of cain rejected the reason for this distinction cannot be pronounced with absolute certainty either the offering of abel was a free and bounteous presentation of the best that he had while that of cain was merely commonplace and perfunctory or abel brought his offering in a spirit of faith and trustful acquiescence in a divinely instituted though mysterious command hebrews six four a motive which the offering of his elder brother lacked whatever was the precise reason of the distinction it roused all cain's latent jealousy and he became his brother's murderer one john three twelve for thus shedding righteous blood matthew twenty three thirty five he was condemned by the almighty to perpetual banishment from the region of eden fearful of vengeance from the other children of adam whose family we may infer from the mention of cain's wife had largely increased he feared to depart before he received from the almighty a special sign or pledge of security in the land of his banishment this having been granted he removed into the region of nod exile and there became the ancestor of numerous descendants the heads of whom are enumerated to the sixth generation under the names of enoch irod mehu jael methu sael and lamech in this region too he built the earliest city of which we have any record and called it enoch after the name of his eldest son the canaanite families were distinguished for their attention to the development of the arts and pleasures of life as cain built the first city so lamech instituted polygamy while of his three sons jabal introduced the nomadic life jubal the use of musical instruments and tubal cain the art of working in metals genesis four sixteen through twenty four meanwhile with another son seth substituted who had been given to adam in place of abel commenced a line distinct in its social and religious tendencies from that of cain the heads of this family are enumerated to the tenth generation under the names of seth enos canaan mahalalil jared enoch methuselah lamech noah while the descendants of cain advanced indeed in civilization but were addicted to luxury and violence the descendants of seth were distinguished for pastoral simplicity they called upon the name of the lord genesis four twenty six they were the chosen repositories of the promise of redemption and the witnesses for a god of righteousness in the midst of a generation which already began to become corrupt and in the seen to forget the unseen an eminent type of the characteristic virtues of this line was enoch the son of jared the seventh from adam jude fourteen all his life long he walked in closest communion with the most high in the spiritual world faith hebrews six five implicit trust in the righteous ruler of the universe was the principle of his life and the secret spring of his holiness one day he vanished from the society of his fellow men he was not for the god whom he served took him to himself and translated him to the unseen world without undergoing the penalty of death genesis five twenty one through twenty four a peculiar feature of this period was the great length to which human life was prolonged adam attained to the age of nine hundred and thirty years methuselah to that of nine hundred and sixty nine the others nearly as long from this accrued many advantages to the race it tended to promote its speedy increase it preserved uninterrupted such knowledge as men were able to acquire and preeminently the original revelation respecting the one true god the remembrance of paradise and the hope of ultimate redemption but the great longevity of the men of this period did not tend to 
hinder their increasing alienation from the paths of righteousness and obedience to the supreme amidst the extreme brevity of the sacred narrative it is clear that the wickedness of men reached a desperate pitch the earth was filled with violence and all men corrupted their way upon it at length this alienation from god reached its culminating point in a catastrophe to which the sacred record attaches a peculiar and mysterious importance when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them the sons of god saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all that they chose whatever be the true meaning of the expression sons of god whether it refers to the angels as some have thought or the descendants of seth certain it is that a superhuman spirit of wickedness broke out at this period from these mixed marriages spring men remarkable for strength and power for violence and arrogant wickedness through whom both races speedily became hopelessly corrupt the salt even in the line of seth lost its savour and the wickedness of men was great on the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually genesis six one through five in this awful crisis one man only found favour with god noah the son of lamech in whom at his birth with prophetic glance his father beheld a pledge of that rest and comfort which the men of faith felt they so sorely needed from the burden of weary and irksome labor on the ground which jehovah had cursed genesis five twenty nine when noah was five hundred years old he became the father of three sons shem ham and japheth like enoch he was a righteous and perfect man in his generation and in this age of universal apostasy maintained an unflinching trust in the righteous ruler of the universe and at length when the cup of man's iniquity was full he received intimation from the almighty of his intention to bring an awful judgment upon the world behold i even i said god do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die from the general catastrophe noah and his family alone were to be preserved and he was directed to construct an ark a huge vessel of enormous dimensions into which when completed he was to repair with his wife his three sons and their wives and also two of every species of beasts and birds accounted unclean or unfit for sacrifice and seven of every species counted clean the vessel thus ordered was to be constructed of gopher wood probably cypress and was to be overlaid within and without with pitch or bitumen in length it was to be three hundred cubits in breadth fifty in depth thirty but though the impending judgment was thus announced and a visible pledge of it directed to be constructed the doom itself was not to be as yet he who afterwards waited four hundred years till the cup of the iniquity of the amorites was full who gave the ninevites forty days for repentance now waited first peter three twenty with much long suffering for a space of one hundred and twenty years during this period according to all that god commanded noah so did he though the things of which he was warned were not yet seen hebrews eleven seven nay must have seemed to the men of his generation in the extremest degree improbable moved with fear he yet persevered in his awful task and by this act of faith as well as by his own works continued to warn his fellow men of what was to come but his warnings fell on unheeding ears the men of his generation set at naught all his counsel and mocked at his reproofs they did eat they drank they married wives they were given in marriage matthew twenty four thirty eight luke seventeen twenty six and twenty seven until the day of doom arrived on the seventeenth day of the second month of the six hundredth year of noah's life he and his family entered into the ark and the lord shut them in then after a solemn pause of seven days the elements of destruction were bidden to do their work the fountains of the great deep were broken up the windows of heaven were open and the rain descended till the waters covered the highest hills and all flesh wherein was the breath of life died of fowl of cattle of wild beasts and of every creeping thing which creepeth upon the earth and every man in these simple but impressive words the sacred narrative describes the appalling catastrophe written for a far higher purpose it paints no scene as a human writer would have done 
we see nothing of the death struggle we hear not the cry of despair we are not called upon to witness the frantic agony of husband and wife of parent and child as they fled in terror before the rising waters not a word is said of the sadness of the one righteous man who save himself looked upon the destruction which he could not avert but one impression is left upon the mind with peculiar vividness from the very simplicity of the narrative and it is that of utter desolation all flesh died noah only was left and they that were with him in the ark for a hundred and fifty days the waters prevailed till at length on the seventeenth day of the seventh month the ark rested on one of the peaks of ararat from this time the waters gradually decreased till the first day of the tenth month when the tops of the mountains having begun to appear noah sent forth a raven which returned not to the ark a week afterwards he sent forth a dove to see if the waters were abated from the lower and more level country but the dove finding no rest for the sole of her foot returned unto the ark again he waited seven days and once more sent her forth when she returned with a fresh olive leaf plucked off in her mouth a sign that the waters had still further subsided yet again after a similar interval noah sent her forth this time however she did not return having found on the earth the rest for the sole of her feet and then he knew that the awful judgment had indeed come to a close and at the divine command left the ark and set foot on the dry land genesis eight one through nineteen end of book one chapter three Book One, Chapter Four of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick MacLear. Book One, Chapter Four. The Confusion of Tongues Genesis 10-11 B.C. 2347 to 2233 The first act of Noah on leaving the ark was to build an altar and offer burnt offerings unto the Lord of every clean beast and of every clean fowl. His sacrifice was accepted and now for the first time a solemn covenant was ratified between the Almighty and the Patriarch, to which definite promises were annexed, and an outward and visible sign. From its baptism of water, the earth had risen once more to be the habitation of man, and Noah and his sons were solemnly assured that all flesh should never again be cut off by the waters of a flood, but that while the earth remained seed time and harvest cold and heat summer and winter and day and night should not cease again too the blessing of paradise was bestowed sovereignty and dominion over the animal creation were assured and once more men were bidden to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth at the same time, animal food was expressly allowed, while the sanctity of human life was as solemnly enforced. Whoso shed man's blood, by man should his blood be shed. Of this covenant, the rainbow was the visible pledge, assuring man that he might enter afresh on his course of probation, nor dread its interruption by any catastrophe like that with which the earth had been so lately visited. Genesis 9, 8-17 through 17. The elevation of the Armenian plateau, in the neighborhood of which the ark had rested, being equidistant between the Black and Caspian seas on the north, the Persian Gulf and Mediterranean Sea on the south, being also the region in which all the great rivers of Western Asia, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Araxes, and the Halys take their rise, formed a natural and convenient center whence the descendants of Noah might overspread the whole earth. 
But on this migration, they did not set out before an unseemly incident revealed the natural character of his sons, prophetic of their future destinies. Noah began to practice agriculture and planted a vineyard, and through ignorance, as it has been supposed, of its properties, drank of the wine in excess and lay exposed in his tent. Ham, his youngest son, mocked him while he lay in his condition, but Shem and Japheth, with more filial feeling, averting their eyes, covered their father with a garment. Awaking from his slumbers, Noah became conscious of what his youngest son had done, and justly angry at the irreverence he had displayed, break forth into prophetic utterances of blessing and cursing foreshadowing the diverse destinies of the descendants of his family. Upon Canaan, the fourth son of Ham, and probably a partaker in his father's transgression, he pronounced the doom of perpetual servitude to his brethren. Shem he declared to be the chosen one of Jehovah, from whom the promised salvation should proceed, while Japheth multiplied and enlarged, should dwell in his tents, and be received as a partaker in his spiritual privileges. With their future destinies thus foretold, the sons of Noah went forth, and took up their abode for some time on the rich alluvial plain of Shinar, between the Tigris and Euphrates. Here their descendants began to form a great fraternal community, which it was the more easy to do, seeing that they all proceeded from the same parental home, and had all one language. But here, in defiance of the divine command, which bade them disperse themselves abroad, and replenish the whole earth, they resolved to make a city and a huge tower whose top might reach unto heaven, to serve as a central point of union and a great world metropolis. But their design was counteracted. The Almighty interposed, and by confounding their language so that they could not understand one another's speech, rent the closest bond of human society. Unable to continue the erection of their city and tower, which was henceforth called Babel, or confusion, they were scattered abroad over the face of the earth, and thus constrained to fulfill the eternal designs of him who has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of the habitations of the sons of men. Acts 17.26 Before, however, it leaves them to pursue their own ways, the sacred narrative presents to us a genealogical table in which the names of the several nations descended from Noah and their geographical distribution have been preserved. With this table, antiquity has handed down nothing that can be compared for accuracy or comprehensiveness. It exposes the fallacies of the mythical genealogies of pagans, contradicts their fables respecting gods, heroes, and periods of millions of years, and also affords a firm foundation for investigations concerning the origin and the traditions of nations. From this table, then, it appears that, 1. The descendants of Japheth enlargement, after leaving the original cradle of the human race, occupied chiefly the isles of the Gentiles, or the coastlands of the Mediterranean Sea, in Asia Minor and Europe, and thence spread chiefly in a northerly direction over the entire European continent, and a great portion of Asia. Thus Gomer was the ancestor of the Chimerians, or Cimbri. Magog of the Scythians, Madai of the Medes, Javan of the Ionians and Greek race, Tubal and Mesic of the Tiberini and Mosci, 
two Colchian tribes, and Tyrus of the Thracians. 2. The descendants of Ham, Heat, proceeded in a southerly direction, and occupied the whole of Africa and the southern peninsulas of Asia, India, and Arabia. Of his four sons, Cush extended his settlements from Babylonia to Ethiopia. Mizraim colonized Egypt, Phut, Libya, and Canaan, the land called by his name. 3. The descendants of Shem established themselves in Central Asia, and thence extended in an easterly and westerly direction, Aram colonizing the country afterwards known as Syria, Lud, Lydia, Arphaxad, Chaldea, Asher, part of Assyria, Elam, Persia, Joktan, a portion of the Arabian Peninsula. Genesis 10, 1 through 26. Thus he who hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, Acts 17, 26, directed the repeopling of the world by the descendants of Noah. Like prodigal sons, they were to go into far countries and learn by bitter experience that neither human strength nor human wisdom can work out the righteousness of God or win back for man his lost inheritance. But the preservation of their names in this table of nations is a proof that no one of them was forgotten by a God of love, that though they might forget him, he yet guided their destinies and overruled their counsels only to the accomplishment of his gracious purposes of redemption. The day of Pentecost in the New Testament corresponds to the confusion of tongues in the Old. Then, not till then, did men hear, each in their tongue wherein they were born, the glad tidings of one, very God and very man, in whom there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. Galatians three twenty eight. End of Book One, Chapter Four. Book One, Chapter Five of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear Book 1, Chapter 5 Rise of Idolatry, The Patriarch Job Genesis 10, 6-12 Job Sacred history does not record many facts connected with the immediate descendants of Noah. The scene of the confusion of tongues continued to attract around it a large number of the early inhabitants of the world, and here was established one of the earliest of the great empires of the earth by Nimrod, a son of Cush and grandson of Ham. Of great powers and gigantic stature, he first obtained widespread renown by his exploits as a mighty hunter and the services he rendered the surrounding populations by ridding them of the terror of noxious and terrible animals. In process of time, however, he combined with his exploits as a hunter the conquest of men and founded a great empire on the plains of Shinar, the chief towns of which were Babel, Erech, Edessa, Akkad, Nisibis, and Calne, Tesiphon. Thence, for such seems to be the meaning of Genesis 10:11, he extended his dominions along the course of the Tigris into Assyria among the descendants of Shem, where he founded a second group of cities, Nineveh, Rehoboth, Kela, and Rezin. At a period when men's lives were prolonged so far beyond the period now allotted them, it is probable that this great conqueror may have carried on his successful invasions for nearly two hundred years, and after death was worshipped under the title of Belus, or Bel, the Lord. Certainly the vast ruins that overspread the site of the ancient Babylonian Empire 
seemed to tell of the days when there were great heroes on the earth. And to Nimrod, the modern Arabs ascribe all the great works of ancient times, the Burs Nimrud near Babylon, Tel Nimrud near Baghdad, and the Mount of Nimrud near Mosul. Whether the practice of idolatrous worship was introduced, as some have supposed, by this great hero of the ancient world or not, certain it is that mankind became more and more addicted to idolatry. Though the knowledge of the one true God and the promise of salvation had been handed down by tradition, and though his invisible attributes, even his eternal power and Godhead, were clearly to be discerned in the works of creation, Romans 1, 1920, Yet mankind glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. They began to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. The sun, moon, and stars, the principle of fire, even the inferior animals and departed heroes, came to be regarded with veneration and usurped the worship due only to the supreme. With idolatry came its usual consequences, a deep moral degeneracy, cruelty, tyranny, and licentiousness. One of the earliest allusions to the worship of the heavenly bodies occurs in the book of Job 31, 26-28. The age and writer of this book are alike unknown. By some it is ascribed to Job himself, by others to Moses, by others to some writer who lived at a still later period. As, however, the scenes therein described had with great probability been referred to a period very little removed from that of which we have now arrived, it may be well to speak of them here. Job was an eminent eastern chief, dwelling in the very early times in the land of Uz, Job 1 1, probably Arabia Deserta, or as some suppose Mesopotamia. Greatest among the sons of the east, endowed with all the riches of his age, he ruled piously and wisely over a happy and numerous household, having seven sons and three daughters. To considerable mental attainments, he added a moral uprightness, which preserved him blameless in all the relations of life, and was declared by the Lord himself to be without his like in all the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Job 1, eight, With large and liberal hand, he distributed to the necessities of the poor, so that whenever the ear heard him, then it blessed him. When the eye saw him, it gave witness to him. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon him, and he caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. But in the midst of this almost perfect temporal happiness, he was suddenly overwhelmed with the heaviest misfortunes that can befall the sons of men. He who slandered God to Eve slandered Job before God and affirmed that he did not fear him for naught, that if he were stripped of all his possessions, he would be as other men and curse the Lord to his face. Job 1.11 To put, therefore, the patriarch's faith to the most certain test, the accuser of mankind received mysterious permission to cast him down and try him with the most grievous afflictions. Blow after blow descended upon him. From being the lord of a numerous and attached household, he suddenly became childless. For the storm of the desert swept over the house where his sons and daughters were assembled, and crushed them all beneath its ruins. From being the richest of the sons of the east, he suddenly became a beggar. For the thunderbolt, the fire of God, fell and struck down all his sheep as they were grazing quietly with their shepherds while his camels were carried off by a band of Chaldean robbers and his oxen and asses by a horde of Sabians. And not only did he become a childless, beggared, ruined man, but upon his own body the black leprosy of the East set its awful mark, making him an object hateful and loathsome to look upon, smitten with sores from the sole of his foot even unto his crown. He sat apart, forsaken by his friends, and even by his wife. But amidst these awful trials, his faith was not prostrated. When the terrible tidings reached him of the fate of his household, he said, in words of sublime resignation, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away, and blessed be the name of the Lord. When his wife, utterly unable to bear up, bade him curse his Maker and die, he replied, 
What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Job 1 and 21, 2 and 10. Before long, the news of his terrible affliction was noised abroad, and three of his old friends, Eliphaz from Teman, Bildad from Shua, and Zophar of Namath, came to mourn with him and to comfort him. In their presence, Job at length brake forth into desperate words and cursed the day of his birth. Job 3 and 1. The storm of his soul was not calmed by the sympathy of his friends. Instead of pouring in the oil of comfort, they only heightened his griefs by ascribing his calamities to some great sin, some secret guilt, if not committed by himself, at least by his children, for which he was now punished. A distinct question was thus propounded. Is great suffering a proof of great guilt? Job's friends affirmed it was, and exhorted him to repent and confess. Job denied, and at great length labored to refute this. Job 4 and 5 to 32 At the close of their dialogue, Elihu, another and younger friend of the patriarch, intervened to moderate between the disputants. Unable to solve the problem of Job's calamities, he declared that afflictions, even when not the direct consequences of sin, were intended for good, and he reproved his friend for justifying himself rather than the Almighty and speaking unadvisedly of his works. Job 32-37 to At length the Lord himself condescended to interpose in the controversy. From the midst of a whirlwind, in words of incomparable grandeur and sublimity, he silenced the murmurs of his servant, bidding him reflect on the glory of creation and learn from the marvels of the animal kingdom the stupendous power and wisdom of him with whom it is useless for a created being to contend. Job 38-41 to Thereupon, in deep contrition, Job acknowledged his error and supplicated the divine pardon for the bitterness and arrogance of his complaints. This penitent acknowledgment was accepted, and Job's three friends were severely reproved for their uncharitable surmises, respecting the origin of his misfortunes. On the intercession, however, of the patriarch, they were pardoned, and he who had suffered him to be thus sorely tried, when his trials had served the purpose for which they had been sent, once more showered down upon him the riches of his goodness, restoring him to still greater prosperity than he had even enjoyed before and made him the father of seven sons and three daughters, celebrated for their beauty above all the maidens of the East. Job survived his altered fortunes upward of a 140 years, and then having seen his children to the fourth generation, died in a good old age, an instructive example of integrity, Ezekiel 14, 14 and 20, and of patience under the most trying calamities. James 5 11. End of Book 1, Chapter 5. Book 2, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 2, Chapter 1, The Call of Abraham, Genesis 11, B.C. 1921. There will always perhaps be a doubt as to the exact period after the flood when Job lived, but there can be no doubt that neither his constancy nor his faithfulness to the one true God were the characteristics of the age succeeding the flood. Within ten generations after that event, mankind had again become forgetful of their Maker, and corrupted their way, threatening a fresh outbreak of violence and irreligion. Now, however, it was not the purpose of the Almighty to visit the earth with any universal judgment. In the counsels of redemption, it was his will to select a man, and through him, a nation, to be his witness upon earth, to withdraw this nation from contact with the surrounding world, to place it under a special and peculiar constitution, to entrust to it the guardianship of ancient truths and of future hopes, 
and out of it to bring, in the fullness of time, Galatians 4, 4, the promised savior of the human race. At this point, then, sacred history becomes more full, and its stream, hitherto slender, widens into a broad river. Mighty empires and great nations seem for a while to be forgotten, but only because we are now to be more especially concerned with the history of that particular nation, in and through which all nations of the earth were to be blessed. Genesis 12, 3. The man selected by the Almighty to be the ancestor of a people destined to exert so momentous an influence on the salvation of the world was Abraham, or, as he was first called, Abram, the son of Terah, who lived in the eighth generation from Shem, in Ur of the Chaldees. Besides Abram, Terah had two other sons, Naor and Haran, but Abram, though mentioned first, was in all probability the youngest of the three. From Ur, which may perhaps be identified with the modern Orpha in Upper Mesopotamia, where his family had become tainted with the generally prevailing idolatry, Joshua 24, 2 and 14. Terah removed, and traveling in a southerly direction, arrived at Haran, or Charon, where he stayed. In this journey he was accompanied by his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his grandson Lot and seems to have intended to go into the land of Canaan, Genesis 11:31, but this was prevented by his death at Haran, when he had reached the age of 205. After this event, a still more distinct intimation of the divine will was made to his son Abram, bidding him leave his country, his kindred, and his father's house, and go to a land which God would show him. There, said the Almighty, I will make of thee a great nation, and make thy name great and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Severe as were the hardships which this call involved, painful as it must have been to flesh and blood to sever the ties which bound him to his family and his people, Abram did not refuse to follow the hand which promised him guidance, protection, and a mighty future. At the age of seventy-five, with his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all that he possessed, he left Haran, crossed the Euphrates, and commenced his journey southward and westward towards the land of promise. Acts 7, 4, and 5. This country, the future home of the great nation destined to spring from his loins, was in many respects eminently adapted for its special mission in the history of the world. In extent, indeed, it was but a narrow strip of country, but a little larger than the six northern counties of England, being nearly 180 miles in length and seventy-five in breadth, and having an area of about 13,600 English square miles. Bounded on the west by the Mediterranean Sea, on the north by the mountains of Lebanon, on the east by the Syrian desert, on the south by the wilderness of Arabia, it was situated at the meeting point of the two continents of Asia and Africa, on the very outpost, on the extremest western edge of the east. It was a secluded land, a wilderness encompassed it on the east and south, mountains shut it in on the north, and the great sea which washed its western shore was the terror rather than the thoroughfare of ancient nations. Unlike the coast of Europe, and especially of Greece, it had no indentations, no winding creeks, no deep havens, but one small port, that of Joppa, with which to tempt the mariner from the west. But while thus eminently adapted to be the silent and retired nursery of the kingdom of God, it was in the very center of the activity of the ancient world, in the midst of the nations, in the countries that were round about it. Ezekiel 5.5 5. On the south was the great empire of Egypt, on the northeast the rising kingdom of Assyria. Neither of these great nations could communicate with the other without passing through Palestine and so learning something of its peculiar institutions and religion. And when the fullness of time was come, no country was better suited from its position at the extremist verge of the eastern world to be the starting point whence the glad tidings of redemption might be proclaimed to all nations. Moreover, narrow as were its limits and secluded as was its position, it yet presented a greater variety of surface, scenery, and temperature than is to be found in any other part of the world, and need it not to depend on other countries for anything that 
either the luxuries or actual wants of its inhabitants required four broadly marked longitudinal regions divided its surface first there was the low plain of the western sea coast broad towards the south and gradually narrowing towards the north famous for the shepala the low country with its waving cornfields and the vale of sharon level country the garden of palestine from this was an ascent to a strip of tableland every part of which was more or less undulating but increasing in elevation from north to south and broken only by the plain of jezreel or esdraelon to this succeeded a rapid descent into a deep fissure or valley through which the jordan the descender the only river of importance in the country rushed from its source at the base of hermon into the dead sea the surface of which is no less than one thousand three hundred and sixteen feet below that of the mediterranean hence was a second ascent to a strip of tableland on the east similar to that on the west and seeming with its range of purple tinted mountains to overhang jerusalem itself crowned by the forests and upland pastures of gilead and bashan this eastern tableland gradually melted into the desert which rolled between it and the valley of mesopotamia thus within a very small space were crowded the most diverse features of natural scenery and the most varied products it was a good land a land of brooks of water of fountains and depths that sprang out of the valleys and hills a land flowing with milk and honey deuteratomy eight seven through nine and eleven ten through twelve the low plains yielded luxuriant crops of wheat and barley of rye and maize on the tablelands with their equable and moderate climate grew the vine the olive the fig the almond the pomegranate in the tropical neighborhood of jericho flourished the palm tree and the balsam while the noble cedar waved on the mountains of lebanon such was the land secluded and yet central narrow and yet wonderfully diversified alike in its natural features and its products whither the almighty now bade abram direct his steps striking across the great syrian desert the patriarch kept on his southward course and having crossed the jordan passed through the land till he came to shechem situated between the mountains ebal and jerazim this spot destined afterwards to be so celebrated was then only marked by the majestic oak of morha probably a canaanitish chief but its many fountains rills and watercourses made it then as it ever has been since a natural pasture ground for flocks and herds and here abram halted and learnt that he had reached the goal of his long journey this land said god i will give unto thy seed and at shechem the patriarch built his first altar to the lord in the land of promise genesis twelve six and seven thence he afterwards removed southward a distance of about twenty miles to the strong mountain country east of bethel or as it was then called loose one of the finest tracts of the land for pasturage and here he erected his second altar unto the lord during his sojourn in this neighborhood he learnt that though the heir of mighty promises he was not to be exempt from his share of trials and disappointments the first that befell him was a grievous famine caused probably by a failure of the usual rains in consequence of which finding himself unable to support his numerous dependents he resolved though without direct divine suggestion to go down into egypt then as always the fertile granary of the neighboring nations as he drew near the land of the mighty pharaohs he reflected that the beauty of his wife might expose her to danger from the sensual voluptuous egyptians and under the influence of these apprehensions persuaded her to stoop to an unworthy equivocation and give herself out as his sister what he anticipated came to pass the princess of Egypt beheld the woman that she was fair, and recommended her to their monarch, by whom she was taken into his palace, while numerous presents of cattle and sheep were sent to her supposed brother. But the monarch found that the coming of the stranger into his palace involved him in serious troubles. The Lord plagued Pharaoh with great plagues, till having ascertained the true relation between her and Abram, he sent her back to her husband, with a strong rebuke to the latter for the deception he had practiced how long after this abram stayed in egypt we are not told but at length his wealth in cattle and gold and silver having materially increased 
he quitted the country and once more took up his abode on his former camping ground between bethel and i hitherto his nephew lot had accompanied him in all his wanderings but now the increasing numbers of their flocks and herds generated a quarrel between their respective herdsmen and it was plainly necessary that they should separate with characteristic generosity abram bade his nephew take the first choice and select for himself whether on the left hand or the right a place for his new abode from the high mountain range to the east of bethel where they were then encamped lot lifted up his eyes and looked down upon the wide and welled water plain south of the jordan then a very garden of the lord like the land of egypt genesis thirteen ten they had so lately left as yet no terrible convulsion had effaced the sight of sodom and gomorrah and the other cities of the plain fair and fertile the coveted possessions stretch onwards unto zoar and in spite of the notorious wickedness of the inhabitants lot chose it for his abode and the two separated themselves the one from the other though abram was thus left to wait alone for the fulfilment of the promise he was not forgotten by the god in whom he trusted a more full and more definite promise was now vouchsafed to him lift up thine eyes said the almighty and look from place to place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward all the land which thou seest to thee will i give it and to thy seed for ever and i will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth then shall thy seed also be numbered genesis thirteen fourteen through seventeen thus encouraged the friend of god james two twenty three removed his tent and travelling southward took up his abode under the spreading terebinth of mamre an amorite prince genesis fourteen thirteen and twenty four near hebron or as it was then called kirjath arba the city of arba the father of anak and the progenitor of the giant anakim genesis twenty three two thirty five twenty seven and joshua fourteen fifteen while dwelling peacefully in this neighborhood which like all other places he hallowed with an altar to jehovah he received one day unexpected tidings of his nephew lot the chiefs of the five cities in the tropical valley of the jordan sodom gomorrah adma zeboim and bela had for twelve years been subject to cheter laomer a powerful king of elam or mesopotopia but they had lately united together to throw off his yoke thereupon the king of elam aided by three other confederate chiefs proceeded to make war against the southern kings sweeping down on a sudden foray he smote the countries on the eastern uplands of the jordan and the southern region of mount zair returning thence he ravaged all the country of the amalekites and with his allied chiefs met the kings of sodom and gomorrah in pitched battle in the valley of siddam probably at the northwest corner of the dead sea the five southern kings were utterly routed and with much spoil and many captives the assyrian invader commenced his return northwards it was the news of this sudden invasion which now reached the ears of abram without losing a moment he instantly armed his three hundred and eighteen trained servants and aided by the confederate chief marmore and his brothers eshcol and aner arose and pursued the assyrians by night the latter had in the meantime reached the neighborhood of the sidonian laish far up in the northern mountains thither however abram pursued them and falling upon them suddenly while all unconscious of coming danger he smote them and chased them to hoba on the left of damascus thence with the recovered captives among whom was lot he returned and at the king's dale not far from hebron was met by the king of sodom accompanied by a mysterious personage who now meets us for the first and only time named melchizedek a king of salem and priest of the most high god the sudden appearance of one thus uniting the kingly and priestly functions of whose origin and family we know nothing has led to much speculation putting aside more improbable conjectures we may perhaps conclude that he was an eminent canaanitish prince in the line of ham who had maintained the pure worship of the one true god and who according to a custom not uncommon in patriarchal times was at once king and priest a sufficient proof of his high dignity is afforded 
by the fact that to him the patriarch abram reverently gave tithes of all that he had taken in his late successful expedition and received his solemn blessing hebrews seven two and six before they parted the king of sodom pressed abram to take a portion of the spoil as his reward this however the latter with his usual generosity firmly declined he would take nothing from a thread even to a shoe latchet genesis fourteen twenty three save only a portion for his allies the chiefs anir eshcol and mamre and then returned to the shade of the oak or terebinth near hebron end of book two chapter one book two chapter two of a class book of old testament history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a class book of old testament history by george frederick mcclear book two chapter two the life of abraham continued genesis fifteen through twenty five B.C. 1913 to 1822. We now enter on another and a different scene in the history of Abram. He had been victorious over the Assyrian kings. He had gotten him honor as the prompt avenger of injustice and oppression before the chiefs of the land in which he was a pilgrim and a sojourner. He had been solemnly blessed by the king of righteousness, but where was the fulfillment of the promise for which he had so long been waiting? He had no son, no single pledge of the mighty nation, destined to spring from his loins. When, therefore, his all-merciful God appeared to him again in a vision to assure him of safety and protection, he could not restrain the deep sorrow of his heart, and mournfully complained that in place of a son, one born in his house, probably Eliezer of Damascus would be his heir. On this occasion the Almighty not only solemnly assured his desponding servant that a son should be born to him, an earnest of a seed as numerous as the stars of heaven, and that the land in which he walked should undoubtedly be their inheritance. But as in the case of Noah after the flood, he vouchsafed to him an outward and visible sign. To strengthen and support his faith, he bade the patriarch take a heifer, a ram, and a she-goat, each three years old, together with a turtle-dove and a young pigeon, and after dividing them all, except the birds, to lay them piece by piece over against the other. Familiar, doubtless, with this ancient method of ratifying a covenant, Abram did as the Lord had told him, slew the victims, and laid the divided portions in order. Then from morning until evening he watched them, and from time to time drove away the birds of prey which hovered over them. At length the sun went down, and a deep sleep fell upon him, and a horror of great darkness gathered around him. Amidst the deepening gloom there appeared to him a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passing along the space between the divided victims. Presently a voice came to him, telling him that his seed should be a stranger in a land that was not theirs, that there they should suffer affliction four hundred years, that afterwards in the fourth generation, when the cup of the Amorites was full, they should come out with great substance, return to the spot where the patriarch now was and enter on their promised inheritance. Thus amidst mingled light and gloom, the ancestor of the elect nation was warned of the checkered fortunes which awaited his progeny, while at the same time he was assured of the ultimate fulfillment of the promise, and the actual boundaries of the lands of his inheritance were marked out from the river of Egypt to the distant Euphrates, and in this confidence Abram was content to possess his soul in patience. Luke twenty one nineteen. As yet it will be observed, it had not been expressly said that his wife Sarai was the destined mother of the long-promised son. As the prospect, therefore, of her contributing to the fulfillment of the promise became more and more remote, she seems to have concluded that this honor was not reserved for her, and accordingly persuaded her husband to take her handmaid, Hagar, an Egyptian, as a secondary wife that by her he might obtain what was denied herself. Abram complied with her suggestion, and Hagar conceived, but the consequence did not tend to increase the patriarch's happiness. In a moment of elation Hagar mocked her mistress, and Sarai dealt harshly with her, 
till she fled from her into the southern wilderness on the way that led to her native land. There, as she halted near a fountain of water, an angel of the Lord met her and bade her return and submit herself to her mistress, assuring her at the same time that she should give birth to a son, whom she was to call Ishmael, whom God hears. Though the son of a bondwoman, Galatians 4, 22 and 23, no mean future lay before him. He should become the ancestor of a numerous seed, who, like himself, would be true roving sons of the desert, their hand against every man, and every man's hand against them. In remembrance of this incident, Hagar named the fountain Bir Lahai Roy, the well of the god that appeareth, and returned to the tents of Sarai, where in process of time she gave birth to Ishmael, when Abram was eighty-six years old. Again thirteen years rolled away, and still the promise was not fulfilled. But when hope might almost have ceased to hope, God appeared once more to Abram, recapitulated the main outline of the covenant promise, changed his name from Abram, a high father, to Abraham, the father of a multitude, and assured him that at length the long-expected time was well-nigh come, but in prospect of the peculiar blessing about to be bestowed upon him, he himself and all his seed after him must carry about with them a perpetual pledge of their covenant relation to Jehovah. The rite of circumcision must now be adopted by him, and instead of being the badge of any favored class among the nation destined to spring from his loins, was on pain of excommunication to be open to the lowliest member of the Hebrew commonwealth, even to the bondservant and the stranger. At the same time it was intimated to the patriarch that his wife Sarai, whose name also was now changed to Sarah, princess, and no other, was to be the mother of the promised child, that it would be born during the next year, and be called Isaac, laughter. While Ishmael also, for whom Abraham had prayed, would not be forgotten, but be a partaker in the divine blessing and become the father of twelve princes, the ancestors of a great nation. Thereupon Abraham complied with the divine command, and was circumcised, together with Ishmael, now thirteen years of age, and all the male members of his household. Shortly after this, as the patriarch sat, in the heat of the day, under the oak of Mamre, he received a visit from three mysterious strangers, whom he entertained with becoming hospitality. The meal over, which he had hastily prepared, one of them inquired for his wife, and formally announced that within the year she would be the mother of a son. His words were overheard by Sarah, and she laughed incredulously at the possibility of such an event, but was thereupon reproved by the speaker, and assured in a still more confident manner of the fulfillment of his word. Then the three left the tent and turned their steps eastward toward Sodom. Abraham accompanied them, and on the way one of them, in whom he recognized no other than the angel of the covenant, informed him of the real purport of this visit to the cities where his nephew Lot had taken up his abode. The sin of these cities was very great, and their cup was now full. Their inhabitants had wearied themselves with wickedness, and their licentiousness and iniquity called to heaven for a visible revelation of divine wrath. And judgment was now even at the door. Informed of the impending doom, the friend of God drew near, and with marvelous boldness, blended with the deepest humility, pleaded with the Almighty for the guilty cities. Per adventure, there might be found therein at least fifty, or forty-five, or forty, or thirty, or twenty, or even ten righteous souls. Would the Lord of all the earth spare them, for ten's sake? Thereupon he was assured that if only ten righteous souls could be found, the cities should be spared. While he was thus pleading with God, the two other angels entered Sodom, and were hospitably entertained by Lot. But their celestial beauty only served to excite the wickedness of the inhabitants who surrounded Lot's house, and in spite of his earnest expostulations, would have offered them personal violence had they not been suddenly stricken with blindness. As the night wore on, his visitors assured Lot of the certain destruction of the city, and warned him to gather together with all speed every member of his family, if he would save them from the impending judgment. Lot did as he was advised, but his warning was lost upon his sons-in-law and his daughters-in-law, and he seemed unto them as one that mocked. 
when the day dawned the angels broke off any further delay by laying hold on him and his wife and his two daughters and having dragged them forth beyond the city bade them flee to their neighboring mountain range if they would not be consumed but thither lot was afraid to flee and in compliance with his urgent entreaty was permitted to betake himself to the town of bella or zoar little on the southern extremity of the dead sea the sun rose as he entered the city of refuge and then the lord rained upon sodom and gomorrah brimstone and fire out of heaven and utterly swept away by an awful convulsion every trace of the guilty cities and their inhabitants the sight of which became henceforth a perpetual desolation few as were the remnants of this fearful overthrow yet one of these few failed to reach the little city of refuge in spite of the angel's reiterated warning lot's wife lingered looked back and caught by the advancing sulphurous tide was smothered as she stood and became a pillar of salt genesis nineteen twenty six and luke seventeen thirty two as for lot himself afraid to dwell even in zoar he fled with his two daughters to the eastern mountains and became the father of two sons moab and ben ami the ancestors of two powerful nations the moabites and the ammonites shortly after this terrible judgment abraham left the oak of mamre where he had so long encamped and journeyed in a southern direction towards gerar between kadesh and shur at that time the principal seat of the philistines whose chief was known by the hereditary title of abimelech or father king under the same apprehensions which he had felt when drawing nigh to egypt abraham wished that sarah should pass for his sister and again exposed her to eminent risk but as before the lord mercifully intervened and the philistine chief restored his wife to the patriarch together with ample presents genesis twenty fourteen through sixteen at length the time had come for which abraham now upwards of one hundred years of age had so long waited either at gerar or beersheba sarah gave birth to the child of promise who was duly circumcised on the eighth day and named isaac laughter according to the divine command at the feast given on the occasion of his weaning ishmael mocked or in some way insulted the child this act observed by sarah roused all her animosity and she demanded the instant dismissal of the boy and his mother though sorely against his will abraham advised by god yielded to his wife and early on the following morning hagar and her son were sent away to wander in the wilderness of beersheba in a short time the water in her skin bottle was spent and the boy tormented with thirst seemed at the point of death unable to endure the sight of his sufferings hagar laid him under the shade of the desert shrubs and sat down about a bowshot off but the boy was not thus to die god heard his cry and the angel of the lord called to hagar out of heaven and bade her not despair at the same time her eyes were opened to discern a well of water with which she filled her bottle and gave the lad drink thus his life was preserved and he grew and prospered and dwelled in the wild desert of paran near mount sinai and was renowned for his skill in the use of the bow marrying an egyptian he became the father of twelve sons and one daughter genesis twenty five thirteen through fifteen twenty eight nine and thirty six three the ancestors of the chief portion of the wild arab tribes living by warlike forays and plunder their hand against every man and every man's hand against them meanwhile abraham was living in peace and security feared and respected by his philistine neighbors in the south country near beersheba when a far keener trial befell him than any he had yet experienced the call from his own country the famine that drove him into egypt the desertion of lot the long deferring of the promised seed the separation from ishmael all these had been sore trials to flesh and blood but now when the hope of his life seemed at length to have been gained he was commanded to take his son his only son isaac a three days journey into the land of moriah and offer him up as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that should be shown him utterly inexplicable as this command must have seemed and indescribably painful to his feelings the patriarch's trust in god did not falter 
assured that he who had called him into being could, if it pleased him, raise up his son even from the dead. Hebrews 11.19 He rose up early in the morning, clave the wood for the sacrifice, saddled his ass, and with two young men and Isaac commenced his journey. On the third day he lifted up his eyes and beheld the spot afar off. Thereupon leaving the young men behind, he laid the wood upon his son, and with a fire in his hand and a knife ascended the mountain to the spot of which God had told him. Marveling that no victim had been brought, but assured that a lamb would be provided for a burnt offering, Isaac accompanied his father to the summit. And when the altar had been built, and the wood laid thereon, submit it without a murmur to be bound, and placed upon it. Another moment, and the father's hand was actually outstretched to slay his son, when a voice from heaven arrested him, and bade him forbear to proceed further. Seeing that the end for which this mysterious trial had been sent was now gained, for Abraham had not withheld his only son, but given proof of his willingness to surrender even him to the divine call. At the same moment the patriarch looked, and beheld behind him a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, which he took, and offered as a burnt offering instead of his son. In memory of this eventful day he named the place Jehovah Jireh, i.e., Jehovah will see or provide, and again received the assurance of the divine blessing upon himself and his future descendants, who should be multiplied as the stars of heaven and as the sand upon the seashore, become the channel of blessings to all the nations of the earth. This is the culminating point in Abraham's life, implicit trust in the Most High, unfaltering obedience to his will, had never been more signally displayed, and his faith was counted to him for righteousness. Romans 4, 3, and 9. From this time his course was calm and peaceful. Leaving Beersheba, he turned northwards, and once more abode under the oak of Marmore. Here he lost the partner of his long and eventful career. At the age of 127, the only instance in which the age of a woman is recorded in Scripture, Sarah died, and was laid in the cave of the field of Machpelah, a spot now covered by the mosque of Hebron, which Abraham bought for four hundred shekels of silver, for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite. So deep was the respect of the children of Heath for the mighty prince who had so long lived among them, that in spite of the usual oriental jealousy on this point, they would willingly have permitted him to bury his dead in the choices of their own sepulchres. But this Abraham declined, and the cave of Machpelah, with the surrounding field, was made over to him for a possession forever. Three years afterwards, anxious to prevent an alliance between his son and any of the Canaanitish nations, he sent the eldest servant of his house, probably Eliezer of Damascus, into Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor, his brother, to procure from thence a wife for him. His servant faithfully discharged his commission, and the piety he displayed reflecting the goodness of the patriarch himself was rewarded. At a well outside the city of Haran he met Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Nahor, going forth with her pitcher on her shoulder to draw water. In answer to his inquiry she told him who she was, and conducted him to the house of her brother Laban. There he recounted all that had befallen his master in the land of his pilgrimage, and made known the purpose of his errand. Rebecca, when asked by her brother and mother, announced her readiness to accompany the servant to the tents of Abraham, and in the course of time became Isaac's wife. Genesis 24 Before long Abraham himself also married again, and by Keturah his second wife became the father of six children, Zimran, Jokshan, Medin, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Genesis 25, 2. The ancestors of Arabian and Midianitish tribes, lest they should dispute the inheritance with Isaac, the prudent patriarch, while he yet lived, presented them with gifts and sent them away into the southeast country. Genesis 25, 6 where their descendants settled along the borders of the Ellenitic Gulf in considerable numbers, and then the father of the faithful, the friend of God, being 175 years old, had reached the term of life allotted to him. In a good old age and full of years, he was gathered unto his people, 
and was laid by Isaac and Ishmael also, who had come up from the wild desert of Paran to assist in these last sad offices by the side of his beloved Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. End of Book Two, Chapter Two. Section Eight A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History, Book Two, Chapter Three The History of Isaac by George Frederick MacLear. For nineteen years after their marriage, Isaac and Rebecca were childless. But at length, in answer to earnest prayer, Rebecca became the mother of twin sons, Esau, Harry, Ruff, and Jacob, he that holds by the heel or supplanter. The bitter enmity afterwards to exist between the brothers was foreshadowed even before their birth, and as they grew, the difference in their characters became still more prominent. Esau became a cunning hunter, wild and daring, even as his rough and robust frame betokened, reveling like a true son in the desert in the excitement of the chase. Jacob, on the other hand, was a quiet domestic youth, dwelling in tents, the favorite of his mother, while Esau, by a not uncommon caprice of affection, was the favorite of the general retiring Isaac whose keen relish for savory food was gratified by his success in the hunting field. It is in connection with his favorite pursuit that Esau first attracts our notice. As the eldest son, he had several important privileges. He held superior rank in the family, and would succeed to a double portion of his father's property. His also was, in all probability, the priestly office and the covenant blessing. These were the privileges of his birthright, and by an oriental patriarch were held as dear as life itself. On one occasion Esau returned faint and weary from the chase, and saw his brother Jacob preparing some dark red pottage of lentils. Famished and exhausted, he longed for the fragrant mess, and implored his brother to let him have it. Seeing his distress, Jacob determined to avail himself of it for his own ends, and agreed to give his brother the pottage on condition that he sold him his birthright. Unable to control the pangs of hunger, bent on the immediate gratification of his appetite, Esau was willing to barter all his privileges for a single meal. But words were not sufficient for his artful brother. He must have an oath solemnly attesting the exchange. Swear unto me, said he, and Esau swore, and sold his birthright for one morsel of meat, and ate and drank, and rose up and went his way. At a subsequent period, in consequence of a grievous famine, Isaac left Lahai Roy, and journeyed southward to Gerar, within the fertile coastline of Philistia. While here he received a warning from the Almighty against going down into Egypt, and was assured of the continuance of the same blessing which his father had enjoyed. Thus encouraged, he continued to dwell at Gerar, but like his father, was not always proof against temptations to distrust his almighty protector. He persuaded Rebekah to represent herself as his sister, and subjected himself to a cutting rebuke from Abimelech for this unworthy equivocation. At Gerar his wealth increased exceedingly, and he made the first advance beyond the purely pastoral life. He sowed in that land, and reaped within the year a hundredfold. But his wealth and prosperity in time provoked the jealousy of the Philistines, and they stopped up the wells which his father had dug, nor did the patriarch feel himself secure till he had moved still further southward to Beersheba. Here, like Abraham before him, he built an altar unto Jehovah and called upon his name, and was rewarded by a second confirmation of the covenant promise, while his contentions with the Philistines were brought to a close, and a mutual compact ratified between them. But his domestic happiness was not equally secured. To the great grief of both his parents, Esau, now forty years of age, 
contracted an alliance with Judith, the daughter of Beeri, and Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon, both of the race of the Hittites, to whom he afterwards added Mahalath, a daughter of Ishmael. Of the greater portion of Isaac's life at Beersheba, the scripture narrative tells nothing, nor is any incident recorded till we hear that he waxed old and his eyes grew dim so that he could not see. Then reminded of the uncertain tenure of life, he resolved by a solemn act to bestow the patriarchal blessing upon his eldest son. Summoning Esau before him, he bade him go forth to the hunt and bring him venison such as he loved, promising the blessing as his reward. His words did not escape the quick ears of Rebecca. Eager to obtain this important privilege for her favorite Jacob, she bade him, during the absence of his brother, slay two kids with which she prepared savory meats such as Isaac loved. Then arraying him in garments belonging to his brother and placing the skins upon his hands and neck, she directed him to go into the presence of his father and pass himself off as his wild, rough brother Esau. After some hesitation, Jacob fell in with her plan, and in the disguise she had prepared presented himself before his father. But Isaac, though old and dim-sighted, was not free from his suspicions. To Jacob's assurance that he had been to the chase and brought of the prey, he replied by inquiring how he had found it so quickly. Nor did the ready but untruthful answer that the Lord had brought it to him relieve his mind. Come near, said he, that I may feel thee, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near, and his father felt him. Another question and another falsehood followed, and at length Jacob was bidden to present the venison that he had taken, and the old man ate and drank, and then bestowed upon him in all its fullness the covenant blessing. He prayed that God would give his son the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine, that he would make people to serve him, and nations to bow down to him, so that he might be lord over his brethren and see his mother's sons bow down to him, a blessing to all that blessed him, a curse to all that cursed him. Thus successful in his shameful artifice, Jacob had scarcely gone forth from his father's presence, when the true Esau returned from the chase. With savory meat he too presented himself before Isaac, and besought his blessing. The old man trembled very exceedingly when he heard the voice of his eldest son, but told him that he had come too late. His brother, the supplanter, had been before him, and the irrevocable words had been spoken. With a great and exceeding bitter cry, Esau implored his father for one blessing which perchance might be left, and at length Isaac assured him that his dwelling would be of the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of heaven from above, but he must live by his sword and serve his brother till the day when he too shall gain the dominion, and should shake his brother's yoke from off his neck. Enraged at the deception which had been practiced upon him, Esau did not conceal his design of revenging himself by putting Jacob to death, and only deferred it till the days of mourning for his father were ended, whose death he deemed to be near at hand. But his dark threat became known to Rebekah. Anxious to save her favorite son, she persuaded him to undertake a journey to his uncle Laban at Pardon Aram, promising, when a few days were over and his brother's wrath was appeased, to send for him again. Without communicating her real motive in urging this journey, she at the same time secured the acquiescence of Isaac by pretending anxiety that Jacob should marry one of the daughters of Laban, rather than follow his brother's example and contract an alliance among the Hittites. Accordingly, Isaac sent for his son, and bade him go to Padan Aram, urging him to take thence a wife from amongst his own kindred, and then consciously and purposely transferred to him and his seed after him the blessing of Abraham. This is the end of Section 8, Book 2, Chapter 3, by Dave Currier. Section 9, A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
A Class Book of Old Testament History, Book 2, Chapter 4, The Life of Jacob, by George Frederick MacLear. Thus solemnly assured of a covenant blessing, Jacob bade farewell to his mother, whom he was never to see again, and set out a solitary traveler for the eastern uplands of Aram, where in place of a few days he was destined to spend many weary years, and amidst many trials and vicissitudes to find the same measure that he had measured to his brother measured also to himself. As the sun went down on the first evening of his journey, he reached the side of one of Abraham's encampments, the stony soil near the Canaanite town of Luz. Taking of the stones that lay around, he put them for his pillow and lay down to sleep. As he slept, there appeared to him a vision of the night. A ladder seemed to rise up from the bare ground on which he lay, and the top of it reached even unto heaven, and on it he saw angels ascending and descending. Moreover, from above there came the voice of God, assuring the wonder of his protection, renewing to him the promise of Abraham, and encouraging him with the hope of return from exile. Jacob awoke, trembling and afraid. Surely, said he, the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then rising early, he took the stone that had formed his pillow, poured oil upon it, and set it up for a memorial, calling the spot Bethel, the house of God. At the same time he made a solemn vow that, if Jehovah would indeed sustain him in all his ways, and bring him back as he had promised, he would not only dedicate the spot as his house, but would give him the tenth of all that he possessed. Then he continued his journey, and striking in a northeasterly direction, at length reached a well in Padan Aram, round which were gathered three flocks with shepherds from Haran. As he was conversing with them, Rachel, the daughter of his uncle Laban, approached, and with true courtesy Jacob went near, rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flocks. He then kissed the maiden, and told her he was Rebekah's son, whereupon she ran and told her father, who welcomed Jacob to the tents of Haran. After a stay of one month, Laban proposed that the wanderer should serve him as a shepherd, to which Jacob assented, and promised to serve him seven years on condition of receiving the hand of Rachel. The seven years passed away, and he who had supplanted his brother twice now learnt what it was to be supplanted himself. On the evening of his marriage, Laban substituted her sister Lee in place of Rachel. Nor was the deceit discovered till the following morning, when, in answer to Jacob's reproaches, he informed him that it was not customary to give the younger before the elder daughter, and that if he would have Rachel, he must serve seven more years for her. To these hard conditions Jacob assented, and in the course of time became the father of a numerous family, eleven sons and one daughter. Of these, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and a daughter Dinah were born to Leah, Dan, and Naphtali to Bilhah Rachel's maid, whom the latter, finding she had no children, gave to Jacob as a secondary wife, Gad and Asher to Zilpah, Leah's maid, and Joseph to Rachel. Shortly after the birth of this last son, Jacob, having completed his time of service, proposed to Laban that he should return into his own country. But the latter, who had found by experience that his son-in-law had brought a blessing to his house, prevailed upon him to continue in his service, on condition of receiving a certain portion of the flocks as his hire. Six years longer, therefore, Jacob stayed with his father-in-law and prospered and became himself the owner of numerous herds. But on Laban's side the covenant was not strictly kept. Again and again he changed the wages of his faithful servant, till at length finding any longer stay rendered impossible by the envy and jealousy of his father-in-law and his sons, and encouraged by the word of Jehovah, Jacob determined to set out for his native land, Accordingly, availing himself of Laban's absence at a sheep-shearing, 
he gathered together all his goods, and with his wives and family crossed the river, the great river Euphrates, and set his face toward the uplands of Gilead on the east of Jordan. Three days after his departure, news of his flight reached the ears of Laban, who forthwith pursued after him a seven days' journey, and overtook him as he was encamped in the range of Gilead. Warned by God in a dream against using any violence towards his son-in-law, Laban contented himself with reproaching him for his secret flight, hypocritically complaining that he had not given him time to send him away with due formality, and accusing him of stealing his household gods, the teraphim, or images, which Rachel had taken and concealed in the camel's furniture. After some altercation, it was resolved to come to terms. Stones were gathered together and set up as a pillar of witness, in token of their agreement that neither party to injure the other would cross over what was henceforth to be the boundary between their respective territories, after which Laban returned to his home in the distant east. Thus relieved from pressing danger, Jacob continued his journey westward. The twenty years of exile was over, and he was bound for his native land, as if to welcome him thither, and to remind him of the fulfillment of God's promise, the angel, whom he had seen twenty years before in vision at Bethel, now met him in two hosts, to commemorate which event he named the spot Mehanaim, two hosts. He was now on the brink of the river which divided him from his father's home, and the remembrance of his brother Esau, and the uncertainty of the reception he might meet with from him caused the deepest anxiety. Sending messengers into the land of Seir, he informed his lord Esau of his return from the land of exile, and of the success that had attended him. The messengers went, and returned with the alarming intelligence that Esau was coming to meet him with four hundred men. Jacob's distress was extreme, and he poured forth his whole soul in fervent prayer to God for protection. Then selecting a valuable present from his flocks and herds, he sent them to meet and propitiate his approaching brother, and at midnight dispatched his wives and sons, and all that he had, across the ford Jabbok, but stayed himself behind to renew his earnest supplications for the divine protection. Through the night, even to the breaking of the day, there wrestled with him one, whom he knew not, and whose name he could not prevail upon to reveal, but who left upon him a palpable mark of their mysterious conflict, for he touched the hollow of his thigh, so that it was out of joint. But in memory of the same crisis in his life, another sign was given him. His name was changed. No more was he to be called Jacob, the supplanter. During the long years of his weary exile, old things had passed away, and all things were becoming new. Henceforth he was to be known as Israel, the Prince of God, for as a prince had he power with God and with man, and had prevailed. The sight of this memorable conflict Jacob named Peniel, the face of God. When the day broke he looked up, and saw Esau approaching with his retinue. Thereupon in long procession he went forth to meet him first advanced the handmaids Bilhah and Zilpah with their children, then followed Leah and her children, last of all Rachel and Joseph. Jacob himself led the way, bowing to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother, who ran to meet him and fell upon his neck and kissed him. The reconciliation was complete. After mutual converse, Esau agreed to leave to Jacob the land of his inheritance, and retired himself to the rugged mountains of Seir, whence he and his descendants expelled the aboriginal tribes, and dwelt in their stead in the land henceforth known as Edom, or Idumea, a race of hunters living by the sword. Meanwhile, Jacob continued his journey towards the valley of the Jordan, and for a while settled at Succoth where he puts up booths, sucketh, for his cattle, as well as a house for himself. Thence he moved westwards, and crossing the Jordan, advanced into the very heart of Palestine, and pitched his tent before the city of Shechem. Of Hamor, its chief, he subsequently brought a portion of the rich plain, east of the city, and here he settled down, and like Abraham before him, erected an altar to Jehovah. 
During his stay at this place, which appears to have been somewhat protracted, an unfortunate occurrence caused him for a time the greatest anxiety, and eventually drove him from the neighborhood. One day, on the occasion, it is not improbable, of some local festival, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, at this time from thirteen to fifteen years of age, went out to see the daughters of the land, and was dishonored by Shechem, the Hivite chieftain, in whose territory the patriarch had settled. His father Hamor thereupon proposed that his son should pay a certain sum, by way of reparation, to her father and mother for the injury he had done to the maiden and marry her, and that this should be followed by a general intermarriage between the two peoples. To this proposition, the brothers of Dinah assented, but demanded, as the single condition of the treaty, that the people of Shechem should consent to be circumcised. These terms were unwittingly accepted by the Shechemites, and three days afterwards Simeon and Levi, Dinah's own brothers, at the head of their households, attacked the city, slew the chiefs and all the males in the place, spoiled it of every article of value it contained, and took captive even the women and little children. This bloody and treacherous act excited Jacob's deepest indignation, and shortly afterwards, fearful lest the neighboring tribes should gather together and slay him and all his house, in accordance with a divine warning, he determined to repair to Bethel, and dwell there and perform the vow, which now he seems almost to have forgotten. The journey partook somewhat of a religious pilgrimage, and was preceded by a general purification on the part of the patriarch's followers, and a collection of the teraphim, or strange gods, which had been brought from Mesopotamia, and were now hidden under an oak at Shechem. Arrived once more at the scene of his wondrous vision, Jacob erected an altar, which he called El Bethel, and there he was again visited by the Almighty, who renewed to him his name of Israel, and assured him of his share in the blessings of the covenant. During his stay at Bethel, his intimacy with his father Isaac, who was still alive, appears to have been renewed, for we are told that Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and was buried under an oak, henceforth known as Alan Bakuth, the Oak of Tears. But his departure from the same place a day's journey southwards was saddened by a grievous trial. As he drew near to Ephrath, the Canaanitish name of Bethlehem. Rachel, his favorite wife, died in giving birth to a son, whom she called Benoni, the son of sorrow, but whom his father named Benjamin, the son of my right hand. Over her grave the sorrowing husband erected a pillar, and moving southward pitched his tent besides Edar, or the watchtower of the flocks, and subsequently beneath the oak of Mamre before Hebron where Isaac died, in the 180th year of his age, and was committed to the tomb by Jacob and Esau. This is the end of Section 9, Book 2, Chapter 4, by Dave Currier. Book 2, Chapter 5 of A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear Book 2, Chapter 5 History of Joseph Genesis 37-42 to B.C. 1727-1707 to It was while he was sojourning in the neighborhood of Hebron, where, like his father, he united agricultural with pastoral occupations, Genesis 37 and 7, that the saddest trial of his life befell Jacob. Of all his sons, none was dearer to him than Joseph, the child of his beloved Rachel. In token of his affection, he bestowed upon him a coat of many colors, probably a tunic furnished with sleeves and reaching down to the ankles, worn by youths of the richer class. By some, this is supposed to indicate his intention of transferring to him, as being the eldest son of the favorite Rachel, the right of primogenitor. Whether this was so or not, it roused much jealousy and ill-feeling amongst Joseph's brothers. Already incensed by the circumstance of his bearing to his father, 
when seventeen years of age, an evil report of the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah, with whom he kept the flocks. Another incident fanned the flame of ill feeling. Joseph unwittingly told his brethren of two dreams he had dreamt, in one of which he had seemed to see them binding sheaves in the field, and lo, his sheaf rose and stood upright, while their sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to his sheaf. In the other he beheld the sun, moon, and the eleven stars making obeisance to him. Even Jacob rebuked his favorite son for his seeming self-exaltation, though he observed the saying. Genesis thirty-seven eleven. After a time, an opportunity was presented to the brothers of taking a cruel revenge. Though Jacob was settled in the vale of Hebron, a portion of his numerous flocks and herds were kept by his sons on the rich pasture grounds near Shechem. Thither on one occasion Jacob sent his favorite son to see how his brethren fared and bring him word again. Joseph set out, and being directed by a man whom he met, to Dothan, or the two wells, a place about twelve miles north of Shechem, famous for its pasturage, he went thither in quest of them. From the rising ground where they were keeping their flocks, the brothers descried the dreamer approaching, and straightway resolved to slay him and cast him into a pit, and then report to his father that he had been devoured by wild beasts. From actually putting him to death they were, however, dissuaded by Reuben, and contented themselves with stripping him of his coat of many colors, and casting him into an empty cistern, intending probably to let him die by hunger. But when they had done this, and had sat down to eat, a company of Ishmaelite, or Midianite, merchants, for the two names are used interchangeably, approached, mounted on camels and bearing spicery and balm, going down the high road which passed near from Gilead to Egypt. Thereupon Judah proposed that they should sell him to these traders, and he was taken up from the pit and sold to the Ishmaelites, who paid for him twenty pieces of silver, the usual price of a male slave from five to twenty years of age. Reuben was not present when the cruel bargain was struck, and was greatly distressed when, on his return, he found that his brother was gone. But the others killed a kid, dipped Joseph's coat of many colors in its blood, and brought it to Jacob, with the hypocritical enquiry whether it was his son's coat or no, and informing him that they had found it thus smeared with blood. Even Reuben did not reveal the true state of the case, and Jacob, supposing that his favorite son had been slain by wild beasts, put sackcloth upon his loins, and refusing every proffered consolation, mourned for him many days. Genesis 37, 29-35 Meanwhile, the Midianitish caravan kept on its southward course, and eventually reaching Egypt, sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and captain of the executioners. Genesis 38, 36 margin. In his house, Joseph, though a foreigner and a slave, gradually won the confidence of his master, who appears to have been a wealthy man and possessed of property in the field as well as in the house, so that before long, in the capacity of overseer, he was entrusted with the entire possessions of the Egyptian, and the divine blessing rested upon his house for Joseph's sake. But this period of happiness and prosperity was destined to come to an abrupt termination. With the profligacy for which the Egyptian women were notorious, the wife of Potiphar on one occasion tempted Joseph to commit adultery with her, and when he resisted all her seductions, charged him to her husband with the very crime she had ineffectually tempted him to commit. Thereupon Potiphar, fully believing her story, without bringing his faithful steward before any public tribunal, cast him into the prison in his own house. But amidst this grievous trial, Joseph was not forsaken. The Lord was with him, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, who, convinced of his fidelity and uprightness, entrusted him with the care of all the prisoners there confined. Amongst these there soon appeared the chief of Pharaoh's cupbearers, and the chief of his bakers, two high officers of the Egyptian court, on whom Joseph was specially directed to wait. During their imprisonment, each of them dreamt a dream. The chief of the cupbearers dreamt that a vine was before him, on which were three branches, 
that it was as though it budded, and its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. That of these he took, and pressed them into the Pharaoh's cup, which was in his hand, and gave it to that monarch. The chief of the bakers dreamt that he had three white baskets on his head, the uppermost full of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, which the birds ate out of the baskets on his head. Convinced that these dreams portended events of great importance in their lives, and unable to interpret them, these high officers were filled with sadness. But Joseph, being informed of the cause, by virtue of his prophetic gifts, interpreted the dreams, and announced to the chief of the butlers that within three days on the anniversary of Pharaoh's birthday, he should be restored to his office, while within the same period his fellow prisoner would be hanged upon a tree, where the birds would eat his flesh from off him. As he had predicted, so it came to pass. Within the specified period, the one of these grandees was executed, and the other restored to his former high position. But though the Hebrew captive had told the chief of the butlers his own sad story, in the hour of prosperity, the restored grandee forgot his benefactor and his touching request that he would intercede with Pharaoh on his behalf. Genesis forty twelve to 23 Two more years, therefore, of tedious imprisonment passed over Joseph's head, when one night Pharaoh himself was troubled with two mysterious dreams. In the first he seemed to stand by the banks of the Nile, and behold, out of it there came seven well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and fed in the marsh grass that lined the banks. And behold, after them there came up seven poor, ill-favored, lean-fleshed kine, and they ate up the seven well-favored and fat kine, and when they had done so, it could not be known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ill-favored as at the beginning. In his second dream, the monarch beheld seven ears of corn growing upon one stalk, full, fat, and good, and after them seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind, which devoured the seven full and fat ears. Troubled with these visions of the night, he awoke and sent for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof, and told them his dream, but they were unable to give him any interpretation. In this difficulty the chief of the butlers bethought him of his youthful benefactor in the prison, and told Pharaoh what had befallen him there, and how a young man, a Hebrew, servant to the captain of the executioners, had interpreted his dream. Upon this the monarch sent for Joseph, who was brought into the royal presence, and having been told the nature of the dreams, informed Pharaoh that they were sent by the great God to forewarn him of what he was about to do. The seven good kine and the seven good ears denoted seven years of plenty. The seven thin, ill-favored kine and the seven empty ears of corn denoted seven years of very grievous famine, about to befall the entire land of Egypt. The doubling of the dreams denoted that the event was certain and imminent. He advised, therefore, that without delay the monarch should set over the land a man, discreet and wise, with overseers under him, to take up the fifth part of the land during the seven years of plenty, and lay up corn and food in various cities against the seven years of famine, which were assuredly to come. Genesis 41, 14 36. This advice found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh, and deeming no other so well fitted for the post as the interpreter of his dreams, he appointed him to fill it, and in token of his freedom, placed on his hand his own signet ring and a gold collar about his neck, and arraying him in vestures of fine linen, he caused him to ride in the second chariot that he had, preceded by heralds crying, Bow the knee. Joseph was thus invested with the dignity of an oriental vizier, and could act in the name of the king. Besides these marks of honor, Pharaoh changed his name to zaphnath Paniah, or the Revealer of Secrets, and united him in marriage with Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, devoted to Ra or the son, priest or prince. Genesis 41, 45 margin. Of On, the later Heliopolis, and the religious capital of the country. Thus at the age of thirty, after thirteen years of painful vicissitudes, 
the son of Jacob was elevated to the highest position next to the sovereign himself in the great kingdom of Egypt. In accordance with the plan he himself had indicated, he straightway commenced a tour throughout the land, and during the seven years of plenty, brought up a fifth part of the corn in the country, and laid it up in granaries in the various cities. During the same period he became the father of two sons, to whom, though born of an Egyptian wife, he gave Hebrew names, calling the firstborn Manasseh, a forgetter. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. The second he named Ephraim, fruitful. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. At the close of the seven years of plenty, the seven years of dearth drew on, and its effects were felt not only in Egypt, but in all the neighboring lands. During the first part of this period, the wants of the people were relieved by the abundance which the foresight of the vizier had stored up. He opened all his granaries and sold unto the Egyptians, delivering over the money into the Pharaoh's exchequer. When money failed, barter was resorted to and the Egyptians obtained bread in exchange for their horses, cattle, and flocks. When at length these means were exhausted, they sold him their land, except that of the priests, who, being provided from the royal treasury, did not feel the horrors of the famine. Thus possessed of the entire country, Joseph improved the opportunity to place the relations between the Egyptian monarch and his people on a settled and legal footing. He made them indeed vassals of their sovereign, but in place of allowing them to be taxed according to royal caprice, he disposed of the land to them on the understanding that four parts were to be their own for seed of the field and for food for them and their families, while a fifth part was to be paid annually to the king in place of ground rent, an arrangement by no means oppressive when it is considered that the soil sometimes yielded thirtyfold or even a greater increase. Genesis 41, 46-57 At an earlier period during the seven years of famine, ten of Joseph's brethren went down into Egypt at the suggestion of their father and presented themselves before him with the petition to be allowed to buy corn. In the viceroy, second only to the great pharaoh, they did not for a moment recognize the boy whom twenty years before they had lowered into the dry pit at Dothan. But though Joseph knew them and recognized the fulfillment of his early dreams, he did not reveal himself to them. Through an interpreter he spake roughly unto them, pronounced them to be spies who had come down to see the nakedness of the land, and when they denied the charge, declared they should be imprisoned till one of them had brought down their youngest brother. For three days he actually kept them in ward, and finally, on condition that one remained behind as a hostage, permitted them to return with corn for their families. Stricken with remorse, and not imagining that the viceroy could understand their language, they acknowledged that their sin had found them out, and recalled the day when they saw the anguish of their brother and turned a deaf ear to his beseeching entreaties that they would not deal hardly with them. Then Simeon was bound before their eyes, and sad and sorrowful they commenced their return. But on the road they had fresh cause for alarm and confusion. On opening their sacks, they discovered not only that corn had been supplied them, but that their money had been restored to them. Marveling at this strange circumstance, they reached home, and recounted to their father all that had befallen them, and how he could not hope to see Simeon again till they returned with their youngest brother Benjamin into the presence of the viceroy of Egypt. On hearing this hard condition, Jacob burst forth into bitter complaints, and though Reuben offered the life of his two children as a pledge for Benjamin's safe return, absolutely refused to allow him to accompany them. His brother, said he, is dead and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Genesis 42, 38 End of Book 2, Chapter 5
Book 2, Chapter 6 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliffstone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 2, Chapter 6. Jacob's Descent into Egypt and Death of Joseph. Genesis chapters 43 to 50, B.C. 1707 to 1635. But as time went on, and the corn the brothers had brought from Egypt was consumed, it became absolutely necessary to go thither a second time, if they would live and not die. Without Benjamin, however, they knew the journey would be useless, and Benjamin, their father, would not send. At length Judah stood forward as spokesman for the rest, and offered to bear forever in his own person the blame if any evil befell him, till after a struggle Jacob consented. With a present of such things as the land afforded, a little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds, with double money also in their hand, the brothers took Benjamin from his sorrowing father and once more commenced their journey to Egypt. Arrived there, they were again presented to the viceroy, who perceiving that Benjamin was with them, ordered the steward of his house to conduct them home and to slay and make ready, that they might dine with him at noon. Full of fear, the brothers followed the steward, and on the way informed him of their surprise when on their return from their previous visit they found their money in their sacks. The steward, however, answered them kindly, restored Simeon to them, and brought them water to wash their feet. At noon Joseph returned, and the brothers spread out the present their father had sent bowing themselves before him to the earth. After some questions touching the welfare of the old man they had left in the land of Canaan, he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and his whole soul yearned towards him, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. Thence having washed his face, he returned, commanded the attendants to set on bread, and the brothers sat down, ranged each according to his age. Joseph sat at a table by himself, and the Egyptians in his retinue by themselves, for to eat bread with the Hebrews was regarded by them as an abomination. Then from Joseph's table portions were sent to his brethren, but Benjamin's portion was five times as great as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. Genesis 43 verse 34 The next morning, as soon as it was light, with sacks replenished and rejoicing, At the successful termination of their journey, the sons of Jacob commenced their return to Canaan. But they had proceeded only a little way from the city when the steward of Joseph overtook them and charged them with returning evil for all the good they had received and stealing the silver divining cup, Genesis 44 verse 5, belonging to his master. In the full assurance of their innocence, the brothers not only denied the charge, but declared their willingness that the guilty one should die and the rest become bondmen to the viceroy. The sacks were therefore taken from the asses, and lo, in Benjamin's sack, where it had been purposely placed by Joseph's command, the cup was found. Horror struck at the discovery, the brothers returned to the house, and flinging themselves on the ground before Joseph, expressed their resolution to become slaves with Benjamin, rather than return without him to his heartbroken father. In the dialogue that ensued, Judah again was the chief speaker. God, he owned, had found out their iniquity, and they and he with whom the cup had been found would become Joseph's bondman. To this, however, Joseph would not consent. He with whom the cup had been found, he alone need remain behind in servitude. The rest might return in peace to their father. Then Judah went near to him, who was even as Pharaoh, Genesis 44 verse 18, and in words of utmost pathos related how in obedience to his command, their father had with great difficulty been prevailed on to suffer the child of his old age to accompany them, and how, if he failed to return, he would certainly die, for his life was bound up in the life of his favourite son. Nay more, he continued, he himself had become surety for the lad, and was now ready, rather than bring down the old man's grey hairs with sorrow to the grave, to remain alone in the land of Egypt, a bondman unto his lord, if only Benjamin and the rest might return unto the land of Canaan. 
Genesis 44, verses 18 to 34. As Judah proceeded with his moving tale, Joseph could restrain himself no longer. He desired every man to leave the chamber, and he and his brethren were left alone. Then amidst many tears, he at length broke forth with the astounding words, I am Joseph. Coupling the revelation with the inquiry, Doth my father yet live? But the brothers were too terrified to answer him a word. Thereupon he bade them come near unto him, and again assured them that he was Joseph, their brother, whom they had sold to the Midianitish caravan. Let them not, he said, be grieved that they had sold him into Egypt. God, who orders all things, had sent him thither before them to preserve their lives, and had made him a father unto Pharaoh and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Instead of repining for the past, let them return to the old man, their father, and tell him of all his glory in Egypt, and bring him down and settle, they and their children, their flocks and their herds, and all that they had in the goodly country of Goshen frontier. Having thus at length poured forth his pent-up feelings, Joseph fell upon Benjamin's neck, and wept and kissed him, and likewise all his brethren. Tidings of what had occurred soon reached the ears of Pharaoh, who readily assented to Joseph's wish that his father should be suffered to settle in the land. Wagons were then made ready to bring him and all that he had, ample provisions were supplied for the journey, and rich presents bestowed upon all the brothers, but especially on Benjamin. Then, with a parting charge to see that they fell not out of the way, Genesis 45, verse 24, the sons of Jacob returned to their father and recounted to him all the strange events that had befallen them. The long-lost Joseph, the son of the beloved Rachel, was alive. Nay, he was governor over all the land of Egypt. At the first announcement, Jacob's heart failed him, nor could he believe their words. But when the wagons that Joseph had provided came in sight, Then at length his spirit revived, and he exclaimed, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Genesis 45, verse 28. To forsake, however, the familiar pasture grounds of Hebron, to leave the soil promised to him and to his seed forever, required of the patriarch no little resolution. Abraham had gone down to Egypt, but only to involve himself in great difficulties. Isaac had been on the point of going thither when he was restrained by the hand of God. Genesis 26 verse 2 Did the divine blessing rest on that journey which an imperious necessity now induced him to essay? Jacob was not long left in doubt. On reaching Beersheba, the Almighty appeared to him in vision and bade him lay aside all apprehensions. In Egypt, in the land of the mighty pharaohs, he would not fail to protect him. There he would make him a great nation, and thence in the fullness of time he would bring his seed back to the land of promise. Thus encouraged, Jacob arose from Beersheba, and with his sons, their wives and their little ones, their herds, their flocks, and all the goods they had gotten in the land of Canaan, commenced his journey. Judah led the way, and on the frontier of Egypt the patriarch met his long-lost son, and fell upon his neck, and wept on his neck a good while. Arrived in the land of the pharaohs, five of Joseph's brethren were introduced to the reigning monarch. They told him that they were shepherds, that they had come down into Egypt in consequence of the severity of the famine, and requested permission to settle as strangers and foreigners in Goshen, the most easterly frontier land of Egypt, and offered to become guardians of the royal herds. Permission was granted, and Jacob himself was introduced to Pharaoh and bestowed his blessing upon the monarch. Genesis 47 verses 1 through 10. The period of Jacob's own sojourning in the land of Ham, Psalms 105 verse 23, was limited to 17 years, at the close of which he had reached the age of 147 and perceived that his end was nigh. Informed that his father was sickening, Joseph brought his two sons Ephraim and Manasseh and placed them before his bedside. Guiding his hands wittingly, the aged patriarch stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, though he was the firstborn. At this, Joseph was displeased and would have altered the disposition of his father's hands. But Jacob refused, and with his hands as they were, bestowed upon the young men and their father his solemn and abiding blessing. 
Though born in Egypt, Ephraim and Manasseh were to be reckoned as his own sons, and would both grow into great tribes. But as it had been in Jacob's own case, so would it be with them. The younger brother would be greater than the elder, and his seed should become a multitude of nations. Then turning to Joseph, the patriarch bestowed on him a special mark of affection, even one portion above his brethren, a piece of land which with his sword and his bow he had conquered from the Amorites, probably outside the green vale of Shechem, Genesis 48 verse 22, Joshua 17 verse 14, etc. And now the day drew nigh when the patriarch's eventful life must close. Wishing by virtue of the gift of prophecy, which gained greater power the nearer he approached the borders of the eternal world, to tell them that which should befall them in the last days, he desired that his sons might be summoned to his bedside. Obedient to his word, they gathered round him, and then in prophetic trance, but having his eyes open, he beheld the mighty vision of the future, and predicted their several fortunes in the land, through which he himself had wandered as a pilgrim for more than one hundred years. First, before him stood Reuben, over whom in the tents of Laban he had rejoiced as his firstborn, his might, and the beginning of his strength. To him, by the law of primogeniture, belonged the headship of the family and the double inheritance. But he had proved unworthy of his vocation. Unstable as water, he should not excel. Next in order of their birth came Simeon and Levi. Brethren of one mother, they had been also brethren in cruelty and deceit. In their conduct toward the Shechemites, they had proved the fierceness of their anger and the cruelty of their disposition. Unworthy were they to be the head of a nation which was to be a blessing and not a curse to all peoples of the earth. Therefore were they to be divided in Jacob and scattered in Israel. Next came Judah, and to him the patriarch could assign a portion at least of the blessing of the firstborn. His should be the preeminence in power and dignity. Him should his brethren praise, before him should his father's children bow down. His should be the scepter and the lawgiver, nor from beneath his feet should they ever depart, till Shiloh, the peaceable or peacemaker, came. Genesis 49 verses 1 to 10. Having thus transferred the privileges of the firstborn to Judah and predicted the fortunes of his other sons, the dying patriarch once more solemnly adjured them, as he had already adjured Joseph, not to leave his bones in Egypt, but to carry them into the land of hope and promise, and lay them in the cave of Machpelah in the family grave of his fathers. And then he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost. Obedient to such reiterated commands, Joseph caused his father's body to be embalmed in the Egyptian fashion by the physicians, and obtained permission from Pharaoh to accompany his remains to the burial place he had marked out for them. Then at the head of a numerous retinue, composed not only of the members of his own family, but also of the court officers of Pharaoh and the grandees of the empire, and accompanied by chariots and horsemen, he set out. The nearest road would have been by Gaza and through the territory of the Philistines. Instead of this, the funeral procession took a long circuitous route round Mount Seir and the eastern side of the Dead Sea, and halted at the threshing floor of Atad on the east side of the Jordan opposite Jericho. Here seven days were spent in solemn mourning. And so grievous was the lamentation that the Canaanites of the Jordan Valley called the spot Abel Mizraim, the meadow, or the mourning of the Egyptians. Further than this point, the Egyptian retinue did not seem to have proceeded. The sons of Jacob alone crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan and laid their father in the cave of Machpelah by the side of Abram, Isaac, and Sarah. Genesis 50 verses 1 to 13. The funeral over, Joseph and his brethren returned to Egypt. Fearful now their father was dead that the viceroy would requite them for all the evil they had done towards him, the sons of Jacob sent a messenger to intercede in their behalf. But Joseph calmed their fears and assured them of safety and protection. Together then they dwelt in peace and security in the land of Goshen. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation and the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, brought up upon his knees. At length, when he reached the age of 110, perceiving that his end was near, he sent for his brethren, and having assured them that God would certainly visit them, 
and bring them up out of Egypt into the land which he had promised to their forefathers, and taken an oath of them that they would remove his bones into the same good land, he died, and was embalmed, and laid in a coffin in Egypt. Genesis 50 verse 26 End of Book 2, Chapter 6 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 2, Concluding Note of A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear Book 2, Concluding Note Survey of the Patriarchal Age with the death of Joseph, the patriarchal age of Israel's history may be said to close. The family had now thrown out many branches and was on the point of merging into the nation. At this juncture, then, it may be well to look back and review some of the chief features of patriarchal life. 1. And the first of these that claims attention is its nomadic character. Unlike the founders of Egypt, of Babylon, of Nineveh, the patriarchs were not the builders of cities and towns, but pilgrims and sojourners, dwellers in tents, Hebrews 11, 9. But they were very different from rude hordes, like the Amalekites and other sons of the desert, abhorring any higher mode of life. Abraham was no stranger to the highest form of civilization that his age afforded. He was acquainted with Ur, with Nineveh, with Damascus, with Egypt. He had left his home in one of the chief cities of Mesopotamia, not from choice, but in consequence of a direct personal call from God. Moreover, so far from regarding his present mode of life as an ultimate end, he and Isaac and Jacob were ever looking forward to a time when it would close, when their descendants should be settled in the land of promise and become a great nation, when the portable tent should give way to the city that had foundations. Hebrews 11, 10, and 13 through 16. Compare with Genesis 24, 7, 28, 4, 49, 1 through 27, 50, 24. Hence, from time to time, as opportunity afforded, we see the wandering life freely and willingly laid aside. Lot settled in Sodom, Genesis 13, 10 through 12. Abraham in Egypt went direct to Pharaoh's court, Genesis 12, 14. At Hebron he settled and became a prince of God in the midst of the Hittites, Genesis 23, 6. Isaac not only lived near the Philistines, but occupied a house opposite the palace, Genesis 26, 8, and practiced agriculture, Genesis 26, 12. And Joseph's dream of the sheaves points out that this was also continued in the time of Jacob, Genesis 37, 7. 2. The family was the center of the patriarchal commonwealth. Its head was the source of authority and jurisdiction. He possessed the power of life and death. Genesis 38:24. He united in himself the functions of chief and priest. He offered the burnt offering. He had his armed retainers. Genesis 14:14, 14, 48:22, 14, 34:25, and 33:20. His intercourse with his wives, for polygamy was not forbidden, was free and unrestrained. The wife's consent was asked before wedlock. Genesis 24, 57 and 58. Love hallowed the relations of Abraham with Sarah, of Isaac with Rebekah, of Jacob with Leah and Rachel. Woman indeed did not occupy the position since conceded to her, but her position was far from degraded, and the sanctity of the marriage bond was defended by severe laws, which made death the punishment for adultery. Genesis 38, 24. Slavery, it is true, existed, but in the tents of Abraham, the slave was ever treated with consideration, and not excluded from, but made a partaker of, religious privileges. Genesis 27:13. The fidelity and attachment of Eleazar, the steward of Abraham's house, the mourning for Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, Genesis 35, 8, are pleasing proofs of the peace that reigned in the patriarchal household. 3. Civilization. The life of the patriarchs was chiefly that of the shepherd, and their wealth mainly consisted in their flocks and their herds. But besides practicing agriculture, they were not unacquainted with money and the precious metals. Abraham paid for the field of Machpelah with coin. Genesis 23, 9-20 through 20. 
and the sons of Jacob took money with them into Egypt. Genesis 42, verses 25 and 35. While the gold ring and armlets presented to Rebekah by Eleazar, Genesis 24, 22, the bracelet and signet ring of Judah, Genesis 38, 18, the earrings of Rachel, Genesis 35, 4, the many-colored coat of Joseph, indicate an acquaintance with the luxuries of life. 4. Religion. While other nations were rapidly learning to deify the powers of nature, the patriarchs believed not only in a God above and beyond nature, but in a God personal, omnipotent, and holy. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was no mere abstraction, no mere law. He could and did reveal himself by angelic appearances, by visions, by dreams. He could console, strengthen, encourage. He could punish, rebuke, and, on repentance, forgive. Abraham, the friend of God, James 2.23, intercedes with him in behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 27.23-33, Isaac is warned by him against going down into Egypt, Genesis 24.2, Jacob is consoled by him at Bethel when setting out into the land of exile, Genesis 28.13-15, and wrestles with him by the fords of Jabbok until the break of day. Genesis 32:24. Joseph believes in his invisible but ever-present help in prison and in a strange land, and ascribes to him all his wisdom in the interpretation of dreams. Genesis 41:16. The divine promise of a great future, Abraham believed under circumstances of greatest trial, and his faith was counted to him for righteousness. Romans 4, 3. Moreover, the God of the patriarchs was no mere national or household God. His sphere of operation was not restricted to the patriarchs and their families. He is the God of all the earth. Genesis 24, 3. The God of righteousness and holiness. He punishes the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19, 24 and 25. He plagues Pharaoh's house. Genesis 12, 17. He is the God of the priest king, Melchizedek. Genesis 14:18 and of the Philistine Abimelech Genesis 23 he protects not only Isaac the child of promise but the outcast Ishmael the child of the bondwoman Genesis 21:13 he is with Joseph in prison but he sends dreams to Pharaoh and through Joseph he saves Egypt from famine Genesis 50:20 5 The religious worship of the patriarchs was in keeping with the simplicity of their creed. The head of the family was also the priest of the family. Whenever Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob reached any new spot in their pilgrimage, they invariably erected an altar, generally of stone and on a high situation. Genesis 22, 9, 26, 25, 35, 7. There they called on the name of Jehovah. There they presented their burnt sacrifice. There they offered up their prayers. Their history also proves the existence of offering covenant sacrifices and celebrating covenant feasts. Genesis 15, 9 through 18, 21, 32. The making and paying of vows. Genesis 28, 23. The erection of memorial pillars and the consecration of them by pouring upon them oil and wine. Genesis 28, 18. The rite of circumcision. Genesis 27, verses 10 through 14 and the paying of tithes. Genesis 14, 20. 6. The character of the patriarchs is never represented as perfect. Their faults are freely exposed. Theirs is no ideal history. If we compare the four most eminent amongst them, we seem to trace in 1. Abraham, the faith that can remove mountains, in its power and in its fullness, revealing itself in unfaltering trust and unquestioning obedience under the most trying circumstances conceivable. In 2. Isaac, the faith that can possess itself in patience and discharge the ordinary duties of life in quietness and waiting. In 3. Jacob, the violent contest of faith with the flesh, the higher with the lower nature, till by hard discipline the latter is purified and the supplanter becomes the prince, the prevailer with God. In 4. Joseph, the fidelity and perseverance of faith revealed not only in the patient endurance of the most grievous trials, but in energetic action, and at length crowned with victory. He unites in himself the noble trust and resolution of Abraham with the quiet perseverance of Isaac and the careful prudence of Jacob. 
He is, moreover, an eminent historic type of Christ, in 1. His persecution and sale by his brethren, 2. His resisting temptation, 3. His humiliation and exaltation, 4. His dispensing to a famine-stricken people the bread of life, 5. In the fullness of his forgiving love. End of section 12. End of book 2. Book 3, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 3 From the Settlement of the Israelites in Egypt to the Giving of the Law. Chapter 1 the birth and calling of Moses. Exodus chapters 1 through 6, B.C. 1706 to 1491. The district of Goshen, frontier, also called the land of Ramesses, Genesis 47 verse 11, where the Israelites were settled during the period of their sojourn in the land of the Pharaohs, was the most easterly borderland of Egypt. It was scarcely included within the boundaries of Egypt proper and was inhabited by a mixed population of Egyptians and foreigners. Exodus 12 verse 38 Eminently a pasture land and adapted to the rearing of flocks and herds, it included also a considerable portion of fruit-bearing soil, which owed its fertility to the overflowing of the Nile, called by the Egyptians Hapimu, the genius of the waters, by the Israelites Sihor, or Shehor, the black. Isaiah 23, verse 3, Jeremiah 2, verse 18. Touching on the west, the green valley of this wondrous river, and stretching onwards to the yellow sands of the Arabian desert immediately south of Palestine, it was then, as it has always been, the most productive part of Egypt, yielding luxuriant crops of wheat and millet, and abounding in cucumbers and melons, gourds and beans, and other vegetable growths. Numbers 11 verse 5 Sacred history does not reveal to us many particulars respecting the early portion of the period during which the sons of Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. We know that they were fruitful and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, so that when the time came for them to go forth from Egypt, they could scarcely have numbered less than two million souls. We need not, however, suppose that these were all the direct descendants of the seventy immediate relatives of Jacob. When that patriarch and his sons went down into Egypt, they would naturally take with them not only their flocks and herds, but their men servants and maid servants. Genesis 45 verses 10 and 11. Of the number of these we can form some calculation by remembering the 318 trained servants who accompanied Abraham at the rescue of Lot. Genesis 14, verse 14. The great store of servants possessed by Isaac. Genesis 26, verses 13 and 14. Two-thirds, at least of whom, passed into the possession of Jacob and must be added to the two hosts which he bought from Mesopotamia. Genesis 32, verses 7 and 8. But even thus their increase was marvellous and must be ascribed to the direct superintending hand of God. The effect, however, of their stay was perceptible in other respects. They not only increased in numbers, but became acquainted with many arts and sciences, and thus fitted for their future national existence. One portion, indeed, of the nation seems to have retained its pastoral habits, even to the end. The descendants of Reuben, Gad and Manasseh, Numbers 32 verse 1, probably tended their large flocks and herds on the eastern border of Goshen, but others settled in the cities and villages on the confines of the land of Goshen, and not only adopted more generally agricultural pursuits, Deuteronomy 11 verse 10, but became acquainted with many useful arts, with writing, the working of precious and common metals, the grinding and engraving of precious stones, with carpentry, byssus weaving, and pottery, First Chronicles 4 verse 14, 21 and 23, with fishing, gardening, Numbers 11 verse 5, and artificial irrigation. Deuteronomy 11 verse 10. On the other hand, they could not fail to become acquainted with forms of religious worship hitherto utterly unknown to them. Now, for the first time, 
could they witness the gorgeous and mysterious ceremonies that attended the worship of Ra, the sun god, or of Isis and Osiris. Now for the first time, they might behold the incense burnt three times every day, and the solemn sacrifice offered once a month to the sacred black calf Nevis at On, Heliopolis, or to his rival, the bull, Apis, at Memphis. Now they saw, as they could scarcely have seen elsewhere, the adoration of the creature rather than the creator carried to its furthest point, and divine honours paid not only to the mighty Pharaoh, the child, the representative of the sun god, but to almost everything in heaven above, and the earth beneath, and the waters under the earth, to the crocodile and the hawk, the cat and the dog, the hippopotamus and the serpent. That the simple patriarchal faith of the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob would suffer from contact with such diverse forms of idolatry might naturally be expected. The worship of the sacred calf exercised over them a peculiar fascination. Your fathers worshipped other gods in Egypt, says Joshua afterwards. Joshua 24 verse 14. They forsook not the idols of Egypt, is the accusation of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 20 verse 7 and 8. 23 verse 3. But an important event exercised a still greater influence on their social and religious condition. A change took place in the reigning dynasty. There arose a new king over Egypt. Exodus 1 verse 8, Acts 7 verse 18, that knew not Joseph, who regarded with no friendly feelings the strange community with alien rites and traditions settled on the eastern outskirts of his realm. He viewed with alarm their rapid increase, and dreaded lest, in the event of a war, instead of guarding his kingdom against, they might join the enemies of Egypt, the roving tribes of the east, the terror of the inhabitants of the Nile, and fight against his own people, and effect their escape from the land. Accordingly, he determined to reduce them to the condition of public serfs or slaves, and in order to crush their free and independent spirit, set taskmasters over them, and employed them in gigantic works, making bricks for his treasure cities, Pithom and Ramesses. Day after day, therefore, their lives were made bitter with hard bondage, while beneath the burning rainless sky, naked and in gangs they toiled, under the lash in the quarry or in the brickfield. But this expedient did not produce the effects the monarch desired. The more they were afflicted, the more this strange people grew and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, Thereupon instructions were given to the Hebrew midwives to destroy, in some secret way, every Hebrew man-child. And when this too proved ineffectual, from the unwillingness of the midwives to obey so cruel a decree, an order was issued that every Hebrew boy should be flung into the waters of the Nile. What Abraham had seen in mystic vision was now fulfilled. Genesis 15 verse 12 A horror of great darkness had settled upon his descendants. Strangers in a strange land, they were suffering grievous affliction. They sighed by reason of their bondage, and their cry came up unto God. Exodus 2 verse 23 But it was at this juncture, when everything seemed at the worst, that the future deliverer of Israel was born. Amram, a man of the house of Levi, married Jochebed, a woman of the same tribe, and became the father of a daughter, Miriam, a son, Aaron, and a boy remarkable from his childhood for peculiar beauty. Exodus 2 verse 2, Acts 7 verse 20. For three months his mother succeeded in eluding the vigilance of Pharaoh's inquisitors and concealing her child. But at the close of that period, finding further concealment impossible, she constructed an ark or boat of papyrus stalks, and having protected it with pitch or bitumen, placed the child therein among the reeds of the Nile. There the mother left it, but Miriam, the sister, stood afar off to watch her brother's fate. As the ark floated with the stream, the daughter of Pharaoh, attended by her maidens, came down to bathe in the waters of the sacred river, and as she walked by the bank, her eye lit upon the basket, and she sent one of her attendants to fetch it. It was brought, and when opened, behold, the babe wept. Struck with compassion, the Egyptian princess though she perceived it was one of the Hebrews' children, determined to rear it for her own. At this moment Miriam approached and asked permission to call a nurse for the child. 
Permission was given, and Jochebed once more saw her boy restored to her with the command to rear it for its preserver. The child grew, and after a while was brought to the princess, and she, in memory of its preservation, named it Moses, or in its Egyptian form, Moshi, from Mo, water, and Ushi, saved. Exodus 2 and verse 10. The foundling of the Nile was now formally brought up as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, and in conformity with his high position, received a suitable education. He became learned, St. Stephen tells us, Acts 7 verse 22, in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. In all, therefore, we may believe that the science of that day could teach him of arithmetic, writing, astronomy, medicine, and sacred symbolism. On the same authority, we further learn that Moses became mighty, not only in words, but also in deeds, Acts 7.22. What these deeds were is not known, but it is certain that the Hebrew youth was in a position to have achieved a splendid career. He might have enjoyed to the full the pleasures of the Egyptian court, Hebrews 11.25, and amassed much of its accumulated treasures. But the traditions, the hopes, the creed of his own nation had not, we may believe, been concealed from him by his mother. Hence, when he came to the age of forty, chancing to go forth from On or Memphis to the land of Goshen, he beheld one of his countrymen not only toiling amidst the shadeless brickfields, but suffering the bastinado from his Egyptian taskmaster. Filled with indignation, Moses looked this way and that way, and seeing no one by, slew the Egyptian and hid the corpse in the white sand of the desert. The next day, seeing two of the Hebrews quarrelling, he tried to act as arbiter between them. His good offices, however, were not only rejected by the one he decided to be in the wrong, but he discovered that the murder of the Egyptian was no secret. He imagined that his countrymen would have recognized in him a deliverer sent from the God of their fathers, but they did not. Before long, news of the murder reached the ears of Pharaoh, and Moses, perceiving that his life was no longer safe, fled from Goshen, in a southeasterly direction to the land of Midian, or the peninsula of Sinai in Arabia, peopled by the descendants of Abraham by Keturah. Genesis 25 verse 2. He was sitting on a well in Midian when he perceived the approach of the seven daughters of Jethro, the chief and priest of that country, to draw water for their flocks. They were in the act of filling the troughs when certain Arabian shepherds rudely tried to drive them away. Thereupon, with the same zeal he had shown in behalf of his own countrymen, Moses intervened and defended the maidens against the intruders. Their unusually early return prompted the inquiries of their father and led to his introduction to the chivalrous stranger. Moses was contented to dwell with the Midianitish chief and kept his flocks and afterward married his daughter Zipporah, by whom he became the father of two sons, Gershom, stranger, and Eliezer, God is my help. And here, amidst the granite precipices and silent valleys of Horeb, in quiet and seclusion, forty years of his life passed away. Acts 7, verse 30. Here, as nowhere else, he could commune alone with God, and know himself, and learn the lessons of patience and self-control, and dependence on the unseen, while the daily duties of his shepherd life made him acquainted with every path and track and fountain in a region, which he was afterwards to revisit under such different circumstances. Meanwhile, though there was a change of ruler, the lot of the Israelites experienced no alteration. Still they toiled in cruel bondage. Still their cry went up to the God of their fathers. At length, the time drew near when the promise made to Abraham was to be fulfilled. The oppressing nation judged and the people delivered. Genesis 15 verse 14 One day, Moses was leading the flocks of Jethro some distance from the spots where he seems to have usually tended them to the back of the wilderness, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb, when a marvellous sight arrested his attention. He looked, and behold, before him burning with fire was a bush of wild acacia, the shaggy thorn bush of the desert, but though enveloped in flames, it was not consumed. It remained unsinged and uninjured by the fiery element which played around it. Astonished at the prodigy, Moses determined to draw near and ascertain the cause of this great sight, 
And as he approached, lo, a voice, the voice of God, called unto him out of the midst of the bush, saying, Moses, Moses. The awestruck shepherd answered the voice, and then was directed to draw not nearer, but take his shoes from off his feet, for the place on which he stood was holy ground. Moses complied, and hiding his face, for he dared not look upon God, listened while the Lord spake again, assuring him that he was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He had not been unmindful of the sufferings of his people in Egypt. He had seen their affliction. He had heard their cry. He had come down to deliver them from their oppressors and to bring them up into a land flowing with milk and honey. And he had appointed no other than Moses himself to be their deliverer and bring them forth from the land of Egypt. Filled with awe and misgiving, Moses at first sought in every way to excuse himself from the tremendous commission. Who am I, said he, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? I will be with thee, was the reply. But who was this I? When Moses went to the children of Israel, and assured them of the commission he had received, what was the name he was to announce to them as his authority? Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, replied the Almighty, I am Jehovah, the Eternal, the Self-existent, hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3 and verse 14. But this did not satisfy Moses. What outward and visible assurance could he give the people of his divine commission? This difficulty was also met. The Lord invested him with a threefold miraculous power whereby to attest his authority alike before the people and before Pharaoh. First, he should cast his staff, his shepherd's crook, upon the ground, and it would become a serpent, and on taking the creature by the tail, it would resume its former state. Then he should put his hand into his bosom, and it would become leprous, but on returning it to his bosom would become as his other flesh. Thirdly, If they believed neither the first nor the second sign, he was to take the water of the sacred Nile and pour it upon the dry land, and it should become blood. But now Moses pleaded another obstacle. He was not eloquent. He was of a slow speech and a slow tongue. No words had he wherewith to bend the awful Pharaoh on his throne. Who hath made man's mouth, was the reply. Who maketh the dumb, the deaf, the blind? Have not I the Lord? Go, and I will be with thy mouth. I will teach thee what thou shalt say. Still Moses made another effort to roll off from himself the awful responsibility of the commission. O my Lord, he cried, send, I pray thee, by the hand thou shouldest send. This last proof of distrust provoked even the Lord to anger, but it was the anger of love, the love that remembers mercy and sustains the weak. The Lord had already provided a spokesman. Aaron, his brother, was at this moment on his way to meet him, and he was known to be able to speak well. Together, like the apostles afterwards, the brothers should go in before Pharaoh, Aaron should be instead of a mouth, and Moses should be to him instead of God, and with his rod he should perform the prescribed signs. Then at last his timidity was removed. He consented to go, The object of the vision of the burning bush was thus far attained. Exodus 4 verses 1 to 17. End of book 3, chapter 1. Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. Book 3, chapter 2 of a class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear. Book 3. Chapter 2. Signs and Wonders in Egypt. Exodus chapters 4 through 11, B.C. 1491. The first step Moses took towards fulfilling the trust thus confided to him was to request of his father-in-law permission to revisit his brethren in Egypt. 
Jethro gave his consent, and then having received the divine assurance that all the men were dead which sought his life, accompanied by Zipporah and her two sons, Gershom and Eleazar, Moses commenced his return to Egypt. He had not proceeded far before he encountered his brother Aaron coming forth to meet him, to whom he explained their commission and the signs that were to attest it. On arriving in the land of Goshen, the brothers gathered together all the clans of the nation. Aaron, as spokesman, rehearsed the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. His announcement had the desired effect. The Israelites believed that the Lord God of their fathers had indeed interposed in their behalf and bowed their heads and worshipped. The next step was to procure from Pharaoh the necessary permission for the departure of the people. But now, even as the Almighty had forewarned them, the difficulties of the brothers commenced. On presenting themselves before Pharaoh and informing him of the will of Jehovah, the God of Israel, that his people should be permitted to go three days' journey into the wilderness, there to offer sacrifice unto him, Exodus 5 and verse 3, the monarch haughtily asked, Who is Jehovah, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Conceiving the God of Israel to be merely a national God, it seemed to him inexplicable that one who had suffered his worshippers to endure a lengthened and degrading bondage could demand of him, the mightiest monarch of the earth, to let his people depart. Concluding, therefore, that it was only an expedient to excite aspirations for freedom among the bond slaves, in contemptuous mockery of them and their God, he ordered that the severity of their toil should be doubled. Hitherto straw had been found them, wherewith to make bricks for the treasure cities and other gigantic works then in progress. But now it was ordered that they must go and gather straw for themselves, and yet the tally of bricks must not be diminished. What it was before, that it was to remain, and to be completed also. To comply with this tyrannical command was impossible, and the Israelitish officers who had been set over the people by the Egyptians were beaten, and their complaints to Pharaoh were utterly disregarded. This produced a great change of feeling towards Moses and Aaron, at whose announcement of speedy deliverance the people had so lately bowed the head and worshipped. They heaped reproaches upon them, and openly charged them with being the cause of their now accumulated miseries, of having made their saviour to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh. Exodus 5 verses 1 through 21 Thus the first attempt of Moses to execute his commission ended in complete failure. In deep dejection he laid before Jehovah the ineffectual issue of his efforts, and in reply not only received a second assurance of protection and ultimate triumph, but was told that as Pharaoh had rejected the word of God, God would now speak to him in deeds and multiply his signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, until the Egyptians knew that he was the Lord. But the contest in which Moses was now to engage was not to be fought with carnal weapons. As the accredited servant of Jehovah, he was to contend against the gods of Egypt, against those arts, the very lifeblood of heathenism, in which Egypt deemed itself so strong, its magic and necromancy, its priests and conjurers. Accordingly, the brothers went a second time into Pharaoh's presence and renewed their request. The monarch demanded a miracle in attestation of their claim. Thereupon, Aaron threw down his rod before the king and his courtiers, and straightway it became a serpent. But snake charming was an art in which Egypt bore off the palm from every other country in the world. Pharaoh therefore summoned his magicians, who cast down their rods, and they likewise became serpents. But though Aaron's wad swallowed up their rods, the monarch would not acknowledge that his servants had been defeated. He hardened his heart and refused to recognize in this miracle an authoritative warning to let the people go. The signs, therefore, were now to become plagues. 
Exodus 7 verses 8 through to 14. Accordingly, on the morrow, at the command of God, Moses made his appearance before Pharaoh just as he was going to offer sacrifice to or perform his religious ablutions in the sacred waters of the Nile, the father of life, the father of the gods, as it was called by the Egyptians. In words few but decisive, he announced the reason of his coming. Then the word was given. Aaron lifted up his rod, and in a moment, before the very eyes of the monarch and all his servants, the waters of the sacred, fruit-defying river, not only in the stream itself, but in the canals and tanks, in the vessels of wood and vessels of stone, then as now used for the filtration of the water from the sediment of the riverbed, were turned into blood. The fish, though similarly objects of religious reverence, died in incredible numbers, and the father of waters, the source of health and blessing, stank, nor could the Egyptians drink thereof, for there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But again the magicians were summoned. With their enchantments they caused other water, probably obtained by digging about the river, to assume the same blood-red appearance. And Pharaoh turned into his house and hardened his heart, neither would he let the people go. Exodus 7, verses 14 through 25. After an interval, therefore, of seven days, Moses and Aaron again presented themselves before him, and when their request was again denied, inflicted the second plague. From the streams, the rivers, the ponds of Egypt, frogs came up over the whole land, penetrating into the royal palace, the houses of the courtiers and of the people, defiling bedchamber and bed, oven and kneading trough, with their loathsome touch. Again the magicians were summoned, and though they were utterly unable to counteract, they succeeded in imitating this plague also. Pharaoh was more deeply moved than before. He not only condescended to big Moses and Aaron that they would entreat Jehovah to remove this plague from his people, but undertook to allow the Israelites to depart and do sacrifice to the Lord. But no sooner had the desired deliverance been vouchsafed than he again hardened his heart and refused to fulfill his word. Exodus 8, verses 1 through to 15. For the third time, therefore, Aaron uplifted his rod, and now, not from the father of waters, but from the fertile soil of Egypt itself, came forth innumerable swarms either of lice or of gnats, which afflicted both man and beast with intolerable discomfort. This plague, all the spells and incantations of the court magicians were unable to imitate, and they were fain to confess to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God, but he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them. Exodus 8 verses 16 through 19 On the morning after, as he went forth to the waters of the river, which he had lately seen so grievously dishonoured, he was met by Moses and refused for the fourth time to relieve the people of their bondage. On this the servant of Jehovah spake the word, and there came innumerable flies of various kinds, usually a fearful torment in Egypt, but now attacking with unwanted fury both man and beast, and swarming in every house of the Egyptians, while they touched neither house nor person of the Israelites in Goshen. Such was the intolerable severity of this plague that Pharaoh so far relented as to permit the people to sacrifice to Jehovah in the land itself, but with the proviso that they should not leave it. This Moses would not concede. Therefore the monarch extended his concession to a journey some little way into the wilderness, but on the removal of the judgment revoked it and retained the nation in bondage. Exodus 8 verses 20 to 32. The fifth plague was now inflicted. A grievous murrain broke out amongst the horses, the asses, the camels, the oxen, the sheep of the Egyptians, so that all the cattle of Egypt, including not only the useful beast, but probably the sacred goat of Bendis, the ram of Ammon, the calf of Heliopolis, the bull of Apis, died, while in the land of Goshen, as Pharaoh himself ascertained, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. But even this had no effect on his proud heart. Exodus 9 verses 1 through 7 Accordingly, 
Moses and Aaron were commanded to take handfuls of ashes of the furnace and sprinkle them upwards toward the heaven, and on their so doing boils and blisters and other eruptive disorders broke forth upon man and upon beast. Even the royal magicians suffered so terribly from this, the sixth plague, that they could not stand before Moses. But the heart of their master was still hardened, nor would he yield to the will of God. Exodus 9 verses 8 through 12 With still greater solemnity, therefore, the coming of the seventh plague was announced to him, and he was warned to send his servants and gather together such of his cattle as were grazing in the fields, if he would not have them utterly destroyed by a terrible storm of thunder, lightning and hail. By some who heard the warning, it was heeded in time. By others, it was utterly disregarded. But it was too surely fulfilled. Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and on the fair garden of Egypt, with its green meadows and fields of corn and barley and maize, the storm burst forth with unwanted fury. The Lord thundered out of heaven, and the highest gave his thunder. Psalms 18 verse 13 The fire ran along upon the ground, the hail rattled and smote the vines and fig trees. Psalms 105 verse 33 And every herb of the field, and every tree of the field, the barley then in the ear, and the flax then bold or risen in the stalk, as also the cattle and herdsmen that had not been removed to any place of shelter. Alarmed beyond measure at this unexampled tempest, Pharaoh begged Moses to intercede for him, owned this time that he had sinned, that the Lord was righteous, that he and his people were wicked, and promised to do all that was required of him. But as before, when the fury of the elements was hushed, he refused to abide by his word. Exodus 9 verses 13 through 35 and now for the eighth time the release of the people was demanded and the monarch was told that in the event of refusal the country already grievously devastated should be given up to the awful ravages of the locusts which in numbers such as neither his fathers nor his father's fathers had seen should swarm in the palace and the hut covering the face of the ground and eating up whatever herb or tree had escaped the fury of the late storm. This announcement filled the Egyptians, already suffering severely, with uttermost alarm. Let the people go, they cried to their king, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? Even Pharaoh was fain to lend an ear to this remonstrance. Summoning Moses and Aaron, he informed them that he was ready to allow such as were men among the Israelites to depart and serve their God, but their wives and children must remain as a guarantee for their return. The servants, however, of Jehovah were not empowered to make this concession, and the plague began. A strong east wind blew continuously and brought the locusts, which in dense swarms covered the face of the land, so that it was darkened and became a desolate wilderness without a leaf upon the trees or a blade of grass in the fields. The obduracy of the monarch now broke down and was followed by a brief repentance, which lasted no longer than the west wind which swept away the locusts. For once more, in the face of an utterly devastated country and a murmuring people, he refused to hearken to the word of the Lord. Exodus 10 verses 1 through 20. Without the pre-announcements, therefore, which had preceded the infliction of the other plagues, the ninth now appeared in the shape of darkness, so dense that it might be felt, which for three days enveloped the entire land, save only for the favoured country of Goshen. During this period, the light of the sun was obscured, an awful and preternatural gloom shrouded the land, so that the Egyptians neither could see one another nor rise from their place. At the end of the three days, Pharaoh once more capitulated. All the Israelites, young and old, might depart. The flocks and herds alone must remain. These conditions, however, were rejected by Moses, and he was dismissed from the palace with the warning to take heed that he saw the face of Pharaoh no more, for on the day that he saw his face, he should surely die. Exodus 10 verses 21 to 29. 
End of Book 3, Chapter 2 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G.F. McClear. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. Book 3, Chapter 3 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Hare. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick MacLear. Book 3, Chapter 3. The Last Plague, the Passover, the Exodus. Exodus 11 to 15. Hitherto the elements of nature had each in their turn been commissioned to fight against Pharaoh. In all the preceding plagues there had been human intervention. The rod or the hand of Moses had summoned from the sacred river, or the fertile soil, or the rainless air, or the desert sands of Arabia, the ministers of punishment, and wrought signs and wonders in the land of Ham, and had proved that the God he served was no mere national God, but was Lord over earth and air and water, over cattle and man, over tree and herb. But none of the elements of nature were to bring on Pharaoh God's last sore judgment. At midnight, said Jehovah, will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. I will execute judgment against all the gods or princes, Exodus thirteen twelve Marg, of Egypt. I am Jehovah. Before, however, this last great blow was struck, involving the firstborn of the highest and the lowest in one common fate, certain important preliminaries were to be enacted. It was now the Hebrew month of Nisan, or Abib, the month of green ears. On the fourteenth day of this month it was announced that the last sword judgment would be inflicted. But on the tenth day of this month, a month to be to the Israelites henceforth the beginning of months, the first month of their sacred year, the father of every household was to select a lamb or kid without blemish, a male of the first year. It was to be kept till the fourteenth day, and then slain just before the evening twilight, Exodus 12, 1-6. A portion of the blood was to be sprinkled with a bunch of hyssop on the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses of the Israelites. And on the selfsame night, the lamb, roast with fire, whole, not a bone being broken, was to be eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Of this meal each household was to partake, with their loins girded, their shoes on their feet, their staves in their hands, in haste like persons in a hurry to depart. Of the flesh of the lamb nothing was to be allowed to remain until morning, and all remnants were to be burnt with fire. And at midnight, while they were partaking of this mysterious meal, the Lord, they were told, would pass through the land of Egypt and smite all the firstborn, both of man and beast. But when he saw the blood sprinkled on the houses of the Israelites, he would pass over them, and the plague should not be upon them to their destruction. Exodus 12, 7-12 to Such was the ordinance of the Passover, a memorial feast to be celebrated, not on that night only, but throughout all future generations, and to be kept for a period of seven days, during which leavened bread was neither to be eaten nor found in any of the houses of the Israelites. On receiving from Moses the Lord's commands respecting this feast, the elders of Israel, partakers with him of a like faith in the certainty of the events about to be enacted, Hebrews 11:28, bowed their heads and worshipped. On the tenth day of Nisan, the month of redemption, each household selected a lamb or kid, kept it till the fourteenth day, slew it sprinkled the blood upon the side posts and the upper door post of their houses, and at midnight were eating of it with the prescribed ceremonies, when suddenly the last and most awful of all the ten plagues began. The Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon unto the firstborn of the mighty Pharaoh himself, 
and all the firstborn of cattle. In the darkness of that awful night the monarch rose up, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and a loud frantic cry arose throughout the land, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Terrified and confounded, the stubborn king could no longer resist the power of Jehovah. He implored Moses and Aaron, as an act of kindness, to depart with the utmost speed. And not only he, but all his people joined in the petition, and pressed upon the Israelites jewels of silver and jewels of gold, earrings, signet rings, necklaces, and festal apparel. Thus furnished by the Egyptians themselves with costly ornaments befitting the great day of their deliverance, the whole host of the Israelites, numbering six hundred thousand men capable of bearing arms, besides women and children and a mixed multitude from the lower orders of the Egyptians, went forth from Ramses, and in the darkness and cool of the night pursued their way. Exodus 12, 37, 38 The nearest route to Canaan would have been the usual caravan route, which runs in a northeasterly direction along the coast of the Mediterranean, and would not have occupied more than a few days but it would have brought the host into collision with the warlike and powerful nation of the Philistines, and for such an encounter they were as yet totally unfit. From Ramses, therefore, which was probably on the eastern skirts of the delta in the Wadi Tumilat, they proceeded in a southerly course, and after a day's journey halted for the second time at Succoth, Exodus twelve thirty-seven, the place of booths, formed by the luxuriant foliage of tamarisk, sycamore, and palm, at the verge of the cultivated land of Egypt. The next day's halt was at Etham in the edge of the wilderness, Exodus thirteen twenty. At this point, the Lord himself, in an outward and visible form, assumed the direction of their march, appearing by day in a pillar of cloud and by night in a pillar of fire. Such a miraculous intervention was indeed needed to confirm the faith of the host, for instead of being conducted around the northern extremity of the Red Sea, so as to escape with all speed beyond reach of their Egyptian oppressors, they were commanded to turn and encamp before Pihaharoth, the place of Sedge, between Migdal, a frontier watchtower, and the western side of the Red Sea over against Baal Zephon. Here they had scarcely encamped, when lifting up their eyes the Israelites discerned the terrible horses and chariots of Pharaoh pursuing after them. Astonished that the people had not made good their flight into Asia, and deeming them entangled in the land and shut in by the wilderness, the monarch had directed all his forces to give chase to the fugitives. In wild alarm the Israelites cried out to Moses, and already complained of their deliverance from the bond of Egypt. But the faith of their leader was not shaken. He bade the trembling, panic-stricken host stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. They had not long to wait, for at this moment the angel of God, who went before the host of Israel in the pillar of cloud and fire, stationed himself behind them so as to deepen the gloom in which the Egyptians were advancing, and afford light and encouragement to the Israelites. Simultaneously Moses advanced toward the Red Sea, either at the present fords of Suez or at some point higher up, and stretched over it his rod. Thereupon a strong east wind began to blow, the waters were divided, the bottom of the sea was exposed, and amidst walls of water standing up on either side of them, on their right hand and on their left, the caravan of the Israelites defiled in long procession. All night the wondrous passage continued, and as the morning broke they had safely landed on the further shore. Meanwhile their foes, determined to prevent the second escape of their prey, had rushed on amidst the pitchy darkness that surrounded them into the same awful pass. But at the morning watch, when they had reached the midst of the sea, the Lord looked upon them from the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled their host, and caused their heavy chariot wheels to sink in the sand, so that they drave them heavily. In wild confusion they shouted to one another to turn back, but it was too late. 
Again the hand of Moses was uplifted, and straightway the waters, till now congealed from their lowest depths, Exodus 15, 8, began to break and give way, and the sea to return to his strength. All efforts to escape were fruitless. Fast and furious the sea swept on. The engulfing waves closed over them. Horse and chariot and horsemen sank like lead in the mighty waters. Then from the Israelitish leader and the host which had stood still and seen the deliverance Jehovah had wrought for them, there burst forth a noble song of praise and thanksgiving, while Miriam, his sister, and her women accompanied them with timbrels and dances. Together they sang the praises of him who had triumphed gloriously, who had cast Pharaoh's chariots and his host into the sea, and drowned his chosen captains in the waves, whose right hand became glorious in power, and dashed in pieces the enemy, who had blown with his wind and gathered the waters with the blast of his nostrils, and in his mercy led forth the people which he had redeemed. Exodus 15, 1-19. Compare Psalms 127, 16-19. Thus, at length, the word of the Most High, which he spake to the patriarch Abraham at least four hundred years before, was fulfilled. The seed of the patriarch had grown into a great nation. They had been strangers in a land that was not theirs. They had suffered cruel affliction and degradation. But the oppressing nation had been judged, and with much substance the oppressed had come forth. The jewels of silver and gold and the festal apparel, which their late tyrants had forced upon them, well became this their national birthday. Once slaves, they were now free. Once a degraded tribe, they were now an independent people. They had left behind them Egypt with its grinding tyranny and its memories of years of suffering. They had been baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 1 Corinthians 10, 2 Their faces were set towards a promised land, their hopes fastened on a glorious future. End of Book 3 Chapter 3Book 3, Chapter 4 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 3, Chapter 4 The Journey from the Red Sea to Rephidim. Exodus chapters 15 through 19, B.C. 1491. And now the ransomed people commenced their journey. Skirting the eastern shore of the Red Sea, they entered the wilderness of Shur, or Etham, Numbers 33 verse 8, on the western base of the high tableland which forms the northern portion of the peninsula of Sinai. A three days' march brought them to a well, probably a Inhawara, plentifully supplied indeed with water, but so bitter that they could not drink of it, whence they called it Mara, bitterness. This was the first test of their faith in their invisible leader, and they proved unequal to it. They murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? In his distress, Moses turned to the Lord, who bade him cast a tree into the waters, and they were straight away sweetened. Leaving Mara, they reached Elam, Wadi Gorondel, or Wadi Yuzit, where were twelve wells of refreshing water and three score and ten palm trees. Here they probably stayed some days, and then passing between vast cliffs, probably at the mouth of the Wadi Teaba, again came in sight of the deep blue waters of the Red Sea, Numbers 33 verse 10, where they encamped and were able for the last time to discern the shadowy line of Egypt, the land of bondage. Leaving the seashore on the fifteenth day of the second month, they entered the shadeless desert of Sin. Exodus 16 verse 1 By this time the supply of bread they had brought with them from Egypt was consumed, and the people burst forth into loud murmurings against Moses and Aaron. Would God, they cried, we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, 
when we sat by the flesh pots and did eat bread to the full. Thereupon Moses was commissioned to assure them of speedy relief, and that very evening dense flocks of quails, immense numbers of which are found in Arabia Petraea and the adjoining countries, covered the ground around their encampment. Exodus 16 verse 13. Moreover, the next morning when the dew had gone up, behold, there lay on the face of the wilderness a small round thing, as small as the hoar-frost, white like coriander seed, the taste of which was like wafers made with honey. On seeing this curious substance and not knowing its origin or properties, the Israelites exclaimed, Manu, what is it? Whence the substance hitherto unknown received the name of mana. Exodus 16 verses 14 to 36. Two conditions were annexed to the enjoyment of this extraordinary and unlooked-for blessing. The people were instructed to gather only a sufficient quantity for the wants of a single day, an omer, about five pints each man, and they were to leave none of it until the morning. Some of them, however, infringed both these conditions, and in both instances found cause to regret their conduct. Some took the trouble to gather more than the prescribed quantity and found that in spite of their exertions, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. Others did leave some of it until the morning, but they too found themselves disappointed, for it was in a state of decomposition and utterly unfit for food. On the sixth day, however, each man was surprised to find himself able to gather twice the usual quantity. The circumstance Moses explained to them. The seventh day was to be observed as a holy Sabbath, rest unto the Lord. On that day no manna would be found lying on the ground. But on the sixth day they were to gather twice the usual quantity to make provision for the deficiency on the Sabbath. This command, however, was not universally obeyed. Some went out to gather on the Sabbath, but returned empty-handed. Thus the institution of the day of rest was presented as one of peculiar significance, and a preparation was made for the more precise legislation respecting it to be afterwards promulgated. In memory of this miraculous supply of the people's needs, Moses directed that an omer of the mana should be put aside in a vessel as a memorial to all future generations. Exodus 16 verses 32 to 34, John 6 verses 31 and 32, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 3, Hebrews 9 verse 4. After a halt of a week in the wilderness of sin, and also at two intermediate stations, Dovka and Alush, Numbers 33 verses 12 to 14, the positions of which are unknown, the Israelites reached Rephidim, places of rest, most probably the Wadi Firan and the finest valley in the whole peninsula. Two circumstances distinguished their encampment in this valley. In consequence of a second failure of water, the murmurings of the people against their leader reached such a pitch that they showed signs of a readiness even to stone him with stones. Again, however, the Lord interposed and mercifully directed Moses to strike a rock in Horeb, that is, one of the outer hills in the Sinaitic group, whereupon a copious stream flowed forth and refreshed the thirsty host. In memory of the murmuring of the people, Moses named the spot Massa, Temptation, and Meribah, Strife, Exodus 17, verse 7. The other circumstance which rendered memorable the encampment at this spot was of a different nature. One of the main streams of population occupying at this time the Sinaitic Peninsula was the powerful tribe of Amalek. Their settlements extended from the northern part of the peninsula even to the borders of Palestine. They were descended from Esau and were governed by a chief who bore the title, by some deemed hereditary, of Agag, the burner or destroyer. Compare Numbers 24 verse 7, 1 Samuel 15 verses 8 and 9. Regarding the encampment of the Israelites in the rich and fertile valley of Rephidim, with no friendly feelings, they mustered their forces and, treacherously falling upon their exhausted rear, smote the hindmost of them and the feeble amongst them when they were faint and weary. Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 to 19. To repel this attack, Moses directed a young man, whose name is here for the first time mentioned, Joshua, or as he was now called Hoshea, Salvation, the son of Nun of the tribe of Ephraim, to select a body of men and go forth to meet Amalek in the valley. 
Meanwhile, he himself ascended the hill, whence probably the refreshing streams had issued, with the rod of God in his hand and accompanied by Aaron and Hur. There, within sight of the battle in the valley below, he stood and stretched forth his hands in supplication to heaven. So long as his hands remained thus uplifted, the Israelites made good their superiority over the foe. But as often as from weariness his hands drooped, Amalek prevailed. For a long time the contest seemed undecided. At length Aaron and Hur, seeing Moses wearied with his exertions, took a stone and placed it under him, and stayed up his hands in the attitude of supplication till the sun went down, by which time Amalek had sustained a total defeat and been smitten with the edge of the sword. This victory and the circumstances leading to it were too important to be forgotten. On the summit of the hill, where he had stood in the attitude of prayer, Moses erected an altar, which he called Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner, and, by the divine direction, inscribed in a book the account of Amalek's attack and rehearsed it in the ears of Joshua. Their treacherous conduct had placed them under the same ban as the nations of Canaan, and the Lord would utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Exodus 17 verse 14, 1 Samuel 15 verse 2 and 3, 2 Samuel 8 verse 12. Not long afterwards, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, having heard all that the Lord had done for his kinsmen, and of the wonderful deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt, left his tents among the Midianites and came to meet him with his daughter Zipporah and her two sons, Gershom and Eleazar. After mutual salutation, the two passed into the tent, and Moses recounted to his father-in-law the marvels of the Exodus, the travail of the people by the way, and their late deliverance from the sword of Amalek. Jethro rejoiced at the recital, bestowed upon the Israelites his solemn blessing, and offered sacrifices to Jehovah, to which, and the thanksgiving feast that followed, Aaron, the future high priest, and all the elders of Israel were invited. On the morrow, perceiving Moses occupied from morning until evening with the administration of justice and the settlement of disputes among the people, Jethro ventured to remonstrate with him on the risk he incurred by undertaking unaided so heavy a burden. He suggested that judges, rulers and elders, able men such as feared God and hated covetousness, should be appointed, who should at stated seasons see justice done between man and man and reserve only the weightier matters for the attention of Moses himself. His wise advice was adopted, and men were duly appointed to preside over every ten, every fifty, every hundred, and every thousand of the people, and thus equalize the burden hitherto sustained by Moses alone. Exodus 18, verses 1 to 27. End of Book 3, Chapter 4. Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. Book 3, Chapter 5 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 3, Chapter 5. Sinai and the Giving of the Law, Exodus 19 and 20, B.C. 1491 At length, the halt at Rephidim came to an end. In the third month, Exodus 19, 1, the Israelites once more set out in a southerly direction, and after ascending winding valleys and rugged passes, and staircases of lofty rocks rising one above the other in long succession reached a level plain, probably Erahe, in front of which towered the massive cliffs of Sinai, rising like a huge altar in front of the whole congregation. Here, in a spot where they could find water and pasture for their flocks and herds, they pitched their tents before the mount, 
Exodus 19.2, the natural aspect of everything around them was of a character calculated to exert a most solemnizing influence upon their feelings. They had reached a kind of natural sanctuary, not made with hands, which for magnificence and grandeur far exceeded any of those massive Egyptian temples on which their eyes had rested by the green valley of the Nile. Far removed from the stir and confusion of earthly things, amidst a scene of desolate grandeur and a silence unbroken even by the sound of waters or the trickling of rills down the mountain gorges, they experienced everything that the natural influence of scenery and association could affect towards fitting their minds for the great and sublime transactions now about to be enacted between them and the Almighty. They were about to receive direct communication from the Lord of all the earth, and to learn why, with an outstretched arm and signs and great wonders, they had been delivered from the bondage of Egypt, and thus led forth into the wilderness. By way of preparation for the great scene, Moses left the congregation encamped on the plain and proceeded up the winding steep ascent of Sinai. On reaching the summit, the Lord called unto him and made known his intention of renewing the patriarchal covenant, which, though it might seem to have been forgotten during the weary years of bondage in Egypt, had never been disannulled. Galatians 3.17, and was now to be solemnly republished. Like all covenants, it contained a stipulation and a promise. If Israel would obey the voice of him who had delivered them from Egypt, and borne them on eagles' wings, and brought them to himself, Exodus 19.4, If they would submit themselves to his laws and keep his commandments, then, though all the earth was his, yet should they be a peculiar treasure unto him above all people. Jehovah would enter into a special relation towards them. He would undertake the duties and claim the privileges of sovereignty, while they should be unto him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It was not a single and peculiar order that was to be elevated to the high position of a member of the priest kingdom, as was the case in Egypt. Every Israelite was to sustain this relation, and in the midst of a world given up to idolatry, was called to preserve the knowledge of the one true God, and exhibit to the nations the spectacle of a people walking in the ways of holiness, righteousness, and truth. The conditions of this covenant Moses made known to the elders and people of Israel. He laid before them all the words which the Lord commanded him, and when they had voluntarily agreed to obey them, he returned with their reply to the Lord, and was told of the intention of Jehovah to come unto him in a thick cloud, that the people might hear him and believe him forever. Exodus 19.9 Three days, therefore, were now devoted to preparatory and ceremonial ablutions, during which the people were commanded to abstain from all sensual and worldly enjoyments. Then, Bounds were set round the mountain on which a God of holiness was about to appear, lest any of the people should ascend or even touch it. Of any infringement of this prohibition, death was denounced as the certain penalty, and that not inflicted in the usual way, lest the executioners should themselves be polluted, but from a distance with stones and arrows. Exodus 19.12 and 13, Hebrews 12.20 At length the morning of the third day dawned, and the awful silence of the mountain sanctuary was broken by peals of thunder, 
which echoed and re-echoed amidst the rocky gorges, while flashes of lightning lit up the peaks of Sinai, and revealed by their contrast the pitchy darkness and the thick cloud which had settled upon the mountain top. Presently, the voice as of a trumpet, compare Revelations 1.10 and 4.1, sounded exceeding loud, audible even above the crash of the thunder, so that every soul in the camp trembled. This was the signal God had made known to Moses, who straightway led forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount, which appeared altogether on a smoke, like the smoke of a furnace, enshrouding a mysterious flame in which the Lord descended. Exodus 19.18 Again the trumpet pealed with a long-continued blast, and waxed louder and louder, and Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice, summoning him to meet him on the top of Sinai. Arrived there, he was commanded again to warn the people, and even the priest, against drawing too near, or breaking through the bounds that had been set about the mount for the purpose of indulging any profane gaze, and so incurring the inevitable penalty of death. Exodus 19.21 Moses therefore returned to the awestruck crowd on the plain below, and renewed the solemn warning. Then, from out of the midst of the fire, and the cloud, and the thick darkness, with a great voice, Deuteronomy 5.22, Jehovah himself spake to the assembled host face to face, and proclaimed the ten fundamental words of the law of the covenant. Not as the Lord of the universe, or the creator of all things, did the Most High now reveal himself to the people, but as their Redeemer, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and from the house of bondage. Exodus 22 1. Beside him, therefore, they were to have no other God. 2. Of him, they were to make no representation, or construct any graven image, or any likeness in the form of anything either in the heaven above, or the earth beneath, or the waters under the earth. 3. For his name they were to entertain the deepest reverence, nor profane it by taking it in vain. 4. His day, the seventh day, the day of rest, they were ever to observe. Six days they might labor and do all their work, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath of the Lord their God, no work might be done by the head of the family or his son or his daughter, his manservant or his maidservant, his cattle or the stranger sojourning within his gates. Such was the duty of the Israelite towards God. But now also the Almighty proclaimed man's duty towards his neighbor. He enjoined and connected with a special promise of temporal prosperity. 5. Filial reverence for parents. And forbade 6. Murder 7. Adultery 8. Theft 9. False witness and 10. Covetousness Exodus 20, 1 through 17. These were the ten words, the fundamentals of the divine law under which the Israelites were henceforth called to live, and which they were to accept as the charter of their constitution. But so great was their terror when they heard God thus speaking to them face to face that they fled, and standing afar off, implored Moses to intercede with the Almighty, that they might no more hear his voice, lest they should die. Go thou near, said they, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. 
Deuteronomy 5.27 Their request found favor in the sight of Jehovah, and Moses was now solemnly appointed as the mediator between the Israelites and God. At the same time, the Lord intimated that he would raise up a still greater prophet than Moses from the midst of the Israelites, yet like unto him, that he would put his words in his mouth, and he should speak unto them all that he commanded. Deuteronomy 18, 13-19 Accordingly, in his capacity of mediator, Moses now returned up the mountain and ascended into the thick darkness that still abode upon it for the purpose of receiving the further commands of Jehovah. After remaining there for some time, he came back to the people. They had, on their part, already agreed to enter into covenant with God, but it was necessary that this covenant should now be solemnly ratified by them, its provisions read in their hearing and formally accepted as the basis of their constitution. Accordingly, Moses first wrote all the words that Jehovah had spoken in a book, probably a papyrus roll, and then, having built an altar at the foot of the mount and set up twelve pillars, he caused calves and goats to be slain as burnt offerings and peace offerings by the hands of certain selected youths. In the ears of the assembled people, he next read every word of the law, and when these conditions of the covenant had been formally accepted by them, he took the blood of the victims already slain, together with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, Hebrews 9, 19-21, sprinkled one half of the blood on the altar and the roll containing the covenant conditions, and the other half on the people, saying as he did so, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. But one portion only of the ceremony was complete. The victims had yielded up their life. The blood, the source of life, had been sprinkled on the altar and accepted by Jehovah. It was now necessary that the sacrificers should join in the covenant feast. To celebrate this, Moses, accompanied by Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy elders, as representatives of the people, ascended to a level spot near the summit of Sinai. There they saw the glory of the God of Israel, under whose feet there was, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and the body of heaven in its clearness. But instead of suffering any harm from such close proximity to the majesty of the Supreme, they ate and drank in his presence of the covenant feast, and thereby were assured of his mercy and loving kindness. Exodus 24, 9-11 End of Book 3, Chapter 5book 3 chapter 6 of a class book of old testament history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a class book of old testament history by george frederick mcclear book 3 Chapter 6 Moses in the Mount, the Construction of the Calf, Exodus 24 through 34, B.C. 1491. Thus the covenant was formally ratified, and the nation solemnly devoted itself to the service of the God of Israel. Further revelations, however, awaited Moses and after committing the charge of the people to Aaron and her, Exodus 24:14, he again went up into the mount, accompanied only by Joshua, 
his minister and attendant. After an interval of six days, the voice of God summoned him to ascend alone, yet higher into the midst of the cloud that still overhung the mount, and for forty days and forty nights he there remained in mysterious converse with Jehovah. During this period, the Lord showed him in vision a representation of the sanctuary, Hebrews 8, 5, which he required should be the solemn place of meeting between him and the people, and gave him the necessary instructions for its erection, Exodus 25 through 28, together with full particulars respecting the order of its services and ritual, Exodus 29 through 30, as also the names of the two men who were to be employed in building it namely Bezalel of the tribe of Judah and Aholiab of the tribe of Dan, Exodus 31, 1-11. At the same time, Moses received two tables of stone on which the Ten Commandments had been written by the finger of God. While, however, the Israelitish leader had been engaged in solemn converse with the Supreme, a far different scene had been going on in the plain below. His prolonged absence had filled the Israelites with doubt and perplexity. When the glory of the Lord descended upon Sinai, they had indeed felt the mountain quake. They had heard the thunder roar. They had seen the lightning flash. But of Jehovah himself, they had beheld no form or similitude. Now to believe in one who did not, like the gods of every other nation round about, reveal himself under any palpable figure, was not easy for men who had so long lived amidst the fascinations of the idolatrous rites of pagan Egypt. As weeks therefore passed away, and still no sign appeared of the return of their leader, the people began to lose their trust in him whom they had promised to obey. They wished to break up their long encampment, but who would go before them and guide them in the way? Yearning, therefore, for some visible representative of Jehovah, and possibly yielding to the suggestions of some of the Egyptians amongst the mixed multitude in the camp, they gathered themselves together before Aaron with the petition that he would make them gods to go before them. For as for Moses, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, they knew not what was become of him. Unable to stem the popular clamor, and taking refuge in an unworthy expediency, Aaron bade them bring him the golden earrings of their wives, their sons, and their daughters and of these he fashioned a calf, probably according to the well-known form of the Egyptian Apis or Menevis, whose worship the people must often have witnessed during their sojourn in the Nile Valley. Then, building an altar, he proclaimed a three days festival to Jehovah. Accordingly, with the earliest dawn of the following day, the people arose and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the image, exclaiming, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, and concluded the ceremony with one of those licentious orgies, accompanied by song and dance, which were so common amongst heathen nations. Exodus 32.4, 1 Corinthians 10.7 it was while they were in the very act of celebrating this idolatrous festival that Moses, accompanied by Joshua, returned from the presence of the nation's invisible king. He had already received divine intimation of the apostasy of the people, and in his capacity of mediator had already interceded in their behalf. Now, with the two tables of the law in his hands, he descended the mount. 
to the ear of his companion the noise of the host as it ascended upwards from the valley below sounded like the noise of war in the camp but moses knew otherwise it is not the noise of them that shout for the mastery he replied neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome but the noise of them that sing do i hear then as he drew near the camp and beheld with his own eyes the heathenish orgies that were going on his feelings overmastered him his anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount next advancing towards the senseless image he seized it burnt it with fire reduced it to powder strode the ashes on the neighboring brook of horeb and compelled the people to drink thereof then after sternly rebuking his brother for conniving at so heinous a sin he stationed himself at the entrance of the camp and bade all who still remained faithful to jehovah gird on their swords and without regard to family tie or private friendship slay the offenders from gate to gate with the edge of the sword it was a severe but necessary test of the fidelity of the people and the sons of levi were found faithful with a zeal very dissimilar from that which had animated their forefather at shechem genesis thirty four twenty five and twenty six instead of siding with aaron though their tribal leader they arose and slew about three thousand of the offenders thus effacing the blot on the memory of their tribe and qualifying themselves for high functions in the sanctuary exodus thirty two twenty five through twenty nine in order to make an atonement for the people's sin moses on the next day reascended the mount and solemnly interceded with the almighty on their behalf standing in the gap psalm 106 23 between a justly offended god and an erring nation he offered if no other way of forgiveness was possible freely to surrender his own life and to suffer the blotting out of his own name from god's book eventually his intercession prevailed the almighty promised that the nation should not be cut off and that he would send his angel before them who should lead them into the land promised to their forefathers but further punishment certainly awaited them in the day of his visitation he would visit their sin upon them an earnest of which they speedily experienced in the shape of plagues exodus thirty two thirty five with which the lord plagued the people because of their sin in turning his glory into the similitude of a calf that eateth hay psalm one o six twenty the announcement of moses that their journey into the promised land was not to be suspended but that jehovah would not go up in their midst was received by the people with much lamentation exodus thirty three four their sorrow was accepted as a sign of repentance and moses caused his own tent to be pitched at a long distance without the camp and named it the tent or tabernacle of meeting exodus thirty three seven then accompanied only by joshua he passed through the long line of the people's tents at the doors of which they stood and watched him and as he entered his own the cloudy pillar which hitherto had rested on the top of sinai descended and stood before it and amidst the joyful reverence of the watching host the lord conversed with moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend exodus thirty three eleven the descent of the cloudy pillar 
and its position at the entrance of the tent of Israel's leader, though at a distance from the people, was a sign that his intercession had prevailed. In spite of their recent sin, Jehovah had not forgotten to be gracious. He would fulfill his promise, and the nation should be led into the land assured to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and everyone who sought the Lord might draw nigh and consult him through his servant Moses in the appointed place of meeting. Emboldened by this measure of success, Moses expressed a desire, since he was the ordained leader of the people, and had found grace in the sight of God, that he might be permitted to behold the essential glory of him with whom he was privileged to speak face to face. Exodus 33.13 He asked for more than he or any other finite creature could endure. The face, the essential majesty of Jehovah, no man could see and live. But if he ascended the mount on the morrow and took precautions that no man or beast appeared in sight and brought with him two fresh tables of stone hewn out of the rock, the Lord promised that he should see so much of his glory as mortal eye could bear. Accordingly, on the morrow, with two fresh hewn tables, he ascended and awaited the mysterious revelation. Every precaution had been taken. No man was allowed to be seen throughout all the mount. No flock or herd was suffered to feed before it. Exodus 34.3 Alone, unattended even by the faithful Joshua, the accepted mediator between the people and their invisible king, stood in a cleft of the rock. And while he stood, covered with Jehovah's hand, the Lord passed by and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. As Moses listened to this proclamation of the incommunicable attributes of the Most High, justice and mercy, truth and love, like Elijah after him in a cleft of the same jagged rocks, 1 Kings 19, 9 through 13, he bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped and interceded for a more complete renewal of the broken covenant between Jehovah and his people. His prayer was heard. The covenant was once more renewed And for a second period of forty days and forty nights, Moses remained in the divine presence and received fresh instructions respecting the moral and ceremonial laws of the theocracy. At the close of this period, with the two fresh tables inscribed with the ten words, he again returned to the people. On this occasion, he retained more permanent marks of the awful converse he had been permitted to hold. Aaron and the elders of the people were afraid to approach him, for the skin of his face shone with a celestial radiance, and the reflection of Jehovah's glory gilded his brow. The lawgiver himself, not aware of the change that had come over his features, called unto them, And at length, emboldened to approach, they heard at his mouth all the commands of God. But the unearthly splendor was not permanent. Lest, therefore, the people should behold the fading away of this visible credential of his interview with the Supreme, 
Moses was in the habit of placing a veil upon his face whenever he departed from them. Compare Second Corinthians three thirteen, but removed it as often as he was permitted to behold the presence of the Lord and receive fresh renewals of the celestial radiance. End of book three, chapter six. Section 19, Book 4, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 4, Chapter 1 The Mosaic Worship and Polity. The Tabernacle. Exodus 36 through 40. 1490 B.C. The encampment of the Israelites before Sinai continued for more than a year. Numbers 1, 1. At this point, then, it will be convenient to group together and consider the most important of those ordinances which they now received, and the chief features of the Constitution under which they were called to live. The purpose for which the Jewish nation was raised up was of the most momentous character. In the midst of surrounding idolatry and moral degeneracy, they were called to preserve intact the doctrine of the unity of God, to be the guardians of His gracious promises of redemption, and to exhibit to the world holiness. See Romans 9, 4, and 5. The doctrine of the divine unity was the kernel of the Mosaic law, and as such was defended by the sternest and most rigorous enactments. The Israelites were forbidden even to mention the names of the gods of the Canaanite nations, Exodus 23.13. They were commanded to burn or destroy their images, their altars, their sacred groves, Exodus 23.24 and 34.13. They were to deem accursed the precious metals of which their idols were composed, Deuteronomy 7.25. And on no pretense whatever were they to conclude any treaty or make any marriage with them. Deuteronomy 7, 2, and 3. Relapse into idolatry was to be regarded as the greatest crime, and whether committed by a city or an individual, was to be punished with unrelenting severity. In the latter case, death by stoning was the inevitable penalty. In the former, all the inhabitants were to be put to the sword, the whole spoil was to be collected into a heap and burnt, and a solemn curse was to be pronounced against anyone who attempted to rebuild it. Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 18. No less vigorous were the enactments against the construction of any representation of the true God under any form or similitude, whether of man or animal, bird or fish or star. But while all the idolatrous forms of worship were thus rigorously forbidden, the Almighty condescended to make known to His people the way in which He was willing to receive their adoration. Stooping to the infirmities of a nation just delivered from degrading bondage, he took them by the hand and provided for the wants of their religious nature in a way marvelously adapted to their native genius and character, as also to their previous habits and modes of thought. And first, that the Israelites might have a visible assurance of the divine presence in their midst, a sanctuary was to be erected, not according to any model suggested by the people themselves, but according to a divine pattern shown to Moses in the mount. Exodus 25, 9, Hebrews 8, 5. The patriarchs had their pillars of stone, Genesis 28, 18, and 19, or the shade of the consecrated grove, Genesis 21, 33. The Egyptian had his huge colossal temples, built of vast granite blocks or hewn out of solid rock. Not such was to be the sanctuary of Jehovah, amongst a people journeying through a wilderness to a promised land. As the nomad chief had his tent in the midst of his tribe, so Jehovah, as head of the Hebrew pilgrim nation, ordained that a tent or tabernacle should be erected for him, where he might meet and speak to his people, and they might draw nigh to him. I will sanctify, said God, the tabernacle of meeting. There I will meet with, and will dwell among the children of Israel, and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Exodus 29, 42 through 46, and 30, 6 and 36. In the erection of this pavilion temple, 
every member of the nation was invited to take part, and to contribute either the gold and jewels of which the Egyptian had been spoiled, or the arts which, as we have seen, many of the Israelites had learned from them. While, therefore, the superintendence of the work was entrusted to two skillful artificers, Bezal El of the tribe of Judah and Aholiab of the tribe of Dan, Exodus 31, 2 and 6 and 35, 34, many of the congregation contributed offerings of gold and silver and brass, of blue and red and crimson, of fine linen and goatskins, and ramskins dyed red. Others were dispatched in different directions throughout the fertile valley where they were encamped to fell the shita or acacia tree, which grew abundantly in the neighborhood of Sinai, and was exactly adapted by its durability and lightness for the construction of a movable tent. And while the workmen prepared it for its different purposes, the women employed themselves diligently in weaving and spinning blue and crimson hangings, thus consecrating the arts which they had learnt while serving as bond slaves in the houses of the princes of Egypt. Exodus 35, 20-35 A. The area, or court, within which the tabernacle stood, was an oblong square, 100 cubits in length, by 50 in breadth, formed by curtains of fine linen, 5 cubits in height, hanging from pillars of wood, with capitals overlaid with silver, and furnished with sockets of brass. Note, the ordinary cubit was 18 and a quarter English inches. There was a shorter one, 15 inches. The Babylonian cubit was 21 inches. These pillars, 20 on each longer side and 10 on each shorter, were held together by means of silver rods attached by silver hooks and were fastened to the ground by means of pegs of brass. The entrance was from the east, so as to catch the rays of the rising sun. Here the curtains extended only 15 cubits from each corner, and the intervening space with its four pillars formed the entrance, and was overhung with curtains of fine twined linen of the richest and most brilliant colors, blue and purple and scarlet. In a line with the entrance and the tabernacle itself stood A, the altar of burnt sacrifice, and B, the great laver for purification. A, the altar of burnt offering, called in Malachi 1, 7, and 12, the table of the Lord, was in form a square, five cubits long, five broad, and three high, and was constructed of hollow boards of acacia wood overlaid with brass. Exodus 27, 4 and 5. So long as the tabernacle was stationed in any one place, these were probably filled with earth, which thus formed the upper side, or surface, on which the sacrifices were offered. Each corner of the altar was furnished with horns of acacia wood overlaid with brass. To these the victims were fastened, and on them their blood was sprinkled at the consecration of the priests, and the sacrifice of the sin offerings. Psalm eighteen twenty seven, Exodus twenty nine twelve, Leviticus four seven, eighteen and twenty five. From each side projected a horizontal ledge, to the outer edge of which was attached a perpendicular grating of brass, resting like the altar upon the ground, for the purpose of catching any portions of the sacrifice or the fuel that might fall. The ledge on which the priests officiated was approached by a slope of earth for the law forbade the construction of steps leading up to the altar. Exodus 20, 26. The implements used in the sacrifices, such as pans and shovels for collecting and removing the ashes, basins for receiving the blood, flesh hooks for turning the pieces of flesh, were all of brass. Exodus 27, 3. See also 1 Samuel 2, 13 and 14. B. The great laver for purification stood between the altar of burnt offering and the tabernacle. It was made of the brass from the metal mirrors belonging to the women who served at the door of the tabernacle, Exodus 38, 8, and was probably of a circular form standing on a basis or foot. In it the flesh of the victims was washed, as also the hands and feet of the priests, before they performed any holy function. Exodus 30, 18 through 21. B. The tabernacle itself was entered at its eastern side through a magnificent curtain, ten cubits in width, supported on five pillars, Exodus 26. Its dimensions inside were 30 cubits in length, 10 in breadth, and 10 in height. It was formed of planks of acacia wood, overlaid with gold, fixed into the ground by means of two tenons, each fitting into a socket of silver, resembling the sharp end of a spear. At the top they were united by bars of acacia wood, five bars to each piece, passing through golden rings. The roof was formed by several sets of curtains, the innermost, ten in number, 
formed of fine twined linen of various colors, and adorned with cherubic figures of curious workmanship. Next to these were ten curtains of goat's hair, then one of ram's skins with the wool on, dyed red, and lastly another of badgers or more probably seals' skins. The tabernacle consisted of two portions: a the holy place and b the holy of holies. Exodus twenty six thirty three and thirty four, and compare with Hebrews nine two and three. A, the holy place, twenty cubits in length and ten in height and width, was divided from the holy of holies by a veil of the most costly materials and most splendid colors. Without any opening to admit the light from above, it was illumined only by a golden lamp or candlestick with seven lights, fed with pure olive oil, kept burning day and night. And trimmed each morning by a priest with golden snuffers, who carried away the snuff in golden dishes. From the base on which the lamp rested rose a shaft dividing itself on either side into three branches, so that it had seven arms, each adorned with calyxes of almond flowers, apples, and buds of pomegranates or lilies. Exodus twenty-five thirty-one thirty-seven seventeen through twenty-five and Hebrews nine two. Opposite the golden lamp was the table of shewbread, Exodus twenty-five twenty-three through twenty-nine, made of acacia wood, overlaid with gold, two cubits in length, one in breadth, and one and a half in height, and standing on four feet. It had a border to prevent the loaves from falling off, and was furnished with rings and staves for removal. Belonging to it were cups or spoons for incense, bowls for wine, dishes for bringing and removing the loaves, all of gold. These loaves. Also called bread of the face, being set before the face of the Lord, Leviticus twenty-four five through nine, were twelve in number, according to the number of the tribes. Baked to the finest meal, flat and thin, they were placed every Sabbath on the table in two rows, six in each, and sprinkled with incense, and accompanied with libations of wine in the golden bowls. Here they remained till the next Sabbath, when they were taken away and replaced by twelve fresh loaves and eaten by the priests in the holy place, out of which they might not be carried. The frankincense having been burnt as an oblation on the altar of sacrifice, between the table of shewbread and the golden lamp, and immediately before the veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies, was the golden altar of incense. Exodus thirty one through eleven, made of acacia wood. In shape a square, one cubit in length and breadth, and two in height, and ornamented round the middle with a golden wreath, it was furnished like the altar of burnt offering with horns, rings, and staves. But unlike it was wholly overlaid with gold. On it incense, carefully prepared of four different ingredients, Exodus thirty thirty four through thirty eight, was placed by the officiating priest morning and evening with live coals taken from the altar of burnt offering. That the smoke of the incense might perpetually ascend before the Lord. Once a year, its horns were sprinkled with the blood of the sin offering of the atonement, and on no other occasion, except when a sin offering was presented for the high priest or the congregation. B. The holy of holies, separated as we have just said from the holy place by a costly veil supported on a screen of four pillars, formed a perfect cube of ten cubits in length, breadth, and height. While the holy place, though never penetrated by the daylight, was illumined by the splendid golden lamp, the holy of holies was left in utter darkness, symbolical of Him whom no man hath seen nor can see. First Timothy six sixteen. Within this most sacred enclosure, neither priests nor people as a body, but the high priest only, and that but once a year, never entered. Here stood nothing but the ark of the covenant. Exodus twenty five ten through sixteen. This was an oblong chest of acacia wood, overlaid with the purest gold within and without, two and a half cubits in length, one and a half in breadth, one and a half in height. It stood on four small feet, which were provided with four golden rings, through which staves of acacia wood overlaid with gold were passed, and which, when once inserted, were never to be removed. Within it were placed the two stone tables, on both sides of which the decalogue had been inscribed. Round the top ran a crown or wreath of pure gold, and upon it was the mercy seat of the same dimensions as the ark, made not of wood overlaid with gold, but entirely of pure gold. At either end of the mercy seat rose two golden cherubim with outspread wings and faces turned toward each other, and eyes bent downwards as though desirous to look into its mysteries. First Peter one twelve. Neither their size nor their form are distinctly described. 
By some, they are thought to have been handed down by patriarchal tradition from those which were placed in paradise. Genesis 3:24. By others, to have resembled Egyptian models, while Josephus, in Antiquities, Book 3, Chapter 6, Verse 5, declares that they resembled no figures known to men, and that in his day their form was utterly lost. In Ezekiel 50, verses 5 through 13, we find them likened to compound figures with the head of a man, an ox, a lion, and an eagle, with four wings, two serving for flight, two to cover the body, and straight feet inflexible at the knee. It is not improbable that they represent the manifold powers of nature, created life in its highest form, their overshadowing wings meeting as in perfect harmony, their eyes downcast toward the divine law, over which seemingly so rigid and unbending was the compassion of one forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. End of section 19. Recording by Olivia. Section 20. Book 4. Chapter 1. Note of a class book of Old Testament history. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. A class book of Old Testament history by George Frederick McClear. Book 4. Chapter 1. Note. History of the Tabernacle. Such was the pavilion temple which Moses constructed according to the pattern shown to him in the mount. The chief facts connected with its history are as follows. First, during the wanderings in the wilderness, it was the one place where Jehovah met his people, and where, from the ineffable glory above the mercy seat, he revealed his will. There the Spirit came upon the seventy elders, and they prophesied. Numbers 11, 24, 25. Thither Moses and Aaron were summoned on all important occasions, as on that of the rebellion of Miriam, Numbers 12, 4, of the unfaithfulness of the spies, 14, 10, of the rebellion of Korah, 16, 19, of the sin of Mirabah, 26, there on the death of Moses, his successor was solemnly appointed, Deuteronomy 31, 14. 2. During the conquest of Canaan, it was, probably, moved from place to place, wherever the host of Israel was encamped. 3. Afterwards, it was brought to Shiloh, Joshua 9, 27, 18, 1, and 19, 51 on account, doubtless, of its secluded and central position, and as being within the territory of the powerful tribe of Ephraim, to which Joshua belonged, and here it remained during the entire period of the Judges. Compare Joshua 19.51, 22.12, with Judges 21.21. 21. 4. But in the time of Eli, the licentiousness of his sons stained the sanctity of Shiloh, and degraded the tabernacle almost to the level of a heathen temple. 1 Samuel 2.22 while the capture of the ark by the Philistines, 1 Samuel 4.22, still further dimmed its glories, and Samuel himself sacrificed at other places, Mizpah, 1 Samuel 7.9, Ramah, 9.12 and 10.3, and Gilgal, 10.8 and 11.15. 5. After this it was for some time settled at Nob, 1 Samuel 20.1-6, and thither also misfortune followed it. Saul murdered the priests, 1 Samuel 22:11 through 19 and Abiathar fled with the sacred ephod to David 1 Samuel 23:6 In the time of David and Solomon we find it at Gibeon 1 Chronicles 16:39 and 21:29 29, 29. but the ark was now removed to Kirjath Jerim and afterwards on the capture of Jerusalem to that city where a new tabernacle was constructed to receive it 1 Samuel 6:17 1 Chronicles 15:1 its glory now waned more and more. It became connected with the worship of the high places, 1 Kings 3-4, retained only the old altar of burnt offering, 1 Chronicles 21-29, and eventually it seems to have been either taken down or left to be forgotten and vanish away. End of section 20. End of book 4, chapter 1. Recording by Olivia. Book 4, Chapter 2 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 4, Chapter 2 The Priests. Exodus Chapters 28 and 29. Leviticus chapters 8 and 9, Numbers chapters 3 and 4. 
Prior to the Mosaic period, as has been already noticed, the head of each family and the firstborn appear to have exercised all kinds of government, ecclesiastical, as well as civil, being both kings and priests in their own houses. At the departure, however, from Egypt, it was declared that all the firstborn were specially sanctified to God in token of the mercy shown to them there, Exodus 13 verse 2. And when Moses received the divine commands concerning the construction of the tabernacle, it was ordered that from the children of Israel, Aaron and his sons should be specially selected to minister in the priest's office, Exodus 28 verse 1. Subsequently, when the whole tribe of Levi displayed such signal zeal on the occasion of the construction of the golden calf, Exodus 32 verse 26, that tribe was separated for the service of the sanctuary and accepted in the place of the firstborn as the royal guard to wait on Israel's king. Numbers 1 verses 47 to 54, 3 verses 5 to 13. But though the whole tribe was set apart for these important purposes, a strictly prescribed order regulated its particular functions to each branch, of which there were three. A. The Levites. B. The priests. C. The high priest. A. The Levites entered on their duties at the age of 30, Numbers 4, verses 23, 30, and 35, and were consecrated not as the priests by anointing and investiture, but by a ceremony of washing accompanied by sacrifices, after which the elders laid their hands upon them, and Aaron presented them as a wave offering before the Lord, in token that they were offered to the Lord by the congregation for the service of the sanctuary, and handed over by him to the priests. Thus occupying a middle place between the people, who were all ideally a kingdom of priests and the higher sacerdotal orders, they might approach nearer to the tabernacle than the other tribes, but they might not offer sacrifice, nor burn incense, nor handle the holy vessels of the sanctuary till they were concealed from view. Numbers 4 verse 15 The Levites then were the assistants of the priests, and consisted of three families or sections, the sons of Gershon, Kohath, and Mirari. Firstly, the Kohathites held the first rank, as being the family to which Aaron belonged. It was their duty on the removal of the tabernacle to bear all the sacred vessels, including the ark itself, but not before the priests had concealed them from the profane gaze with a dark blue pall. Numbers 3 verse 31, 4 verse 6, 9 and 15, Deuteronomy 31 verse 25. Secondly, the Gershonites were charged with the removal of the curtains, veils and tent hangings, Numbers 4, verses 22 to 26. Thirdly, to the Mirrorites was entrusted the heavier portion of the tabernacle furniture, such as the boards, pillars and bars, and therefore with the Gershonites they were permitted to use the oxen and wagons contributed by the congregation, while the Kohathites were only suffered to remove the sacred vessels on their shoulders, Numbers 7, verses 1 through 9. With this arrangement agreed their position in the encampment in the wilderness. While the place of honour on the east was occupied by the sons of Aaron, the Kohathites were on the south, the Gershonites on the west, the Mirarites on the north. In place of territorial possessions, the Levites received the tithe of the produce of land and cattle, of which they again gave one-tenth to the priests. Numbers 18 verses 24 to 26. At the close of the wanderings, they would need a more fixed abode, and 48 cities with suburbs of pasture land for their flocks and herds were assigned them. Of these, the Levites had 35, Kohath 10, Gershon 13, Merari 12, while the remaining 13, including the six cities of refuge, were assigned to the priests. It was also designed that at the settlement of the nation in the land of promise, their function should be not only diffused as widely as possible, but should include others besides those of merely assisting the priests. They were to take the place of the old household priests, to share in all festivals and rejoicings. Deuteronomy 12, verse 19, 14, verse 26 and 27, 26 and verse 11. To preserve and transcribe the law, Deuteronomy 17 verses 9 to 12, and to read it publicly at the Feast of Tabernacles every seventh year. 
Deuteronomy 31, verses 9 to 13. B. The priests were consecrated to their office with far more imposing ceremonies than the Levites. After laying aside their old garments, they washed their bodies with pure water, were anointed with the holy oil, and then arrayed in their new vestments. Exodus 29, verses 4 to 7. Themselves compassed about with infirmity, they needed to offer up sacrifice first for their own sins before they could intercede for others. Hebrews 5, verse 2, 7, verse 27. On the head, therefore, of a bullock, they solemnly laid their hands, and thus symbolically transferred to it the guilt that clung to themselves. Then, in token of their entire devotion to their solemn calling, a ram was slain as a burnt offering, and its blood sprinkled on the altar. Exodus 29, verses 10 to 18, Leviticus 8, verses 18 and 19. Another ram was next slain as a peace offering, and some of its blood was smeared on the tip of the right ear, the thumb of the right hand, the great toe of the right foot, in token of their intention to devote every member to the service of Jehovah. And finally, as they were not only to intercede for the guilt of the people, but to offer their praises and thanksgiving, sacrificial cakes of unleavened bread with portions of the sacrifice were placed in their hands, and these were waved before the Lord. Exodus 29 verses 19 to 24. The vestments they wore during their ministrations consisted of fine linen drawers, and over these a closely fitting tunic or cassock, white, woven whole in one piece, embroidered, reaching to the feet. This was confined round the waist by a girdle wrought with needlework, exhibiting the three sacred colours, blue, purple and scarlet, intermingled with white. Upon their heads they wore a linen tiara in the form of the calyx of a flower, In all their ministrations they seem to have been barefooted. Certain qualifications were essential before they could enter on the discharge of their duties. As the victim was required to be without blemish, so also was the sacrificer. And in Leviticus 21 verses 17 to 21, the defects are enumerated, which excluded from the priestly office. During their period of ministration, they might drink neither wine nor strong drink. Leviticus 10 verse 9. Except in the case of the nearest relatives, they might make no mourning for the dead, Leviticus 21 verses 1 to 5, or shave their heads, or, like the priests of heathen nations, make cuttings in their flesh, or otherwise mutilate themselves, Leviticus 19 verse 28, 1 Kings 18 verse 28. They were permitted to marry, but might not ally themselves with one of an alien race, or an unchaste woman, or one who had been divorced, or the widow of anyone but a priest. Leviticus 21, verses 7 and 14. Their duties were to keep the fire ever burning on the altar of burnt offering both day and night. Leviticus 6, verse 12. To trim and feed with oil the golden lamp. Exodus 27, verses 20 and 21. To offer morning and evening the regulated sacrifices at the door of the tabernacle. Exodus 29, verses 38 to 44 to lay the fresh shoe bread on the table every seventh day, Leviticus 24, verse 8, to blow the silver trumpets and proclaim all solemn days, Numbers 10, verses 1 to 10, to examine the lepers and pronounce whether they were clean or unclean, Leviticus 8, to act as judges and expositors of the law and teach the people the statutes of the Lord, Leviticus 10, verse 11, Deuteronomy 33, verse 10. A distinct provision was made for their support, and consisted of, firstly, one-tenth of the tithes of the whole produce of the country paid to the Levites, Numbers 18, verses 21 and 26. Secondly, the loaves of shoe bread, Leviticus 24, verse 9. Thirdly, the first fruits of oil, wine and corn, Numbers 18, verse 12. Fourthly, the redemption money for the firstborn of man or beast, five shekels a head, and also for everything devoted. Numbers 18, verses 14 and 15. Fifthly, the prerequisites of the sacrifices, the flesh of the burnt offerings, peace offerings, and trespass offerings, and especially the heave shoulder and the wave breast. Numbers 18, verses 8 to 14. Leviticus 10, verses 12 to 15. Sixthly, a fixed portion of the spoils taken in war. Numbers 31, verses 25 to 47. C. 
The office of high priest was conferred first on Aaron, then on his son Eleazar and his descendants. At some period before the time of Eli, the succession passed to the line of Ithamar, and there continued till the time of Solomon, in whose reign it reverted to the line of Eleazar. 1 Samuel 2 verses 35, 1 Kings 2 verse 35. The same ceremonies accompanied the consecration of the high priest as that of the priest, save that the anointing, which in the latter appears to have been confined to the sprinkling of their garments with the sacred oil, was more copious in his case, and the oil was poured upon his head. Leviticus 8 verse 12, Psalms 133 verse 2. The vestments of the high priest were far more rich and splendid than those of the priests. Like the latter, he wore the linen drawers, but in place of the closely fitting tunic, he wore the robe of the ephod, which was all blue, of woven work, without sleeves, reaching down to the feet, and drawn over the head through an opening, which was fringed with a border of woven work to prevent its rending. The skirt of this robe was set with a trimming of pomegranates of the three sacred colours, blue, crimson and purple, with a golden bell between each pomegranate, designed to give forth a tinkling sound as he went in and out of the holy place. Immediately above this robe was the ephod itself, a short cloak consisting of two parts, one covering the back and the other the breast and upper part of the body, wrought with colours and gold. The two halves were united on the shoulder with two onyx stones, on each of which were engraved the names of six of the tribes. It was gathered round the waist by a curious girdle of fine twined linen, adorned with gold, blue, purple and scarlet. Just above the girdle, and attached to the ephod by rings and ribbons of blue, was the breastplate, or the breastplate of judgment. This, like the ephod, was of cunning work, a square of a span breadth, formed double so as to make a bag, set with twelve precious stones in four rows, each engraved with the name of one of the tribes. Within the breastplate was the Urim and the Thummim, light and perfection, Exodus 28, verses 15 to 30. Not a word in scripture explains the meaning of these mysterious objects, but they were certainly employed in some way now unknown for ascertaining the divine will. Compare 1 Samuel 28, verse 6, Judges 1 verse 1, 20 verse 18, 1 Samuel 14 verses 3 and 18, 23 verse 9, 2 Samuel 21 verse 1. Some identify them with the twelve stones inscribed with the names of the twelve tribes, and suppose that the illumination, simultaneous or successive, of the letters guided the high priest to the answer. Others think that within the breastplate was a stone or a plate of gold inscribed with the name of Jehovah, and that by means of this he was enabled to discern the divine voice as it proceeded from the glories of the Shekinah. Like the other members of the order, the high priest wore on his head a tiara, but attached to this by a blue ribbon was a gold plate, on which was engraved, Holiness to the Lord. Exodus 28 verses 36 to 39, 39 verse 30. Some of the functions of the high priest were peculiar, Firstly, to him alone it appertained to enter the Holy of Holies on one day in the year, the Day of Atonement, to sprinkle the blood of the sin offering on the mercy seat and burn incense within the veil. Leviticus chapter 16. On this occasion he did not wear his full pontifical dress, but was arrayed entirely in fine white linen. Leviticus 16 verses 4 and 32. A custom which afterwards seems to have undergone some change. Secondly, to him alone it belonged to consult the divine oracle, Numbers 27 verse 21, and preside over the court of judgment, Deuteronomy 17 verse 9. Thirdly, even greater purity and blamelessness was required of him than of the other priests. He could marry none but a virgin in the first freshness of her youth, Leviticus 21 verse 13. And as illegitimacy was an absolute bar to the office, the importance attached to genealogies was great, and in these the name of the mother as well as father was registered. The office lasted for life, but does not seem to have had any peculiar emoluments attached to it over and above those enjoyed by the priests. End of Book 4, Chapter 2 Recording by Cliffstone of Sydney, Australia
Book 4, Chapter 3 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 4, Chapter 3, The Sacrifices and Offerings. Exodus chapters 29 and 30, Leviticus chapters 1 through 6, and Numbers chapter 15. The rite of sacrifice, so universal in the ancient world, came down to the Israelites from the earliest times, from the days of their forefathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the generations that lived before the flood, and was regulated by Moses with the utmost precision. One rule applied to all sacrifices. They could only be offered on the great brazen altar of the tabernacle. To offer them on high places or spots selected by the caprice of the worshipper was expressly forbidden. Leviticus 17 verse 4, Deuteronomy 12 verses 13 and 14, though this rule appears to have been subsequently relaxed in the case of the prophets. 1 Samuel 8 verses 8 to 14, 16 verses 1 through 5, 1 Kings 18 verses 21 to 40. Perhaps the simplest classification of sacrifices is that which arranges them under the heads of 1. Those offered without, and 2. Those offered with blood. 1. Unbloody sacrifices will include a. First fruits and tithes, b. Meat and drink offerings, c. Incense. a. First fruits and tithes were presented by every Israelite to the priests in token of gratitude and humble thankfulness to Jehovah, and consisted of the produce of the land, either in its natural state, as grain, fruit, grapes, wool, or prepared for human use, as meal, oil, new wine. Exodus 23 verse 19, Numbers 18 verse 12, Deuteronomy 18 verse 4. To the Levites also was paid the tenth part of all produce of the land and of cattle. Leviticus 27 verses 30 to 33, Numbers 18 verses 21 to 24. B. Meat and drink offerings generally accompanied each other. The meat offering was composed of fine flour seasoned with salt and mingled with frankincense and oil, but without leaven. A portion of the flour and oil the priest placed upon the altar, together with all the frankincense, and there burnt them, the rest of the flour and oil becoming his own perquisite. Sometimes cakes of fine flour were offered with oil and salt, but without leaven or honey. Leviticus 2 and 6 verses 14 to 23. A drink offering consisted of wine, which was poured at the foot of the altar, the quantity varying according to the victim, being for a lamb or kid a quarter of a hin, it was one gallon, two pints, for a ram, one third, for a bullock, one half, numbers 15 verses 5, 7 and 10, 28 verse 14. By these offerings, as by those of tithes and first fruits, the Israelite acknowledged the undeserved bounty of Jehovah and dedicated to him the best of his gifts. Flour, the staff of life, wine, the symbol of strengthening and refreshing, oil, the symbol of richness. Compare Psalms 104 verse 15. The meat offering might be presented either 1. By itself as a free will offering, as in the instance of firstly the twelve unleavened cakes on the table of shewbread, secondly the sheaf of the first fruits of barley on the second day of the Passover, thirdly the two wheaten loaves at Pentecost, or two, together with the burnt and thank offering but not with the sin or trespass offering as one of public sacrifices, with firstly the daily morning and evening sacrifice, secondly the Sabbath offering, Thirdly, the offering at the new moon. Fourthly, on the great day of atonement. Two, of private sacrifices. And firstly, the consecration of priests and Levites. Secondly, the cleansing of the leper. Thirdly, the termination of the Nazarite vow. C. Incense, the last example of an unbloody offering, accompanied every proper meat offering, but was also offered daily on the golden altar in the holy place and on the great day of atonement was burnt in the holy of holies by the high priest before the ark. The greatest pains were taken in its preparation. It was compounded 
by the art of the apocathery of four ingredients beaten small, stakti, onica, galbanum, and pure frankincense, Exodus 30, verses 34 to 36, nor could any other kind be offered, Exodus 30, verse 9. Desecration of this incense by using it for common purposes was to be punished with death, Exodus 30, verse 38. 2. In reference to the second class of sacrifices, in which the life of a victim was taken and its blood poured upon the altar, it is to be observed that these were limited to the herd, the flock, and all clean birds. All wild and unclean beasts were strictly excluded. The Israelite was to select only those animals which were most nearly connected with man, and of these, again, such as were most meek, innocent, pure, and valuable, such as oxen, sheep, goats, pigeons, and turtle doves. The selected victim was required to be perfect of its kind and without blemish, not less than eight days old and usually a year. If it was blind or broken or maimed or had any defect as a wen or scab, it could not be offered. Leviticus 22 verses 20 to 27, Deuteronomy 15 verses 21 and 22, 17 verse 1. Such being the conditions respecting the victim, the offerer was required first to purify himself by ablutions and then to bring the victim to the door of the tabernacle, that is, to the great brazen altar of burnt offering in the court. There, whatever might be the precise kind of offering, he was to lay his hand on its head in token of surrender, dedication and substitution, and then to slay it himself. Leviticus 1 verse 5 He had now performed his part. All the rest devolved upon the priest. He began by receiving the blood of the animal in a vessel, and then sprinkled it in different ways upon the brazen altar. Leviticus 4, verses 6, 7, and 25, 5, verse 9, or as we shall see in some cases on the golden altar of incense, and on one day in the year on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. He then performed other ceremonies, which varied according to the nature of the sacrifice but uniformly it was required a of the offerer, firstly to bring his victim to the altar, secondly to lay his hand upon it, and thirdly to slay it, b of the priest, firstly to receive the blood in a vessel, and secondly to sprinkle it upon the altar. Of the bloody sacrifices the chief were a burnt offerings, b peace offerings, c sin and trespass offerings. A. In the case of the burnt offering, any kind of animal fit for sacrifice might be offered, but the victim was always required to be a male and to be accompanied by a meat offering. After presentation at the great altar, imposition of the hands of the sacrificer and slaughtering, the priest sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. Leviticus 1 verses 5 and 11. The victim was then flayed, washed with water and cut in pieces, and the parts thus divided were laid on the altar upon the wood and entirely consumed by fire. The burning by fire was the chief point in this class of offering, and marked it as an expression of perpetual obligation to complete, sanctified, self-surrender to Jehovah. Hence it was not presented like the sin and trespass offerings upon the commission of any particular sin, nor like the peace offerings upon the acceptance of any special divine mercies, It embodied the general idea of sacrifice and in a sense represented the whole sacrificial institute. Every morning and evening, therefore, a lamb was sacrificed with its usual meat and drink offering as a burnt offering on behalf of the whole covenant people. And the evening victim was to be so slowly consumed that it might last till the morning, an expressive symbol of that continual self-dedication to God which is the duty of man. Exodus 29, verses 38 to 44, Leviticus 6, verses 9 to 13. B. Of peace offerings, there were three kinds, representing various emotions of the offerer, the thank offering, the free will gift, and the vow. Leviticus 3, verses 1 to 17, 7, verses 11 to 21, verses 28 to 36. The nature of the offering was left to the sacrificer, It might be taken from the herd or from the flock, might be male or female, but not birds. Leviticus 3 verse 1. 
Like the burnt offering, it was always accompanied by a meat offering, which consisted of unleavened cakes mingled with oil and leavened bread. Leviticus 7 verses 12 and 13. The ritual of the peace offering was up to a certain point the same as that of the burnt offering. The sacrificer brought his victim to the brazen altar, laid his hands upon it and slew it, while the priest sprinkled the blood upon the altar. But after this there was a distinction. The victim was divided, and the priest laid upon the altar the fat of the kidneys and the lobe or flap of the liver, and in the case of a sheep, the fat tail, and burnt them with fire. He then separated the right shoulder and breast, and waved them before the Lord. They became his portion, which he was to eat in a clean place with his family and friends. The remaining portions of the victim were then restored to the sacrificer, who the same day feasted thereon, together with his whole family and his friends. Leviticus 7 verses 15 to 21, 19 verse 6, 22 verse 30. This sacrificial feast was peculiar to the peace offerings and indicated that the atonement was complete, that the sin was covered and cancelled which had separated the offerer from Jehovah, who now welcomed him to his table and in his meal gave him a pledge of reconciliation. To an oriental mind, two ideas were inseparably united in the notion of a meal. On the one hand, that of fellowship and friendship existing among the participators themselves and also between them and the provider of the meal. And on the other hand, that of joy and gladness, so that even the highest and purest joy, viz. blessedness in the kingdom of heaven, is described under the figure of a meal. Psalms 23 verse 5, 36 verse 8, Matthew 8 verse 11, 22 verses 2 to 13, Luke 14 verse 16. As the total consumption by fire on the altar was the culminating point in the burnt offering, so this sacrificial feast was that of the peace offering, which therefore, whenever presented with other offerings, was invariably the last. Compare Exodus 24 verse 5 and 11, 29 verses 1 to 32. C. The sin and trespass offerings were peculiar to the Mosaic law, which was added on account of transgression. Galatians 3 verse 19, and deepened the knowledge and conviction of sin. Romans 7 verse 7, etc. A. The sin offering consisted of one animal only, and was not accompanied by a meat offering. The victim, if offered for the whole covenant people, was a kid of the goats. Leviticus 16 verses 5, 9 and 15, Numbers 28 verses 15, 22 and 30. For the priests and Levites at their consecration, a young bullock, Exodus 29 verse 11, Numbers 8 verse 8 and following. For the high priest on the great day of atonement, a young bullock, Leviticus 16 verses 3 and 6 and 11. For the purification of women after childbirth, a young pigeon or turtle dove, Leviticus 12 verses 6 and 8. Compare Luke 2 verses 22 and 24. For the cleansing of a leper or a leprous house, a yearling ewe, or, in a case of poverty, a bird for the leper and two for the house. Leviticus 14, verse 13, verse 22 to 49. For an inadvertent transgression of some prohibition, a, on the part of the whole congregation or the high priest, a young bullock, b, a prince, a he-goat, c, a common man, a yearling ewe or kid. Leviticus 4, verses 1 to 35. The ritual of the sin offering deserves attention. The offerer brought the victim to the great altar, laid his hand upon it with a confession of the sin and a prayer for its expiation, and then slew it. The priest then dipped his finger in the blood, and in the case of a prince or individual, sprinkled it seven times on the horns of the brazen altar. Leviticus 4, verse 7, 18, 30, 34. In that of the high priest and congregation, seven times on the veil before the ark, and seven times on the horns of the golden altar of incense. Leviticus 4, verses 6, 17, and 25. On the great day of atonement, the high priest himself sprinkled it seven times on and before the mercy seat, and then seven times streaked with it the horns of the altar of incense. Leviticus 16, verses 14, 15, and 19. The rest of the blood was poured on the ground before the brazen altar.
After the sprinkling, the same portions were burnt on the altar, as in the case of the peace offerings, and in ordinary cases, the rest of the victim was eaten by the priest in the court of the tabernacle with only the males of his family. But any vessels in which the flesh had been boiled were required, if earthenware, to be broken, if metal, to be carefully scoured. Leviticus 6 verses 24 to 30 But in the case of the more important sin offerings, where the blood was sprinkled within the holy place, or the holy of holies, the entire carcass, except the altarpieces, with the hide, entrails, etc., was conveyed to a clean place without the camp, and there burnt with fire. Leviticus 4, verses 11, 12, and 21, 16, verse 27. Except when offered for the whole people, or the priests and Levites at their consecration, sin offerings were presented as an atonement for sins of culpable weakness and ignorance, negligence and frailty, repented of by the unpunished offender, who was thus restored to his place in the commonwealth. They could not be offered for presumptuous or deliberate and unrepented sins, such as willful murder or adultery, for which the punishment of death was appointed. Numbers 15 verses 30 and 31, Deuteronomy 17 verse 12, and compare Hebrews 10 verse 26. B. The trespass or debt offering, on the other hand, Though closely connected with the sin offering and sometimes offered with it, as in the case of the leper, Leviticus 14 verse 12, was always offered for some special act of sin and was regarded in the light of reparation to the Lord for a wrong done to him. Hence it was presented for sins in which the offence given or the debt incurred by the misdeed admitted of some sort of recompense which could be actually estimated. The following cases will illustrate the occasions on which a trespass offering could be presented. A leper, on the occasion of his cleansing, owed a debt offering to Jehovah for the time of his exclusion from the camp. The Nazarite for a temporary suspension of his vow by touching a dead body. Numbers 6 verse 12. A man who had inadvertently appropriated or made away with anything consecrated to the Lord. Leviticus 5 verses 15 and 16 or unwittingly violated a divine prohibition, Leviticus 5, verse 17 and 18, or denied a trust or any damage sustained by the thing entrusted, or denied having found some lost article of property, or sworn falsely in such a matter, Leviticus 6, verse 2 and following. In these cases, whether the wrong done was in a matter of property or to the Lord, the damage was made good with an overplus, generally a fifth of the value, while the trespass offering itself was the substitute for the damages due to the Lord and assessed by the priest. The victim was, as in the case of the sin offering, one animal only and always a ram. End of Book 4, Chapter 3 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 4, Chapter 4 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick MacLear. Book 4, Chapter 4, Holy Times and Seasons. Exodus, Chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 23 and chapter 25, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 16. The holy times and seasons of the Israelites may be arranged under three heads. 1. Those that were connected with the seventh day of rest, such as a. The weekly Sabbath, b. The month Sabbath or new moon, c. The year Sabbath, d. The year of Jubilee, 2. The day of atonement, 3. The Great Historical Festivals A. The Passover B. The Feast of Pentecost, or Weeks C. The Feast of Tabernacles First, those connected with the seventh day of rest A. The observance of the weekly Sabbath, or day of rest, is not improbably thought to have been known to the Israelites before the giving of the law Exodus sixteen twenty two and 23 As indeed... The words of the fourth commandment, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, seem to imply Exodus 22, 8-11, 
compare with Genesis 2, 1 through 3. The observance of this day was appointed for a perpetual covenant as a sign between God and the children of Israel forever. Exodus 31, 16 and 17. It was to be shared by the whole people with the stranger and, to complete the picture of tranquility, with the animals. Bodily labor was strictly prohibited. It was unlawful to kindle a fire for cooking food, Exodus 35, 3, Numbers 15, 32, or to go out of the camp to gather manna, Exodus 16, 22 through 30. Willful desecration of the day was punished by stoning, Exodus 31, 14, Numbers 15, 35. In the tabernacle service, the daily burnt offering was doubled, Numbers 28, 9. The shewbread was renewed, Leviticus 24, 8, and the priestly course for the week commenced their duties. The Sabbath was not regarded as a fast, but a day for rest from worldly occupation and holy joy. It was ordained by God for man and the furtherance of his truest and highest interests. Mark 2, 27 and 28. Quote, the thought of him who is raised above all change and who after the completion of the works of creation rejoiced that everything was very good, this, coupled with the cessation of work, was to lead man up to the contemplation of his own origin from God. As the bodily refreshment restored his physical energies, so should the consciousness of union with the Almighty and the Eternal restore the true life to the soul. End quote. Von Gerlach on the Pentateuch. B. The month Sabbath, or New Moon Festival, was ushered in by blowing with the silver trumpets and by the sacrifice of eleven victims in addition to the daily offering, Numbers 10, 10, 28, 11, and forward. Businesses and trade were in later times suspended. Amos 8, 5. Sacrificial feasts were held. 1 Samuel 20, 5 through 24. And the people resorted to the prophets for religious instruction. 2 Kings 4, 23. The new moon festival of the seventh month, Tisri, October, being the commencement of the civil year, was observed with still greater solemnity. It was one of the seven days of holy convocation. Not merely were the trumpets blown at the time of offering the sacrifices, but it was a day for the blowing of the trumpets, Numbers 29, 1 through 6, whence its name, the Feast of Trumpets. In addition to the daily sacrifices and the eleven victims offered on the first day of each month, nine other victims were offered as burnt offerings with a kid for a sin offering. C. During the seventh or sabbatical year, the land was to lie fallow and enjoy her Sabbaths, Exodus 23.10 and 11, Leviticus 25.2-7, through 7, Deuteronomy 15. No tillage or cultivation of any sort was to be practiced, and the spontaneous produce of the fields, instead of being reaped, was to be freely gleaned by the poor, the stranger, and even the cattle. By this rest, the land, like man, was to do homage to its Lord and Creator, and the poor were to share without stint in those spontaneous blessings which by his will it brings forth. And the Israelite, who every seventh day acknowledged God's claim on his time, thus acknowledged also his claim upon his land. In Deuteronomy 15, we find that the seventh year was also to be one of release for debtors. In spite of the threatenings in Leviticus 26, the sabbatical year, as appears from Second Chronicles 36, verses 20 and 21, was greatly neglected. After the return from the captivity, its observance revived. See 1 Maccabees 6, 49. D. The year of Jubilee. At the end of seven times seven years, that is, forty-nine entire years, the fiftieth was observed as the year of Jubilee, a word of uncertain meaning. It was proclaimed by the sound of trumpets on the tenth day of the seventh month, Tisri, the Day of Atonement. During this year, the soil was to lie fallow, as in the sabbatical year, but in addition to this, all land that had been alienated was to return to those to whom it had been allotted at the original distribution, and all bondmen of Hebrew blood were to be liberated. Leviticus 25, 8-16, through 23-35, through 35, and 27, 16-25. Quote, as the weekly Sabbath and the sabbatical year was intended to restore through rest to man and to the land, so the year of Jubilee was designed to raise the whole people, in respect to their rights and possessions, from the changeableness of outward circumstances to the unchangeableness of the divine appointment, to prevent the inordinate accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few, to relieve those to whom misfortune or fault had reduced to poverty, 
to restore that equality in outward circumstances which was instituted on the first settlement of the land by Joshua, and to vindicate the right of each Israelite to his part in the covenant which God had made with his fathers respecting the land of promise. End quote. Von Gerlach on the Pentateuch. 2. The Day of Atonement was observed on the tenth day of the seventh month, Tisri, as the great day of national humiliation, and for the expiation of the sins both of the priests and the people. This was the highest, the most perfect, the most comprehensive of all acts of expiation, and not only took place but once in the entire year, but was performed by the high priest alone, and not in the holy place, but the holy of holies. Its celebration is prescribed in Leviticus chapter 16 and 23, verses 26 through 32, Numbers chapter 29, verses 7 through 11. The day was to be regarded as a high Sabbath, a day of holy convocation, on which the Israelites, under pain of extirpation, were expected to afflict their souls with fasting and mourning. Compare Leviticus 16, 29, and 31 with Acts 27, 9. The ritual was as follows. The high priest, having bathed, arrayed himself not in his gorgeous robes, but in the white linen garments common to himself and the rest of the priesthood. As a sacrifice for himself and the priests, he brought a bullock for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, which he had purchased at his own cost. As a sacrifice for the people, two he-goats for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, which were purchased out of the public treasury. The two he-goats he then brought to the door of the tabernacle, that is, to the brazen altar, and there, having presented them before the Lord, cast two lots upon them, one inscribed for Jehovah, the other for Azazel. This done as the head of the priesthood itself, compassed with infirmity. Hebrews 5, 2. He first proceeded to make atonement for his own order. Accordingly, he slew the bullock, and taking a censer filled with live coals from the altar of burnt offering and two handfuls of incense, he passed with these through the holy place onwards behind the veil into the holy of holies, and there threw the incense upon the coals so that the fragrant cloud might envelop the mercy seat. Then, returning to the brazen altar and taking some of the blood of the bullock in a vessel, he once more passed into the holy of holies and sprinkled it seven times before the mercy seat, the seat of the glory of Jehovah. Having thus made expiation for himself and his own order, he slew the goat upon which the lot for Jehovah had fallen, as a sin offering for the people, and sprinkled its blood as he had done that of the bullock. Then, on his return from the Holy of Holies, he purified the holy place, now solitary and deserted, by sprinkling the blood of both victims seven times on the horns of the golden altar of incense, and, as some think, on those of the altar of burnt offering. The purification of the tabernacle completed, he came forth and laid both his hands upon the goat, on which the lot for Azazel, had fallen, solemnly confessed over it the sins of the people, and then gave it to a man, chosen for the purpose, to be led away into the wilderness, into a place not inhabited, and there let loose. This done, he once more entered the tabernacle, bathed, and having arrayed himself in his gorgeous robes, offered the two rams as a burnt offering, one for himself, the other for the people, and at the same time placed upon the altar the fat of the two sin offerings. While these were consuming, the remains of the victims were conveyed outside the camp, nor could they who were deputed for this office, or the man who had led away the scapegoat, return into the camp until they had purified themselves and their clothes with water. The distinction between this solemnity and others is very striking. It took place but once a year, five days before the joyous Feast of Tabernacles, which testified the nation's gratitude for the preservation of the seasonable fruits of the earth. In it the high priest alone officiated." clad not in his gorgeous robes, but in the simple, pure white robes common to him and the rest of the priesthood. He made expiation for himself, his order, and the people, an atonement for the sins of the whole year. On this day, and this day only, he entered within the veil and sprinkled the blood before the mercy seat seven times. On this day, and this day only, the idea of the remission of sin found its highest expression in the sacrifice of one goat as a sin offering to Jehovah, and the solemn confession of the sins of the whole people over another, and its dismissal laden with its awful typical burden, into a far distant and separated land, a land not inhabited, lying, as it were, under the curse of Jehovah. This solemnity contained the exact antidote to the somber and often cruel rites of heathenism. The lots were cast over both the goats. Both were presented to Jehovah at the door of the tabernacle, 
At his command, the scapegoat carried away the burden of the people's sins into an unknown desert land. He sanctified the people and accepted the atonement for the high priest, the priestly order, and the entire nation, and the purification of the place where he had condescended to meet the Israelites. In the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapters 9 and 10, we have the key to the expressive imagery of this great day in the Jewish year. The fact that once in the year the high priest could enter within the veil intimated that under a system of provisional and typical ordinances, the way into the holiest of all was not as yet made manifest. But when the true high priest, even Jesus Christ, offered himself unto death on the altar of his cross for the sins of the whole world, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one, Mark fifteen thirty-eight. He died, he rose again, and clad not in the resplendent robes of that divine nature he had before the world, but in the garb of our human nature, he ascended into the heavenly sanctuary, the antitype of the Jewish sanctuary on earth, and there pleads, and will forever plead, the merits of his blood before the throne of God. End of section 19. End of book 4, chapter 1. Book 4, chapter 5 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick MacLear. Book 4, Chapter 5. The Great Festivals. Exodus 23, verses 14 through 17. Leviticus 23, 1 through 22. Numbers 28, 16 through 31. And Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 16. The great historical festivals at which all males amongst the Israelites were required to appear before the Lord were, as has been said already, 1. The Passover, 2. The Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, and 3. The Feast of Tabernacles. 1. The Passover. The original institution of this festival has been already noticed. The directions for its yearly celebration are given in Exodus 23, verses 14 through 17, Leviticus 23, 5 through 8, Numbers 28, 16 through 25, and Deuteronomy 16, verses 1 through 8. As in Egypt, so now, on the tenth day of Nisan, or Aviv, corresponding to the close of March, or the beginning of April, each paschal company, which might not exceed twenty or be less than ten, was to select a lamb or kid, a male, of the first year, and keep it till the fourteenth day. If pronounced by the priest to be free from blemish, it was to be slain between the evenings in the court of the tabernacle, and its blood poured round the altar of burnt offering. It was then, after being flayed, to be taken to the house where the paschal company intended to assemble, to be roasted with fire, whole and entire, without the breaking of a single bone, and to be eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The festival lasted from the 14th to the 21st of Nisan, and during this period nothing but unleavened bread might be eaten, and all leaven was to be carefully removed from the house before the 14th. The daily sacrifices for the nation consisted of, one, a burnt offering of two bullocks, one ram, seven yearling lambs, accompanied by the usual meat offering, and two, one goat for a sin offering. Thank offerings, called by the Jews Hagiga, might also be offered by individuals during the festival, especially on the 15th, the first day of Holy Convocation. Compare Leviticus 7, verses 29 through 34, Second Chronicles 30, verses 22 through 44, and Second Chronicles 35, verse 7. On the 16th, the first ripe sheaf of barley was to be brought into the sanctuary, and there waved by the priests before the Lord, and at the same time a yearling lamb was offered with a meat and drink offering. See Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14. Till this sheaf had thus been waved, and this offering presented, no produce of the now ripening harvest, whether bread or parched corn or green ears, might be eaten. Joshua 5, verses 11 and 12. 2. At the end of seven complete weeks from the 16th of Nisan, the second day of unleavened bread, commenced the Feast of Weeks, Exodus 34, verse 22, and Deuteronomy 16, verse 10, or of harvest, Exodus 23, verse 16, 
or of first fruits, Numbers 28, verse 26, or of Pentecost, Acts 2, verse 1, from the Greek word for the 50th day. The passages bearing on it will be found in Exodus 23, verse 16, Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 22, Numbers 28, verses 26 through 31, and Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12. The festival lasted but one day, which was kept with a holy convocation. Its distinguishing feature was the offering of two leavened loaves made from the new corn of the now completed harvest, which together with two lambs as a burnt offering were waved before the Lord. The special sacrifices in addition to the daily offering were one young bullock, two rams, and seven yearling lambs as a burnt offering with the usual meat and drink offering and a goat for a sin offering. But thank offerings might, as at the Passover, be made at pleasure by individuals. The character of the festival was preeminently an expression of gratitude for the harvest, which commenced with the offering of the first sheaf of ripe barley at the Passover, and ended with that of the two loaves now presented and made of the newly ripened wheat. In its festive joy, the manservant and maidservant, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow were to share with the freeborn Israelite, who was to be reminded of the bondage in Egypt and his obligation to keep the law. Deuteronomy 16, verse 12. 3. The Feast of Tabernacles, or of Ingathering, Exodus 34, verse 22, was so called as being, one, a feast of thanksgiving for the completion of the ingathering of fruits and of the vintage, and two, as commemorating the dwelling of the Israelites in tents during their wanderings in the wilderness. Leviticus 23, verse 43. The chief passages relating to it are Exodus 23, verse 16, Leviticus 23, verses 34 through 43, Numbers 29, verses 13 through 39, Deuteronomy 16, verses 13 through 15, and compare with these Nehemiah 8. It was celebrated in the autumn on the 15th of the seventh month Tishri and lasted seven days, of which the first and the last were days of holy convocation. It was the most joyous of all the festivals. During it, the Israelites were commanded to live in tents or booths of green boughs of the olive, palm, pine, myrtle, and other trees with thick foliage. Nehemiah 8 verses 15 and 16. The burnt offerings were more numerous at this feast than any other, including, besides the sacrifice on each day of two rams, fourteen lambs, and a kid for a sin offering, that of seventy bullocks, thirteen on the first day, twelve on the second, and so on to the seventh, when seven bullocks only were offered. If the festival fell on a sabbatical year, portions of the law, chiefly Deuteronomy, were read each day in public. Deuteronomy 31, verses 10 through 12, and Nehemiah 8, verse 18. The most remarkable celebrations of this feast were, one, at the dedication of Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 8, verses 2 and 65, and two, after the captivity, Ezra 3, verse 4, and Nehemiah 8, verse 17. Later festivals were, one, the Feast of Purim, or Lots, instituted by Mordecai to commemorate the defeat of Haman's machination against the Jews, Esther 3, verses 7 through 15, and 9, 24 through 26. It began on the 14th day of the 12th month Adar, and lasted two days. Two, the Feast of Dedication, to commemorate the cleansing of the temple after its defilement by Antiochus Epiphanes, Daniel 11, verse 31. Established by Judas Maccabeus, it was kept on the 25th of the winter month Chislu, December, John 10, verse 22, and lasted eight days, being distinguished by the offering of many sacrifices, a general illumination, hence its name, the Feast of Lights, and other rejoicings. In scripture, dates are often fixed by a reference to the seasons or productions, Numbers 13, 20, and 2 Samuel 21, 9. The following table, therefore, is here given, in which the civil and sacred months, their approximate English equivalents, the various annual feasts, and the chief features of the seasons are combined. It is assumed that Aviv, or Nisan, answers to April. See article month in Smith's Bible Dictionary and Angus's Bible Handbook, page 270. Calendar chart. First month of the sacred year, seventh month of the civil year. Aviv, or Nisan, which means green ears, 30 days, 
Exodus 12, verse 2. Approximately April. Passover celebrated on the 14th. First fruits of barley harvest presented on the 16th. Fall of the latter or spring rain. Deuteronomy 11, 14. Floods. Joshua 3, 14. Harvest. Barley ripe at Jericho. Wheat partially in the air. Second sacred month. Eighth civil month. Ziph, which means blossom. 29 days. First Kings 6, verse 1. Approximately May. Second Passover for those who could not keep the first celebrated on the 14th. Numbers 9, verses 10 and 11. Barley harvest general. Ruth 1, 22. Wheat ripens. Third sacred month. Ninth civil month. Sivan. 30 days. Esther 8, verse 9. Approximately June. Pentecost or Feast of Weeks celebrated on the 6th. Wheat harvest. Summer begins. No rain from April to September. 1 Samuel 12, 17. Fourth sacred month. Tenth civil month. Thamuz. 29 days. Zechariah eight nineteen. Approximately July. No festivals. Hot season. Heat increases. Fifth sacred month. 11th civil month. Ab. 30 days. Esther 7, 9. Approximately August. No festivals. The streams dry up. Heat intense. Vintage. Leviticus 26, 5. Sixth sacred month. 12th civil month. Elul. 29 days. Nehemiah 6, 15. Approximately September. No festivals. Heat still intense. Second Kings 4, verses 18 through 20. Grape harvest general. Numbers 13, 23. Seventh sacred month. First civil month. Tishri or Ethanim. 30 days. First Kings 8, 2 and Second Chronicles 5, 3. Approximately October. Feast of trumpets celebrated on the first. Day of atonement celebrated on the 10th. Feast of tabernacles. First fruits of oil and wine celebrated on the 15th. Leviticus 23, 39. Seed time. Former or early rains begin. Joel 2, 23. Plowing and sowing begins. Eighth sacred month. Second civil month. Bool, which means rain. 29 days. First Kings 6, 38. Approximately November. No festivals. Rain continues. Wheat and barley sown. Vintage in North Palestine. Ninth sacred month. Third civil month, Chislu, 30 days, Nehemiah 1, 1, approximately December. Feast of dedication celebrated on the 25th, 1st Maccabees 4, 52 through 59. Winter, winter begins, snow on the mountains. Tenth sacred month, fourth civil month, Thebeth, 29 days, Esther 2, 16, approximately January. No festivals. Coldest month, hail, snow, Joshua 10, 11. 11th sacred month, 5th civil month, Shabbat, 30 days, Zechariah 1, 7, approximately February. No festivals, weather gradually becomes warmer. 12th sacred month, 6th civil month, Adar, 29 days, Esther 3, 7 and Esther 9, 27, approximately March. The Feast of Purim celebrated on the 14th and 15th. Cold season. Thunder and hail frequent. Almond tree blossoms. End of Book 4, Chapter 5. Book 4, Chapter 5 Note of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 4, Chapter 5, Note. The Laws of Purity. Not altogether unconnected with these regulations respecting holy times and seasons were other enactments of the Mosaic Code, having for their object the enforcement of ideas of purity and holiness. Ye shall be holy unto me, 
was the divine command. For I, the Lord thy God, am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Leviticus 19.2, 20 verse 7. Many of these regulations were, doubtless, laws of health, tending to regulate diet, enforce cleanliness, and guard against many prevalent disorders. But over and above this, they had a higher object, and formed part of the moral discipline of the elect nation. They regard, one, things unclean to eat, two, things unclean to touch, and three, unclean matters or conditions. One, things unclean to eat. The prohibitions respecting food follow directly the laws concerning sacrifice. Portions of many sacrifices, as we have seen, might be eaten. From this eating, the law passes on to food generally, the nature of which has commonly no little influence on the refinement and manners of a people. Concerning vegetable eating, no rules are laid down. In respect to animal food, the laws are clear and precise. 1. Of quadrupeds, the clean were such as both parted the hoof and chewed the cud. All others were unclean. All animals, therefore, used in sacrifice might be eaten, as also the numerous species of deer and gazelles, Deuteronomy 14.5, but none of the carnivora, or such animals as the camel, coney, hare, or pig. 2. Of birds, also, all that were offered in sacrifice might be eaten, such as doves, pigeons, and also quails, but all birds of prey, and nearly all the waterfowl, were unclean. 3. Of fish, those only were clean that had both fins and scales. 4. All reptiles and insects were unclean, except locusts, and such as had four legs for walking and two for springing. Leviticus 11, verse 21 and 22. Compare Matthew 3, verse 4. But the Israelite was also strictly forbidden to eat anything that had died of itself. Exodus 22, verse 31 or was torn by beasts, emphatically the blood of any animal. Genesis 9, verse 4, Leviticus 3, verse 17, and Leviticus 17, verse 10 and 12. Compare 1 Samuel 14, verses 32 and 33. 2. Things unclean to touch. An Israelite incurred defilement who touched or handled, 1. The dead body of any animal, whether clean or unclean, Leviticus 11, verses 24 through 28. 2. The body, bones, or grave of a dead man. Numbers 19, verses 11, 13, and 16. The latter was deemed a defilement calling for special purification. The person was unclean seven days. For his cleansing, a young red heifer was slain outside the camp or town, in the presence of one of the priests. Some of the blood the priest was then to sprinkle seven times in the direction of the sanctuary, to burn the entire carcass, and cast into the fire cedar wood, scarlet wool, and hyssop. The ashes were then collected and laid up in a clean place, and a portion mixed with water was to be sprinkled on whatever had been defiled, man, or place, or vessel. This ceremony was to be repeated twice, on the third and on the seventh day. On the latter day, the person defiled washed his clothes, bathed, and was clean at even. But still stricter regulations were enforced when a priest or a Nazarite had become defiled. Numbers 19, verses 1 through 22. 3. Unclean matters or conditions. Many are enumerated, but we need speak of only one, the disease of leprosy. This fearful malady, indigenous in Egypt and Asia Minor, disfiguring the whole person and making it horrible to the beholder, was called by the Jews the stroke, and even by the Greeks the firstborn son of death. It made itself apparent by a white swelling on the skin, especially on the face, turning the skin white, Exodus 4, verse 6, and the hair white or yellow, Leviticus 13, verses 3, 10, and 30, and producing other disfigurements. The person affected with it was instantly to repair to the priests, Leviticus 13, verses 2 and 9, whose duty it was to make a minute examination and pronounce whether it was a case of true leprosy.
If so, the sufferer was pronounced utterly unclean and forthwith assumed the awful badges of his sad condition. He rent his clothes, bared his head, put a covering on his upper lip, Leviticus 13.45, as though he were mourning for the dead, Ezekiel 24.17 and 22, and wherever he went cried out, Unclean! Unclean! An exile from his home, his family, his friends, Numbers 5.2. He was bound to reside without the camp or city in a separate house by himself or in the society of others similarly afflicted. Leviticus 13 verse 46, 2 Kings 15 verse 5, 2 Kings 7 verse 3, and Luke 17 verse 12. No Israelite ever pretended to effect a cure of this awful malady. The priest could pronounce upon the symptoms, shut out the sufferer from the congregation, but he had no power to heal. If, however, the symptoms abated and there were any signs of a cure, the sufferer again went to the priest, who carefully ascertained whether this was the case. If so, a peculiar ceremony celebrated the healing. It consisted of two stages. One, two birds were taken one killed by the priest over running water, the other dipped, together with cedar wood, scarlet wool, and hyssop, in its blood, and suffered to fly away into the open air. The priest then sprinkled the leper with the blood seven times and pronounced him clean. Two, but before he could return to the society of his fellow men, he must wash his clothes, shape off all his hair, bathe, and then present himself at the sanctuary with a he lamb as a trespass offering, a ewe lamb as a sin offering, and a he lamb as a burnt offering with its usual meat offering. In cases of poverty, two doves or pigeons might be presented in place of the two latter offerings, but the he lamb as a trespass offering was indispensable. This was first slain, and its blood smeared by the priest on the leper's right ear, the thumb of his right hand, and the great toe of his right foot. Consecrated oil was then similarly applied and poured on his head, and the other sacrifices offered, at the conclusion of which atonement was deemed to have been made, and the leper was clean. Leviticus 14, verses 49-53. through The regulations respecting this fearful malady were no mere sanitary regulations, for it was not catching from one person to another. Compare 2 Kings 5 verse 1 and 2 Kings 8 verse 4. And the ordinances respecting it did not apply to the stranger and the sojourner. From the whole host of maladies and diseases which might have broken in upon man's body, God selected this the sickness of sicknesses, that he might thereby testify against that out of which it and all other sicknesses grew, against sin, as not from him, and as grievous in his sight. It was the outward and visible sign of the innermost spiritual corruption, a meat emblem in its small beginnings, its gradual spread, its internal disfigurement, its dissolution little by little of the whole body, of that which corrupts, degrades and defiles man's inner nature and renders him unmeet to enter the presence of a pure and holy God. 4. Among the vows known before the time of Moses, and which, as a general rule, were discouraged by him, compare Deuteronomy 23, verse 21 through 23, was that of the Nazarite. The person making this vow was bound, usually for a certain time, to abstain from wine or strong drink, from grapes or anything made from the vine, from cutting the hair of his head, or approaching a corpse, even that of his nearest relative. Number 6, verse 2 through 7. If he accidentally touched a corpse, he was obliged on the seventh day to cut off his hair and begin his vow afresh on the next day, after presenting to the priest two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, one for a sin, and the other for a burnt offering, and a lamb as a trespass offering. At the expiration of his vow, he brought to the tabernacle a burnt sin and thank offering, Leviticus 7, verses 12 and 13, with a meat and drink offering, number 6, verse 15, had the left shoulder of the thank offering waved upon his hands by the priest, numbers 6, verses 19 and 20, and cutting off his hair, burnt it in the fire on the altar. Of Nazarites for life, three are mentioned in scripture. Samson, the only one actually called a Nazarite, Judges 13, verse 5, Samuel, 1 Samuel 1, verse 11, and John the Baptist, Luke 1, verse 15. 
End of Book 4, Chapter 5, Note. Book 4, Chapter 6 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 4, Chapter 6. Civil and Moral Laws. Exodus 21 through 23. Deuteronomy 19 through 24. Hitherto we have been concerned with those portions of the Mosaic Law which instructed the Israelite in his duty towards God and the mode in which he was to be worshipped. We will now turn to the chief of those which instructed him in his duty as 1. A member of a family and 2. Of a nation. 1. The family relations include 1. The mutual duties of parents and children 2. Of husband and wife 3. Of master and servant 1. The duties of parents and children. Reverence for parents is enjoined in the Decalogue as the first duty next after those appertaining to God himself. Honor thy father and mother is the first and the only commandment to which a promise of long life and continuance in the promised land is definitely attached. Exodus 20 verse 12 and Ephesians 6 verse 2. And to smite or revile father or mother is made a capital offense. Exodus 21, verses 15 and 17, Leviticus 19, verses 3, and Leviticus 20, verse 9. In the patriarchal times, as we have already seen, the authority of the father over his children was very great. His blessing conferred special benefits, his curse special injury. Genesis 9, verses 25 and 27, Genesis 27, verses 27 through 40, Genesis 48, verses 15 and 20, and Genesis 49. His authority was of great moment, not only in the marriage of sons, Genesis 24, verse 3, but of daughters, though in the latter case the consent of the brothers, or at least of the elder brother, was deemed important, Genesis 24, verse 50 and 51, and Genesis 34, verse 11. But the Mosaic law did not invest the father with the same boundless power as the Greek or Roman law. He could not inflict death irresponsibly. The incorrigible son, whom he could not restrain from flagrant crimes, he might bring before the elders of the city, who, having obtained the concurrence of both parents, might sentence him to be stoned to death. But in the execution of the judgment, the whole congregation were required to take part, in order to promote a more general abhorrence of the sin. Deuteronomy 21, verses 18-21 through 21. The father could not disinherit his sons. To the firstborn, he must give two portions and equal shares to the rest. But in case of extreme indigence, he might sell his children, especially his daughters, into servitude or surrender them to creditors as a pledge. Exodus 21, verse 7. 2. The Relations of Husband and Wife The institution of marriage was jealously guarded by the Mosaic Law. Adultery ranked next to murder and the punishment for both parties was death by stoning. Leviticus 18, verse 20, Leviticus 20, verse 10, and Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. In deference to the universal custom of Oriental nations and the example of the patriarchs, polygamy was allowed, though by no means encouraged, and though frequently practiced by the kings of Israel, was rare in private life. 1 Samuel 1, verse 2. The right of divorce was conceded. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, on account of the hardness of the hearts of the people, Matthew 19, verse 8, but a woman once divorced and marrying again might not return to her first husband, either on the death of or when put away by the second. The Mosaic Law sanctioned a custom of the patriarchal age, Genesis 38, verse 8, which made it necessary that if a man died childless, his wife should be taken in marriage by his surviving brother. And it was further ordained that the firstborn son by such a marriage should succeed in the name of his brother, that it be not put out in Israel. Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, etc. The rigor, however, of the old custom was relaxed. If the brother had children of his own alive, he was exempt. And if he declared in open court his unwillingness to enter into the marriage, the duty devolved on the next relation of the deceased husband. See Ruth 4, verses 5 through 11. 3. The Relation of Master and Servant Slavery existed amongst the Israelites as amongst all other Eastern nations. Slaves could be acquired in four ways. One, they might be taken in war. Numbers 31, verse 11 and 35, Deuteronomy 20, verse 14. Two, 
They might be purchased of parents or former owners or merchants in times of peace. Genesis 17, verse 23, Leviticus 25, verses 44 and 45. Three, they might have sold themselves in satisfaction for a debt. Leviticus 25, verses 39 through 43, and 2 Kings 4, verse 1. Four, they might be the children of slaves born in their master's house. But while slavery was thus recognized as an institution, it was the aim of the Mosaic law to mitigate its evils as much as possible. Thus, not only does it open with a number of precepts relating to slaves, Exodus 21, verses 2 through 6, but it ever pronounced them to be equal before God as regarded their spiritual relation, and freely admitted them to all religious privileges, circumcision, Genesis 17, verses 10 through 14, and Exodus 12, verse 44, the rest of the Sabbath, Exodus 20, verse 10, the festivals, Exodus 12, verse 44, and gave them an interest in all the sacrifices offered by the family. Deuteronomy 16, verses 11 and 14. In regard, again, to civil rights, the Hebrew slave was never looked upon as a mere thing or chattel. A master could not chastise a slave to death without being punished. Exodus 21, verses 20 and 21. And if he inflicted bodily mutilation, the slave, whether male or female, might claim to be free. Exodus 21, verses 26 and 27. In the seventh year of his service, the Hebrew slave might take up his freedom, leaving, however, his wife given him by his master during service and her children, Exodus 21, verses 3 and 4. If he declined to avail himself of this privilege, his master might take him before the elders, bore his ear with an awl to the door, and then he was his servant forever, i.e. till the year of Jubilee, Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6, Deuteronomy 15, verses 16 and 17. Moreover, as the Israelites, when delivered from Egyptian bondage, had not gone forth empty, so the Hebrew bond slave at his release, which took effect in the Jubilee year, even though he had not served his full time, was to be furnished liberally out of the flock, the floor, and the wine press. Deuteronomy 15 verses 13 and 14. Besides bond slaves, we also find hired servants amongst the Hebrews. They were to be treated kindly and their wages duly paid. Leviticus 19, verse 13, and Deuteronomy 24, verses 14 and 15. Strangers also within the gates, whether runaway slaves or exiles from their own land, who would naturally be an extreme want, were to be treated with great kindness. For the Israelite himself was a stranger in the land of Egypt. Exodus 22, verse 21, and Exodus 23, verse 9. Together with the poor generally, whether Hebrews or heathens, they were to have the free enjoyment of the gleaning of the field and the garden. Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10, 23, verse 22, Deuteronomy 24, verses 19 through 21. Of the spontaneous produce of the sabbatical year, Leviticus 25, verses 5 and 6. Of the sacrificial and tithe feasts, Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29, and their share at joyous family festivals, such as marriages, circumcision, and the weaning of children. 2. The laws affecting the Israelite in his civil capacity may be arranged in three groups, according as they regarded the sanctity of 1. Life, 2. Character, and 3. Property. 1. Life. The laws protecting the life and person include those against a. Premeditated murder and b. Unintentional manslaughter. a. Premeditated murder. The willful shedder of man's blood met with no compassion from the Mosaic Code. The original law at Sinai, Exodus 21, verses 12 through 14, and the subsequent repetition of it, Deuteronomy 19, verses 11 through 13, made death the inevitable penalty of murder, even as it had been in the days of Noah, Genesis 9, verse 6. The murderer was regarded as accursed. For him, the horns of the altar were to be no refuge. He was to be dragged from them by force to suffer his doom. Nor could rank or wealth exempt him from it, for it was expressly provided that on no pretext whatever should any ransom be taken. Numbers 35, verses 31 and 32. Nor was his person only regarded as accursed, but so long as he remained undiscovered, even the land was looked upon as polluted. If no efforts could detect the murderer, The elders of the nearest town were to take a heifer and bring it down to a rough valley, neither eared nor sown, and there strike off its head. They were then to wash their hands over it, and in the presence of the Levites pronounced the following words. Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. 
Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood to thy people of Israel's charge. Thus atonement was to be made. Deuteronomy 21, verses 1 through 9. B. Unintentional homicide. Prior to the Mosaic Age, the duty of avenging blood devolved upon the next of kin, who was called the Goel, or Avenger, and, together with his office, inherited the property of the deceased. Sometimes a whole family took upon them this duty, 2 Samuel 14, verse 7. Amongst the other nations, as the Arab tribes of the present day, any bloodshed whatever, whether willful or accidental, laid the homicide open to the duteous revenge of the relatives and family of the slain person, who, again, in their turn, were then similarly watched and hunted by the opposite party until a family war of extermination had legally settled itself from generation to generation without the least prospect of a peaceful termination. It was the aim of the Mosaic Law, without abolishing this long-established custom, to mitigate its evils as far as possible. Accordingly, it was directed that, on the arrival of the people in the Promised Land, six cities of refuge should be set apart, to which the homicide might fly, if not overtaken by the Avenger. Of these, three were to be on either side of the Jordan, almost equally remote from each other, and the roads leading to them were to be kept in a state of perfect repair. Exodus 21, verse 13, Numbers 35, verse 11, and Deuteronomy 19, verse 3. They were to be chosen out of the priestly and Levitical cities as likely to be inhabited by the more intelligent portion of the community. On reaching one of them, the case of the homicide was to be examined by the elders. If they pronounced him guilty, he was to be delivered up to the avenger. If innocent, an abode was to be provided him in the city, where he was to remain till the death of the high priest. But if found at any time by the avenger beyond the limit of protection, 2,000 cubits, he was liable to be put to death. On the demise of the high priest, he might return to the city of his possession. Numbers 35, verses 25 and 28. 2. The sacredness of a man's character was enforced by the commandment in the Decalogue forbidding false witness, and by laws prohibiting calumny, hatred, partiality, and judgment for rich or poor. Exodus 23, verses 1 through 3, and Leviticus 19, verses 16 through 18. No exact penalty was enforced, but it was enjoined that, in the case of false witnesses, the parties should be brought before the priests and judges, and if, after diligent inquisition, the charge was established, then it should be done unto the slanderer as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so that the evil might be put away. Deuteronomy 19, verses 19 through 21. 3. Property was carefully guarded in the Mosaic Law, which forbade not only stealing, the act, but coveting, the intention. A. Direct theft was punished by restitution. If the stolen goods were found in the hands of the thief, he was to restore twofold. If, before his detection, he had applied them to his own use, he was to restore five oxen for an ox, four sheep for a sheep. Compare 2 Samuel 12, verse 16. But a still heavier fine was exacted if he had not only sold, but killed and injured. If unable to pay the fine, he was to be sold into slavery to a Hebrew master and serve him till he could pay. Exodus 22 verses 1 through 4. A night thief might be resisted even to death. Exodus 22 verse 2. Man stealing or kidnapping was a capital offense. Exodus 21 verse 16. The crime of removing a neighbor's landmark was severely reprobated. Deuteronomy 19, verse 14, and Deuteronomy 27, verse 17. B. Indirect injury through carelessness or other causes. This included injury done to property entrusted to another for safe keeping. If it was stolen and the thief detected, he was to repay double. If he could not be found, the trustee, on being declared guilty of negligence by the judges, was to restore twofold. Compensation was also exacted where property was injured through a pit being left open, through cattle straying amongst other cattle or trespassing on another's land, or through fire spreading to standing corn. Exodus 21 verses 33 through 36 and Exodus 22 verses 5 and 6. Straying or suffering beasts, even if the property of an enemy, were to be brought back or relieved. Exodus 23 verses 4 and 5. Land. All land was to be regarded as belonging to God and the holders as his tenants. 
At the conquest of Palestine, each tribe was to have its allotment, and each family its portion. These were to remain forever inalienable. Numbers 27, verses 1 through 11. Numbers 36. Compare 1 Kings 21, verse 3, and 2 Kings 9, verses 25 and 26. All sold land, therefore, was to return to its original owners at the Jubilee, but might be redeemed by the owner or his representative at any period before then. Leviticus 25, verses 13 through 16, and 23 through 28. Laws of Debt An Israelite who had fallen into debt from any cause might, one, sell himself as a slave to one of his own nation with the right of resuming his freedom after six years and at the Jubilee recovering his inheritance, Two, claim a timely loan, Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 through 11. But no usury might be taken from an Israelite, Exodus 22, verses 25 through 27, and Deuteronomy 23, verses 19 through 20. Thus, pledges might become frequent, but they might not be cruelly or ruinously exacted. The handmill, a necessity in every family, might not be pledged, Deuteronomy 24, verse 6. The cloak must be restored before nightfall when it became essential. Exodus 22, verses 26 and 27, and Deuteronomy 24, verses 12 and 13. The lender was not to go into the house of his debtor to claim his pledge or seize any article he chose. He was to stand abroad, and the pledge was to be brought out to him. Deuteronomy 24, verses 10 and 11. End of Book 4, Chapter 6. End of Book 4. Book 5, Book 5, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 5, The Departure from Sinai to the Death of Moses. Book 5, Chapter 1. Kadesh Barnea and the Mission of the Spies, Numbers 10 through 14, BC 1490. The period of the encampment of the Israelites at Sinai had now occupied upwards of a year. The covenant had been concluded, the law had been given, the tabernacle had been erected, the priests had been consecrated, and Jehovah dwelt in the midst of his chosen people. It was now time to think of marching onwards towards Canaan. As, however, the occupation of that country must of necessity be preceded by its conquest, an organization of Israelitish forces was the first duty. Accordingly, a census was taken of all who were fit for war, or about 20 years old, and the result gave a total of 603,550 fighting men, Numbers 1, verses 46, to whom, if we add the Levites, the women, and the children, we may conclude that the host numbered altogether between two and three millions. The first anniversary of the Passover was then duly celebrated, and on the twentieth day of the second month in the second year, the pillar of cloud moved from off the tabernacle, and this signal for departure having been given, the order of the march was marshaled. First, borne by the Kohathites, went the Ark of the Covenant, the lid of which was the throne of Jehovah, and was overspread by the cloudy pillar, Numbers 10.33. Then followed the tribe of Judah, the most numerous and the strongest of all the tribes, supported by Issachar and Zebulun, under the standard of a lion, the ensign of Judah. Then followed the sons of Gershon and Merari, bearing the external portions of the tabernacle, the coverings and hangings, the boards, the pillars, and the sockets. They were succeeded by the tribe of Reuben, flanked by Gad and Simeon, marching under the common standard of Reuben, a man's head. Next came the rest of the Kohathites, bearing the sacred vessels of the sanctuary. Then the tribe of Ephraim, flanked by Benjamin and Manasseh, under the standard of Ephraim, the figure of an ox. And the long procession closed with the tribe of Dan, between Naphtali and Asher, with the standard of Dan, an eagle with a serpent in its talons. These arrangements having been made, the silver trumpets sounded. The silence of the desert was broken by the shout, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. Numbers 10.35 Compare Psalm 68, verses 1 and 2. And the march began. At this time there was present in the camp Hobab, who some supposed to have been the father-in-law, by others the brother-in-law of Moses. 
the Israelitish leader knew how invaluable would be the experience of one so well acquainted with every track and pass in the terrible wilderness they were now about to traverse, and he earnestly entreated him to continue with them and share the goodness which the Lord would show to Israel. Numbers 10.29 there seems little doubt that Hobab consented to accompany the people and to be to them instead of eyes amidst the dangers of the inhospitable desert. In the course of three days, the host entered on the sandy plain which parts the mountain mass of Sinai from the tableland of the T. Having for more than a year enjoyed the pleasant encampment before the Mount of God, they no sooner entered on this arid tract than they gave vent to their feelings of discontent. During the journey from the Red Sea to Sinai, God had borne with similar manifestations of their weakness. But now that they had been brought into nearer and more visible relations with him, having the sanctuary in their midst, the ark preceding them, and the manna dropping upon them from day to day, their murmurings could not thus be passed over, but brought down instant rebuke and punishment. On this occasion, the divine displeasure was marked by the outbreak of a fire on the extreme outskirts of the encampment, which inflicted considerable damage, and was only removed by the intercession of Moses, who called this spot Tabera, or the burning, Numbers 11, verses 1 through 3. But this judgment had scarcely been removed when the same spirit of discontent broke out afresh. The mixed multitude which had accompanied them from Egypt, and soon afterwards the Israelites themselves, began to complain of the manna, this light food as they called it, and lamented the loss of the fish, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and other vegetables they had enjoyed in the fertile valley of the Nile. So loud in general were their complainings that Moses, despaired of accomplishing the purport of his mission, and poured out his soul in prayer to God, begging for some relief from the burden of daily anxiety which weighed him down. In mercy towards his despairing servant, the Lord bade him select seventy elders and bring them to the door of the tabernacle, and promised to take of the spirit that was upon him and bestow a portion on them, that they might share with him the weight of responsibility. He also promised that, on the morrow, flesh such as the people had pined after should be given them, and that, not for one day only, but for a whole month, until it became even more loathsome to them than the celestial food which they had so lately despised. In obedience to this command, the seventy elders were brought before the tabernacle, and the Lord bestowed upon them a portion of the spirit that was upon the Israelitish leader, and they prophesied and did not cease. Two of their number, Eldad and Medad, those selected for this high office, either from accident or some other cause, did not accompany the rest to the appointed place. And though they remained in the camp and at a distance from the cloudy pillar, became inspired with the same spirit. This striking incident was announced to Moses by Joshua, who, jealous for his master's honor, thought that such prophesying ought to be prohibited. But Moses thought otherwise. Envious thou for my sake, he replied. Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Numbers 11, verse 24 through 30. Compare Mark 9, verse 38, and Luke 9, verse 49. Shortly afterwards, the second promise of the Lord was also fulfilled. A strong wind brought up a prodigious number of quails from the sea in the proximity of the Gulf of Aqaba, which covered the ground to the extent of a day's journey on either side of the camp. For two days and a night, the people were busily occupied in collecting and spreading the birds abroad, probably for the purpose of drying them. So they did eat and were filled, for God gave them of their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust. Psalm 78 verses 29 and 30. But while the meat was still between their teeth, his wrath fell upon them, and he smote them with a severe plague, and slew the mightiest of them, even the chosen ones of Israel. Psalm 78 verse 31. And the spot where they were buried was named Kibroth Hata'ava, the graves of lust. From this ill-omened encampment, the host proceeded in a northeasterly direction to Hazaroth, which is thought to have been the modern Ain el hudura and to have consisted of the unenclosed semi-permanent villages in which the Bedouins are found to congregate. Here a still severer trial awaited Moses. There arrived in the camp a Cushite or Ethiopian woman, Numbers 12 verse 1, whom he had married, and who is identified by some with Zipporah, while others believe her to have been an Egyptian whom he had espoused previous to his flight from that country. 
Hitherto the position of Miriam had been one of great influence in the camp, and second only to that of Moses and Aaron. Compare Micah 6, verse 4. To her, the arrival of the stranger was most unwelcome, and she feared she would now be deposed from her high position as a mother in Israel. Having therefore induced Aaron to share her views, she openly turned against Moses and maintained that he was not the sole expositor of Jehovah's will, that she and Aaron were of equal authority with him. Numbers 12, verses 1 through 4. With his wanted self-control, Moses was content to endure these reproaches in silence. But the Lord interposed to defend the honor of his servant. The pillar of cloud suddenly appeared before the tabernacle, and thither Aaron and Miriam were summoned together with Moses himself. There, in words of stern rebuke, the Lord denounced their hard speeches against his chosen servant. Very different was his position from that of an ordinary prophet, to whom the divine will might be made known by vision or dream. My servant Moses, said Jehovah, is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then, were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? With this vindication of the true position of the Hebrew leader, the cloud removed, and Aaron looked on Miriam, and behold, she had become leprous as white as snow. Thereupon Moses interceded for her, and the Lord promised that the judgment should not be permanent, but, as unclean, she must remain without the camp for seven days, during which period the host remained at Hazaroth. Numbers 12, verses 4-16. through 16. The days of her purification being ended, the Israelites resumed their march, and striking northwards across the plateau of the T, probably after several intermediate encampments, reached Kadesh, or Kadesh Barnea, Numbers 33, verse 36. This spot, whether identified with the spring of Ein Kudus, or with Ein Sheheba south of Gibel al muhra or with Ein Hwabi in the Arba, was at the very gates of the Promised Land. It required but a strenuous and persevering effort to reach the final goal of their long journey. This effort Moses exhorted them to make, Deuteronomy 1, verses 20 and 21, bidding them not be afraid, but go up boldly and possess the land which the Lord God of their fathers had given them. On this, the people proposed, Deuteronomy 1, verse 22, that spies should first be sent to ascertain the best route, and what cities ought first to be attacked. Moses consented to this proposal, and with the divine concurrence selected twelve princes, one from each tribe, whom he exhorted to make a thorough search throughout the length and breadth of the land, and ascertain its character, its products, and its inhabitants. Deuteronomy 1, verse 23, and Numbers 13, verses 1 through 20. One of the select twelve was Hoshea, the valiant attendant of Moses, whose name was now changed to Jehoshua, or Joshua, God the Savior, a title which well became the future leader of the Israelitish hosts. It was now the time of the first ripe grapes, Numbers 13, verse 20, or the month of September. Setting out from the wilderness of Paran, the spies traversed the land as far north as Rahab on the way to Hamath, in the valley of the Orontes, which divides the ranges of Lebanon and anti-Lebanon. Then they ascended by the south and came to Hebron, where dwelt Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the gigantic sons of Anak. In a valley opening on the city, celebrated even now for its vineyards, they plucked pomegranates and figs and a bunch with one cluster of grapes of such enormous size that it required to be carried on a staff between two men, whence the valley was named Eshkol, or the Valley of the Cluster. With these proofs of the fertility of the land, after an absence of forty days, the spies returned and presented themselves in the camp at Kadesh before the hosts assembled to hear the report. The productiveness of the promised land, they said, was sufficiently attested by the fruits they had brought back. It was indeed a good land and flowed with milk and honey. But the people, it could not be denied, were strong and of great stature, and among them were the sons of Anak, before whom they themselves appeared as grasshoppers. Numbers 13, verse 33. They were proceeding to enumerate the chief tribes whom they had encountered when Caleb, the Kenizzite of the tribe of Judah, one of their number, anxious to dispel the feelings of despondency with which their report was received, broke in with the advice that the people should make an immediate attack and promised them speedy and certain success. 
But save the valiant Joshua, he found no other to support his brave counsels. The rest of the spies dwelt only on the dangers of the expedition, and their despondency found but too faithful an echo in the hearts of the people, who burst forth into lamentation, openly murmured against Moses and Aaron for having brought them thither, and even proposed to appoint a captain to lead them back into Egypt. In vain, Joshua and Caleb tried to calm the tumult and to check the mutiny. The host would listen to nothing and even threatened to stone them to death. But at this moment, the glory of Jehovah appeared before the tabernacle in the sight of the whole people. Terrible, though most just, was his wrath at the signal proof of faithlessness. In spite of all the signs and wonders he had wrought in their midst, he threatened to destroy them utterly with pestilence and make of Moses a nation greater and mightier than they. But as before on Sinai, so now that unselfish leader stood heroically in the gap. He pleaded earnestly with the justly offended Jehovah. He represented the joy the rejection of the people would cause to the Egyptians and the nations of Canaan, who had all heard of the mighty hand and the stretched out arm which had guided them through the wilderness. Finally, he appealed to the name which the Lord himself had proclaimed on the top of Sinai. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, and implored the forgiveness of the people. Numbers 14, verses 11 through 19. His prayer was heard. The Almighty assured him that the nation, as a nation, should be preserved. Their name should not be utterly blotted out. But, save Joshua and Caleb, not one of that generation, which, in spite of the wonders they had seen in Egypt and in the wilderness, had refused to trust in God, should enter into the promised land. For them, all hope of entry was cut off. Everyone from 20 years old and upwards should die. Their carcasses should lie bleaching in the wilderness. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 5. While their children, whom they had deemed a certain prey for the Canaanites, should atone for their faithlessness by wandering 40 years. A year for each day the spies had been engaged in searching out the land. Numbers 14 verses 33 and 34. As an earnest of this judgment, the ten spies, who by their faithless despondency had been the primary cause of the mutiny, were struck with instant death, and the command was given to the rest of the hosts to return into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. This announcement was received by the people with universal lamentation, and on the morrow they rose up, and in spite of the earnest exhortations of Moses, Deuteronomy 1, verses 42 and 43, and the ominous circumstance that the cloud had not removed from the tabernacle, made a wild rush up the steep and difficult pass, probably as Sufa, leading into the uplands of southern Palestine, where they encountered the Amorites, Deuteronomy 1, verse 44, the highlanders of the mountains, and their old enemies, the Amalekites, Numbers 14, verse 45, by whom they were driven back, routed and discomfited as far as Horma. Numbers 14, verses 20 through 45. End of Book 5, Chapter 1. Section 28, A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Classic Book of Old Testament History Book 5, Chapter 2, The Wanderings, Death of Miriam and Aaron By George Frederick MacLear after this signal defeat, it was clear that the sentence pronounced upon the existing generation was irrevocable, and the host remained for a considerable time at Kadesh. During this period, a formidable conspiracy broke out against the authority of Moses and Aaron. In their natural state of mortification at recent events, the people were now more than ever likely to lend a ready ear to those who whispered that under the auspices of any other than their present leaders, they might escape from their humiliating doom and reach the goal of their hopes. Such fatal advisers soon appeared in the persons of Korah, a Kohathite of the tribe of Levi, and Dathan, Abiram, and On of the tribe of Reuben. The former, jealous probably of the sacerdotal preeminence of the line of Amram, and the latter loth to see their tribe deprived of their ancestors' right of primogeniture, conspired, it is thought, to place Korah at the head of a priesthood chosen by popular election, and possibly to restore the tribe of Reuben to the rights of the firstborn, of which it had been deprived. 
successful in gaining over to their views 250 princes of the people, they rose up against Moses and Aaron and publicly charged them with talking too much upon themselves and usurping functions which ought to have been shared by the congregation at large, who were all, every one of them, holy unto the Lord. On hearing these charges, Moses resolved to refer the matter to the divine decision, and bade Korah and his company assemble on the morrow with lighted censers before the tabernacle. A similar summons was addressed to the Reubenite leaders, but they flatly refused to attend at the place of meeting, and charged Moses with having disappointed the hopes of the people, and being anxious only to make himself a prince over them. Curiosity, however, induced them to stand at the doors of their tents in full view of the tabernacle, where Korah and his associates stood with lighted censers awaiting the divine decision. Before long the glory of the Lord appeared, and Moses was instructed to command that a clear space should be kept round the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and that the people should be careful to touch nothing belonging to them, lest they should be consumed in their sin. Then the servant of Jehovah offered to submit his claims to an awful and infallible test. If the ringleaders in this rebellion died the common death of all men, or were visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord had not sent him. But if a new and terrible fate befell them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, then it would be known that they had provoked the Lord. His words had hardly been uttered when this awful catastrophe took place. The earth clave asunder, and swallowed up Korah, Dathan, and Abram, with everything belonging to them, and at the same time a fire burst forth and consumed the two hundred and fifty men, who had presumed to offer incense at the sanctuary. Thus this great conspiracy was signally punished, and as a memorial of the occurrence, Eleazar, the son of Aaron, was directed to take the brazen censers of the offenders, and therewith to make plates for the altar of burnt sacrifice. In spite, however, of this terrible proof of the divine displeasure, the very next day saw the people again murmuring against Moses and Aaron, complaining that they had slain the people of Jehovah, and threatening to break out into a fresh and general mutiny. Thereupon the glory of Jehovah once more overshadowed the tabernacle, and a plague broke out amongst the host. But at the exhortation of Moses, Aaron took a lighted censer from off the altar, and standing between the living and the dead, made an atonement for the people. But not before 14,700 men had by their deaths paid the penalty for their murmuring and insubordination. Thus the divinely ordained priesthood of Aaron averted, while that assumed by Korah only brought destruction upon the host. But in order that the Aaronic priesthood might be still further attested, and that for all future generations another sign was vouchsafed, Moses was directed to receive from the prince of each tribe an, an almond rod with the name of the tribe inscribed thereon, and to lay these rods before the ark and the holy of holies, that on the morrow it might be proved incontestably which tribe had been selected to perform the priestly functions. Moses obeyed, and on the morrow, when the rods were removed, behold, that of Levi, on which the name of Aaron had been inscribed, instead of being dry like the rest, had brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. Thus, to the confusion of all other pretenders, the claims of this branch of the tribe of Levi were confirmed in a way that could not be gainsaid, and the mystic rod was directed to be laid up before the ark as a testimony against all future pretenders, and a pledge of the divine choice. From Kadesh the host now took their journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, and for thirty-eight years continued to wander in the deserts of Paran. This long period of punishment and humiliation is shrouded by the sacred historian in profound obscurity. It is probable that Kadesh was for some time a sort of headquarters, whence the great mass of the people were scattered far and wide in smaller or larger groups over the peninsula, while afterwards encampments were made at different spots, wherever Moses and the tabernacle were settled. From a comparison of the four passages of Holy Scripture which alone throw any light upon this dark period of Israel's history, we infer that it was a period of training and temptation, of humiliation and blessing, of natural wants and supernatural existence, 
that the rite of circumcision was neglected, and the annual celebration of the Passover not kept up, while the Sabbath also was not strictly observed. Meanwhile, according to the sentence pronounced upon them, all the men of that generation from twenty years old and upwards died, save Moses and his brother, and the two faithful spies, Joshua and Caleb. At the close, however, of this period, the host once more assembled at Kadesh. Moses was now far advanced in years, and his second approach to the very threshold of the promised land was saddened by two events of a peculiarly mournful character. First, Miriam, his sister, and companion of his childhood, died and was buried at Kadesh. But however afflicted he may have been at her loss, the conduct of the people whom he led must have grieved him still more. For again, on a failure of water, the new generation proved faithless and break forth into murmurings and complainings as violent as their forefathers at Rephidim. For the second time the ill-omened words of disaffection sounded in his ears and roused in him and his brother feelings of greater irritation than they had, had ever displayed before. On appealing to the Lord, they were commanded to assemble the people before the rock facing the encampment, and it was promised that it should bring forth water and obedience to their word. Thereupon the brothers gathered the people together before the rock, but instead of appealing to it, Moses began to speak unadvisedly to them, saying, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Then instead of doing as he had been instructed, he lifted up his hand, and with the rock struck the rock, not once, but twice, on which the refreshing streams indeed flowed forth abundantly, and supplied the wants of the people and their cattle, but the fidelity and self-control of the brothers, of the prophet and the priest, had alike failed, neither had they sanctified Jehovah in the eyes of the host. For this sin, whatever may have been its precise heinousness, the Almighty pronounced on both the brothers the sentence of exclusion from the promised land. Into it they were never to enter or realize with the people they had led the hopes and anticipations of so many long and weary years. But though thus excluded from the goal of his long pilgrimage, there was on the part of Moses no diminution of the zeal he had ever displayed in behalf of the people. Always preferring their welfare to his own, he was ready to lead them towards, if he was not to lead them into, the promised land, and as a preliminary he sent ambassadors to the Edomites and Moabites, requesting a free passage through their territory. But though his messengers recounted the various proofs of divine protection which had accompanied the journeyings of the people, and promised to keep to the highway, and injure neither the fields, the vineyards, nor the wells, but pay for any water they might use, they met with a direct refusal. Edom not only forbade them a passage through his territory, but posted a strong force to guard all the approaches into it. Thereupon, in obedience to the divine command, the Israelites abstained from any retaliation against the descendants of Esau, and the latter did not openly venture to attack them. But an Amorite tribe inhabiting the southern highlands of Palestine, under the command of their chief Arad, fell upon them and took some of them prisoners. This roused the spirit of the people. They attacked their foes and utterly destroyed them in their cities, naming the spot and memory of the incident Horma, or utter destruction. Thus debarred from what would have been the natural route towards the country east of the Jordan, nothing remained but to march southward down the Araba towards the eastern arm of the Red Sea, and then take a long and wearisome circuit round the territory of the Edomites. Accordingly they set out and reached Mount Hor, at the edge of the land of Edom, and the highest and most conspicuous of the whole range of its sandstone mountains, overshadowing the mysterious city of Selah, or Petra, the rock. Here it was intimated to Moses that another of the few remaining links which connected him with the generation that had come forth from Egypt must be taken from him. He had already laid Miriam in her desert grave at Kadesh. Now he was told that on the craggy top of Hor he must leave his brother, the high priest Aaron who in accordance with his recent sentence must die for his sin at the waters of strife. For the last time, therefore, the brothers repaired to the tabernacle, where Aaron was arrayed in his priestly robes, and then, accompanied by Eleazar, his son, 
the three ascended the toilsome height in the sight of the mournful and watching host. Arrived at the summit, Moses stripped his brother of his priestly garments and put them on Eleazar, and there, in full view of the desert, the scene of his long pilgrimage, and just in sight of the utmost borders of the land of promise, on the first day of the fifth month, in the hundred and twenty-third year of his age, the great high priest was gathered to his fathers. Then Moses and Eleazar reverently interred him in his rocky tomb, and descended from the mount, and Eleazar ministered that evening in the familiar garments of him, whom the people would see no more. Thirty days were spent in mourning for Aaron, and then the host continued their march down the Arabah, and after encamping at Ezion Geber, at the eastern head of the Red Sea, entered on a sandy, shadeless waste, which stretched eastward from the mountains of Edom far on to the Persian Gulf, and was even more terrible than the desert they had left. This and the thought of the long circuit that awaited them so wrought upon the spirit of the people, that they again broke out into bitterest complaints against their leader, their tedious march, and their food. The region they were now transversing around in fiery or deadly serpents, of which the Lord sent many among the people, and much people of Israel died. But on the manifestation of a spirit of repentance, Moses, by the divine command, made a brazen serpent and fixed it upon a pole in the sight of the congregation, and all who looked thereon were healed. The symbol of this wonderful deliverance was long preserved and was regarded with veneration as late as the days of Hezekiah, by whom it was destroyed. The occurrence is also memorable as having suggested one of the most sacred similitudes of the New Testament. For in his well-known conversation with Nicodemus, the Savior likened to the uplifting of the servant by Moses his own uplifting upon the cross, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. After this incident, the Israelites resumed their march, and pressing forward in a northerly direction, skirted the eastern frontier of Edom, and eventually encamped near the willow-shaded brook or valley of Zered, which ran into the Dead Sea near its southeast corner, and formed the southern boundary of Moab. Hence they advanced towards the rushing stream of the Arnon, swift, noisy, dashing through a deep defile of sandstone rocks, the first river they had seen since they left the Nile. Crossing one of its fords, an incident commemorated in an ancient song, they reached a spot which they called by a name sufficient of itself to indicate that their weary wanderings were at an end, and that they were approaching a cultivated land. Needing water, the princes and nobles, at the command of Moses, dug in the ground with their staves until they reached a cool, refreshing spring. In memory of this grateful discovery, they called the spot Bir Elim, the well of the heroes, and celebrated their thanksgiving in a burst of sacred poetry. They were now encamped on the vast range of forest and pasture on the east of the Jordan. This is the end of section 28, book 5, chapter 2, by Dave Currier. Section 29 a Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Classic Book of Old Testament History. Book 5, Chapter 3. Conquest of the East of Jordan, Balaam and Balak. By George Frederick MacLear. The country north of the present encampment of the Israelites from the Arnon to the Jabbok was at this time possessed by the Amorites. We have already met with this tribe on the western side of the Jordan. Tempted by the rich pasture lands east of this river, a colony of them appears to have crossed, and having driven the Moabites with great slaughter and the loss of many captives from the country south of the Jabbok to have made the wide chasm of the Aaron henceforth the boundary between them. The Amorite king at this time was Sihon, and his capital was Heshbon, twenty miles east of the Jordan, on the parallel of the northern end of the Dead Sea. Thither the Israelitish leaders sent messengers requesting a peaceful passage through his territory, and promising the same respect for his land and possessions which had already been proposed to the Edomites. 
but their request was rudely rejected. Sihon would not allow them even to pass through his borders, but assembled his forces and prepared for battle. The Israelites did not decline the engagement, which took place at Jahaz, probably a short distance south of Hezbon, and resulted in the total defeat of the Amorites. Sihon himself, his sons, and all his people were smitten with the sword. His walled towns Ar and Heshbon, Nopha and Medeba, were captured, and his numerous flocks and herds fell into the hands of the victors, who thus became masters of the entire country between the Arnon and the Jabbok. Apparently about the same time that Sihon had ex expelled the Moabites from the rich territory south of the Jabbok, Another Amorite chief seized the country extending from that river to the foot of Hermon, and known as the land of Bashan. His name was Og, one of the last of the giant race of Rephaim. He ruled over sixty cities, and his stronghold was a remarkable oval district, about twenty-two miles from north to south by fourteen from west to east, called by the Hebrews Argob, or the Stony, afterwards by the Greeks Traconitis and now Leha. This extraordinary region has been described as an ocean of basaltic rocks and boulders, tossed about in the wildest confusion, and intermingled with fissures and crevices in every direction, and yet in spite of its ungainly and forbidding features thickly studded even now with deserted cities and villages, in all of which the dwellings are solidly built and of remote antiquity. On a rocky promontory southwest of this marvelous region, without water, without access, save over rocks and through defiles almost impracticable, was a city of Edri, strength. Here, as if in the Thermopylae of his kingdom, the giant king of Bashan and all his people resolved to encounter the advancing hosts of the Israelites, led, it seems probable, by two eminent chiefs of the tribe of Manasseh, Jer and Noba. Like the Amorite chief of Hezbon, Og could not withstand the valor of the Israelites. He was utterly rooted, and his threescore cities fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, besides unwalled towns, a great many, fell into their hands. A trophy of this victory, long preserved by the children of Ammon in the city of Rabbah, was a huge iron bedstead of the Amorite king, nine cubits long by four wide, and long afterwards the subjugation of Sihon king of the Amorites and Og the king of Bashan, great kings, famous kings, mighty kings, was deemed worthy of being ranked with the tokens and wonders wrought in the land of Egypt and the overthrow of Pharaoh in the Red Sea. After these two decisive engagements, which made them masters of the entire country east of the Jordan, from the wide chasm of the Arnon to the foot of the snow-capped Hermon, the Israelites encamped in the plains of Shittim, or the meadow of the Acacias, amidst the long belt of Acacia groves, which, on its eastern as well as its western side, lined the upper terraces of the Jordan over against Jericho. South of the Arnon was the little corner of territory occupied by Moab, who viewed with no little alarm the successes of the Israelites against such mighty kings as Sihon and Og. This people, said Balak, the king of Moab, to the elders of Midian, lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. Sensible of the uselessness of attacking a nation so manifestly under the protection of an invisible power, the two confederate tribes resolved before falling upon them to place them under an awful curse, which might have the effect of paralyzing their arms. At this time, no man was supposed to have greater power in this way than a famous prophet named Balaam, the son of Beor. He lived far away from the present encampment of the Israelites at Pethor, beyond the Euphrates, in Aram, among the mountains of the east, but his fame had spread across the Assyrian desert, even to the shores of the Dead Sea. His gifts he exercised as a prophet of the same God, who had wrought so many miracles in behalf of the Israelites. If, therefore, he could be persuaded to lay upon them his powerful ban, their further success the Moabites thought might be checked, and the children of Lot might not only recover the land of which they had been deprived by the Amorites, but possibly add to them the fertile territory the Israelites had so lately won from Sion and Og. Accordingly, elders of both Moab and Midian, 
with the rewards of divination in their hands, were dispatched eastward across the Assyrian desert to entreat the aid of the powerful prophet. On reaching their destination and announcing the purpur of their errand, Balaam, uncertain of the lawfulness of complying with it, requested them to lodge there that night while he ascertained the will of Jehovah. The answer he obtained was unfavorable. Thou shalt not go with them, said God, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. On the morrow, therefore, he sent the messengers away, bidding them announce to their master that Jehovah forbade his accompanying them. Undeterred by this failure, and possibly informed by his messengers that the prophet himself did not seem unwilling to come, the king of Moab sent a second embassy consisting of princes more and more honorable than the last, to inform him that he would advance him to very great honor, and do whatever he commanded, if only he would come. Again, therefore, the toilsome Syrian desert was traversed, and the messengers preferred their request. But again they seemed to have come in vain. If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, said the prophet, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord to do less or more. But instead of at once sending the messengers away, he bade them lodge with him that night, while he consulted the Lord a second time. On this occasion the word of the Lord came to him, and bade him go, but authorized him to speak nothing more and nothing less than the very words that should be put into his mouth. Balaam accordingly set out on his journey, but he was not to accomplish it without receiving another and more terrible warning against it and its object. As he rode upon his ass, the angel of the Lord stood in the way, with his sword drawn in his hand. As if in derision of his claims to be a powerful seer, the beast alone discerned the celestial adversary, and started aside out of the way into a field. On this, Balaam smote it and turned it into a path running through some vineyards. But again the angel confronted the willful prophet, and the frightened ass in its efforts to avoid him crushed his foot against the wall. Therefore Balaam struck it a second time, and now, as if in still deeper derision of one, who claimed to be able to reveal to kings and princes the will of the invisible, the dumb beast, in the accents of a man forbade the madness of life of the prophet, on this, Balaam's eyes were at length opened, and as he bowed himself down before the angel, he was sternly rebuked for his willfulness, and proposed to turn back rather than displease the Lord. But since his mind was wholly bent on that course, he was a second time bidden to proceed, but a second time also warned against uttering any other words than those which a divine power should put into his mouth. The journey was now resumed, and at length the watchmen of Balak announced to their master that the mighty prophet was approaching. Therefore, Balak went forth to meet him, and after a brief rebuke of his delay, conducted his visitor to Kerjath Hozoth, the town of streets, a place in the furthest borders of his kingdom, and possibly of sacred or oracular reputation, where he entertained him at a great feast. On the next day he conducted him to the high places dedicated to Baal, that rose above the encampment of the Israelites, whence he might gain a view of the utmost part of the people he had desired him to curse. There, by the prophet's direction, the king erected seven altars, and on each they offered together a bullock and a ram, and while Balak with his attendant princes stood by his burnt offering, Balaam went forth to a high place to learn the divine will. And God met Balaam, and put a word in his mouth, and returning to the expectant king, he declared that it was impossible for him to curse Jacob and defy Israel, that he could not curse him whom God had not cursed, or defy him whom Jehovah had not defied. On hearing this response so entirely opposite to what he had expected, Balak was highly incensed, but thinking a change of view might have a different influence on the prophet's spirit, he brought him to Zophim, a cultivated field of the watchmen high up on a range of Pisgah. Again the altars were built, and the victims slain, again the king stood by his burnt sacrifice, and again Balaam went forth to meet the Lord. But still the answer was unfavorable. The steam of sacrifice could not bend the will of Jehovah, 
He was not a man that he should lie or repent of his fixed purpose, what he had said he would do, what he had spoken he would perform. In Jacob he had not beheld iniquity, neither had he seen perverseness in Israel. He had brought them out of Egypt, and neither augury nor divination could prevail against them. More incensed than before, the king of Moab burst forth into bitter complaints against the prophet, and though the latter reminded him that he could speak nothing but the word of Jehovah, yet he determined from one more point to show him the people, that peradventure he might thence effect the potent curse. He led him up, therefore, to a peak, where stood the sanctuary of Peor, looking toward Jeshimon, or the waste, probably the dreary barren waste of the hills lying immediately on the east of the Dead Sea. There the seven alders were for the third time built, and the victims for the third time slain. But Balaam was now convinced that Jehovah was pleased only to bless the people, without resorting, therefore, any more to useless divinations. He lifted up his eyes and looked down upon the tribes encamped in the acacia groves below him with their goodly tents spread out like the valleys or watercourses of the mountains, like the hanging gardens beside his own great river Euphrates. As line aloes, which the Lord had planted, as cedar trees beside the waters. And as he stood with tranced yet open gaze, he saw the vision of the Almighty, and in outline dim and vast beheld the future of the desert-wearied tribes, that lay encamped before him in sight of Canaan. He beheld them pouring water from their buckets, their seed in many waters, their king higher than any Amalekite Agag ruling in the Arabian wilderness south of where he stood. He knew that God had brought them forth out of Egypt, and that their strength was like that of the unicorn. He foresaw them couched as a lion and lying down as a great lion, eating up the nations their enemies, breaking their bones, and piercing them through with the arrows of their archers. Blessed was he that blessed them, and cursed was he that cursed them. Balak's vexation was now increased tenfold. Smiting his hands together, he upbraided the prophet for his deceit, and in place of advancing him, as he had intended, to high honor, bade him flee for his life to his native land. Nor was the other loath to go. But before he went, for he felt himself still moved by the prophetic spirit, he would advertise the king of what this mysterious people would do to his people in the latter days. Again, therefore, he took up his parable, and saw, but not now, he beheld but not nigh a star, bright as any that spangled the eastern sky, coming out of Jacob, and a scepter rising out of Israel, smiting through the princess of Moab, and destroying all their wild warriors, the sons of Tumult. One by one he saw the giant forms of empires on their way to ruin, Edom and Seir becoming a possession for their enemies, Amalek, then the first of the nations, in his latter and perishing forever, the Kenites, then strong in their dwelling place, and putting their nest in the neighboring rocks of Engedi, wasted and made a prey, nay, even Israel carried away captive by Ashur. And yet once more he saw woe in store even for Ashur, even for his own native land. Far in the distant future he saw ships coming from Chittim, the island of Cyprus, to afflict Asher and to afflict Eber, till the proud kingdoms of the eastern world, and he who should afflict them perished forever. And then the vision closed, the true prophetic light died away, and the king of Moab, baffled and disappointed, returned to his people. This is the end of section 29, book 5, chapter 3, by Dave Courier. Book 5, Chapter 4 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 5, Chapter 4. 
war with the Midianites through the death of Moses. Numbers 25 through 32, Deuteronomy 32, B.C. 1451. But though his tongue had pronounced eloquent blessings upon the people he found he could not curse, Balaam's heart was filled with malice against them. Dismissed by the king of Moab without the promised honors and rewards, he lingered amongst the neighboring Midianites and, with the keen hatred of his now hardened heart, counseled them to join the children of Moab in seducing the Israelites from their allegiance to Jehovah. The festival of Baal Peor was at hand and was celebrated with all the unbridled licentiousness of a heathen orgy. If the Israelites could be persuaded to join in it, they might, he suggested, become as other men, and the invisible protection now vouchsafed would be withdrawn. Numbers 31, verse 16. His artful suggestion was adopted. The festival was celebrated, and the Israelites fell into the snare. They joined themselves to Baal Peor, took part in the hideous rites, and defiled themselves before the Lord. Thus they brought upon themselves a curse far more real than any that the divinations of Balaam could have effected. Had such apostasy gone unpunished, the strength of Israel would indeed have ceased, and the counsels of the wily prophet would have been successful. The crisis required severe and exemplary visitation. A plague broke out which swept off upwards of 24,000, and the princes of the tribes, at the command of Moses, slew the guilty with unsparing vigor and hanged them up before the Lord. On this occasion, Phineas, the son of Eleazar and grandson of Aaron, particularly distinguished himself by his righteous zeal, which was accepted as an atonement for the people and rewarded not only by the cessation of the pestilence, but with a promise that the priesthood should remain in his family forever. But a terrible vengeance was denounced against the crafty Midianites, and after a second numbering of the people by Moses and Eliezer, a sacred war was proclaimed. A thousand warriors from each tribe, led not by Joshua but by Phinehas, and accompanied by the ark, went forth to execute the task of righteous retribution. The silver trumpet sounded the signal for the onset, and the Midianites were utterly routed. Five of their chiefs, Evi and Rechem, Zur and Hur and Reba, as also all their males, were put to death. Their cities were burnt, their goodly castles fired, their women and children taken captive. Nor did the crafty prophet escape. He received the wages of his unrighteousness and perished by the sword. Numbers 31 verse 8 and Second Peter 2 verse 15. The country east of the Jordan, which the Israelites had now wrested from Sihon and Og, was, to a great extent, a long tableland of undulating downs, famed for its rich pasturage, and clothed with luxuriant vegetation. It was the forest land, the pasture land of Palestine, a place for cattle, Numbers 32 verse 1. Of the tribes of Israel, as we have already noticed, Reuben and Gad were eminently pastoral. They had a very great multitude of cattle, Numbers 32 verse 1. On the conclusion, therefore, of the sacred war against the Midianites, they approached Moses and the elders of Israel with the petition that they might be allowed to settle down in a region so peculiarly suited to their requirements. This request seemed to the Israelitish leader to savor of a desire to shrink from the arduous work which lay before the nation, and as likely to discourage the people from crossing over and attempting the conquest of the rugged western country, and he reproached them for their apparent selfishness and indifference to the welfare of their brethren. But the two tribes protested their perfect sympathy with the great national cause. They were ready to send the flower of their troops across the river, and only wished for the present to build sheepfolds for their cattle, and cities for their little ones, whither they might return on the conquest of the western country. This promise was deemed sufficient, and Moses distributed between them the lately conquered territory, assigning to Reuben and Gad the kingdom of Sihon from the Arnon to the Jabbok, and entrusting to the half of the warlike tribe of Manasseh, whose warriors had taken so prominent a part in the conquest of the east of the Jordan, Numbers 32 verse 39 and Deuteronomy 3 verses 13 through 15, the inaccessible heights and impassable ravines of Bashan, and the almost impregnable tract of Argob, the chief stronghold of the giant Og. Meanwhile, it had been once and again intimated to the Israelitish leader that the day drew near when he must be gathered unto his fathers. Under the special direction, therefore, of Jehovah, he now occupied himself with giving final and specific instructions respecting the future government of the nation. Joshua, his minister, was solemnly appointed to be his successor. The boundaries of the promised land were definitely marked out. Numbers 34. Its cities, with their suburbs, including six cities of refuge for the unquitting manslayer, were assigned to the tribe of Levi, Numbers 32, and other necessary regulations were made. For an ordinary leader, this would have been enough. 
But the recent sad occurrences in the matter of Baal Peor had only too surely reminded Moses of the fickle tendencies of the nation, and none knew better than himself the awful consequences of national apostasy. For the last time, therefore, he assembled the people together and delivered to them his final counsels. Commencing with a retrospect of the past forty years, he reminded them of the goodness and faithfulness which had always followed them, in spite of their murmurings and discontent, and the victories they had been enabled to achieve. Deuteronomy chapter 1 through chapter 4 verse 43. He recapitulated the law given on Mount Sinai with such additions or modifications as his own enlarged experience suggested. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 1 through chapter 26 verse 19 and appointed a day on which, at the conclusion of the conquest, its blessings and curses were to be ratified by the nation with the most imposing and solemn ceremonies. Deuteronomy 27. He then, for the last time, enlarged on the exalted vocation of the nation, and the blessings which would assuredly accompany obedience to the divine laws, in the city and the field, in their basket and their store, in their going out and their coming in, and dwelt with no less earnestness on the terrible punishments which would follow apostasy and transgression, and furnishing images for which the whole realm of nature was exhausted, in which nothing, excepting the real horrors of the Jewish history, the misery of their sieges, the cruelty, the contempt, the oppressions, for which ages the scattered, despised, and detested nation have endured, can approach. Deuteronomy chapters 28 through 30. But oral delivery was not deemed sufficient. He therefore wrote out the law with its blessings and its curses, and gave it to the priests charging them to place it beside the ark in the Holy of Holies and to read it in the hearing of all the people once every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacles, Deuteronomy 31, verses 9 and 26. Then, turning to Joshua, whom he had already nominated as his successor, he bade him be strong and of good courage, assuring him that Jehovah would be with him and would make all he did to prosper. But as if to deepen the gloomy forebodings past experience must have suggested, the Lord himself not only announced in the clearest terms the future apostasy of the people, Deuteronomy 31, verses 16 through 18, but directed Moses to compose a song, which the people were to learn and teach their children as a testimony against themselves in the days to come, when they should have turned unto other gods and served them and provoked the Lord and broken his covenant. Deuteronomy 31, verses 18 and 21, and Deuteronomy 32, verses 1 through 43. Having composed this song of witness and pronounced his last solemn blessing, not like Jacob upon twelve men gathered round his deathbed, but on a mighty nation, on the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh, the aged prophet, whose eye was not dim nor his natural force abated, was warned that his hour was come. From the plains of Moab he went up on the mountain of Nebo, to the highest point in the long eastern range over against Jericho. And there he who called him to his high mission at the burning bush showed him that land, which had been so long sworn to the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Eastward and westward, southward and northward, he surveyed the goodly land. He saw it all with his eyes, though he was not to set his foot thereon. Beneath him lay the tents of Israel ready for the march, and over against them, distinctly visible in its grove of palm trees, the stately Jericho, key of the land of promise. Beyond was spread out the whole range of the mountains of Palestine in its fourfold masses, all Gilead with Hermon and Lebanon in the east and north, the hills of Galilee overhanging the lake of Gennesaret, the wide opening where lay the plain of Esdraelon, the future battlefield of the nations, and the rounded summits of Ebal and Gerizim. Immediately in front of him, the hills of Judea and amidst them, seen distinctly through the rents in their rocky walls, Bethlehem on its narrow ridge, and the invincible fortress of Jebus. Such was his Pisgah view. And then all was over. The great prophet had served his day and his generation. He had reached his 120th year, and his work was ended. There, in the land of Moab, he died, and he whom he had served faithfully in all his house buried him in a valley or a ravine in the land of Moab, over against the idol sanctuary of Beth Peor. Deuteronomy 34, verse 6. But no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. End of Book 5, Chapter 4. Book 5, Chapter 4, Note of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 5, Chapter 4, Note. Three points in reference to Moses deserve attention. One, his work. Two, his character. And three, his office. 
one, his work. The Hebrew lawgiver was a man who, considered merely in an historical light without any reference to his divine inspiration, has exercised a more extensive and permanent influence over the destinies of his own nation and mankind at large than any other individual recorded in the annals of the world. To his own nation he was a chieftain historian, poet, lawgiver. He was more than all these. He was the founder of their civil existence. Other founders of republics and distinguished legislators had been, like Numa, already at the head of a settled and organized community, or had been voluntarily invested with authority, like Lycurgus and Solon, by a people suffering the inconvenience of anarchy. Moses had first to form his own people, to lead them out of captivity, to train them for 40 years in the desert, and bestow on them a country of their own, before he could create his commonwealth. 2. His Character The word meekness, Numbers 12, verse 3, which is used in scripture in reference to his personal character, represents what we should now designate by the word disinterested. All that is told of him indicates a withdrawal of himself, a preference of the cause of his own nation to his own interests, which makes him the most complete example of Jewish patriotism. He joins his countrymen in their degrading servitude, Exodus 2 verse 11 and Exodus 5 verse 4. He forgets himself to avenge their wrongs, Exodus 4 verse 13. He wishes that not he only, but all the nation were gifted alike. Envious thou for my sake, Numbers 11 verse 29. When the offer is made that the people should be destroyed and that he should be made a great nation, Exodus 32, verse 10, he prays that they may be forgiven. If not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written, Exodus 32, verse 32. Even when excluded from realizing the hopes of a lifetime, his zeal for his people suffers no diminution. 3. His Office While other prophets saw Jehovah only in visions and dreams, Moses spake with him mouth to mouth and was entrusted with the whole household of God, Hebrews 3, verses 2 and 5. He was at once deliverer, lawgiver, priest, teacher, leader, and judge. His prophetic gift controlled, pervaded, inspired, and regulated all these functions, and he was thus an eminent type of a still greater prophet, Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 18, to be raised up to Israel from among their brethren. 1. As a redeemer of his people, 2. As a mediator between them and God, 3. As a teacher and lawgiver, 4. As receiving the fullest communications from God, 5. As a revealer of a new name of God, 6. As the founder of a new religious society. See Millman's History of the Jews, Chapter 1, page 214, Article Moses, in Smith's Bible Dictionary, Kurtz's History of the Old Covenant, Chapter 3, page 478, and Davidson's On Prophecy, Pages 110 through 112. End of Book 5, Chapter 4, Note. Book 6, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick MacLear. Book 6. Joshua and the Conquest of Western Palestine. Chapter 1. The Passage of the Jordan and Fall of Jericho. Joshua chapters 1 to 6. B.C. 1451. Joshua, the son of Nun, of the powerful tribe of Ephraim, had, as we have seen, been already selected as a successor of Moses and the leader of the Israelitish forces. When, therefore, the thirty days of mourning for that eminent servant of God were ended, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 8, he was encouraged by the Lord to undertake the task of conquest, which now devolved upon him and was assured of complete success, if careful to observe the commandments of the law. Accordingly, preparations were made for the enterprise without delay. Provisions for three days were issued to the host and the tribes of Reuben, Gad and Manasseh, already located on the eastern side of the Jordan, were reminded of their promise to accompany their brethren and share the perils and hardships of the campaign. 
The general distribution of the nations now inhabiting Western Palestine has been already described. Along the valley of the Jordan and a large portion of the plain of Israelon, as also the sea coast, dwelt the Canaanites proper, or lowlanders. The Jebusites held the strong fortress of Jebus, Jerusalem. The Hittites, Hebron and its vicinity. Between the Hittites and the Dead Sea were the powerful and warlike Amorites, or Highlanders. The Hivites occupied the country about Gibeon and under Mount Hermon. The Perizzites, the high plains under the range of Carmel. While in the extreme north dwelt a powerful chief who bore the hereditary name of Jabin, or the Wise. His fortress was at Hazor, somewhere on the high ground overlooking the waters of Merom, a strong and fortified position, and the principal city of that portion of the land. The first step to any complete subjugation of the country was the capture of the important city of Jericho, situated immediately opposite the camp of Joshua, in a vast grove of noble palm trees, nearly three miles broad and eight miles long, which must have recalled to the few survivors of the old generation of the Israelites the magnificent palm groves of Egypt, such as may now be seen stretching along the shores of the Nile at Memphis. It was a fenced city enclosed by walls of considerable breadth, was the residence of a king, and not only contained sheep and oxen, but abounded in silver and gold, and vessels of brass and iron. Joshua chapter 6 verse 24 From its position, it was the key of western Palestine, and commanded the two main passes into the central mountains. The first act of Joshua, therefore, was to send two spies to reconnoitre this important place, setting out from Shittim, or the meadows of Acacia, and crossing the Jordan, they effected their entrance into the house of a woman named Rahab on the city wall. Their arrival was not unobserved, and was reported to the king of Jericho. He sent to Rahab's house, and demanded their surrender, but she had already concealed her visitors among the flax stalks spread out to dry on the flat roof of her house and when the king's messengers arrived, she informed them that the two men had departed and advised a speedy pursuit. Misled by this information, the officers of the king went after them in all haste, while she came up to the spies upon the roof and related what had occurred. The townsfolk, she said, had heard of the marvellous passage of the Red Sea and of the defeat of the great Amorite chiefs on the east of Jordan and despaired of offering any effectual resistance to a nation thus visibly protected by a God powerful in heaven above and in earth beneath. Joshua chapter 2 verse 11 These fears she herself shared, and now offered to assist them. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 31, James chapter 2 verse 25 In escaping, by letting them down by a cord from her window, that they might fly to the jagged range of the white limestone mountains behind the city and conceal themselves for three days till their pursuers were returned. As a requital for this kindness, she implored them at the capture of the city, which she regarded as certain, to spare her life and the lives of her father and mother and all her relatives. To this the spies assented, and having agreed that the scarlet cord should be bound in the window whence they effected their escape, to mark out the house to their comrades, and be a pledge of its security, suffered themselves to be lowered down, and in the course of three days, after hiding in the mountains, once more crossed the Jordan, and announced to Joshua the despondency of the people of Jericho. Early, therefore, the next morning, the Hebrew leader broke up the encampment on the upper terraces of Shittim and descended to the lower banks of the Jordan, where three days were spent in ceremonial purifications, 
and in preparing for the passage of the river. The ark was to lead the way borne by the priests, and the people were to follow at a distance of two thousand cubits, or nearly a mile, and were assured that the feet of the priests should no sooner rest in the river than the waters from the south would be cut off from the waters that came down from above, and would stand on a heap, thus at once affording a passage and a pledge of future and complete victory over all the nations of Canaan. Joshua chapter 3 verses 1 to 13 It was now the time of harvest, which ripens three weeks earlier in the plain of Jericho than in other parts of Palestine, and the Jordan at this point, three quarters of a mile wide, had overflowed all its banks. On the 10th of Nisan, the sacred month, and therefore four days before the feast of the Passover, the signal for the passage was given. The priests advanced, bearing the ark, and presently reached the brim, or broken edge, of Jordan. Joshua chapter 3 verse 15 But no sooner were their feet dipped in the water, than far up the river, in Adam, the city which is beside Zaretan, that is, about thirty miles from the place where the Israelites were encamped, the waters which rushed down from above stood and rose up upon a heap, while those that came down towards the salt sea failed and were cut off. Joshua chapter 3 verse 16 Thus, from north to south, the waters were driven backwards. Psalm 114 verse 3 And the dry riverbed was exposed to view. Into it the priests descended, bearing the ark, and there they stood, firm and motionless, as if on dry ground. Meanwhile, below the spot where they stood, the host, probably at various points, hasted and passed over. Joshua chapter 4 verse 10 Led by the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, whose vanguard amounted to 40,000 men. Joshua chapter 4 verse 12 When, at length, from the deep bed of the river, all had ascended to the desert plains on the further side, Joshua gave the signal to the priests to come out of the river. Preceded by twelve chiefs of the tribes, with twelve huge stones taken from the bed of the Jordan, which were set up as a memorial on the upper bank of the Jordan Valley, they moved from the spot where they had stood so long, and no sooner had they reached the other side than the waters rushed back to their accustomed channel, and the river overflowed its banks as before. Joshua chapter 4 verse 18 Intelligence of this marvellous event reached the ears not only of the Amorite mountain chiefs, but also of the Canaanite lowlanders on the sea coast and filled them with the utmost alarm. Their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more. No attack, therefore, was made upon the Israelites, who were left in quiet possession of their advanced post on the western side of the Jordan. Here the rite of circumcision, so long neglected during their desert wanderings, was performed, and in memory of this removal of the reproach of their uncircumcised state, the rising ground of their encampment was called Gilgal, rolling away. Joshua chapter 5 verse 9 They were now also in a condition to keep the Passover, which was duly celebrated on the fourteenth day of the month, at even, on the plains of Jericho, and the unleavened cakes prescribed for this festival were made of the old corn of the land, and not of the manna, which on the next day entirely ceased, and thus proved that their desert life was really over. Joshua chapter 5 verses 10 to 12 The capture of Jericho was the next step to be taken, and while Joshua was, in all probability, deeply meditating thereon, there appeared to him a man with his sword drawn in his hand, who, in answer to the inquiries of the Israelite leader, declared himself to be the Prince of the Army of Jehovah. In deep reverence, Joshua fell on his face to the ground, and was bidden to loose his shoes from off his feet, 
for the place on which he stood was holy ground. Instructions were then given him respecting the method of the city's capture, to mark in the strongest manner the singularity of the campaign, to distinguish it from anything that had been known before, the great frontier fortress of the Jordan Valley was to fall in a way above all others calculated to show that the Lord fought for Israel. Once a day for six days, the host, preceded by the sacred ark and seven priests, each blowing a trumpet of ram's horn, was to march in procession round the city. On the seventh day, the circuit was to be made seven times, at the conclusion of which the priests were to sound a long blast with the ram's horns. This was to be the signal for a general shout, on which Joshua was assured that the walls of Jericho would fall down flat, and the host would be enabled to advance, every man straight before him, into the doomed city. Once within it, the Israelites were to consider everything, save the house and family of Rahab, as devoted to Jehovah. Man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep, were to be given up to wholesale destruction, and the city itself was to be burnt with fire, and all that was therein, save the vessels of gold and silver, of brass and iron, which were to be consecrated to the service of Jehovah. Accordingly, early the next morning, the strange advance was ordered. First went a select body of armed men. Joshua chapter 6 verse 9. Then followed the priests, blowing with the trumpets. Next the ark, and lastly the vanguard. Save the blasts of the trumpets, there was no war cry of the troops no sound even of human voice. Once a day for six days, the strange procession passed round the city. What the swords of the Israelites could effect had already been proved in fierce conflicts with Sihon and Og. But now they hung unused in their sheaths. At early dawn on the seventh day, the same procession went forth and compassed the city not once but seven times. The last circuit complete, the priests sounded a long continued blast, and on a given signal from Joshua, the great shout of the entire army rose to heaven. Immediately the walls of Jericho fell down flat, and the host advanced straight into it and captured it. In the house of Rahab, her mother and father and other relatives were gathered together as had been agreed and having been identified by the spies, were led forth to a place of safety without the camp of Israel. The rest of the inhabitants, without exception, were slain with the edge of the sword. The city was burnt, and everything was consumed, save the vessels of gold and silver, of brass and iron. And not only was the proud city of palm trees thus utterly destroyed, but Joshua imprecated a solemn curse on anyone who attempted to rebuild it. He should lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son should he set up the gates of it. Joshua chapter 6 verse 26 Thus the first step in the conquest was brought to a successful end, and the most important town in the Jordan Valley, the key of western Palestine, was in the hands of the Israelites. End of Book 6, Chapter 1
Joshua, without delay, sent men to reconnoitre the position of Ai, a royal city strongly posted beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, at the head of the ravines running up from the valley of the Jordan. The spies reported it as easy of capture, and suggested that two or three thousand men would be amply sufficient for the undertaking. Acting on their advice, Joshua dispatched the suggested number, who advanced boldly up the ravine, but only to meet with an unexpected and disastrous repulse. The men of Ai, strong in their high position, chased them down the steep descent from the gates, and slew about thirty-six men. This unlooked-for reverse excited the profoundest despondency in the Israelitish camp. Joshua and the elders, with dust upon their heads, lay till eventide upon the ground before the ark, which had so lately been led triumphantly round Jericho, anticipated nothing less than a general attack of the collected Canaanites, emboldened by the discomfiture of the people. From this dejection they were roused by the voice of the captain of the Lord's host, informing them that the Israelites themselves were the cause of this defeat. They had not kept themselves from the accursed thing in the devoted city of Jericho, but had taken and concealed a portion of the spoil. Nor till atonement was made for this sin could they expect any further success to attend their arms. On the morrow, therefore, all Israel was assembled by their tribes, and an appeal was made to the sacred Lot to discover the offender. The tribe of Judah having been taken, its clans, families, and households were successively led forth, and at length the transgressor was found in the person of Achan, the son of Carmi. Adjured by Joshua to make a full confession, he owned that, from the spoils of Jericho, he had secretly set aside a richly ornamented Babylonish or Assyrian robe, two hundred shekels of silver, and a solid wedge of gold weighing fifty shekels, and had hidden them in the ground under his tent. Thither messengers were sent, and there the stolen property was found, and spread before the assembled host. Achan was then taken to a valley south or southwest of Jericho, and there stoned to death, together with his sons, his daughters, and all his family. There remains, together with his tent, the stolen property, and all his possessions, were then burnt with fire, while a great mound of stones was set up over the scene of the execution, and the valley was henceforth known as that of Achor, trouble. The host was now in a position to resume the attack upon Ai. Selecting 30,000 men from his forces, Joshua set out from Gilgal, and on reaching the neighbourhood of the city, detached 5,000 men to place themselves during the night in ambush behind it. Meanwhile, he himself, with the rest of his army, took up his position on an eminence near the north side of the town. Early the following morning, he descended into the valley, and the king of Ai no sooner detected them than he advanced with all his forces to the encounter. Thereupon the Israelites feigned a retreat, and were hotly pursued by their foes towards the desert of the Jordan, while, at the signal of Joshua's uplifted spear, the ambuscade rushed into Ai and set it on fire. The smoke of their city ascending up to heaven was the first announcement to the inhabitants of the success of the stratagem practised by the Israelites. Attacked before and behind, they were utterly routed, and their whole population, numbering twelve thousand, were put to the sword. The city itself was sacked and burnt, and its king, having been taken prisoner, was hanged upon a tree till sunset, when the body was taken down, and a huge heap of stones was piled up over his grave. After this signal victory, the Israelitish leader determined to take advantage of the terror which the success of his arms had inspired in the hearts of the Canaanites, and carry out the command of Moses touching the ratification of the law with imposing and solemn ceremonies on the mountains Ebal and Gerizim. Deuteronomy chapter 27 From Ai, to the north of which the host had already advanced, Ebal was about twenty miles distant. Thither, accordingly, the host repaired, 
an altar of unhewn stones was erected, and burnt offerings and peace offerings were sacrificed to Jehovah. The stones were then plastered with lime, and the words of the law, probably the Ten Commandments, or the blessings and cursings contained in Deuteronomy chapter 27, inscribed thereon. Half of the assembled tribes then ascended the summit of Ebal, the other half that of Gerizim. In the intermediate valley stood the priests and Levites with the ark, surrounded by the elders, officers and judges, with Joshua at their head. Of the blessings and cursings of the law, each was then read aloud by the Levites, and as they read, to each curse the six tribes on Ebal responded with a unanimous loud Amen, and to each blessing the assembled thousands on Gerizim similarly testified their acquiescence. On their return from this solemn ratification of the covenant, the Israelites assembled at Gilgal. Here they were met by an embassy from Gibeon, now El Jib. It was a royal city situated exactly opposite the opening of the Pass of Ai, inhabited by the commercial Hivites, and was at this time the head of a small group of confederate cities, Chephira Beoreth and Kiriath Jearim. Joshua chapter 9 verse 17. Alarmed by the successes of Joshua, the Canaanite kings of the hills, the valleys, and the sea coast had mustered their forces for a general attack upon him. In this, the Gibeonites had resolved to take no part, but determined, if possible, to make a league with the Israelites. For this purpose, they sent ambassadors arrayed in old and tattered garments and clouted shoes, carrying old sacks upon their asses, dry and mouldy bread, and goatskin bottles patched and shriveled, the better to keep up the appearance of being toil-worn travellers from a far country. Joshua chapter 9 verses 3 to 13 Completely deceived by this wily embassage, without waiting to take counsel of the Lord, Joshua and the princes concluded a covenant with them, and solemnly swore that they would spare their lives. Within three days, however, they arrived in the midst of their cities, and ascertained that, instead of being very far off, they were their near neighbours. Loud was the murmuring of the people against their chiefs when they saw how they had been duped. But the latter nobly determined to abide by their oaths, and, in place of putting the Gibeonites to death, reduced them to the condition of bondmen, and made them hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord. Meanwhile, news of the capitulation of Gibeon having reached the ears of the southern kings, they resolved to attack the recreant city, and five powerful chiefs, the king of Jebus, the king of Hebron, or Kiriath Arba, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, marched against it and commenced a regular siege. In their alarm, the Gibeonites sent an urgent message to Joshua at Gilgal, bidding him slack not his hand, but come to their aid with the utmost speed, and deliver them from their powerful foes. Perceiving that not a moment was to be lost, Joshua instantly arrayed all his forces, and by a forced march suddenly burst upon the Amorite kings as they lay encamped before the city, Unable to offer any effectual resistance to this utterly unexpected attack, they were helpless before the Hebrew leader and the Lord who fought for Israel. Numbers were slaughtered at Gibeon itself. Numbers fled along the rocky ascent leading to Upper Beth Horon, the house of caves, about four miles distant. Hence, however, they were chased by the triumphant Israelites along the rough descent leading to Lower Beth Horon and thence to Azekah and Makedah, when a terrific storm burst forth. The Lord thundered out of heaven and cast down great hailstones upon the flying Canaanites, so that they were more which died with the hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Joshua chapter 10 verse 11 Standing on the summit of Upper Beth Horon, Joshua watched the foe flying in helpless confusion towards the western lowlands. The Lord had already delivered them into his hands, and time only was needed to render the rout complete, 
and enable his forces to avenge themselves on their enemies. But the day was far advanced, and he feared the Canaanites might yet make good their escape. In the sight, then, of all Israel, he cried, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou, moon, in the valley of Ajalon, the place of deer or gazelles. And the Lord, who fought for Israel, hearkened to the voice of his servant. The sun stood still, and the moon stayed, and in the lengthened afternoon the pursuit was continued without pause or rest. Arrived at Makeda, somewhere in the Shephelah or Maritime Plain, the five kings hid themselves in a well-known cave, shaded by trees. But thither also the tide of battle brought the triumphant Joshua, who bade his followers only pause to roll great stones to the mouth of the cave, and set men by it for to keep them. Longer he would not tarry. Intent upon the pursuit, he urged his forces to smite the hindmost of their foes, and prevent their escaping into their cities. His words were obeyed, nor, till they had made an end of slaying the Canaanites with a great slaughter, did the pursuers return to Makeda. Here a camp was formed, and the mouth of the cave having been opened, the five kings were dragged forth in the sight of Joshua and all the men of Israel. As they lay prostrate upon the ground, the Israelite leader bade the captains of the men of war put their feet on their necks, and then smote them and slew them, and hanged them upon five trees until the evening. Then, as the sun went down upon that memorable day, like which was no day before or after it, they were taken down and flung into the cave where they had vainly tried to conceal themselves. Great stones were once more rolled to its mouth, and the royal sepulchre was closed. Joshua chapter 10, verses 16 to 27. Such was the issue of the eventful battle of Beth Horon. It sealed the fate of every important city of southern Palestine. One after another, Makeda and Libna, Lachish and Eglon, Hebron and Debir, fell before the victorious Israelites. From one captured city they passed on to another, conquering and to conquer, till they had smitten all the country of the hills and of the south and of the vale and of the springs, from Kadesh Barnea in the southern desert to the central plain of Israelon. Joshua chapter 10, verse 41. End of Book 6, Chapter 2book 6 chapter 3 of a class book of old testament history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gillian hendry a class book of old testament history by george frederick mcclear book 6 chapter 3 Battle of Merom and Division of the Land Joshua chapters 11 to 21 B.C. 1450 to 1444 Intelligence of the decisive battle of Beth Horon before long reached the ears of that powerful chief in northern Palestine who has been already mentioned, Jabin the Wise, whose capital, Hazor, was the principal fortress in that part of the country. Determined to make a last effort to defeat the Israelites, he rallied round his standard not only the chiefs in his own immediate neighbourhood, but from the plains south of the Sea of Galilee, or, as it was then called, the Sea of Kenereth, from the Valley of the Jordan, the maritime plain of Dor, and the as yet unconquered fortress of Jebus. Again encouraged by the Lord with the promise of a decisive victory, Joshua did not shrink from encountering this formidable confederacy. Setting forth on a forced march, he burst upon the combined armies of the northern chiefs as they were encamped by the waters of Merom. As before, his attack was irresistible. The Lord delivered the vast hosts of the foe into the hands of Israel, who smote them with great slaughter, 
and chased them as far as the friendly city of Great Zidon on the west, and the valley of Mizpeh on the east. This was the first occasion on which the Israelites encountered the horses and iron chariots of the Canaanites. According to the special command of their leader, Joshua chapter 11 verse 6, they cut the hamstrings of their horses so as to render them unfit for further use, and burnt the chariots with fire. Hazor, the stronghold of Javan, was captured and burnt. Its king and all its inhabitants were put to the sword, the flocks and herds only being reserved as spoil for the people. The Battle of Merom was the last of Joshua's recorded engagements, but a long war, considered to have lasted nearly seven years, now occupied his energies, during which he proved his fidelity to the instructions given by the great lawgiver of the nation. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. Till by the time he had completed his campaigns, six nations and thirty-one kings had swelled the role of his triumphs. Joshua chapter 11, verses 18 to 23, and chapter 12, verse 24. At length, when he was old and stricken in years, he was commanded to divide the conquered territory among the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. The mode adopted was twofold. One, in some cases individual chiefs claimed particular spots on the score of their own prowess, or putting themselves at the head of armed predatory expeditions, conquered certain portions with the sword. The chief instance of this was afforded by the aged compere of Joshua, Caleb, the son of Jephane, who now won distinction and renown for his own tribe of Judah. Forty-five years had elapsed since, as one of the twelve spies in company with Joshua, he had come down the valley of the cluster to Hebron, the fortress of the giant Arba, where they gathered the enormous bunch of Syrian grapes. On that memorable day, Moses had rewarded his eminent faithfulness by promising him the land whereon his feet had trod as an inheritance for himself and his children forever. Numbers chapter 14 verses 23 and 24, Joshua chapter 14 verse 9. This winding valley then of the cluster, this mountain, Joshua chapter 14 verse 12, on which rose the stronghold of the Anakims, was the portion Caleb desired for himself, and hence with the divine aid he vowed to drive forth its gigantic possessors and take it for his own. Joshua willingly granted his request, and the great warrior of the tribe of Judah went up against the city of Arba and drove out the sons of Anak, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai. Thence he proceeded southward to Debir, or kiriath Sefer, the city of books, probably a sacred oracular place, and promised to give to its successful assailant his daughter, Achsa, in marriage. Thereupon Othniel, his nephew, or, according to others, his younger brother, attacked and took the fortress, and won the promised prize. On the way to Othniel's house, Achsa dismounted from the ass on which she rode, and begged her father to give her some better heritage than the dry and thirsty frontier of the desert. Below the spot on which rose the newly captured fortress was a bubbling rivulet, falling into a rich valley. Thou hast given me, said she, a south land. Give me also the bubbling rills. And he gave her the upper and lower bubblings, and thus Hebron and Debir, with the rich valley below, became the inheritance of the great warrior of Judah, and was long after known by his name. 1 Samuel chapter 25 verse 3 and chapter 30 verse 14. 2. But the more general mode of dividing the conquered land in accordance with the divine instructions was by casting lots before the tabernacle at Shiloh, in the presence of Joshua the high priest and the elders of the nation. As the distribution of the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh on the east of the Jordan has been already described, we may confine ourselves to those on the western side, under the threefold division of A, the south, 
B. The centre. C. The north. A. The south. 1. The most southerly frontier was assigned first to Judah, but afterwards to Simeon. Joshua chapter 19 verse 9. And is often called in scripture the south. Joshua chapter 10 verse 40. Judges chapter 1 verse 9. Like Reuben on the east of Jordan, Simeon was destined to have little influence on the subsequent history, to be divided in Jacob and scattered in Israel, Genesis chapter 49 verses 5 to 7, and to be constantly exposed to the attacks of the Amalekites and other nomadic tribes on its frontier. Compare 1 Chronicles chapter 4 verses 39 to 43. 2. Next to Simeon on the north, was the territory of the Lion tribe of Judah, comprising the undulating pasture country of the south, the fertile lowland of the west, the hill fortresses of the centre, and the wild desert bordering on the Dead Sea. Part of his inheritance was fertile and covered with cornfields and vineyards. Genesis chapter 49 verse 11. Part was a wild country, the lair of savage beasts where amidst caverns, ravines, and mountains, Judah, true to the description and the blessing of Jacob, could stoop down and couch as a lion, guarding the southern frontier of the promised land. 3. Northeast of Judah was the warlike little tribe. Psalm 68, verse 27, 1 Samuel, chapter 9, verse 21, of Benjamin, famous for its archers, Second Samuel chapter 1 verse 22, Slingers, Judges chapter 20 verse 16, and Left-Handed Warriors, Judges chapter 3 verse 15 and chapter 20 verse 16. Its territory was small, being hardly larger than the county of Middlesex, but its position was of great importance, containing numerous rounded hills which presented favourable sites for strong fortresses, it commanded the chief passes leading down from the central hills to the Jordan on the one side and the plains of Philistia on the other. In this broken and hilly country, the tribe became warlike and indomitable, ravening as a wolf. Genesis chapter 49 verse 27. 4. Compressed into the narrow space between the northwestern hills of Judah and the Mediterranean was the tribe of Dan containing within the 14 miles from Joppa to Ekron, one of the most fertile tracts in the land, the cornfield and garden of southern Palestine. But for this rich prize, it had to contend first with the Amorites, Judges chapter 1 verse 34, and afterwards with the Philistines, Judges chapter 14 and so on. And eventually, as we shall see, was obliged to seek a new home in the north. Judges chapter 18 verses 27 to 29. B. The Centre. The central portion of the Holy Land, the Samaria of after ages, was assigned to the two brother tribes of the house of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Of this territory, which may be roughly estimated at 55 miles from east to west and 70 from north to south, and which was about equal in extent to the counties of Norfolk and Suffolk combined. 1. The more southerly portion was assigned to Joshua's own tribe of Ephraim. It extended as far south as Ramah and Bethel, within a few miles of Jerusalem, and was rich in fountains and streamlets, in wide plains in the hearts of mountains, and continued tracts of vegetation, in cornfields and orchards, the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, which the lawgiver invoked on the ten thousands of Ephraim. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 13 to 17. And of whose father Jacob had said that he should be a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. Genesis chapter 49, verse 22. 2. And as the duty of guarding the northern outposts on the east of Jordan had been assigned to one half of the tribe of Manasseh, so to the remaining half on the west was assigned the duty of defending the passes into the great plain of Jezreel. Its territory stretched westwards to the Mediterranean and the slopes of Carmel, but did not quite reach the Jordan on the east. 
C. The North The northern portion of the Holy Land, the Galilee of after times, extending from the range of Carmel to the mountains of Lebanon, was assigned to four tribes, allied by birth, and companions on the desert march, Isaacar, Zebulun, Asher, and Naphtali. 1. The territory of Isaacar lay above that of Manasseh, and exactly consisted of the plain of Israelon, the Greek form of the Hebrew Jezreel, the seed plot of God. The luxuriance of this plain, the battlefield of Palestine, is the theme of every traveller. The soil yielded corn and figs, wine and oil. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 40. The stately palm waved over the villages, and the very weeds to this day testify to its extraordinary fertility. Here, Isaacar rejoiced in his tents. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 18 and 19. Crouched down as the strong he ass. Genesis chapter 49, verses 14 and 15 used for burden and field work, and seeing that rest was good, and the land that it was pleasant, bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant to the tribute, which various marauders, Canaanites, Judges chapter 4, verses 3 and 7, Midianites, Amalekites, Judges chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Philistines, First Samuel chapter 29 verse 1 and chapter 31 verses 7 to 10, exacted, bursting through his frontier, open both on the east and west, and tempted by his luxuriant crops. 2. Immediately north of Isaacar was the allotment of Zebulun, extending from the Sea of Kenereth, afterwards the Lake of Gennesareth, on the east towards the Mediterranean on the west. Besides the fertile plain near the fisheries of the lake, this tribe possessed the goings out, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 18, the outlet of the plain of Akka, where it could suck of the abundance of the seas. 3. The land of Naphtali, stretched from the Sea of Kenereth to the valley which separates the ranges of Lebanon and anti-Lebanon and was one of the most densely wooded districts of the country. Its forests surpassed even those of Carmel, and the land has been described as a natural park of oaks and terebinths. Its soil also was rich and fertile, full with the blessings of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 23. 4. To the west of Naphtali, and resting on the seashore, was the lot of the tribe of Asher, it was an important position, including the creeks and harbours, Judges chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, on the coast, and commanding all approaches to Palestine from the sea on the north. Its soil was preeminently fertile, and well fulfilled the blessings of Jacob and Moses. Here Asher could dip his foot in the oil of his luxuriant olive groves, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 24 fatten on the bread, the fruit of his rich plains, and the royal dainties. Genesis chapter 49 verse 20. The produce of his vineyards and pastures, while for and under his shoes, Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 25, was the iron ore of Lebanon, and the brass, or copper, of the neighbouring Phoenician settlements. One tribe alone received no share in this allotment, like Simeon, but in a different sense, the tribe of Levi was to be divided in Jacob and scattered in Israel. Genesis chapter 49 verse 7 Devoted to the service of the sanctuary and sacrificial and other ministrations, this tribe depended for its maintenance on the tithes of the produce of land and cattle. Numbers chapter 18 But besides this, from each tribe, Four cities and their suburban pastures, or forty-eight in all, were set apart for it, and amongst these were included the six cities of refuge, three on each side of the Jordan. On the west, one, Kadesh in Naphtali, two, Shechem in Mount Ephraim, three, Hebron in Judah. On the east, four, Golan in Bashan, 
5. Ramoth Gilead in Gad, 6. Bezer in Reuben. The division of the promised land being thus concluded, and his own inheritance having been assigned to him at Timnath Sarah in Mount Ephraim, where he built a city and settled amongst the people he had led so prudently, Joshua summoned the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and having commended them for their bravery and fidelity, gave them his blessing, and bade them return to their own settlements beyond the Jordan. Joshua chapter 22 verses 1 to 6 Accordingly, these tribes departed, but while yet on the western side of the river, they set up a great altar, not indeed for burnt offering or for sacrifice, which would only be presented at the brazen altar of the tabernacle at Shiloh. Leviticus chapter 17 verses 8 and 9, Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 4 to 29. But as a standing witness to all generations, that though parted by that river, they were not sundered in religion or national interests from their western brethren. No sooner, however, was the erection of this altar announced to the other tribes than they assembled at Shiloh and made war upon their brethren, whom they deemed guilty of apostasy. But first they prudently resolved to send an embassy, with Phinehas and ten princes at its head, to try the effect of a friendly expostulation. Phinehas accordingly set out and laid before them the complaint of their brethren. What trespass, he asked, was this of which they were guilty in building this altar? Had they forgotten the judgments the nation had incurred by their sin in the matter of Baal Peor, or the trouble the nation suffered in consequence of the trespass of Achan? What then did they mean by this turning away from following the Lord and exposing the whole people to his deserved wrath? Startled at this suspicion of faithlessness, the two tribes and a half reiterated the most solemn protestations of their innocence. The altar they had erected was not intended for any sacrificial purposes whatsoever. It was simply an altar of memorial, a testimony to future generations that they had the same part and lot in the interests of the nation as their brethren on the west of Jordan. Even the zealous Phinehas could not but be satisfied with this explanation. It was no apostasy or rebellion, but at the worst an error in judgment. And the embassy returned with the joyful intelligence that there were no grounds for a quarrel or an appeal to arms, while the two tribes and a half, having named the altar Ed, or a witness, continued their journey to their eastern homes, where they settled down in the territories assigned them by Moses. And now, at length, the land had rest. The tribes east and west of Jordan established themselves in the lands of the heathen, and inherited the labour of the people. Psalm 105, verse 44. Before long, Joshua, already stricken in age, became aware that the day was at hand when he must go the way of all the earth. Summoning, therefore, the tribes of Israel with their elders, their judges, and their officers to Shechem, a spot consecrated by the remains of Joseph. Joshua chapter 24, verse 33. And the national acceptance of the blessings and cursings of the law. Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 to 35. He for the last time exhorted the nation to faithfulness to Jehovah. He reviewed their history from the day that their fathers dwelt on the other side of the Euphrates in the old time until now, when the Lord had given them cities which they builded not, vineyards and olive yards which they planted not. The call of Abraham, the descent of Jacob into Egypt, the wonders of the Exodus, the desert wanderings, the conquest of the Amorites on the east of Jordan, of the Canaanites on this, all these great events in their history were reviewed, and then the aged chief solemnly bade them choose whom they would serve, Jehovah who had done so great things for them, or the gods of their fathers and of the nations in whose land they dwelt. Thereupon the people solemnly renewed the covenant they had before made on the same spot, and, as an abiding memorial of their promise, Joshua set up a stone pillar 
under a sacred oak of Abraham and Jacob, and wrote out the words of the covenant in the book of the law of God. Joshua chapter 24 verse 26. This done, he bade every man depart unto his inheritance, and shortly afterwards, at the age of 110, this devout, blameless, fearless warrior died, and was buried in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Serah. Joshua chapter 24 verse 30. End of book 6, chapter 3. Book 7. Book 7, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 7, Period of the Judges. Book 7, Chapter 1. Events subsequent to the death of Joshua, Judges 1, B.C. circa 1425. The position of the Israelites at the death of Joshua was eminently favorable. A nation of freemen, entrusted at Sinai with the oracles of God, they were now in possession of the Promised Land. Though their late leader had not appointed any successor to those extraordinary functions he had retained throughout his life, a complete form of government had always obtained amongst them ever since they became a nation in Egypt. This was mainly kept up by the chiefs of the several tribes, the heads of the great families or clans, and the heads of houses. Compare Joshua 8, verse 33, 23, verse 2, and 24, verse 1. God himself was their king and, in a sensible and living presence, manifested himself at the tabernacle, now set up at Shiloh, and revealed his will through the mediation of the high priest. But, though their position was one of great privileges and blessings, it was none the less of trial and probation. The purposes for which the vine of Israel had been called out of Egypt, Psalm 80, verse 8, and planted in this goodly land could not be fulfilled without trouble and exertion. There were enemies without and within their newly acquired territory, ready at the first opportunity to attempt its recovery from their hands. If they were secure from their old oppressors, the Egyptians, yet on the south and southeast, the Midianites and Amalekites were only too likely to attack a people whose late victories must have been a continual source of jealousy, while on the northeast were formidable chiefs, who might, as in the days of their forefather Abraham, sweep down upon the country beyond the Jordan and grievously harass the eastern tribes. Moreover, extensive as the conquests of Joshua had been, they had not achieved, nor were they attended to achieve, the entire extirpation of the Canaanites. The conquered population retained large tracts and important positions in the very heart of the country. The Philistines retained the fertile plain of the Shephelah in the southwest. The almost impregnable fortress of Jabus still remained unconquered on the very border of Judah. Well nigh the entire sea coast from door to Sidon was in the hands of the Phoenicians. The strong towns of Bashin, of Tanakh, and Megiddo were still held by Canaanites in the fertile plain of Jezreel, while on the north still lingered formidable remnants of the great confederacy under Jadon. These nations had not been driven out hastily, but had been left to test and prove the fidelity of the generation that had not known the wars of Canaan, Judges 2.22, and the duty of subjugating them had been solemnly enforced by Joshua in his last address to the assembled tribes, Joshua 23, verses 5 through 10. Accordingly, we find that all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, the nation did not forget its vocation, but carried on the work to which it had been called, Judges 2, verse 7. 1. Thus Judah, whose conquest of Hebron and its vicinity has been already related, in alliance with the neighboring tribe of Simeon, attacked Bezek, slew 10,000 of its Canaanite and Perizzite inhabitants, and captured its ferocious king Adonai Bezek, whose cruel mutilation of 70 vassal princes gives us an insight into the character of the native chiefs whom Israel was commissioned to expel, Judges 1, verses 6 and 7. As he had done to others, so Judah did to him. They cut off his thumbs and his great toes and carried him captive to Jerusalem, i.e. to the lower city, which was taken and set on fire. But the upper city resisted all their efforts, as afterwards those of the tribe of Benjamin, Judges 1.21.
They were more successful, however, in other places and reduced numerous cities of the Canaanites in the central mountains, the southern desert, and the low country of the west. Judges 1, verses 17 and 18. 2. The powerful house of Joseph was not behindhand in following the example of the lion tribe of Judah. They sent spies to descry the town of Luz, who, seeing a man coming from thence, seized him, but consented to spare his life and that of his family on condition that he shewed them the entrance, on ascertaining which they smote the place with the edge of the sword. Thus, in addition to Shechem, the house of Joseph became possessed of another spot consecrated by the most sacred associations. Even the town near which was the stone pillar their father Jacob had set up on his way to Paddan Aram and called the place Bethel, the house of God, Judges 1, verse 22 through 26. But they were not similarly successful in expelling the Canaanites from Gezer near Lower Beth Horon, Judges 1, 29 or from their strongholds in the plain of Jezreel, Tanakh, Megiddo, and Bashin. Instead of utterly driving them out, they put them under tribute, as also the Amorites, who succeeded in thrusting the children of Dan from the fertile lowland of the sea coast into the mountains, to be themselves dispossessed in turn by the Philistines. Judges 1, verses 34 and 35. 3. Similar declensions from the strict line of duty marked the conduct of other tribes. Zebulun contented itself with merely imposing tribute on the nations within its borders. Asher made no attempt to expel the powerful Phoenicians on the seacoast, from Akko to Zidon, or from their more inland settlements, and Naphtali spared the inhabitants of the fences of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath, Judges 1, verse 30 through 33. This neglect of an obvious duty soon led to worse results. Contrary to the express commands of the law and the repeated exhortations of Moses and Joshua, the Israelites began to make leagues with the heathen nations. Leagues with nations led to marriages with individuals, and these to their natural consequences. Their new relatives invited the Israelites to their idolatrous festivals, where the consecrated licentiousness gratified their sensual appetites, and before long there arose a generation which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Judges 2.10 Forgetting him who had done so great things for them, they bowed themselves to strange gods and practiced the worst abominations, even sacrificing their sons and their daughters to Baal and Ashtaroth. Psalm 106, verse 37 and 38, and Judges 2, verse 13. This gradual spread of idolatry, and as a natural consequence of moral and social degeneracy, is strikingly illustrated by two incidents recorded in the last five chapters of the book of Judges, which seem to have been inserted for this very purpose as a kind of appendix to that book. End of Book 7, Chapter 1book 7 chapter 2 of a class book of old testament history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jl a class book of old testament history by george frederick mclear book 7 chapter 2 micah and the danites the tribal war judges 17 through 21 B.C. circa 1406. There was living, about twenty years after the death of Joshua and Mount Ephraim in central Palestine, a man named Micah, whose mother one day lost eleven hundred shekels of silver. So terrible was the curse she imprecated on the thief, that her son, in alarm, confessed that he had abstracted the money. Instead of reproaching him, his mother thereupon informed him that she had dedicated this sum, probably the savings of a lifetime, to the Lord, to make a graven and a molten image. Upon this, Micah restored the money to his mother, who sent two hundred shekels to a founder for the purpose of fashioning the idol. When made, it was set up in Micah's house, and he consecrated one of his sons as priest, and arrayed him in a sacred vestment, probably made in imitation of the ephod of the high priest. Not satisfied, however, with the ministrations of his son, on the arrival of a young Levite of Bethlehem in Judea, traveling, probably, in search of employment as a teacher of the law, he persuaded him also to become his priest, and agreed to give him ten shekels of silver a year, suitable sacerdotal vestments, and his living. 
On these terms, the Levite was content to dwell with him, became his priest, and was unto him as one of his sons. Soon after this, it happened that the tribe of Dan, being still hard-pressed by the Amorites and desirous of an addition to their territory, sent five spies from two towns in the low country to discover a new and advantageous settlement. The spies set out, and on their way came to Mount Ephraim, where they obtained a lodging in the house of Micah. Recognizing the voice of the young Levite, they inquired the cause of his presence there, and on ascertaining the position he held, begged him to ask counsel of Jehovah as to the success of their expedition. The Levite did so, and the answer was propitious. Thereupon the spies resumed their journey, and, tracking the Jordan to its source beyond the waters of Merom, came to an eminence on which rose the town of Laish, Tel el Kadi, a colony from Sidon, whose inhabitants, separated from their mother city by the huge mass of Lebanon and half of anti-Lebanon, dwelt quiet and secure, Judges 18, verse 7, in the enjoyment of the warm climate and exquisite scenery, and tilling the fertile soil irrigated by many streams. The spies marked the spot, and on their return bade their brethren arise and take possession of a place where there was no want of anything that is in the earth. Judges 18.10 Upon this, six hundred Danites from Zorah and Eshtael girded on their weapons of war, and went up and encamped at a spot behind kirjath Jerim, which, though it belonged to Judah, they named Mahanad Dan, or the Camp of Dan. Thence they ascended into the mountain range of Ephraim, and, like the spies before them, drew near the house of Micah. Informed that here there was an ephod and a teraphim, a graven image and a molten image, the six hundred warriors took their stand by the gateway leading into the court, and engaged the Levite in conversation, while the spies ascended into the sanctuary and stole away the images, with the sacerdotal vestments. On reappearing, the Levite tried to expostulate, but was speedily bidden to hold his peace and without much difficulty suffered himself to be persuaded that it would be better to accompany them, and, instead of being a priest unto one man, to become a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel. Judges 18.19 With such secrecy was their departure effected, that the Danites had got a good way from the house of Micah before the latter became aware of the grievous wrong he had sustained. Gathering together the inhabitants of the houses, which had gradually clustered round his idolatrous sanctuary, he pursued after the roving warriors. But it was in vain that he gave vent to his grief and rage. The spoilers only mocked him, and bade him take care he did not lose his life as well as his gods. Consequently, he was fain to return to his rifled sanctuary, while the six hundred held on their way northward. Reaching the source of the Jordan far up in the northern mountains, they found the town of Laish just as the spies had described it. Far from its mother city, the careless colony had no deliverer in its hour of peril. Without warning, the spoilers burst upon it, scaled its walls, set it on fire, and massacred its inhabitants, men, women, and children, without mercy. They afterwards rebuilt it, called it Dan after the name of Dan their father, and there set up the images they had taken from Micah. There, too, the young Levite, who, it seems, was no unimportant personage, but no other than Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of the great lawgiver Moses, ministered at this new sanctuary, and his descendants remained till the captivity. Judges 18, verses 14 through 31. If any proof were wanting of the association of religious with moral declension at this period, it is supplied by the biography of another Levite, which is also given in these concluding chapters of the Book of Judges. This Levite, who, like the other, dwelt on the edge of Mount Ephraim, took him a concubine out of Bethlehem Judah, who proved faithless and returned to her father's house. On this, her husband went in quest of her, and was received by her father with true eastern hospitality. As the fifth day declined after his arrival, resisting the importunities of his father-in-law, who would have had him stay longer, he rose up to return, and as night fell, drew near the town of Jebus, which still remained in the hands of its Canaanite inhabitants. Rejecting the advice of his servant to lodge there during the night, he pressed on, and it was already dark when he reached Gibeah and Benjamin. As he was sitting in the streets of the town, awaiting an offer of shelter, an old man approached, coming from his work in the fields. 
His home, too, was in Mount Ephraim, but he was sojourning at Gibeah. And, taking compassion on the homeless condition of the Levite, he brought him into his house and gave him a lodging for the night. As they sat at meat, certain of the lowest inhabitants of the place sat upon the house and treated the Levite's concubine with such violence that, in the morning when he arose, he found her lying dead before the door. Enraged at the savage act, he took her home, and there with his knife divided her, together with her bones, into twelve pieces, and sent them among the twelve tribes. This ferocious summons to vengeance roused all Israel as one man. Judges 20 verse 1. Even the tribes beyond the Jordan assembled with the rest of their brethren, and 400,000 warriors met at Mizpah in Benjamin, a fortified eminence a little to the north of Jebus, and listened to the Levite while he recounted the dark tale of outrage. Judges 20 verses 2 through 6. The recital excited still greater indignation, and all the people, knit together as one man, bound themselves by a solemn vow never to return to their homes till they had taken deep vengeance on the inhabitants of Gibeah for the disgrace they had brought upon Israel. Messengers were accordingly sent through the territory of Benjamin demanding their surrender. This the Benjamites absolutely refused, and, making the cause of Gibeah their own, prepared to encounter the men of Israel with all their forces, amounting to 26,000, together with the 700 warriors of Gibeah, chosen men, left-handed, each one of whom could sling stones at a hairbreadth and not miss. Judges 20, verse 16. In this juncture, instead of consulting the divine will whether they should embark in this war at all, the indignant tribes, having already decided on the campaign, only sought to know who should take the lead. Judah was the tribe indicated by the divine response, and in the engagement that ensued, the Israelites were defeated with a loss of upwards of 22,000 men. On the day following, they renewed the attack, but only to sustain a second reverse and the loss of 18,000 of their best troops. In the greatest distress at this double defeat, the eleven tribes assembled at Bethel, fasted the whole day until the evening, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Then Phineas, who had led the sacred war against the Midianites, inquired whether a third engagement should be hazarded, and in reply was bidden to go up, for this time the Lord would deliver Benjamin into their hand. Judges 20 verse 28. Thereupon it was resolved to repeat the tactics so successful at Ai. An ambuscade was planted behind Gibeah, and on the descent of the Benjamites, a flight was feigned to draw them from the town toward a spot, where the road divided into two paths, the one leading to Bethel, the other to Gibeah in the field, probably the modern Jabah. Unconscious of their danger, the Benjamites suffered themselves to be decoyed from the town and slew about thirty of their foes. Meanwhile, the ambuscade arose and, bursting on the defenseless town, put the inhabitants to the sword. A great pillar of flame and smoke signaled to the rest of the army the success of the stratagem, and the Benjamites, at last awakened to their danger, fled eastward to the desert region bordering on the Jordan Valley. But their foes now turned, and, enclosing them round about, Judges 20, verse 43, trode them down and slew 25,000. From this indiscriminate massacre, only 600 of the Benjamites effected their escape to the cliff of Rimmon, an inaccessible natural fortress situated about seven miles northeast of Gibeah and overhanging the wild region bordering on the Jordan. Here they entrenched themselves for a space of four months, while the eleven tribes, not content with firing and ravaging every town in the territory of Benjamin, bound themselves by a vow to abstain from all intermarriage with them. Regret, however, for the almost entire extinction of a tribe in Israel subsequently softened their hearts, and by a curious stratagem characteristic of this troubled period, when there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes, Judges 21 verse 25, they inquired whether any city had failed to take part in the late tribal war. Thereupon, it was discovered that Jabesh Gilead, a city on the east of the Jordan, had sent no forces to aid their brethren. Thither, therefore, 12,000 men were dispatched, with instructions utterly to destroy the recreant city and massacre every man and married woman. This ruthless order was executed to the letter, and the entire population was put to the sword, save 400 virgins, who were given in marriage to the remnant of Benjamin. 
these not sufficing for wives, the Benjamites took advantage of a yearly festival at the sanctuary of Shiloh, when the daughters of the place assembled to take part in the sacred dances, and, concealing themselves in the neighboring vineyards, burst forth upon the unsuspecting maidens and carried off each one a wife for himself, with whom they returned, repaired their towns, and dwelt in them. Judges 21, verses 23 through 25. End of Book 7, Chapter 2 Book 7, Chapter 3 of A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear Book 7, Chapter 3, Othniel and Ehud, Deborah and Barak, Judges 2 through 5, B.C. circa 1406 through 1296. The two incidents just recorded are illustrations of the turbulence and disorder of the period which followed the death of Joshua and of the elders that outlived Joshua. Forgetful of their vocation, the chosen people intermingled with the heathen Canaanites, conformed to their rites and customs, and so forfeited the protection and blessing of their invisible king. He therefore delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. He sold them to their enemies round about, and they were greatly distressed. Judges 2, 14 and 15. But on the first manifestation of repentance, he regarded their affliction, he heard their cry, Psalm 106, 44 and 45, and raised up deliverers, who saved them from their enemies. The Hebrew word used to denote these deliverers, these saviors of their country, shofet, shofetim, in which we have translated judge, is much the same as the sufs, sufets of the Carthaginians at the time of the Punic Wars. Raised up on extraordinary occasions, like the dictators in the history of Rome, they delivered the nation from some pressing danger, and their power and authority generally terminated with the crisis which had called them forth. Higher than the princes of the tribes, vested with extraordinary powers for the emergency, their office was not hereditary, though we shall see it finally tending in more than one instance towards fixedness and perpetuity, and in the person of Eli united with that of the high priest, Judges 10, verses 3 and 4, 12, verses 8 through 14, and 1 Samuel 8, verses 1 through 3. Invasion from the Northeast, Othniel. The crisis which called forth the first of these deliverers was the invasion of the country by Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. From the seat of his dominion between the Euphrates and the Tigris, he extended his conquests so far southward that the Israelites suffered grievously from his oppressions for a space of eight years. At the close of this period, Othniel, whose valor in attacking Kirjah Sefer in marriage with the daughter of the famous Caleb have been lately recorded, went out against him and defeated him and restored rest to the land for 40 years. Judges 3 verses 8 through 11. Invasion from the Southeast, Ehud. On his death, the people again fell into idolatry, and the Moabites under Eglon, aided by their old allies the Ammonites and Amalekites, crossed the Jordan and seized the ruined site of Jericho. From this vantage ground, Eglon was enabled to extend his dominion at least over the tribe of Benjamin, from which, if not from other tribes, he exacted annual tribute for a space of 18 years. This was brought to him at Jericho, where he would seem to have constructed a palace. On one occasion, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, was selected to command the party deputed to carry this proof of subjection. Having executed his commission, he accompanied his men as far back as the quarries, or rather the graven images at Gilgal, Judges 3.19 margin, possibly the idol temples, with which the Moabites had profaned the associations of that sacred spot. Thence he turned back, and on pretense of having a message from God to deliver to him, obtained a private interview with Eglon as he sat in his summer parlor, or parlor of cooling. Judges 3.20, margin, probably on the roof of his house, where he might catch the cool breezes that tempered the tropical heat of the Jordan Valley. On entering, Ehud repeated the purport of his errand, and Eglon bade the attendants instantly withdraw. Then, as he rose from his seat to meet his visitor, Ehud, who was left-handed like many of his tribe, drew a long two-edged dagger which he had made and hidden under his mantle upon his right thigh, Judges 3.16, and stabbed him with such force as to leave the weapon in his body. 
Without lingering a moment, he then shut and locked the doors of the chamber and fled through the porch or gallery that ran round the roof, and, passing beyond Gilgal, made for the wooded, shaggy hills of Sirath in the mountains of Ephraim. There he blew a horn and roused the Israelites, who rushed down the hills and followed him in the direction of Jericho. Meanwhile, the attendants had opened the door of Eglon's chamber and beheld the corpse lying on the floor. Panic-stricken at this unexpected death of their leader, and still more by the sudden rising of the Israelites, the Moabites fled towards the fords of the Jordan. But the Israelites had been beforehand with them, and, suffering none to cross, slew upwards of ten thousand men. Rest was now restored at least to the tribe of Benjamin for eighty years, but in the southwest, the Philistines, encouraged probably by the success of the Moabites, made an inroad and reduced the Israelites to great straits, Judges 5-6. But Shamgar, the son of Anath, was raised up to be a deliverer. Armed with nothing but a long iron-spiked ox goad, he made a sudden and desperate assault upon the Philistines and slew six hundred of them, thus obtaining a temporary respite for his people, Judges 3-31. Invasion from the north, Deborah and Barak. But a more terrible invasion was in store for the nation, which again on the death of Ehud relapsed into idolatry, Judges 4.1. This time the oppressor came from the north, where under a second Jabin, the Canaanites whom Joshua had defeated in his memorable victory at the waters of Miram, had recovered a portion of their former strength. With his vast hosts and his 900 chariots of iron commanded by Sisera, his captain, who resided at Herosheth of the Gentiles, he overran the country of the neighboring tribes, Asher, Naphtali, and Zebulun. Such was the general prostration and terror that, as had already been the case in the days of Shamgar, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers stole from place to place by crooked, torturous bypaths. Judges 5-6 Village life ceased in Israel, and the peasantry, abandoning the cultivation of the ground, retired for refuge to the walled towns. But even here they were not secure. There was war in the gates, the place usually devoted to the administration of justice, and even in the places of drawing water the noise of the archers could be heard twanging their terrible bows, Judges 5, verses 8 and 11. No resistance could be offered, for according to a common policy, 1 Samuel 13, verses 19 through 22, there had been a general disarmament of the people, and not a spear or shield was to be seen among 40,000 in Israel. Judges 5, verse 8. The spirit of the nation was completely crushed, and the second Jabin and Sisera, his captain, carried on unchecked for upwards of 20 years those measures whereby they reduced the Israelites to a condition of degrading servitude. Judges 4, verse 3. At length, however, a deliverer appeared. Under a solitary palm tree in the mountain range of Ephraim between Ramah and Bethel lived a prophetess named Deborah, who was or had been the wife of Lapidoth. In the failure of all other leaders, she was now regarded by the oppressed people with the utmost reverence, and they went up to her for judgment. Judges 4 verse 5. Like Joan of Arc in after times, her whole soul was fired with indignation at the sufferings endured by her people, and at length from Kadesh Naphtali, a city of refuge not far from Jabin's capital, Joshua 20 verse 7 and 21 verse 32, and therefore peculiarly animated with hostility to the oppressor, she summoned Barak, Lightning, the son of Abinoam. On the strength of a divine commission, she then enjoined him to gather 10,000 men from his own and the neighboring tribe of Zebulun to the green summit of Tabor, and promised to draw to the river Kishon in the plain of Esdraelon the great captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his host, and there deliver them into his hand. Barak declined to undertake the arduous enterprise, unless the prophetess promised to accompany him. To this she assented, but distinctly warned him that the expedition would not be for his honor, as he was thus willing to lean upon a woman's aid, so into the hands of a woman would the Lord deliver the leader of his enemy's forces. Leaving her seat of judgment, Deborah then accompanied Barak to Gadesh, and he employed himself in rousing his own tribe of Naphtali and that of Zebulun to join in the insurrection. Having at length gathered 10,000 men around his standard, he marched, still attended by the prophetess, to the high places of Tabor. There he was joined by portions of other tribes, whom the influence of Deborah had roused to take part in the great struggle, consisting of the princes of Issachar, a body of Ephraimites, and detachments from Benjamin and northeastern Manasseh, Judges 5, verses 14 and 15. Other tribes, however, came not thus zealously to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Of the two Martime tribes, Dan on the south clung to his ships in the port of Joppa, and Asher forgot the perils of his fellows in the creeks and harbors of his Phoenician allies, Judges 5, verse 17. 
The name of Judah is not even mentioned among the patriot forces. Amongst the tribes across the Jordan, great was the debate as to the course to be pursued. Reuben preferred to abide secure among his sheepfolds and to listen to the bleating of his flocks, and Gad to linger beyond the Jordan in his grassy uplands, Judges 5.17. But amidst the wavering of many hearts, Zebulun and Naphtali remained firm and prepared to jeopardize their lives unto the death on the high places of Tabor, Judges 5.18. Meanwhile, certain of the Kenites who had separated from the rest of their tribe in the hill country of Judah, Judges 116, and now dwelt under the oaks of Zanaim, near Kadesh, informed Sisera of the sudden movement of Barak towards Tabor, Judges 4, verses 11 and 12. Thereupon, without delay, he gathered all his forces and encamped on the level plain of Esdraelon between the friendly towns of Tanag and Megiddo, where he was also joined by other Canaanite chiefs anxious to quell the sudden insurrection. Judges 5, verses 3 and 19. At length, the heroic Deborah gave the encouraging command to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Probably long before it was light, the camp of Barak's little army was struck, and the patriot tribes, rapidly descending the winding mountain path, fell upon the hosts of Sisera and threw them into wild confusion. As they fled in utter dismay along the plain, not only the troops of Brack, but the stars in their courses, Judges 5.20, the elements of heaven began to fight against the Canaanites. A furious storm of rain and hail gathered from the east and, bursting right in their faces, rendered useless the bows of their archers and swelled into a mighty torrent the rivulets, springs, and spongy marshes near Megiddo. Before long, the ancient torrent of the Kishon, twisted or winding, rose in its bed, and the plain became an impossible morass. The chariots of Sisera were now utterly useless. The hoofs of the horses vainly plunging in the tenacious mud and swollen streams were broken by means of their prancings. Judges 5.22 The torrent of the Kishon, now rushing fast and furious, swept them away, and the strength of the Canaanites was trodden down. Stuck fast, entangled, overwhelmed, they could not stand for a moment before the avenging Barak, and not a man made good his escape to the city of their great leader, Herosheth of the Gentiles, before their pursuers had smitten them with the edge of the sword. Judges 4, verse 16. Meantime, while his mother and her attendants were vainly awaiting the return of his triumphal chariot, Judges 5, verse 28, Sisera himself fled away on foot to the friendly tribe of Heber the Kenite beneath the oaks of Zanaim, where he hoped for safety from his remorseless pursuers. After a while, he drew near the tent of Jael, Heber's wife, and chieftainess of the tribe. She herself had descried him approaching, and went forth to meet him. "'Turn in, my lord,' she said. "'Turn in to me, fear not.' And he turned in, and she covered him with a rug or blanket. Judges 4.18 Spent and weary, before he lay down, he asked for a little water to drink, but she gave him something better than water. She opened the skin bottle of milk, such as always stands by Arab tents. She brought forth butter, or thick curdled milk in a lordly dish, or the bowl used for illustrious strangers, and covered him again with the rug. Thus doubly assured of hospitality, Sisera bade her deny his presence if any inquired after him, and then laid him down and slept. But as she stood at the tent door, other thoughts than those of kindness towards the slumbering chief came over Jael. At length, taking one of the wooden sharp-pointed tent nails in one hand and a mallet in the other, she went softly unto him and smote him with such force that the nail entered into his temples and fastened his head to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, and so he died. Meanwhile, the pursuing Barak drew near. Him, too, Jael went forth to meet, and taking him within, showed him his terrible foe, the captain of the nine hundred iron chariots, lying dead upon the ground, with the nail driven through his temples. Thus, on that day, as the prophetess had said, God delivered Sisera into the hands of a woman. Together, she and Barak returned from the battlefield and chanted responsively a sublime triumphal hymn, celebrating the recent victory over the northern Canaanites, which now secured to the land rest for forty years. Judges 5 End of Book 7, Chapter 3Book 7, Chapter 4 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 7, Chapter 4. Invasion of the Midianites. Gideon. 
Judges 6 through 8, B.C. circa 1256 through 1249. As so often before, the effects of this last great deliverance were but transitory. Again, the Israelites relapsed into idolatry, and in consecrated groves practiced all the abominations that disgraced the worship of Baal. The national punishment they thus drew down upon themselves was more severe than anything they had yet endured. Since the sacred war led by Phineas against the Midianites, Numbers 31, 1-13, through that people had recovered much of their ancient strength, and now, in concert with the Amalekites and the children of the east, Judges 6, verse 3, or the Arabian tribes beyond the Jordan, they determined to invade the territory of Israel. Led by two superior chiefs, having the title of king, Zeba and Zamuna, and two inferior chiefs, Oreb and Zeb, the raven and the wolf, they poured into the country with their herds, their flocks, and their camels, like locusts for multitude, and gradually overran it from the plain of Jezreel, down the valley of the Jordan, and southward, as far as Gaza and the fertile lowlands of the west. Here they established themselves, destroyed the crops, and for a period of seven years reduced the Israelites to the greatest straits, so that they left the plains and fled for refuge to the dens or catacombs, which they cut out of the rocky mountains, to inaccessible strongholds and the limestone caves with which Palestine abounds. Judges 6 verse 2. As so often before, the deliverer came from the quarter most exposed to the ravages of the invaders. At Ophrah, in the hills of western Manasseh, not far from Shechem, and overlooking the plain of Jezreel, the headquarters of the Midianitish host, lived a high-born Abiezrite, a descendant of one of the princely families of Manasseh, Joshua 17, verse 2, and Numbers 26, verse 30, named Joash. The invasion had brought not only impoverishment, but dire bereavement into his home. In a skirmish near the heights of Tabor, the Midianite kings, Zeba and Zamuna, had slain all his noble sons save one, Gideon, Judges 8, verses 18 and 19. On one occasion, as Gideon was threshing wheat, not in the open summer threshing floor, but by the wine press near his native Ophrah, to hide it from the Midianites, an angel appeared and saluted him with the words, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. In reply, Gideon contrasted the present degraded condition of the nation with the glorious days when Jehovah brought them out of Egypt and complained that he had now deserted them, nor was there any hope of deliverance. Thereupon the angel informed him that he was the destined savior of his people, that the Lord would be with him, and that he should smite the Midianites as one man. Judges 6.16 Unable to believe that such a mission could be designed for himself, Gideon requested a sign to assure him that the speaker was a messenger of Jehovah, and by direction of the angel made ready a kid and cakes of unleavened bread and presented them under the oak. The angel then bade him lay the flesh and unleavened cakes upon the rock and pour the broth over them, and when he had done so, touched them with a rod he bore in his hand. Instantly there rose up fire from the rock and consumed the offering, in the midst of which the angel suddenly disappeared. The fact that he had thus been permitted to converse face to face with deity filled Gideon with alarm, but the Lord reassured him, and he built an altar there, which he called Jehovah Shalom, or the Lord send peace in memory of the salutation of the angel. Judges 6, 24. 1. Thus solemnly called to be the deliverer of his countrymen, Gideon was first commissioned to testify against the idolatrous practices which had caused the present national degradation. The Lord appeared to him in a dream and bade him throw down an altar which his father had erected in honor of Baal and cut down a grove he had set up and then to build, in an orderly manner, an altar to Jehovah on the rock where his meat offering had been accepted, and sacrifice thereupon his father's second bullock of seven years old. With the assistance of his servants, Gideon, during the night time, executed this commission, and on the morrow the townspeople were surprised to find that both altar and grove had disappeared. Enquiry led to the detection of the offender, and Joash was bid to bring forth his son that he might be put to death for the sacrilege of which he had been guilty. But Joash replied with much irony that he was truly guilty of impiety, who believed that Baal could not defend himself. Will ye take upon yourselves, said he, to plead Baal's cause? Let him plead for himself. A new name, which Gideon henceforth bore, Jerob Baal, or the trier of Baal, 
attested the national acquiescence in the wisdom of his father's reply. Judges 6, verse 32. 2. Tried and not found wanting in moral courage, Gideon was now directed to carry out the second part of his commission. Blowing a trumpet, he first gathered around him his own clan of Abiezer, and then sending messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, invited the aid of these tribes against the common enemy. With characteristic caution, however, he requested a further sign from Jehovah before actually entering upon his arduous task. A double sign was vouchsafed to him. A fleece of wool, first dripping with dew while all the soil around was hot and dry, then dry while all the soil around was damp, convinced him that the Lord would indeed deliver Israel by his hand. By this time, upwards of 32,000 of his countrymen had gathered around him, and with this force he encamped on the slope of Gilboa, near the spring of Jezreel, henceforth known as the spring of Herod, or trembling, overlooking the plain of Jezreel, covered with the tents of the Midianites. But the host was too many and too great for God to give victory thereby. If they were successful with their present numbers, they might vaunt that their own hand had saved them. Proclamation was therefore made that from the spring of trembling, all who were afraid to persevere in their arduous enterprise might return to their homes. Of this permission, 22,000 at once availed themselves and went their way. But another trial was to test the qualifications of the rest. By divine command, Gideon took the remaining 10,000 of his forces to the spring and watched them as they assuaged their thirst. While all the rest bowed down upon their knees, 300, putting their hand to their mouth, lapped of the water with their tongues as a dog lappeth. Judges 7, 5, and 6. These 300 Gideon set by themselves. The rest he sent away. Night now drew on, and with his little band, like the same famous number at Thermopylae, he was left alone on the brow of the steep mountain which overlooks the Vale of Jezreel, where Midian and Amalek and all the children of the east lay along like locusts for multitude, their camels gaily caparisoned, numerous as the sand on the seashore. Judges 7.12 to confirm the faith of Gideon in this great crisis, God now bade him, attended by Pura his armor-bearer, drop down from the height where he was, and go to the host of his enemy. Accordingly, the two crept down cautiously from rock to rock in the still night to the outskirts of the Midianitish tents, where Gideon overheard a man tell his fellow how he had dreamt a dream, and, lo, a cake of common barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came unto a tent, and smote it, that it fell, and overturned it, that the tent lay along. To this recital the other replied, showing the reputation Gideon had gained even amongst his foes. This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hands hath God delivered Midian and all the host. Judges seven thirteen and 14. The listener heard the dream and the interpretation, and straightway knew what he was to do. Returning up the mountain to his faithful three hundred, he divided them into three companies, and gave to every man a horn, an earthen pitcher, and a firebrand or torch, Judges 7.16, margin, to put therein. Then bidding them follow him, and do exactly as they saw him do, in the beginning of the middle watch, he again stole down towards the outskirts of the tents of the Midianites, while the three companies, following silently, took their places, every man round about the slumbering camp. Then Gideon and his company suddenly blew their horns, and at this signal three hundred horns blew, three hundred pitchers crashed, three hundred torches blazed, and the always terrible war cry of the Israelites, the sword of Jehovah and of Gideon, rent the midnight air. In a moment the Midianites and Amalekites were roused and thrown into inextricable confusion and alarm. Amidst the blazing of so many torches, the crashing of so many pitchers, and the blast of so many trumpets all on different sides, they imagined themselves attacked by an enormous force, filled with uncontrollable terror. They turned their swords against one another, and then rushed with one accord down the steep descent towards the Jordan eastward to Bashita, the house of the Acacia, and Abel Mahola, the meadow of the dance. Hotly pursued, not only by the three hundred, but some of the forces of Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, now convinced amidst the returning light of day that Gideon had indeed achieved a great victory. Judges seven twenty three. The Midianites hoped to reach the fords of Bethbara immediately under the highlands of Ephraim. 
But Gideon had already sent messengers thither, and the Ephraimites were not slow to seize the fords and intercept the flying foe, but not before a considerable body had already crossed with the two kings, Zeb and Zamuna. But they were in time to capture the two inferior chiefs, Oreb and Zeb, the one at a sharp cliff, the other at a wine press, where they slew them, and, cutting off their heads, hurried after Gideon, who, with his three hundred, was already on the other side of the Jordan, faint yet pursuing. Annoyed, now that the victory was won, that they had not been summoned to join in the battle, the haughty Ephraimites chode with him, and manifested great resentment. With rare self-restraint, the victorious leader asked what, after all, he had done in comparison with them. Pointing to the bloody heads of the princes they had slain, he inquired whether the grapes Ephraim had already gleaned were not better than the entire vintage of his little clan of Abiezer. This soft answer turned away the wrath of the offended tribe, and the chase was renewed. Judges 8, verses 1 through 3. Two places on the track of the pursuit refused to befriend Gideon. The men of Succoth on the east of the Jordan, near the ford of the torrent Jabok, and of Penuel further up the mountains, declined to supply his nearly exhausted troops with bread, and mocked at him when he said he was chasing the kings of Midian. Halting only to threaten them with vengeance on his return, he hurried on after the enemy. The victorious Israelites had already slain 120,000, but 15,000 with the two kings had reached Karkor, far from any towns in the open desert waste east of the Jordan. Here they thought themselves secure, but Gideon, ascending from the valley of the Jordan, burst upon them, put them to a complete rout, and at last captured the two kings, Ziba and Zamuna. Then, in triumph, the conqueror returned down the long defiles leading to the Jordan, followed by his cavalcade of captives mounted on their gaily decked camels. Judges 8, verse 21. As he passed Penuel, he raised to the ground its lofty watchtower and slew the men of the city. Reaching Succoth, he obtained from a young man of the place a description of its seventy-seven headmen and showed them the captive kings. And then, with the thorny branches of the neighboring acacia groves, he beat them to death. Then, pushing westward, he reached his native Ophrah. There, turning to the captive kings, and at length revealing the secret of this long pursuit, he inquired what manner of men they were whom they had murdered on the green slopes of Tabor. As thou art, so were they, was the reply. Each one resembled the children of a king. The remembrance of his brothers, the sons of his own mother, filled the warrior with wrath. Had they shown mercy to them, he would have spared his prisoners. But now that could not be. Summoning, therefore, his firstborn, Jether, he bade him draw his sword and slay them. But the boy quailed before those mighty kings, and at their request, Gideon himself took the sword and slew them, and gathered up the golden chains and crescent-shaped cowlers and trappings of their camels. Judges 8, verses 18 through 21. The immediate effect upon the nation of this deliverance was greater than that of any other. Not only had the country quietness for forty years, Judges 8, verse 28, not only did Gideon's altar and the spring of trembling and the rock Oreb, or the raven's crag, and the winepress of Zeb remain standing monuments of this great day, when God made like a wheel and drove over the uplands of Gilead as stubble before the wind, Psalm 83, 13 and 14, like clouds of chaff blown from the summer threshing floors, the proud people which had said, let us take to ourselves the pastures of God in possession, Psalm 83, verse 12, but... For the first time, the Israelites offered hereditary royal dignity to the great conqueror. Rule thou over us, said they, both thou and thy son, and thy son's sons also. Gideon had the rare self-control to decline the flattering request. I will not rule over you, said he. Neither shall my son rule over you. Jehovah shall rule over you. One request only, and a strange one, did he make of the grateful tribes, that they would give him the golden earrings and the other ornaments they had taken from the conquered foe. Willingly into his cloak the people flung the ornaments, jewels, and chains from the camel's necks to the weight of 1,700 shekels. And with these Gideon made an ephod, and put it in his native Ophrah, and all Israel went a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Though he declined the royal dignity, he was addicted to a royal failing. He multiplied wives and begat seventy sons, and, after living to a good old age, descended in peace to the tomb of his father Josiah and Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Judges 8.32 End of Book 7, Chapter 4「Book 7, Chapter 5 of A Class Book of the Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick MacLear. Book 7, Chapter 5. Abimelech and Jephthah. Judges 9 through 12. B.C. circa 1249 through 1188. After the death of Gideon, Jehovah, whose minister he had been for the deliverance of the people, was again forgotten by the Israelites. Forgetting him who had sent Gideon, they made Baal Baroth, Baal of the Covenant, their god, and set up his sanctuary even in Shechem, though hollowed by the memories of the patriarchs and the solemn ratification of the law. Meanwhile, Gideon's seventy sons appear to have exercised authority over some portion of the country. One of them, whose name was Abimelech, the son of a slave, a Canaanite native of Shechem, after consultation with his mother's brethren and her relatives, Judges 9-1, suggested that, in place of the divided authority of his numerous brothers, he, their bone and their flesh, Judges 9-2, should be vested with the supreme authority. The spirit of clanship was strong. He is our brother, whispered the family to the Shechemites, who, at length, fell in with this scheme, and lent Abimelech seventy pieces of silver from the sanctuary of Baal Barith. With the money he hired a body of men, and, going to his father's house at Ophrah, murdered all his brethren, save Jotham the youngest, who managed to escape. He was now left alone, and was solemnly anointed king by the men of Shechem, who thus formally signified their revolt from the Hebrew commonwealth. Tidings of what was going on reached the ears of Jotham. Emerging from his hiding place, he stationed himself on one of the rocky, inaccessible spurs of Mount Gerizim, and taking up his parable from the variegated foliage of the valley below and the neighboring forest, bade the men of Shechem listen while he addressed to them the earliest parable, that of the Bramble King. Once, he said, the trees went forth to anoint a king over them. The olive, the vine, the fig were each asked to accept the royal dignity, but each declined. The olive could not leave his fatness, nor the fig tree his sweetness, nor the vine the juice of his grapes. Recourse was then had to the bramble, which not only accepted the proffered honor, but bade the other trees put their trust in its shadow, and threatened, if they did not, that fire should come forth from it and devour even the cedars of Lebanon. Jotham then reminded the Shechemites of the services his father had rendered to the nation and rebuked them for their gross ingratitude to his family. If they thought they had done well in electing Abimelech, the Bramble King, he bade them rejoice in him. If not, he hoped a fire might come forth from the king, in whose shadow they had placed their trust, and destroy him and all who joined in electing him. With these words, the speaker fled. In a short time, his words were fulfilled. For three years, Abimelech maintained his supremacy, residing himself at Aruma, Judges 941, not far from Shechem, while that place was entrusted to Zebul, his viceroy. During the joyous season of the vintage, Judges 927, Gael, the son of Ebed, a leader of a body of freebooters, tried to persuade the people of Shechem to transfer their allegiance from Abimelech, who was but half a kinsman, to the Hivite tribe of Hamor. Intelligence of this movement reached the ears of Zebul, who, without delay, sent word to Abimelech, bidding him levy his forces and surprise the plotters in the city. After a desperate battle, Abimelech captured the place, put the entire population to the sword, and sowed the ruins of the city with salt. Judges 9.45 A remnant, however, of the insurgents took refuge in the temple of Baal Barith. Thither Abimelech pursued them at the head of his followers, whom he commanded on their way to cut down boughs from the trees on the wooded eminence of Zalman, Psalm 68, verse 14, close to the city. These he piled against the hold, set them on fire, and suffocated and burnt the refugees. From Shechem he repaired to Thebes, Tubas, and speedily captured the town, but again the inhabitants took refuge in one of its strong towers, and there held out. Forcing his way up to it, Abimelech was about to repeat the stratagem he had found so successful at Shechem, Judges 9, verse 52, when a woman flung a fragment of a millstone at his head. Unwilling to die thus ingloriously, he bade his armor-bearer thrust him through with his sword, and so expired. Other judges now succeeded, of whom Tola, of the tribe of Issachar, governed Israel for a space of 23 years at Shamir and Mount Ephraim, Judges 10, verses 1 and 2. He was succeeded by Jair of Gilead, who, during twenty-two years, shared his almost regal honors with his thirty sons. Judges 10, verses 3 and 4. Invasion of the Ammonites. Jephthah. 
but recent judgments had not the effect of restraining the people from apostasy. To the worship of Baal and Ashtore, they now added that of the gods of Syria, of Zidon, of Moab, and Ammon, as also of the Philistines. The national punishment they thus drew down upon themselves came from two quarters. On the southwest and along the fertile borders of the Shephelah, the Philistines rose and reduced a portion of the country to subjection, while the tribes on the east of Jordan fell a prey to the Ammonites, and for eighteen years endured the humiliation of irksome oppression. Nor were they the only sufferers, for the Ammonites crossed the Jordan and carried on their ravages even in the territories of Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. Judges 10, verses 6 through 9. So terrible was the oppression they now endured that at length the Israelites were roused to a deep repentance. Finding it in vain to cry unto their false gods in the day of tribulation, they put them away and besought Jehovah, if only this once, to stretch forth his hand and deliver them. Grieved for the misery of Israel, Judges 10, verse 16, the Lord raised up a deliverer in the person of Jephthah, a base-born native of Gilead. Driven forth from his father's house by his legitimate sons, Jephthah had fled into the land of Tob, somewhere on the east of Gilead, where, putting himself at the head of brave but lawless men, he lived the life of a freebooter, making incursions from time to time into the territories of neighboring tribes and living on the proceeds of the spoil. Judges 11 verses 1 through 3. Determined to throw off the Ammonites' yoke, the tribes on the east of Jordan now turned to Jephthah and promised him the chieftaincy if he would undertake to lead them against the enemy. Jephthah consented, and it was formally agreed that, in the event of success, he should retain the supreme command. His first step was to send an embassy to the Ammonites urging the right of the Israelites to the land of Gilead. This being unsuccessful, he prepared for open war, and, traversing Gilead and Manasseh, collected warriors from such places as acknowledged his authority. But before entering on the campaign, in imitation probably of heathen customs, and especially of the Ammonites, Second Kings 3 verse 27, he solemnly vowed to offer as a burnt offering to Jehovah whatever should first come forth from his house to meet him on his return from battle. The engagement took place in the forests of Gilead, and the Ammonites were utterly routed. Twenty cities, from Aror on the Arnon to Minith and Abel Karamim, the meadow of the vineyards, fell into the hands of the conqueror. Judges 11.33 But his rash and heathenish vow cast a deep shadow on his triumphal return. As he drew near his home in Mizpah, the watchtower of Gilead, his daughter and only child came forth to meet him with timbrels and with dances. When the father saw her, he rent his clothes and with the utmost grief made known to her his vow, from which he declared he could not go back. But the noble maiden did not decline the awful sacrifice demanded of her. All she requested was that for two months she might be allowed to wander with her companions among the mountain gorges of her native Gilead and bewail her virginity. At the expiration of this period, she returned to her father and Jephthah without referring the matter to the high priest or remembering the strict commands of the law on the subject, his spirit clouded with gloomy superstition, did with her according to his vow that he had vowed. Judges 11.39 The memory of this awful sacrifice was kept up by a yearly festival, lasting four days, during which the daughters of Israel went up into the mountains of Gilead to praise and lament the death of their heroic sister. Jephthah, however, was not long suffered either to enjoy his triumph or lament the fatal vow which had stained it. Like Gideon before him, he had to encounter the complaints of the proud and jealous tribe of Ephraim for not summoning them to share the glories of the late victory. In vindication of their absurd claims, they even threatened to burn his house over his head and invaded the territory of the Gileadites, whom they taunted with being fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and Manassites. A second tribal war ensued, in which the men of Ephraim were thoroughly worsted. Rushing routed to the fords of the Jordan, they found them already in possession of Jephthah's forces, who allowed none to cross that failed to pronounce the word Shibboleth. Upwards of 42,000 revealed their Ephraimite origin by substituting the simple S for SH and were massacred. The supreme authority for which he had covenanted, Jephthah only lived to enjoy for six years when he died and was buried in one of the cities of his native land. Judges 12 verses 1 through 7. After him, other and obscurer judges rose to display the growing tendency towards hereditary monarchy. Thus, Isbin of Bethlehem and Zebulun judged, at least northwestern Israel, for seven years and conferred a portion of his dignity on his thirty sons and thirty daughters. 
Elon of the same tribe ruled for ten years, and after him, Abdon of Pirathon in the land of Ephraim, about six miles from Shechem, exercised the supremacy for eight years, and was succeeded in a portion of his almost regal honors by his numerous children. Judges 12, verses 8 through 14. End of Book 7, Chapter 5. Book 7, Chapter 6 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick MacLear. Book 7, Chapter 6. Invasion from the Southwest. Samson. Judges 13 through 16. B.C. 1161 through 1120. Meanwhile, the Philistines on the southwest had not only established themselves in the Shekelah, or Low Country, but now commenced that long and deadly hostility to the Israelites, which lasted from this time through the reigns of Saul and David, and was not finally terminated till the time of Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18, verse 8. Their oppressions naturally pressed most heavily on the little tribe of Dan, already hard-pushed by the Amorites. From this tribe, then, the Deliverer came— but unlike others who had been called to the same office, he was specially set apart for it even before his birth. On the high hill of Zor, overlooking the fertile lowlands of Philistia, lived a Danite named Manoah. To his wife, who as yet had no child, it was announced by an angel that she was about to become the mother of a son, whom she was to devote as a Nazarite unto God from his birth. No razor was ever to come upon his head, wine and strong drink he was never to touch, and he should commence the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines. Judges 13 verse 5. These words were announced to Manoah by his wife, and a second appearance of the angel was vouchsafed to assure both parents of the certainty of these events, which was further confirmed, as in the case of Gideon, by the disappearance of the angel in the flames which consumed the Danites meat offering. Judges 13 verse 20. In process of time, the child was born and was named Samson, either the sunlight or the strong. As he grew, he became distinguished for supernatural strength, and from time to time in Mahanadan, the camp of the famous 600 of his tribe, was moved to perform those exploits which made him the terror of the Philistines. His first action, however, when come to man's estate, did not display the hostility to the national enemy, which his parents would naturally have expected. At Timnath, then in the occupation of the Philistines, he saw one of the daughters of the place whom he was resolved to marry. Very unwillingly did his father and mother give their consent, and went down from Zorah with their wayward son through wild rocky gorges to the vineyards of Timnath, situated, as was often the case, far from the village to which they belonged, and amidst rough wadis and wild cliffs. In one of these, Samson encountered a young lion, and though he had nothing in his hand, rent it as he would have rent a kid. Thinking little of the circumstance, he did not mention it to his father and mother, but went with them to Timnath and talked with the woman, and she pleased him well. On his second descent through the same wild rocky pass, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and discovered amongst the bones a swarm of bees. A portion of the honey he took himself, and gave a portion to his parents, saying nothing of his exploit or the place whence he had obtained the honey. The wedding festival was celebrated at Timnath and lasted several days, on one of which the bridegroom put forth a riddle to his thirty Philistine companions, promising thirty sheets and thirty changes of garments to any that guessed it, but demanding the same of them if, within the days of the feast, they failed to discover it. The young men accepted the challenge, and Samson put forth his riddle, saying, Out of the eater came forth meat, out of the strong came forth sweetness. For three days the Philistine youths tried to unravel it and failed. Then they beset Samson's wife and threatened to burn her and her father's house if she did not ascertain for them the interpretation. During the remaining days, therefore, she implored of Samson with tears the revelation of the secret. At first he was proof against her entreaties, but on the last day of the feast he told her, and she revealed it to the thirty Philistines, who came to him in the evening and said, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle, was the giant's brief reply. 
and going down to Ashkelon, one of the five cities of the lords of the Philistines, on the extreme southern edge of the Mediterranean Sea. He slew thirty men, and of the spoil brought the stipulated reward. Then, in great wrath, he returned to Zorah. But when wheat harvest came round, his passion for the woman was somewhat rekindled, and he resolved to present her with a kid, and now learned from her father for the first time that, probably during his absence at Ashkelon, thinking he utterly hated her, he had bestowed her upon another. Thereupon, Samson, being enraged, resolved to wreak his vengeance on the Philistines, and catching, probably in pitfalls and snares, three hundred foxes, he fastened them tail to tail with lighted firebrands in the midst, and sent them into their cornfields, olive yards, and vineyards. Terrible was the mischief thus inflicted in the country, which, even now, in the summer months, is one sea of dead ripe grain, dry as tinder. At length, the Philistines ascertained who was the author of this destructive conflagration, and went to the house of his late wife, and burnt her and her father to death. Thereupon, Samson avenged himself by inflicting upon them a great slaughter, and went and took up his abode on the lofty cliff of Etim, probably not very far from Bethlehem. Thither the Philistines pursued him, and demanded his surrender of the men of Judah. So utterly lost to all feelings of honor, so degraded from its former high estate was this tribe, that three thousand men actually scaled the rocky cliff and brought Samson bound with two new cords to his enemies. On his approach, the Philistines raised a mighty shout, but at the moment, supernatural strength was given to the captive. He burst his bonds as though they had been cords of flax burnt in the fire, and, seizing the jawbone of an ass, and aided probably by the now inspirited Israelites, slew a thousand of the Philistines. In memory of this exploit, he named the place Ramath Lahai, the casting away of the jawbone. Sore athirst after his exertions, he feared that, from sheer exhaustion, he might fall once more into the hands of his foes. But from a hollow place in Lahai, God caused water to issue, and his spirit reviving, he called this spot en Hakor, the spring of the crier. Judges 15, verses 16 through 19. Samson is next found at Gaza, the strong, which, though allotted to and conquered by Judah, Joshua 15:47 and Judges 1, 18, had fallen into the hands of the Philistines, who now encompassed the gate of the city, intending to capture him in the morning. But at midnight he arose and, taking the doors of the gate and the two posts, carried them, bar and all, to the top of the hill before Hebron. After this, he fell in love with Delilah, a Philistine courtesan of the Valley of Sorek, apparently near Gaza. This last amour led to his capture and death. For the enormous reward of 1,100 pieces of silver from each lord, equivalent to 5,500 shekels, the five lords of the Philistines persuaded her to undertake the task of discovering the secret of his great strength. Three times she importuned him to reveal the mystery, but he succeeded in putting her off with wiles. Green whites, new ropes, the binding of his seven clustering locks to the web, all these expedients were powerless to detain him prisoner, and he escaped with ease from the hands of the Philistines. The fourth time, however, she succeeded, and he told her all his heart, revealing the secret of his Nazarite vow. Accordingly, while he was asleep upon her knees, she caused his seven locks to be shaved off, and when he awoke, the giant found that his strength had departed from him. The watching Philistines sprang into the chamber, took him, bored out his eyes, and brought him bound with brazen fetters to Gaza, where they made him grind in the prison house. Judges 16.21 Then a day was fixed for a solemn festival in honor of Dagon, their national deity, half man and half fish, to whom the deliverance of the nation from their dreaded foe was ascribed. In the midst of the feast, Samson was brought in to make sport for his unfeeling captors. The temple, where the festival was held, situated probably on a sloping hill, was full of men and women, and even on the roof upwards of three thousand were packed together. The blinded giant was led in by a lad, and, at his own request, was suffered to feel the pillars on which the temple stood. Standing there, he prayed that his old strength might for this once be restored to him, and that he might be enabled to wreak a complete revenge on his unfeeling enemies. Taking hold of the pillars with both hands, and praying that he might die with the Philistines, he bowed himself with all his might, and the temple walls fell in, and crushed the lords of the Philistines and the assembled crowd. 
Samson's body was extricated from the ruins and, in sad procession, was borne by his brethren and kinsmen up the steep ascent to his native hills and laid between Zorah and Eshtael in the burial place of Manoah, his father. Judges 16.31 As judge, Samson's supremacy had lasted twenty years. The words of the angel to his parents had declared that he should begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines, and, in truth, his work was only begun. Its completeness was marred chiefly by himself. His acts were dictated mainly by caprice and the impulse of the moment. He frittered away the great powers which had been bestowed upon him and forgot the divine call which he had received. Still, these incomplete results may in some measure be fairly ascribed to the character of his countrymen. They always permitted him to stand unaided and alone and even surrendered him to the enemy. The work that he began needed a very different man to complete it. The spirit of the people needed renewal, and an internal reformation was essential. Before recounting the means whereby this was brought about, the sacred narrative presents us with a little history, which strikingly illustrates the repose and peacefulness which characterized some of the calmer intervals in the disturbed period of the judges. From Bethlehem, Judah, they went forth during a season of famine to Ephrathites of the place, Elimelech and Naomi, with their sons Malon and Kilian, to seek a home across the Jordan in the land of Moab. Here Elimelech died, and his two sons married two of the daughters of Moab, Orpah and Ruth. After a period of about ten years, his sons also died, and Naomi, hearing that the famine had ceased in the land of Israel, prepared to return to her native town, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, whom no entreaties could induce to remain amongst her own people. It was the beginning of barley harvest when they returned, and Ruth went to glean near Bethlehem in the fields of Boaz, a man of wealth and a kinsman of Elimelech. The appearance and the story of the beautiful stranger, which he learnt from the townspeople, attracted the attention of Boaz to the Moabitess, and he permitted her not only to glean in his fields, but to share with his laborers the provisions supplied them. By the advice of her mother-in-law, Ruth afterwards claimed kinship with the wealthy Boaz, and he was not slow to acknowledge it. A nearer kinsman, however, was first asked to discharge these duties, which included not only the redemption of the land that had belonged to Elimelech, but also the taking of Ruth in marriage to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, Deuteronomy 25, 5-10. On his declining to perform the latter duty, Boaz redeemed the land in the presence of ten elders of Bethlehem and the assembled people, and married Ruth, by whom he became the father of Obed, the grandfather of King David. A more pleasing picture of country life can hardly be imagined than the story of the gleaner Ruth, illustrating, as it does, the friendly relations between the good Boaz and his reapers, the Jewish land system, the method of transferring property from one person to another, the working of the Mosaic law for the relief of distressed and ruined families, but, above all, handing down the unselfishness, the brave love, the unshaken trustfulness of her, who, though not of the chosen race, was, like the Canaanitess Tamar, Genesis thirty eight twenty nine and Matthew one three, and the Canaanitess Rahab, Matthew one five, privileged to become the ancestress of David, and so of great David's greater son. Ruth four verses eighteen through twenty two. End of book seven, chapter six. End of book seven. Book 8. Book 8, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 8. From the Time of Samuel to the Ascension of David. Book 8, Chapter 1. Eli and Samuel, 1 Samuel 1 through 4, BC circa 1171 through 1141. During the 20 years that Samson judged Israel, the high priesthood, diverted for reasons not revealed from the line of Eliezer to the younger line of Ithamar, 1 Chronicles 6 verses 4 through 15 and 24 verse 4, had been filled by Eli, who henceforth appears to have discharged the united duties of high priest and judge. The tabernacle with the ark was now at Shiloh, where a town had rapidly grown up. Inside the gateway leading up to it was a seat or throne, 1 Samuel 1, 9 and 4.13, on which Eli used to sit and then survey the worshippers as they came up on high days to the festivals. 
Year by year, as he sat there, he would see amongst the pilgrims coming up to the Feast of Tabernacles the family of Alkana, a man of Ramathaim Zophim in Mount Ephraim. Though a Levite in the line of Kohath, First Chronicles 6, verse 27 through 34, he affords one of the few instances of polygamy in the ranks of the lower orders. By his wife Penina, he had several children. By Hannah, his favorite wife, he had none, which was, to her, a source of much trouble, and brought down upon her many taunts from her rival. On one occasion, as Eli sat on his throne at the gate, he was led more particularly to notice one of this little family group. At the close of the sacrificial feast, unable any longer to endure the mockery of her rival and her own bitterness of heart, Hannah remained long in silent prayer at the sanctuary. The high priest saw her lips move, but heard no sound of her voice as she prayed. Thinking that she had indulged to excess at the feast, he rebuked her and bade her put away her wine from her. Then Hannah told him of her secret grief, and the aged priest, convinced of his error, quickly made amends by bestowing upon her his blessing, and expressing a hope that the God of Israel might grant the petition she had preferred. 1 Samuel 1.17 The story of the wife of Manoah was probably not unknown to Hannah, and she too prayed that, if the Lord would grant her a man-child, she would devote him as a Nazarite to his service all the days of his life. Her prayer was heard. Before the Feast of Tabernacles came round again, she had become the mother of a son, to whom she gave the appropriate name of Samuel, the Asked, or Heard of God. When he was weaned, she brought him to Shiloh with three bullocks, an ephah of flour, and a skin bottle of wine, and, having poured forth her thankfulness in an inspired hymn, presented the boy to Eli as the child for whom she had prayed, and whom she now wished to return to the Lord. 1 Samuel 2, verses 1-11 through In striking contrast with the simplicity and innocence of the young child, who henceforth waited upon Eli, the two sons of that pontiff, Hophni and Phinehas, were sons of Belial, they knew not the Lord. By their rapacity and lust they had filled all Israel with loathing and indignation, so that men abhorred the offering of the Lord. But Eli restrained them not, and as years went on, their wickedness only seemed to increase in spite of his expostulations. It was a dark day in Israel, and their conduct gives us a terrible glimpse into the fallen condition of the chosen people. 1 Samuel 2, verses 12 through 21. Before long, the first warning came to Eli. A man of God stood before him, and after reminding him of the high honor God had conferred upon him when he chose him to be his high priest, sternly rebuked him for honoring his sons above their maker, and announced that, instead of the office remaining in his family, its high functions should be transferred to another and more faithful line. And not only did he thus denounce distant punishment, but an immediate and speedy pledge of it in the death on one day of both his sons. 1 Samuel 2, verses 27 through 36. But this warning produced no effect. Eli was old and gray-headed. However fitted he might have been once for the task of ruling his family, that day was gone by now. A second warning, therefore, of coming dune was now given him, not by the mouth of any stranger, but of the child whom Hannah had left in the tabernacle at Shiloh, alone unto the Lord. Clad in a white linen ephod, and the little mantle reaching to the feet, which his mother brought from year to year, his long flowing hair betokening his Nazarite vow, Samuel ministered before Eli. The degraded state of the priesthood in the hands of Hophni and Phinehas had made intimations of the divine will rare and precious in those days. There was no open vision. But the Lord found a way to intimate the coming doom of Eli's house. One night, when the aged priest had lain down to rest in one of the chambers hard by the tabernacle, which was illumined only by the light of the seven-branched golden candlestick, in the early morning, before it was yet light, a voice called Samuel and awoke him from his slumber. Thinking Eli had called him, he went to him and inquired the cause. But Eli had not spoken and bade him lie down again. He did so, and again the voice pronounced his name. Once more, he ran to the bedside of the high priest, who, as before, denied that he had called him and told him to return to his bed. A third time the voice pronounced his name, and then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child and bade him, if he heard it again, reply, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Samuel returned to his bed, and when the voice called to him for the fourth time, answered as the aged priest had bidden him, and heard the purport of the mysterious call. The Lord was about to do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of him that heard it should tingle. 
Eli's sons had made themselves vile, and he had not restrained them. For this iniquity, his house was now to be judged, and neither sacrifice nor offering could make atonement. When the Lord began, he would also make an end. Until the sun was up, Samuel lay still and forbore to tell Eli what he had heard. But the high priest, whose conscience, doubtless, only too surely whispered what it was, bade him hide nothing from him. And then the old man, whose eyes were dim that he could not see, listened while the child told him every whit. Death awaited his sons, beggary and desolation his family. It is the Lord, was his brief reply. Let him do what seemeth him good. And in the course of time, the warning was fulfilled. As Samuel grew, the Lord began to reveal himself more and more to him. The influence of Eli, already weakened, now dwindled from day to day. He decreased and Samuel increased, and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground, so that all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that he was established to be a prophet, a revealer of the divine will. 1 Samuel 3, verses 19 through 21. Meanwhile, the strength of the Philistines had recovered from the wounds it had received from the champion of Dan. Advancing their forces to Aphek, no great distance from the fortress of Jebus, they attacked the Israelites and inflicted on them a loss of 4,000 men. Alarmed at this reverse, the Israelites resolved to fetch the ark and take it into battle, that it might save them out of the hands of their enemies. The sacred symbol was thereupon removed from the curtains that enclosed it, and the two sons of Eli accompanied it to the field. A great shout, so that the earth rang again, greeted its arrival in the Israelite camp, and the Philistines, alarmed at the proximity of the mighty gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues, resolved to sell their lives dear, rather than become subject to their enemies. Again, therefore, the battle was joined, and Israel sustained a still more disastrous defeat. Upwards of 30,000 were slain, amongst whom were Eli's sons, and, worse than all, the Ark of God was taken. 1 Samuel 4.11 On his elevated seat by the wayside, Eli sat to receive any tidings from the battlefield, his heart trembling for the sacred symbol of which he was the guardian. As the day closed, a young man of the tribe of Benjamin came running into the town of Shiloh. His clothes were rent, his hair sprinkled with dust. A wail of lamentation arose from the people, who no sooner saw him thus attired than they knew how the day had gone. Eli heard the noise of the tumult and inquired the cause. I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army, said the young man. And what is there done, my son, inquired the pontiff. Israel is fled before the Philistines, was the reply, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. No sooner did the last part of his terrible tidings fall from his mouth, then the aged priest fell from his seat backwards, and his neck broke, and he died. Ninety-eight summers had passed over his head, and forty years he had judged Israel, and now his doom was come. But still another death was to mark that dreadful day. The wife of Phineas was near to be delivered of her second child. The news reached her that her husband and her father-in-law were dead, that Israel had been defeated, that the ark had been taken. She bowed her head, the pangs of childbirth came upon her, a son was born, and the women that stood by tried to cheer her fainting spirits. But in vain, the ark of God was taken, that was all her mind could realize. With her last breath, she gave the child a name that should be a memorial of that fearful day. Call him Ichabod, she said, the glory is departed from Israel. 1 Samuel 4 verses 12 through 22. End of Book 8, Chapter 1
one of their five confederate cities, and placed in the Temple of Dagon. But there its sanctity was remarkably vindicated, for on the morrow that idol was found lying on its face upon the ground. In vain did its votaries set it up in its place again. The next day saw it a second time laid prostrate, and not only fallen, but broken, without head or hands. Moreover, while a plague of mice destroyed their crops, emeralds, that is, hemorrhoids or piles, tormented their bodies. In great consternation, they thereupon removed the ark to Gath, but there too the same plague broke out. And when they were on the point of removing it to Ekron, the inhabitants of that city interfered and declared they would not admit it within their walls. The advice of the priests and diviners was then asked, and they suggested that the sacred coffer should be placed in a new cart drawn by two milk kine, which had never been yoked, and with a trespass offering of five golden mice and five golden emeralds be sent back to the Israelites. If the kine of their own accord took the road to Beth Shemesh, house of the sun, under the hills of Dan, and close to the Philistine lowlands, then it would be certain that their misfortunes were due to the hostility of the gods of the Israelites. Otherwise it might be concluded that some chance had smitten them. The plan was adopted. The ark was placed in the new cart, together with the coffer containing the trespass offerings, and the kine took the high road from Ekron to Beth Shemesh, without turning to the right hand or the left. It was the time of wheat harvest, and the people of the town were busy gathering in their corn, when, lifting up their eyes, they with joy beheld the ark which they had not seen for seven months, 1 Samuel 6, 1. The kine, meanwhile, stopped not till they had reached the field of Joshua, an inhabitant of the place, where there was a great stone. Beth Shemesh being a suburb city and allotted to the priests, Joshua 21, 16, 1 Chronicles 6, 59, the Levites residing there took down the ark and the coffer, placed them on the great stone, then clave the wood of the cart, and offered up the kine as a burnt offering to Jehovah, at the close of which ceremony the five lords of the Philistines, who had joined the procession, returned to their own country, 1 Samuel 6, 10-16. But even this joyous day was not to pass by without a great calamity. Not content with offering sacrifices, the people of Beth Shemesh approached the ark, and though even the priests were not allowed to touch it, removed the lid, to do which some force must have been used, and looked into it, for which profanity a considerable number were stricken with instant death. Messengers were therefore dispatched to kirjath Jearim, the fields of the wood, see Psalms 132.6, and thither through the hills the ark was sent, and placed in the house of the Levite Abinadab, whose son Eleazar was consecrated to keep it, and there it remained until the time of David, 1 Samuel 7, 1. Meanwhile, Samuel, of whom we have not heard since he denounced the doom of the house of Ithamar, was growing up an acknowledged prophet of the Lord. In this sad crisis of the nation's history, he now came forward, and convening an assembly at Mizpah, probably the watchtower of Benjamin, solemnly expostulated with the Israelites on their idolatrous practices. With fasting and public confession, they acknowledged the righteousness of the late judgments. Water was poured upon the ground, and the people entered into a covenant 
to abandon the worship of Baal and Ashtaroth. From this day, Samuel's career as judge began and was inaugurated by a great victory over the Philistines, who, hearing that the Israelites were recovering from their former depression, once more gathered together at Mizpah, prepared to give them battle. At this crisis, Samuel, taking a lamb, offered it as a whole burnt offering for the nation's sins, and was thus piously employed when the Philistines made their onslaught. But at this moment a terrific thunderstorm burst forth, accompanied, according to Josephus, by an earthquake. Seized with a sudden panic, the Philistines fled in disorder and were pursued with great slaughter by the victorious Israelites as far as beth Car, the house of lambs, a height to the west of Mizpah. On the very spot where twenty years before the Philistines had gained their most signal triumph, Samuel now set up a huge stone to commemorate his victory, and named it Ebenezer, the Stone of Help. 1 Samuel 7.12 The subsequent effects of this success were still more apparent. Not only did the Philistines receive a decided check, but the Amorites also, the scourge of the little tribe of Dan, made peace with Israel, and all the cities in the Philistine territory, which had been taken from the Israelites, from Ekron to Gath, were restored. Samuel's office as judge was now confirmed. Rama, his birthplace, was his residence, and here he erected an altar to the Lord, and thence from year to year went forth in solemn circuit to the old sanctuaries, Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, combining with the duties of a judge the functions also of a seer or prophet and with all the weight of an oracle, advising in any of the troubles of national or domestic life. 1 Samuel 9, 11, 18, and 19 As years passed on, and he waxed old, his sons Joel and Abiah, like those of Jair and Abdon before him, shared a portion of his judicial functions and administered justice in the more southerly portions of the country. But they did not walk in their father's footsteps. He, who when a child, had denounced the terrible doom on Eli for the wickedness of his sons, lived to see his own sons turning aside after lucre, exacting excessive usury, and perverting judgment. 1 Samuel 8, 3 A new and more advanced period in the history of the nation was at hand, and the supremacy of the judges was about to close. Samuel, who like Numa after Romulus, did not fail to prepare the people for the new epoch. At Ramah, at Bethel, at Mizpah, at Gilgal, he gathered together schools of the prophets and was the great reformer of the prophetical order, a work of such importance that he is even classed with Moses, the great lawgiver of the nation. Compare Psalm 99, 6, Acts 3, 24, and 13, 20. The title indeed of prophet has occurred already more than once, and is applied to Abraham, Genesis 27, to Moses, Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18, to Aaron, Exodus 7, 1, to Miriam, Exodus 15, 20, to the 70 elders, Numbers 11, 24 through 30, to Deborah, Judges 4, 4. But these were isolated cases. It was the work of Samuel to give permanence and effectiveness to the prophetical functions. Promising youths were gathered by him into schools 
or colleges of prophets, where they lived together in a society or community under a head or leading prophet, whom they called their father. Compare First Samuel ten twelve and nineteen twenty, or master, Second Kings two three, while they were termed his sons. Here they employed themselves in studying the law of Moses, practiced the composition of sacred poetry, and became skilled in sacred music, the psaltery, harp, tabret, pipe, and cymbals. First Samuel ten five, Second Kings three fifteen, First Chronicles twenty five one and six. They also preserved and copied historical records, and gathered up the traditions of their own and former times. Their calling was not merely, sometimes not at all, to predict future events. They were to be forth speakers for God, to commune with God, to speak of God, to teach His truth. To declare his will, and that not only in words, but sometimes in action. Studying the law of Moses and the records of God's past dealings with their nation, they were to see the earnest of his presence for rebuke or consolation in the present. Their vocation required of them to preach morality and spiritual religion to denounce oppression and covetousness, injustice and profligacy, cruelty and idolatry. And while called to reveal God's will in each successive crisis of the nation's history, they were also specially raised up to fix the eye of their countrymen on the future, to keep alive the belief in God's promises of redemption, and to foretell the incarnation of Him in whom all nations were to be blessed. If they often typified him, whose appearance they announced, and whose spirit dwelt in them, in his humiliation, being despised and rejected by the generation in which they lived, yet from time to time they typified him also in his exaltation. For the Lord, whose messengers they were, stood by them, frequently confirmed their word by miracles, and punished those who injured them. The subsequent position of the prophetical order at momentous periods of the national history is strikingly illustrated by the conduct of its reformer and organizer now. The misconduct of Samuel's sons produced dissatisfaction and a cry for change. Samuel himself was stricken in age. He had been a man of peace. One military success and one only had distinguished his judgeship. On the west, the ever-restless Philistines gave signs of recovery from their late defeat. 1 Samuel 10, 5 While beyond the Jordan, Nahash the Ammonite threatened the cities of the tribes of Reuben, Gad and Manasseh, 1 Samuel 12:12. 12, 12. There was no known general in Israel qualified by his position or powers to take the command of the nation's armies and lead them to battle. The fixed form of kingly government, which the people saw enjoyed by all the nations around, which they had themselves partially adopted under Gideon and Abimelech, under Jair and Abdon, and to which events appeared to have been rapidly tending, was not yet realized. At this juncture, then, the elders and accredited heads of the nation repaired to Ramah, and on the ground of Samuel's advanced age, the misconduct of his sons, And, as we gather from an incidental remark of Samuel himself afterwards, an apprehended invasion by the Ammonites, they requested that the form of government might be changed, that a king might rule over them, like the nations round about. 1 Samuel 8, 5 
This demand was a shock to Samuel's feelings, and the thing displeased him. He knew well the abuses such a form of government was too likely to entail. But he did not reject the petition of the nation. He was a true mediator between the old order that was changing and the new order to which it was destined to give place. He prayed to the Lord for advice and direction in this great crisis, and his prayer was heard. Though he had been rightly displeased with the people's request, though they had done worse than rejecting him and had rejected their invisible ruler, he was directed to hearken to their voice, but he was not to leave them without warning. He was to show them the manner of the king that should reign over them. 1 Samuel 8, 9 Accordingly, Samuel convened an assembly and faithfully described the oriental court and ceremonial, which the election of a king would inevitably entail, how he would, at his own pleasure, take their sons and appoint them to command his chariots and his horses, would set them to ear his ground and reap his harvest, and fashion his chariots and instruments of war, how he would take their daughters to be his confectioners, his cooks, and his bakers, how their property would cease to be their own, and their fields, their olive yards and vineyards, their flocks and herds, their men servants and maid servants would be required to be at his disposal. Under this despotism, he warned them that a day would come when they would cry unto the Lord, but he would not hear them. 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 18 His words, however, fell on unheeding ears. The pomp and ceremonial of a court had too many attractions for the nation. Without a king to judge them and fight their battles, they affected to feel isolated and degraded in the eyes of neighboring peoples, and a king they were resolved to have. This answer of the elders Samuel carried back to the Lord, who again bade him hearken to their voice, and promised the fulfillment of their wishes, with which assurance they were dismissed to their several cities. First Samuel 8.22 End of Book 8, Chapter 2book 8 chapter 3 of a class book of old testament history by g f mcclear this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cliff stone of sydney australia a class book of old testament history by g f mcclear book 8 chapter 3 Election of the First King, 1 Samuel chapter 9, B.C. 1095. The elders of Israel had not long to wait for the king they so earnestly desired. Shortly after Samuel's return to Ramah, he received divine intimation that on the morrow one would be sent him, whom he was to anoint to be captain over the Lord's people. Accordingly, the next day, as he was on his way to the high place to give his benediction at a sacrificial feast, he met two wayfaring men. One was a man of Benjamin, Saul, the son of Kish, of a noble and handsome man and gigantic stature, from his shoulders and upward higher than any of the people. The other was his servant. In quest of the asses of Saul's father, which had strayed, the two had been traversing without success the central region of Palestine, and now guided by certain maidens of Ramah, whom they had met at the entrance of the place going out to draw water, they had resolved to ask the advice of Samuel. The prophet had already noticed the tall, handsome stranger, and as he drew near, the divine voice assured him that he was the destined ruler of his people. 1 Samuel 9 verses 15 and 16 when, therefore, Saul inquired for the seer's house, Samuel not only declared that he was the person he sought, 
but revealed his mysterious acquaintance with the secret of his three days' journey, and bade him lay aside all further anxiety, for the asses were found. Then, turning to Saul, he added in yet more mysterious words, On whom is the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and all thy father's house? Marvelling at the import of this significant question addressed to one who belonged to the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and whose family was the least of all the families of Benjamin, 1 Samuel 9 verse 21, Saul followed the prophet to the high place where, with his servant, he was made to sit in the chiefest place among the thirty guests assembled at the sacrificial feast and to partake of a special portion which had been reserved for him. Thence he returned to the town and in the evening held further conversation with Samuel on the housetop of his dwelling. Next morning, at daybreak, Samuel roused his guest and accompanied him some little way to the end of the town. There the servant was bidden to pass on, and the two being left alone, the prophet taking a phial of oil poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, and assured him of his election to be the first king of Israel. To this assurance he added prophetic intimations of incidents that would occur on Saul's return homewards, and which could not fail still further to confirm him in the conviction that his sudden elevation was indeed of the Lord. Two men would meet him at Rachel's sepulchre and inform him that the asses were found, and that his father's anxieties now centred on himself at the plain, or rather the oak of Tabor, 1 Samuel 10 and verse 3. He would meet three men going to Bethel carrying gifts of kids, bread, and a skin bottle of wine. They would salute him and offer him two loaves of bread, which he was to receive at their hand. Then thirdly, on reaching the hill of God, probably Gibeah, where the Philistines had posted a garrison, he would meet a company of the prophets coming down from the high place with psaltery, tabret, pipe and harp, whose inspired strains would so affect him that he would join himself to them and be turned into another man. After the fulfillment of these three signs, he was to go to Gilgal, and there tarry seven days until Samuel's arrival to offer sacrifices and tell him what he should do. 1 Samuel 10 and verse 8. Then the two men parted. Each of the three signs came to pass, and God gave the son of Kish another heart. Convinced of his call to inaugurate the kingly period of Israel's history, his soul rose to the greatness of the occasion. The strains of the prophetic choir so wrought upon his spirit that he felt inspired to join them and his appearance in their society became the occasion of a well-known proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? 1 Samuel 10 and verse 12. Meanwhile, Samuel convened all the people to Mizpah of Benjamin, and after again rebuking them for their want of faith in thus hastily seeking a change of government, bade them present themselves before the Lord by their tribes and by their thousands in order that the sacred lot might decide the election of the king. In solemn order, the tribes passed before him, and the lot fell upon that of Benjamin. Then the ceremony was successfully repeated with the clans, the families, the individuals, and in a manner that none could dispute, it was indicated that Saul, the son of Kish, was the object of the divine choice. But when search was made for him, he was not to be found. Still unwilling to accept the arduous duties of the kingdom, he had concealed himself in the circle of baggage round the encampment at Mizpah. The search was renewed, and he was brought forth from his hiding place. As he advanced into the midst, his exalted stature struck the spectators with admiration, and a universal shout of long live the king betokened the nation's acceptance of its new head. 1 Samuel 10 verse 24 Left to themselves, the Israelites would doubtless have stood committed to the new form of government without pausing to insist on any conditions from their ruler, well content if he proved as absolute and irresponsible as those of the nations round about. But the far-seeing Samuel was wiser than they. Well knowing the bearing of the transactions of that day on the nation's future, he not only expounded to the people the manner of the kingdom as set forth by their great lawgiver in the book of Deuteronomy, 17 verses 14 to 20, but for the sake of greater security, committed the regulations thus accepted to writing, 
and laid them up in safe keeping before the Lord, and thus, under divine sanction, and amidst the despotisms of the East, arose the earliest example of a constitutional monarchy. This ceremony concluded, the people returned to their homes, and Saul retired to Gibeah. Though his elevation had been thus formally approved, there were not wanting those who, on the score probably of the obscurity of his tribe, and the fact that his capacities were as yet unknown, expressed much dissatisfaction at his promotion, questioned his ability to rule them, and brought him none of the usual presents. 1 Samuel 10 and verse 27. With rare self-control, however, he held his peace, and in a short time was enabled to justify the confidence that had been reposed in him. While living in retirement at Gibeah, he received intelligence which roused all his martial ardour, and for the first time revealed his talents as a military leader. The Ammonites, recovered from the defeat they had sustained from Jephthah, had under the leadership of their king Nahash laid siege to Jabesh Gilead. See Judges 21 of verse 8. The inhabitants of which place in their terror invited the heathen king to make a covenant with them and agree to serve him. This, with characteristic haughtiness, he declined except on the condition that he might put out their eyes and thus render them unfit for further military service. In this strait, the elders of the place requested seven days' respite, and meanwhile sent messengers to their brethren, imploring assistance. Saul was driving his herd homewards from the field, when the sound of wild lamentation in his native town revealed the danger which threatened the friendly town of Jabesh Gilead. Immediately, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, 1 Samuel 11 verse 6, filling him with courage and resolution for the emergency. Taking a yoke of oxen, he hewed them in pieces and sent his war token throughout all the tribes, summoning them under pain of eternal disgrace to rally round himself and Samuel and hasten to the rescue of their brethren. He then bade the messengers return to Jabesh Gilead with the assurance of succor before the sun was hot on the morrow. His determined spirit quickly communicated itself to others, and 300,000 from Israel and 30,000 from Judah gathered round him and the prophet. Bezek, a place apparently within a day's march of Jabesh, was appointed their headquarters, and thence dividing his forces into three companies, Saul executed a swift night march and burst upon the Ammonites in the morning watch, who, panic-stricken by this unexpected onslaught, were defeated with enormous loss so that not two of them were left together. 1 Samuel 11, verse 11. This signal success had an instantaneous effect upon the people. The Israelites hailed Saul as the deliverer of their country, and even proposed to put to death those who had not at first acknowledged him as king. With continued self-command, however, he calmed their zeal, and declined to stain with innocent blood the memory of a day on which, as he said with becoming modesty, not he but Jehovah had wrought salvation in Israel. At this juncture, the new ruler, having been tried and not found wanting, Samuel suggested that the people should once more repair to Gilgal and there renew the kingdom. Accordingly, after the sacrifice of peace offerings and amidst great rejoicings, Saul was solemnly inaugurated in his regal functions, while Samuel embraced the opportunity afforded by so large a gathering to bid farewell to the people he had ruled so prudently with all his power. 1 Samuel chapter 12 He had hearkened, he said, to their voice, he had made a king over them. For himself, he was old and grey-headed. He had walked before them from his childhood unto that day. Let them now testify if they had aught against him. Had he defrauded any? Had he oppressed any? Had he taken any bribe to blind his eyes? If so, he would make ample restoration. With one voice, the whole people bore witness to the integrity and uprightness of his public life. Then, like Moses and Joshua, he gave them his parting counsels, and after exhorting them by the memory of past mercies and past deliverances to cleave fast to the Lord and not forsake his commandments, called on the Lord himself to ratify his words by an outward and visible sign. It was the season of wheat harvest, when thunder and rain seldom or never occurred. But at the word of Samuel, the sky became black with clouds, the thunder rolled and the rain fell, 
bearing witness to the solemnity of the prophet's warnings, who, having thus bidden farewell to the people, henceforth retired from any share in the government, which now devolved on Saul alone. End of Book 8, Chapter 3 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 8, Chapter 4 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 8, Chapter 4, The Battle of Michmash. 1 Samuel chapters 13 and 14, B.C. 1093 to 1087. In dismissing Saul from Ramah after their first interview, Samuel, it will be remembered, had told him that he would pass a garrison of the Philistines. 1 Samuel 10 verse 5, 8 verse 3. Recovering from their defeat at Ebenezer, this people had again renewed their old hostilities and pitched in the heart of the mountains of Benjamin. Two years after his accession, 1 Samuel 8 and verse 1, Saul resolved to throw off a yoke which pressed so severely on the neighborhood of his native place. Gathering round him a small standing army of 3,000 men, he placed 1,000 under the command of his valiant son Jonathan at Geba, while he himself, with 2,000, took up a position at Michmash, about seven miles north of Jerusalem, and along the ridge of intervening heights in the direction of Bethel. Either at or close to Jonathan's position was posted a garrison of the Philistines. For some time the rival forces stood watching one another, and at length Jonathan, in a fit of youthful ardour, fell upon the garrison and put it to flight. Tidings of this event quickly reached the Philistines in their rich southern plains, who forthwith swarmed with a vast force up through the passes of Benjamin while Saul retired to Gilgal and there summoned a general gathering of the nation. But in face of the enormous masses of their foes, the Israelites seized with a sudden panic, as in the days of Gideon, Judges 6 verse 2, fled for refuge to the natural hiding places of the country, to the dens, the inaccessible fastnesses and the caves with which it abounded, while some even crossed the Jordan into the territory of Gad and Gilead. 1 Samuel 8 Verse 7. The Philistines now in their turn occupied Michmash, and their oppression of the Israelites was most grievous. A regular disarmament was carried out, so that none of the Hebrews had sword or spear save the king and his son, and their immediate retainers, nay the very smiths were removed, and the Hebrews were constrained to go down to their enemies to get the agricultural implements sharpened. In this terrible crisis, Saul sent messages from Gilgal to Samuel at Ramah, who promised within seven days to join the king and celebrate solemn sacrifices, preparatory, probably, to some concerted plan of action. But the days passed away, and Samuel came not. The Philistines were collecting in constantly increasing numbers at Michmash, and the terrified Israelites dropped off more and more, leaving their king with barely 600 followers. The present posture of affairs imperatively demanded prudence and caution, and from Samuel the king would doubtless have learnt the divine will, and he, who had enabled Gideon with only 300 men to conquer even more numerous foes, would have opened up some mode of deliverance. But Samuel came not, and Saul, unable to restrain his impatience, resolved to offer the sacrifices himself. He had scarcely done so when the prophet arrived and sternly rebuked him for his impetuous zeal. Thou hast done foolishly, he said. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. And he proceeded to intimate that the kingdom, which might have been established in his family, would not continue, but would be transferred to another. 1 Samuel 8 verses 11 to 14. Meanwhile, the Philistines continued their oppressive and tyrannical exactions. Roving bands from their camp went forth in three directions and committed disastrous depredations, while from the heights 
where they were encamped, Saul and Jonathan, at the head of their little band, looked down upon a ravaged and terror-stricken country, unable and afraid to lift a hand against its oppressors. At length, Jonathan resolved to strike another blow. Between the Israelite position at Geba and the Philistine garrison at Michmash was a distance of about three miles, part of which consisted of a deep gorge running between two sharp jagged rocks, the one called Bozes, shining, probably from the white chalky cliffs, the other, Sina, the thorn of acacia, so called probably from some solitary acacia on its summit. Above this gorge was the Philistine garrison. Without informing his father, or communicating his design to anyone except the young man, his armour-bearer, Jonathan resolved to ascend the steep sides of the ravine and then to take the conduct of the enemy as an omen for further operations. If the Philistines came forth and threatened an attack, they would remain in the valley. If they challenged them to advance, they would take this as an augury of success and press on. Upon their hands and feet then the two climbed up and at length were detected by the Philistines. Behold, they cried in derision, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they have hid themselves. Come up and we will shew you a thing. The omen was favourable and the two pressed on. Strong as a lion and swift as an eagle, Second Samuel 1 verse 23, Jonathan no sooner reached the summit than he rushed upon his unexpecting foes and aided by his armour bearer slew at the first onset upwards of twenty men. Thereupon a sudden and uncontrollable panic seized the garrison and spread to the camp and even the marauding hordes in the neighbourhood. A simultaneous earthquake, 1 Samuel 14 verse 15, increased the confusion, and when Saul's watchmen at Gibeah looked towards the opposite end of the gorge of Michmash, they beheld the multitudes melting away, going and beating down one another. Unable to explain the cause of this sudden movement, the king ordered the high priest Ahia to inquire who had left the Israelite camp. On ascertaining that Jonathan was leading an attack upon the enemy, he would have a second time consulted the Ark of God. But while he was talking, the noise of the Philistine host grew louder and louder. On this, he bade the high priest stay his inquiries, and putting himself at the head of his six hundred followers, he rushed up the defile, and on reaching the opposite side, found that a general panic had seized the foe. Every man's hand was against his fellow, and there was a great discomfiture. 1 Samuel 14, verse 20. It was the signal for a general rising. Even the Israelites in the Philistine camp turned against their captors, and were quickly joined by others of their brethren, who till now had remained concealed in the mountains of Ephraim. Onwards the pursuit swept over the high ground of Bethel, and down the pass of Beth Horon to Agilon. In the excitement of the hour, and carried away by that rash impetuosity which henceforth seemed to mar all his actions, Saul cried to heaven, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged of mine enemies. 1 Samuel 14 verse 24 He had not yet encountered his heroic son, and the fasting people were spent and wearied. Soon the pursuit lay through a forest bedewed in divers' places with the droppings of wild honey. Overcome with his exertions, which had brought such glory to the nation, and unaware of his father's rash adjuration, Jonathan put forth the end of his staff into a honeycomb, and therewith refreshed his parched lips. An Israelite saw what he had done, and revealed the terms of the royal curse. "'My father hath troubled the land,' said he, and once more mingled in the pursuit." 1 Samuel 14, verses 24 to 32. The day must now have been far advanced, and the host, utterly unable to endure any longer the enforced fast, flew upon the spoil, and taking sheep and oxen, slew them on the ground, devouring the fresh carcasses even with the blood. When the news of this infraction of the law was announced to Saul, he directed that a large stone should be set up to serve as a kind of altar, Still eager and impetuous, late as it was, he wished to continue the pursuit and to spoil the Philistines till the morning light. The more prudent Ahia suggested that the divine will should first be ascertained. Arrayed in his ephod, 1 Samuel 14 verse 3, he consulted probably the breastplate of judgment, while the king inquired of the Lord, Shall I go down after the Philistines? 
Wilt thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But no answer was vouchsafed. The oracle was dumb. Suspecting there was something to intercept the divine response, Saul proposed to ascertain the cause by appealing to the sacred lot, exclaiming with all his former rashness, As the Lord liveth, though the sin be found in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. In solemn silence the chiefs of the host divided. Saul and Jonathan stood on one side, the people on the other. The lot was cast, and it was ascertained that the sin lay between the king and his son. Again the lot was cast, and this time Jonathan was taken. Adjured by his father, the youthful conqueror confessed that with his staff he had taken and eaten some honey. Saul declared he would abide by his vow, and Jonathan would have fallen a victim to the royal rashness had not the people interfered. With a determination he dared not oppose, they declared that not one hair of his head should fall to the ground. Thus Jonathan was saved, and Saul returned to his native hills, and the Philistines defeated and disgraced to their fertile lowlands. 1 Samuel 14, verses 24 to 46. End of Book 8, Chapter 4 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 8, Chapter 5 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 8. Chapter 5. Saul and the Amalekites, David and Goliath. 1 Samuel chapters 15 through 17, B.C. 1079 to 1063. This signal victory materially confirmed Saul's supremacy. Acting no longer merely on the defensive, he now directed expeditions against Moab, Ammon, Edom, and even the king of Zobah, a region east of Coel Syria and extending toward the Euphrates. While in the full tide of his success, he received a visit from Samuel, who on the strength of a divine command, entrusted him with a commission, which he was to execute to the very letter. The treacherous hostility of the powerful tribe of Amalek, when they fell upon the exhausted rear of the Israelites at their departure from Egypt, had not been forgotten by God. Exodus 17 verses 8 and 14, Numbers 24 and verse 20. Since then they had, on more than one occasion, evinced the same hostility. They were now devoted to utter destruction. Go and smite Amalek, ran the divine commission. Utterly destroy all they have. Spare them not. Slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. First Samuel 15 verses 2 and 3. Thereupon, Saul mustered a force of 210,000 at Telaim in southern Judah, and after warning the Kenites to betake themselves to a place of safety, he attacked the Amalekites and smote them from Havilah to Shur. All the people he utterly destroyed, but in direct violation of the express instructions he had received, spared all the best of the spoil and Agag the Amalekite king. Returning from this expedition, he set up a place, or probably a monument of his victory at Carmel, in the mountainous country of Judah, and thence repaired to Gilgal. A divine intimation had already made known to Samuel how imperfectly the king had executed his commission, and with a heavy heart he went forth to meet him. With a haste which betrayed the misgivings of his conscience, Saul no sooner saw the prophet than he boasted of his execution of the divine mandate. But Samuel was not thus to be deceived. The bleating of the sheep and the lowing of oxen on all sides revealed but too clearly the lax interpretation which Saul had chosen to put upon his instructions, and he only increased his condemnation by trying to throw the blame of his own shortcomings upon the people, who he declared had spared the best of the spoil to sacrifice to Jehovah. 
the prophet sternly reminded him that Jehovah had far more delight in obedience to his commands than in burnt offerings and sacrifices, and for the second time intimated that the continuance of his dynasty was forfeited. He had rejected the word of God, and the Lord had rejected him from being king. 1 Samuel 15 verses 12 through 23 With much contrition, Saul then confessed his error, and as the prophet turned to depart, grasped the skirt of his mantle to induce him to stay. The mantle rent, and Samuel interpreted the omen. The Lord had rent the kingdom from its unworthy head and designed it for a neighbor of his, who was better than he. Without denying the justice of the sentence, Saul entreated the granting of one concession, imploring Samuel to honor him before the elders of his people and turn with him and worship Jehovah. The prophet yielded and for the last time the two offered sacrifice together. But if Saul had neglected his duty, Samuel could not forget the captive king whom the divine decree had devoted to death. He ordered Agag to be brought before him. The king came forward delicately, remarking as if to disarm hostility, surely the bitterness of death is past. As thy sword, rejoined the prophet, hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And he hewed him in pieces before the Lord. The commission of Jehovah thus vindicated, Saul returned to Gibeah and Samuel to Ramah, there to mourn for one whose career, once so hopeful, was now obscured with such dark forebodings of coming doom. 1 Samuel 15 verses 24 to 35 The sorrow of Samuel for Saul's shortcomings was real, but he was before long roused from his grief by a divine commission to take a horn of oil and go to Bethlehem, there to anoint another king. Fear lest the purport of his errand should reach Saul's ears would have deterred him from venturing on the journey, but he was bidden to take a heifer and invite the elders of the town to a sacrificial feast. In obedience to this command, he left Ramah and proceeded on his way. As he ascended the long grey hill leading to the village, his approach was discerned by the elders, who trembled when they saw the venerable prophet. Comest thou peaceably? They inquired anxiously. Peaceably was the reply, and they were bidden to prepare to accompany him to the feast. Amongst those invited on this occasion was Jesse, sprung from one of the oldest families in the place, the son of Obed and grandson of the Moabites Ruth. He was an aged man at this time, and the father of eight sons, of whom seven now accompanied him to the feast. 1 Samuel 17 verse 12 when they were all assembled and waiting to commence, the prophet looked upon the eldest, the tall Eliab, and thought that of a surety he beheld the Lord's anointed. But the divine voice bade him not to look upon his countenance or the height of his stature. For the Lord, who looketh not upon the outward appearance, but upon the heart, had refused him. Then the old man's second son, Abinadab, passed before him, and his third son, Shammah, and after them four other sons. But the Lord had chosen none of them. Are here all thy children? inquired Samuel. There remaineth yet the youngest, said Jesse, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Send and fetch him, rejoined the prophet. Till he come hither, we cannot sit around. First Samuel 16, verse 11, margin. Accordingly, a messenger was sent to the sheepfolds and brought in the youngest, David, the beloved, the darling, the Benjamin of Jesse's house. With his shepherd's staff in his hand, his scrip or wallet round his neck, 1 Samuel 17 verse 40, a mere stripling beside the tall Eliab, ruddy or auburn-haired with fair bright eyes, comely and goodly to look to, 1 Samuel 16 verses 12 and 18, he stood before the prophet. Arise, anoint him, for this is he, whispered the divine voice. And there in the midst of his brethren and the assembled elders, Samuel poured upon him the consecrated oil, on which the feast so long delayed was celebrated, and Samuel rose up and returned to Ramah. See Psalm 78 verses 70 to 72. Meanwhile the Spirit of God, which came upon David from that day forward, departed from Saul, and an evil spirit troubled him, 
1 Samuel 16, verse 14. He became moody and liable to fits of sudden frenzy. To rouse him from this distressing state, his servants advised that a clever player on the harp should be sent for, that by the charms of his music he might soothe his spirit. When inquiry was made for such a minstrel, one of the royal servants mentioned the name of the son of Jesse as not only cunning in playing, but of tried valour, prudent in speech, comely in person, and prospered with the blessing of the Lord. 1 Samuel 16 verse 18 Saul thereupon sent for him, and Jesse dispatched him with a humble offering. Even the troubled spirit of the king was soothed by the music of the future psalmist of Israel. He loved him and made him not only his minstrel, but his armor-bearer, and retained him about his person. 1 Samuel 16, verse 21 When the paroxysms of Saul's malady abated, David would seem to have returned to his old occupations on the bleak downs of Bethlehem, where his faithfulness in a few things fitted him to become a ruler over many things. His shepherd life called into action some of the best qualities in human nature. Firmness, nerve, Energy and constancy were all required of him, who would in true devotion to his calling endure the heat by day and the frost by night. Genesis 31 verse 40 Climb narrow ledges and scale lofty precipices in quest of pasture for his flocks and defend them against wild beasts such as lions and wolves, bears and panthers or robbers of the desert. All these tests David had stood. His strength and courage were well known beyond the boundaries of his native village. Once during his solitary shepherd life, a lion, and at another time a bear, attacked his father's flock. He fled not like a hireling shepherd, but put his life in his hand and went after them and slew them. 1 Samuel 17 verses 34 to 37 Meanwhile, the ever-active Philistines had once more risen in arms against the Israelites. Gathering together their forces, they took up a position on a height, which, probably from being the scene of frequent sanguinary encounters, was known as Ephus Damim, the Boundary of Blood, situated on the frontier hills of Judah between Soko and Azekar. Separated from their foes by a deep ravine or glen, Saul and his followers pitched on the north side of the Valley of Elah, the Terebinth. For forty mornings and evenings there descended into this valley from the camp of the Philistines a giant named Goliath of Gath. Of enormous height and clad in complete armour, he openly defied any one of the Hebrew hosts to mortal combat, and offered to stake the supremacy of either people on the issue. Even the tall majestic Saul declined the challenge, and, like his people, was dismayed and greatly afraid. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 11 while the two armies thus stood confronting each other, early one morning, David entered the camp, having been bidden by his father to visit his three eldest brothers, then serving in the army. As he drew near the outskirts of the camp, the host with the well-known war cry was advancing to take up its daily position in battle array. Hastily leaving with the keeper of the baggage the provisions which his father had sent as a present to their captain, he hurried within the lines and was in the act of saluting his brethren when the voice of the giant was audible, calling across the ravine his morning challenge. David heard his words of haughty defiance and, lost in wonder at the despondency of the people, listened eagerly to the bystanders as they recounted the reward which the king had promised to bestow on anyone who was willing to accept the giant's challenge and slew him in the fight. Heeding nothing the taunts of his eldest brother Eliab, who would have had him mind the few sheep he had left amidst the pastures of Bethlehem, instead of coming thither to see the battle, he went from soldier to soldier, listening again and again to the account of the king's promised reward, till at length his bold defiance of the giant reached the ears of Saul. 1 Samuel 17 verse 31 Summoned into the royal presence, David declared his readiness to go forth and encounter his gigantic foe, and at Saul's request tried on his armour, which however did not fit him, and he speedily put it off again. Then, choosing five smooth stones from the dry torrent bed which ran through the ravine, he placed them in his shepherd's scrip, and with his staff in one hand and a sling in the other, drew near the Philistine. 
The latter, enraged at the youthful appearance of his assailant, cursed him by his gods and threatened to give his flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Undismayed, David returned threat for threat, and as his foe drew near, put his hand into his bag and took thence a stone, which he slang with all his might and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Then without delay he stood upon the prostrate body and drawing the giant's huge sword from its sheath, finished the work by cutting off his head. The sight of their champion lying weltering in his blood filled the Philistines with consternation, and they commenced a precipitate flight. Raising their well-known war cry, the Israelites then rushed across the ravine and up the opposite heights and chased their foes to the gates of Ekron and Gath and spoiled their tents. On their return, the youthful warrior, who had in so signal a manner proved that the Lord saved not with sword and spear, bearing the head of his gigantic enemy in his hand, was conducted to Saul's tent by Abner, the king's uncle and captain of the host. Some two or three years had probably elapsed since the days when David soothed Saul's melancholy with the strings of his harp, and in his altered visage the king did not recognize his former minstrel, but he now took him permanently into his service and would let him no more return to his father's house. 1 Samuel 18 verse 2 End of Book 8, Chapter 5 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 8, Chapter 6 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Todd Manning, Raleigh, North Carolina. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 8, Chapter 6, David's Life as an Outlaw. 1 Samuel 18-23, through B.C. 1063-1061. through The victory over Goliath was the turning point in David's life. He was now no longer the obscure shepherd of Bethlehem, but the recognized deliverer of Israel and the chief of Saul's men of war. 1 Samuel 18, verse 5. Moreover, he now became the devoted friend of Jonathan, the king's son. The hero of Michmash would naturally sympathize with the daring shepherd of Bethlehem, and his soul was knit with the soul of David. 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, compare 2 Samuel number 1, verse 26. The two ratified a solemn vow of undying friendship, and Jonathan bestowed on his newfound friend almost every article of his attire, not only his costly robe that he wore, but even his sword, his bow, and his girdle. 1 Samuel 18, verse 4 But the hour of David's triumph was the signal for the commencement of those embittered relations which subsisted between him and Saul till the day of the latter's death. As the royal party returned from the valley of Elah, they were met by companies of Hebrew maidens, who in their songs expressed the discerning feelings of the nation, singing, Saul hath slain thousands, and David his ten thousands. To the king, this was gall and wormwood. In the youthful warrior, he saw that other more worthy than himself, for whom the kingdom was designed, and he eyed him from that day forward, 1 Samuel, verse 18, number 9. As the king's armor-bearer, David did not neglect his musical talents, and when Saul's fits of madness were upon him, he soothed him with the strains of his harp. But more than once he did so at the peril of his life, for in a sudden paroxysm of rage, the king flung at him the long spear he held in his hand, and would have pinned him to the wall had he not escaped out of his presence. 1 Samuel, verse 18, number 11. Perceiving that the divine favor was withdrawn from himself, Saul now became afraid of David, and in hope of getting rid of him, gave him the command of a thousand men. 1 Samuel, verse 18, number 13. And sent him on several expeditions. 
But David's uniform success and the prudence he displayed only won for him still more the favor of the people. The king then tried other expedients. He promised him his eldest daughter Merib in marriage, on condition that he fought against the Philistines. David went, and instead of falling in battle, only covered himself with fresh glory. But when the time for marriage came, Merib was given to another. 1 Samuel, verse 18, number 19. Meanwhile, Michal, the king's second daughter, had fallen in love with her father's armor-bearer. As if to bring his previous designs to positive fulfillment, Saul named as her dowry proof that David had slain a hundred of the Philistines. At the head of his men, David went, and slew twice that number, and brought the required proofs of their death. The marriage was celebrated, and David became captain of the royal bodyguard, second only, if not equal, to Abner. But the king's jealousy of his successful rival was only the more increased, and he went so far as to propose to Jonathan and his servants that David should be put out of the way, and was only dissuaded by the moving intercession of Jonathan himself. A partial reconciliation with the king ensued, and David returned to court. But his life was not more secure. On one occasion, his own vigilance in eluding the royal javelin. On another, the devotion of his wife Michelle alone saved his life. On the last occasion, the officers charged to put him to death had actually penetrated into his chamber, but only to find in the bed, in place of the object of their search, an image or household god, with the head enveloped in a net of goat's hair. During the night his wife had let him down from the window. Compare Psalms 59. David now fled away to Nioth, the huts or habitations near Ramah, where he enjoyed a brief respite from danger and anxiety in the congenial society of the aged Samuel, whom he had not seen since the occurrence at Bethlehem and of the company of prophets there gathered together under his superintendence. News of his hiding place reached the ears of Saul, who forthwith sent messengers to take him. But the sight of the prophets performing their sacred functions under the eye of the venerable Samuel, and their strains of sacred melody, so wrought upon the messengers, that they could not refrain from joining their religious exercises. A similar issue attended a second and even a third deputation. At length Saul went in person to the great well or cistern of Shishu, not far from Ramah, and inquired for the prophet and the fugitive. But as he drew near the place, he himself could not resist the prophetic impulse, and for the second time justified the inquiry. Is Saul also among the prophets? 1 Samuel, verse 19, number 24. Thus the danger was for the time averted, but this state of suspense was intolerable, and David felt there was but a step between him and death. Probably by Samuel's advice, he now obtained a secret interview with Jonathan at Ezel, a well-known stone near Gibeah. In pathetic language, he poured out his whole soul to his friend and besought him to make an effort to ascertain once and for all the real feelings of his father, which he might think had undergone a change after the incidents at Nioth. The morrow was a festival of the new moon. Saul would hold a solemn feast, and at his table would sit Abner and Jonathan. But David's place would be vacant. The demeanor of the king on observing his absence was to be taken as an omen. If he acquiesced in Jonathan's explanation that David was absent at a similar festival under the family Ruth at Bethlehem, all would be well. If he was wroth, then it would be certain that the old grudge was not healed, and that evil was determined against him. A solemn compact was then ratified between the two. Jonathan undertook to ascertain his father's mind. David promised to shew kindness not only to Jonathan himself, but to all his posterity. 1 Samuel, verse 20, numbers 5 through 10. When this compact had been duly ratified, Jonathan suggested an expedient whereby the news was made known to David. Within three days he would again repair to the great stone with his bow and arrows, and accompanied by a little lad. He would then shoot three arrows, as though he shot at a mark, and his words to the lad, which David would overhear, must decide the point. If he said to the lad, Behold, arrows are on the side of thee, take them, 
Then David might come forth and know that all was well. If he said, The arrows are beyond thee, then he might go his way, certain that the wrath of the king could not be appeased. The day came, and David repaired to his hiding place. In due time, Jonathan and his little lad appeared, and the three arrows were shot as agreed upon. And as the lad ran to pick them up, he cried, Is not the arrow beyond thee? Then David knew that he must fly, and when the lad was gone to carry back the bow and arrows to Gibeah, rose from his hiding place, and with passionate embraces and many tears parted from his friend, who once more commended his posterity to his care. 1 Samuel, verse 20, Numbers 35-42 through 42. David now betook himself to Nob, a sacerdotal city in the tribe of Benjamin, and situated on an eminence near Jerusalem. Here the high priest Amalek resided with the tabernacle and trembled when he saw the captain general of the royal troops approaching alone and unattended by his usual retinue. But David disarmed his suspicions by pretending a secret mission from the king and in this character obtained in the future of other bread the sacred loaves of shoe bread, which having served their turn in the weekly course were about to be replaced by new loaves. With these and the sword of Goliath, which was brought forth from its receptacle behind the ephod, he fled away, resolved to seek refuge amongst his enemies, the Philistines. On his arrival at the court of Achish, king of Gath, he was recognized by the royal guards as the famous champion of Israel, and the sword he carried doubtless recalled bitter memories of the Valley of Elah. He was accordingly thrown into prison, but in this dilemma he changed his behavior, scrabbled on the doors of the gates, let his spittle fall upon his beard, and gave every sign of being insane. The oriental respect for madness procured him his release, and he was suffered to depart. From the lowlands of the Philistines, he now betook himself to the town of Adullam. Joshua verse 15, number 35. At the foot of the mountain range of Judea, and found a secure retreat in one of the extensive caves, with which the limestone cliffs of the neighborhood are pierced. News of his coming reached Bethlehem. 1 Samuel, verse 22, number 1. And straightway his brethren and all his father's house, feeling perhaps insecure from Saul's vengeance, came down to his stronghold from the Judean hills. These probably included his nephews, the sons of Zeruiah, Job, and Abishai, but besides these were four hundred men who joined him from various motives, some from distress, others to avoid exacting creditors, others from some private sorrow. Not considering, however, his aged father and mother secure even in the secluded spot, David hastily crossed the Jordan and conveyed them into the friendly territory of Moab, and there consigned them to the king who agreed to protect them. 1 Samuel, verse 32, numbers 3 and 4. By the advice of his friend, the prophet Gad, he now retired to the forest of Hereth, not far from Adullam. It was probably while he was here, in hold, that the sons of Zeruiah, performed the memorable exploit recorded in 2 Samuel, verse 23, numbers 14 through 17, 1 Chronicles, verse 21, numbers 16 through 19. A garrison of the Philistines had established themselves even in David's native town of Bethlehem. One day, sorely tried by thirst, he expressed a longing for the delicious water of its well near the gate. Upon the word, the three heroes burst through the Philistine forces and returned with the much-coveted draft. But their leader would not drink of the blood of the men that had gone in jeopardy of their lives and poured it forth as a libation before the Lord. Other bands now joined him. Amongst these were eleven mighty men, their faces like the faces of lions, their feet as swift as the rose upon the mountains. First Chronicles, verse 12, number 8. From the uplands of Gad beyond Jordan, who swam that river when it had overflowed all its banks. First Chronicles, verse 12, number 15. And found their way to his hold. They were followed by men, not only from the tribe of Judah, but from that of Benjamin, with their chief Amasai. 
This defection of members of Saul's own tribe at first excited David's suspicion. But the straightforward, honest words of their leader convinced him of their sincerity, and he associated them in the command of his band of six hundred faithful followers. First Chronicles verse 12, number 16 through 18. Meanwhile, the Philistines attacked Kila, a town of uncertain situation in the lowland district of Judah, and robbed the threshing floors. At first David's men, in spite of a divine insurance of success, feared to relieve the place, and so incur the hostility of their powerful foe. A second assurance restored their courage. Kayla was rescued, and the Philistines defeated with great slaughter. Whilst here David was joined by another and an important ally in the person of Abiathar, the son of the high priest Amalek, bearing sad intelligence. On the day of David's visit to Nob, there was a stranger watching intently all that took place between him and the high priest. This was Doeg, an Edomite, and the chief of Saul's herdmen. 1 Samuel verse 21 number 7 when the king was deploring at Gebeah the defection even of his own tribe, Doeg poured into the royal ear his version of what had occurred at Nob. Transported with rage, the king sent for Amalek and all the priests of the line of Ithamar and charged him with befriending his enemies. In vain, the high priest repelled the charge. Saul sentenced the entire body of the priests to instant death and gave the signal to his guard to execute it. But they declined to imbrue their hands in such a bloody murder. Thereupon he called on Doeg, who straightway obeyed, and falling upon the unresisting priests, slew in one day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Not content with this, the king put the entire population of the place to the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings. 1 Samuel, verse 22, number 19. Such was the sad news which the solitary survivor of the house of Ithamar now announced to David. I knew it, replied the latter. I knew it, that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. From this day forward, Abiathar remained with David and having brought with him the high priest Ephod, was enabled by his oracular answers materially to aid David's movements on occasions of difficulty or danger. Meanwhile, the entry of his rival into a town that had gates and bars, 1 Samuel, verse 23, number 7, inspired Saul with the hope of at length capturing David, summoning his forces as if for a regular military expedition. He marched down to Kalea to besiege him and his followers. Aware of the king's secret designs, David consulted the divine will by means of the ephod, and thus ascertaining the intention of the townspeople to betray him. He and his men departed, and went whithersoever they could. 1 Samuel verse 23, number 13. End of Book 8, Chapter 6「Book Eight, Chapter Seven of a Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick MacLear. Book Eight, Chapter Seven. David at Ziklag Battle of Mount Gilboa 1st Samuel 24 through 31 BC 1061 through 1056 From Keilah David now removed to a stronghold in the wilderness of Ziph in the highlands of Judah between Carmel and Judah about 3 miles south of Hebron Hither Saul pursued him with ceaseless zeal, but was utterly unable to discover his hiding place. Jonathan, however, sought him out and found him in a neighboring wood, and strengthened his hand in God, 
assuring him of his belief that his father would never find him, that he would live to come to the throne, and that he himself should be next unto him. The former covenant was now for the third time ratified, and the two friends parted, never to meet again. 1 Samuel 23, 16-18 Meanwhile, Saul returned to Gibeah, whither messengers from the Ziphites followed him with news of David's hiding place and offering to betray him into his hands. Thereupon the king set out, and so close were the pursuer and pursued on one another's track, that while David was climbing down one side of a cliff in the waste pasture ground of Maon, in the extreme south of Judah, Saul and his men were posted to intercept them on the other. But the arrival of a messenger with news of a sudden inroad of the Philistines, obliged the king to discontinue the pursuit, and the name of the spot, Selahamalakoth, the cliff of divisions, long commemorated David's narrow escape, 1 Samuel 23-28. En Gedi, or the spring of the wild goats, a town on the western shore of the Dead Sea, was his next hiding place and the scene of an instance of magnanimity on his part, rare at all times, especially rare amongst Oriental nations. The panic of the Philistine invasion being over, Saul advanced to Engedi at the head of three thousand men, and on one occasion entered one of the numerous caves of the neighborhood. David and his men, seeing but not seen, were concealed in the dark recesses of the same retreat. Had he listened to the advice of his men, he might now have surprised and slain his unsuspecting foe, but he contented himself with cutting off the skirt of the royal robe. Even for this, however, his heart smote him, and bidding his men remember that the king was his master and the Lord's anointed, 1 Samuel 24, 6, he refused to permit them to rise up against him. Presently Saul left the cave, and then David followed, and cried after him, My lord, the king! Saul looked behind him, and David, bowing before him with his face to the ground, expostulated with him in words of touching beauty, and in the skirt of his robe, bade him behold a pledge of his unwillingness to do him any harm. Even Saul himself was deeply moved, and lifted up his voice and wept, frankly acknowledging the generosity of his rival. He then owned how well he knew David was to be the future king, and made him solemnly swear not to visit his own ill will on his posterity or destroy his name out of his father's house. All this David faithfully undertook to perform, but knowing well the capriciousness of the king, did not quit his stronghold. About this time, the aged prophet Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together, and lamented him, and buried him within the walls of his own house at Ramah. 1 Samuel 25.1 The relations of David towards the neighboring landholders is strikingly illustrated by an incident which now took place. On the neighboring range of Carmel dwelt a rich sheepmaster named Nabal. In these troublous times, his shepherds experienced more than usual difficulty in safely keeping his three thousand sheep and one thousand goats. The presence, therefore, of David's valiant men was a matter of no small importance, for instead of injuring or robbing them, they were a wall unto them, both by day and by night. 1 Samuel 25, 15-17 Hearing that Nabal was about to shear his sheep, an occasion of much festivity, 
David sent ten of his retinue to request a small reward for the kindness he had ever shown to his shepherds. This Nabal, who was notorious for his churlish temper, flatly and insultingly refused. Enraged at such selfish insolence, David resolved on vengeance. Leaving two hundred men to guard the baggage, he marched with the remaining four hundred towards Carmel, and would certainly have inflicted severe punishment on the churlish sheep master, had he not on the way encountered his beautiful and prudent wife Abigail, who, informed of her husband's uncivil conduct, had come forth to meet him with a long train of asses laden with provisions. In language courteous and politic, she deprecated his vengeance, frankly allowing that, as for her husband, Nabal, fool, was his name, and folly was with him. 1 Samuel 25.25 25. David consented to desist from his determined revenge, and Abigail returned to find her lord drinking to excess at the feast. The next morning she told him of the risk he had run, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. 1 Samuel 25.37 Smitten with a sudden stroke, he only lingered ten days when he died. Thereupon David married Abigail, and besides her, his wife Michael having been bestowed by Saul upon another, he espoused Ahinoam of Jezreel, 1 Samuel 25, 43 and 44, a town in the neighborhood of the southern Carmel. See Joshua fifteen fifty six. Returning once more to the old hiding place in the pasture country of Ziph, and the neighboring hill of Hakila, the secret of his retreat was again betrayed to Saul by the Ziphites, who at the head of three thousand men went forth to capture David. 1 Samuel 26, 3 Informed of his approach, David retired from the hill to the lower ground, the wood which then covered the country concealing him from view. Saul advanced to the hill and there pitched his tent with Abner his captain general and his forces round about him. Accompanied by his nephew Abishai, David in the dead of the night penetrated through the lines to the spot where the king slept within the baggage, his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. Again Abishai bade him take advantage of the opportunity and asked permission to smite but once the sleeping king, promising not to smite a second time. But again David refused and contented himself with taking the royal spear and the cruise of water from his bolster and passing through the lines of sleeping warriors went over to the other side and standing on the top of a hill afar off, called across the long intervening space to Abner, who was sunk in heavy sleep after the fatigues of the day. Roused by the strange voice disturbing the still midnight air, Abner awoke and asked who called. Then David reproached him for the little care he had taken of his master, and in the well-known royal spear and the cruise of water, bade him see a second proof of his generosity towards an unrelenting foe. Presently Saul himself awoke and recognized the voice of David. Again the fugitive pleaded in moving words with the pursuer, and again Saul touched to the heart with admiration for his magnanimous rival, acknowledged his own guilt, and bestowed a blessing upon him. 1 Samuel 26, 13-25 This last occurrence seems to have convinced David that there was no hope 
of any permanent change in the king's feelings towards himself. 1 Samuel 27, 1 And he therefore determined to seek refuge once more among the Philistines. No longer a solitary fugitive, but accompanied by his two wives and his six hundred followers with their households, he again presented himself before the king of Gath. In answer to his petition for a place in some town in the country, Achish assigned to him and his retinue the town of Ziklag, situated at some distance from Gath, towards the south or southeast of the Philistine frontier, 1 Samuel 27.5. His stay here lasted over a year and four months, and during this period, He and his men made an expedition against the Jezurites, Gezrites, and Amalekites, who roamed over the desert plateau overhanging the Philistian plain, and having carried off enormous booty, lest the truth should reach the ears of Achish, saved neither man nor woman alive. The king, however, did hear of the expedition but in reply to his inquiries, was assured that it had been directed against the country south of Judah and against the south of the Kenites. Satisfied with this proof of the fidelity of his vassal, he rejoiced that David had made his own people Israel utterly to abhor him and deemed it an earnest of still greater services. 1 Samuel 27, 8 through 12. Before long, the Philistines gathered their armies together for another and a decisive contest with the Israelites for the supremacy. Achish and his contingent prepared to take part in the expedition, and as his vassal, David consented to accompany him with his six hundred men. Aphek, near Jezreel, was fixed upon as the place of rendezvous, and thither, probably along the sea coast, the hundreds and thousands of the Philistines poured up from their fertile lowlands. As David passed on the way to Aphek, seven valiant chiefs, captains of thousands of the powerful tribe of Manasseh, instead of joining Saul's army, preferred to throw in their lot with him and share his fortunes. 1 Chronicles 12, 19-21 But the unsuspecting confidence of Achish in his newfound vassal was not shared by the other Philistine chiefs, and they protested against David's followers being allowed to accompany them. Achish was therefore constrained, much against his will, to dismiss him, and with the first dawn, David set out on his return to Ziklag, 1 Samuel 29, 11. On arriving there, no town was to be found, nothing but a mass of burning ruins. During his absence, the Amalekites had burst upon the place, burnt it to the ground, and carried off David's wives and those of his retinue, whose faith in their leader, now for the first and only time, seems to have failed, and in the extremity of their grief, they even threatened to stone him to death. It was a critical moment, but David's old trust did not fail him, and he encouraged himself in the Lord his God, 1 Samuel 36. Abiathar was bidden to bring the ephod and ascertain the divine will. Shall I pursue after this troop? David inquired. The reply was favorable, and his six hundred men, accompanied by the chiefs of Manasseh, set out in the direction of the brook Besser, a wadi somewhere in the extreme south of Judah. Here two hundred of his forces were so spent that he was fain to leave them by the brook, while the remainder, pressing on, found in a field an Egyptian at the point of death, 
who had neither eaten bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. But being supplied by David's men with food and drink, he revived, revealed that he was a slave of one of the Amalekite chiefs, and on promise of his life, consented to guide the avengers to their foes. On coming up with them, they were found spread abroad upon all the earth, eating, drinking, and dancing in honor of their late victory, 1 Samuel 30.16. The attack was instantly made, and David smote them from the twilight of the early dawn to the evening of the next day, till none remained save only four hundred young men who effected their escape on camels. With all the captives recovered and enormous spoil, the conqueror returned to Ziklag and was now for the first time enabled to requite the kindness of many of his own tribe who had protected him during the long period of his wanderings and distributed of the spoil to the elders of many friendly towns. 1 Samuel 30, 26-31 Two days after his return, news arrived of the utmost importance respecting the Philistine invasion. With their chariots and horses, the Philistines had pressed forward towards the plain of Esdraelon, and pitched their camp by Shunem on the southern slope of the range now called Little Hermon, or Jebel ed Duhi, while Saul encamped his forces on the opposite heights of Mount Gilboa, at the fountain that is in Jezreel on the eastern side of the plain. As he beheld the masses of his foes passing on by hundreds and thousands, the Israelite king was filled with the utmost alarm, 1 Samuel 28, 5. In this dreadful crisis, he felt himself utterly alone. Samuel, his old adviser, had been some time dead. The cruel massacre at Nob had alienated from him the entire priestly body. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. 1 Samuel 28, 6 Alone and distrusted even by his own army, he bade inquiry be made for a woman that had a familiar spirit. After diligent search, it was ascertained that by going a distance of about seven or eight miles to Endor, he would find, in one of the dark and gloomy caverns with which the mountain here is hollowed, a woman who might serve his purpose. Disguising himself, therefore, and accompanied by two of his retinue, the unhappy king set out under cover of night. It was an undertaking perilous in the extreme, and nothing but the agony of despair would have induced him to venture upon it. Stealing down the mountain from the camp, the three crossed the shoulder of the very hill on which the Philistines were entrenched, and made for Endor, which lay behind Shunem. Reaching the cave, the king told the witch the object of his coming, he longed to have one more interview with his old adviser, the prophet Samuel, and desired her, by her arts, to bring him up. At first the woman demurred, and pleaded the danger of exciting the wrath of the king, who in better days had distinguished himself by his zeal against all magic and sorcery. But her visitor calmed her fears. She exercised her arts, and the awful form of Samuel, an old man, and covered with a mantle, appeared. Bowing himself with his face to the earth, Saul made known his deep distress. The Philistines, said he, make war against me. God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. 
I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. 1 Samuel 28.15 In reply, the prophet could only inform the king that the day of doom was near. Tomorrow, said he, the Lord will deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. This awful sentence utterly prostrated the unhappy king. He fell with the fullness of his stature all along upon the earth. 1 Samuel 28.20 Marginal For a day and a night he had eaten nothing, and now there was no more strength in him. With the utmost difficulty, the woman and his two attendants succeeded in compelling him to partake of food, and then he rose up, once more crossed the shoulder of the hill, and reached the heights of Gilboa, First Samuel twenty-eight, twenty-one through 25 The next morning broke, and the Philistines made their onset. The Israelite leader, with his doom upon him, could do little in such a crisis. His army was driven up the sides of Gilboa, and as it fled from the victorious Philistines, numbers were slain on the heights. Resolved on striking a decisive blow, the Philistine archers and charioteers followed hard after Saul and his sons. Three of the latter, including the valiant Jonathan, were slain outright and Saul himself was sore wounded. In this extremity, he implored of his armor-bearer to thrust him through with his sword and put an end to his sufferings. But his armor-bearer refused, and Saul, taking his own sword, fell upon it and died, and the other then followed his example. The rout of the Israelites was now complete, and extended even to the tribes beyond the Jordan. Even here, the Israelites fled from their cities, and the Philistines dwelt in them. 1 Samuel 31, 7 On the morrow, after this disastrous battle, the bodies of Saul and his three sons were found by the Philistines when they came to strip the slain. With savage glee, they cut off his head, stripped him of his armor, and sent it into their own land to be placed as a trophy in the temple of Ashtaroth, probably at Ashdod, and fastened his body and those of his three sons to the wall overhanging the open space in front of the gate of the Canaanite city of Beth Shan. On the mountain range beyond Jordan, in full view of Beth Shan, was the town of Jabesh Gilead, by his heroic relief of which Saul had inaugurated his reign. Hearing from the fugitives what had occurred to their king, the grateful inhabitants, mindful of past services, determined that his remains should not continue thus dishonored. Their valiant men arose, crossed the Jordan, and under cover of night took down his body and those of his sons, buried them under the terebinth of their native town, and fasted seven days. 1 Samuel 31.13 Such was the news David now received at Ziklag from a young Amalekite who had been present at the battle. Deeming himself sure of the reward that greeted the bearer of glad tidings, he had brought with him Saul's crown and the bracelet that was on his arm and pretended to have slain him at his own request. 2 Samuel 1, 1 through 1-12 But David's wrath was kindled, and having sternly rebuked him for touching the Lord's anointed, he bade one of his young men put him to death, and then, 
burst into a strain of passionate lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, forgetting all that had passed between him and the fallen king. He remembered only the better features of his character, while towards Jonathan, his whole soul gushed forth in expressions of the tenderest affection. Second Samuel one, seventeen through twenty-seven. End of book eight, chapter seven. Book nine, chapter one. Of a class book of Old Testament history. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Book Nine: The Reigns of David and Solomon. Chapter One: David's Reign at Hebron. Second Samuel chapters two through four, one thousand fifty-five to one thousand forty-eight B.C. The hour which the prophet of Rama had long ago foretold was now come. The long period of trial and discipline was over. The brave shepherd, the conqueror of Goliath, the daring but prudent leader of attached followers, was the only one left to whom the Israelites could look for guidance in this great crisis of their national history. But though the way was open, David did not enter upon it without seeking divine direction. Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? He inquired of the Lord. And the Lord bade him go up to Hebron, the ancient sacred city of the tribe of Judah, the burial place of the patriarch, and the inheritance of Caleb. Accordingly, leaving Ziklag, he repaired thither with his two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, and his faithful band of six hundred. And there the chiefs of Judah, now after a long period of obscurity to become the ruling tribe, anointed him as their king. His first act after his accession was to thank the men of Jabesh Gilead. For their bravery in removing the corpses of Saul and his sons from the walls of Beth Shan, Second Samuel chapter two verses one through seven, of the family of the late king, there now remained only Ishbosheth, his youngest son, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, a child but five years old. Ishbosheth, according to the law of Oriental succession, ascended the throne, and under the protection of his kinsman, the powerful Abner. Established his kingdom at the ancient sanctuary of Mahanaim on the east of the Jordan, ruling over not only the eastern tribes but the territory of Asher, the plain of Esdraelon, central Ephraim, his own tribe of Benjamin, and eventually over all Israel. Second Samuel chapter two verse nine, excepting only Judah, which remained faithful to David. The first of many skirmishes between the rival kings took place at Gibeon, to the heights of which, in their native Benjamin. Abner and his forces went out from Mahanaim, Second Samuel chapter two verse twelve. Thither also, as if to watch their movements, repaired the three nephews of David, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. On the east side of the hill of Gibeon, at the foot of a low cliff, was a large pool or tank, on either side of which the rival forces encamped. And as if to try their respective strength, Abner proposed the select body from both sides should engage in combat. Joab accepted the challenge, and twelve picked champions of the party of Ishbosheth met an equal number of the warriors of David. The struggle was desperate. Each combatant caught his fellow by the head and thrust his sword into his side, and thus all fell dead together on a spot henceforth called Helkath Hazarim, the Field of Heroes. This brought on a general engagement in which the forces of Ishbosheth were defeated, and Abner himself was fain to fly, hotly pursued by Asahel, the youngest of David's nephews, and as light of foot as a wild roe. Second Samuel chapter two verse eighteen. Abner recognized his fleet pursuer and advised him to desist from the chase, but the youth, heeding not, pressed on, and Abner, turning back upon him, thrust him through with a spear. The bleeding corpse lay in the middle of the road and was quickly surrounded by the men of Judah, who, as they came up, stood still in mournful astonishment. Second Samuel chapter two verse twenty-three. But the sight of their brother's body only roused Joab and Abishai to greater fury, and they pursued after Abner as far as the hill of Amma by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon, which they reached at sunset. There, the men of his own tribe of Benjamin rallied round the general of Ishbosheth and stood on the top of the hill. While he cried to the pursuing Joab and implored him not to push matters further, on this Joab gave the signal for a cessation of the pursuit, 
and drew off his men, and conveying his brother's corpse to Bethlehem, laid it in the ancestral tomb. Then at daybreak he rejoined David at Hebron, to whom he announced the loss of only nineteen men in the late encounter. Meanwhile, Abner returned to Mount Ahiam, whence he carried a series of petty wars with the adherents of David, in which David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Second Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. In the course of time, a quarrel with his kinsman and general precipitated the fall of Ishbosheth. Abner had married Rizpah, the daughter of Ajai, and a concubine of Saul. According to the notions of Orientals, this very nearly amounted to treason. Compare Second Samuel chapter 16, verse 21, chapter 22, verse 3, First Kings chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. And as such, Ishbosheth flung it in the teeth of his general. Abner replied in words of utmost anger, and reproaching Ishbosheth with the basest ingratitude, straightway began to open communications with David, who agreed to receive him at Hebron, on the condition that Michal, his former wife, was restored to him. This condition was complied with, and after sounding the chiefs of Israel and of his own tribe, Abner, with twenty men, came to David at Hebron. A feast greeted his arrival, and he departed with the avowed intention of gathering all Israel unto his lord the king. Second Samuel chapter 3, verses 17-21 through 21. He had hardly departed from the royal presence when Joab returned from a foray and was informed of this unexpected visit. Jealous, probably, of a possible rival, and burning with rage against his brother's murder, he remonstrated in no measured terms with David for his imprudence, as he termed it, in admitting the general of Ishbosheth to an audience and sending him away in peace. Then, unknown to the king, he sent messengers after Abner to call him back. Not suspecting treachery, the latter returned to Hebron, and, as he entered the gate, Joab took him aside and stabbed him to death, as he had stabbed his brother Asahel. News of this cruel and treacherous deed roused David's unbounded indignation. Unable to punish the assassin, he imprecated on the house of Joab the most fearful curses and compelled him to attend the funeral of his murdered victim, robed in sackcloth and wearing all the signs of mourning. He himself fasted till sunset, and as he followed the buyer to the burial place of Hebron, poured forth a solemn dirge. This incident gave David an insight into Joab's unscrupulous character, which he never forgot. These men, he said, the sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me, and I am this day weak, though anointed king. Second Samuel chapter 3, verse 39 The death of Abner was the signal for the dissolution of the tottering kingdom he had supported. On receiving the tidings of his kinsman's murder, Ishbosheth's hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. Second Samuel chapter 4, verse 1, verse 50 his bodyguard was composed of men from his own tribe of Benjamin, but two divisions of it were commanded by two men, Bana and Rechab, who, though descendants of the Canaanitish natives of Beeroth, were reckoned among the Benjaminites. In revenge, it has been suggested for some injury they received from Saul, possibly the slaughter of their Gibeonite kinsmen, compare Second Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, and certainly with the hope of conciliating the new king at Hebron, these two resolved to take the life of Ishbosheth about the heat of the day. Second Samuel chapter four verse five. Therefore they entered the palace under pretense of fetching some wheat piled up near the entrance. Second Samuel chapter four verse six. And finding Ishbosheth lying on his bed, they stabbed him to the heart and cut off his head. Then, hurrying all that afternoon and all night, Second Samuel chapter four verse seven, down the valley of the Jordan. They presented themselves before David at Hebron with the bloody head in their hands, but they met with no better reception than the pretended slayer of Saul. David sternly rebuked them for their cold-blooded murder of a righteous person in his own house upon his bed and ordered their instant execution. Their hands and feet were cut off and their bodies were suspended over the pool at Hebron, while the head of Ishbosheth was buried with all honors in the sepulcher of Abner. Second Samuel verse 4 chapters 8 through 12. End of Book 9, Chapter 1book 9 chapter 2 of a class book of old testament history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by olivia a class book of old testament history by george frederick mcclear book 9 chapter 2 david's reign at jerusalem second samuel chapters 5 through 7 1048 
through 1042 B.C. Every obstacle was thus removed that had hitherto prevented David's assuming the royal power over all the tribes. Ishbosheth was dead. Abner was dead. Mephibosheth was dead. Mephibosheth, Jonathan's only surviving son, was barely twelve years of age. The son of Jesse had long waited for his hour, and at length it was come. A deputation from all the tribes of Israel, 2 Samuel 5, verse 1, repaired to Hebron and formally offered him the crown. A solemn league was then entered into, and for the third time David was anointed amidst great rejoicings. At Hebron he had reigned for seven and a half years over Judah. He was now king of all Israel. His band of six hundred faithful followers had rapidly swelled into a great host, like the host of God. First Chronicles 12, verse 22. And now not only Dan and Judah and Simeon, not only Benjamin and Ephraim, not only the tribes beyond the Jordan, Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, flocked around his standard, but Issachar sent men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. First Chronicles 12, verse 32. And Zebulun and Naphtali sent not only men, but the peculiar products of their rich territory. First Chronicles 12, verse 40. While a still more important accession consisted of 4,600 warriors of the Levitical tribe and 3,700 of the house of Aaron, headed by Jehoiada, and the youthful but valiant Zadok. First Chronicles 12, verses 25 through 28. Upwards of 300,000 choice warriors of the flower of Israel were thus gathered together to turn the kingdom of Saul to David and join in celebrating the three days festival which greeted his accession to the throne. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 39. His first act after his coronation was significant. Saul had always been content with the obscurity of his native Gibeah, and had cared little for any central point of union for the tribes. As sovereign over all Israel, both north and south, David resolved to move the seat of government from Hebron nearer to the center of the country. No spot seemed to present so many advantages as the rocky mass on which rose the city of the Jebusites. It was neutral ground on the very meeting point of his own tribe and that of Benjamin. The lower city had once been taken by the warriors of Judah, Judges chapter 1, verse 8. But the fortress of the Jebusites, strong in its seemingly impregnable position, had never been reduced. The presence of so many warriors from all the tribes was favorable for making an attempt on so renowned a citadel, and at the head of all his forces David advanced against it, probably from the south. As before, the lower city appears to have been easily captured but again the fortress held out against every attack. Moreover, so convinced were the Jebusites of the strength of their castle and of the ancient everlasting gates of its rocky ravines that they merely manned its walls with the lame and the blind, Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 6, deeming them amply sufficient for the defense. Their taunts roused the wrath of David, and he promised that whoso first scaled the rocky sides of the citadel and smote the Jebusite garrison— should have the post of captain-general of all the forces. Thereupon, the agile Joab climbed up first, and, as the conqueror of the fastness of Jebus, was rewarded with the post of commander-in-chief, the same office that Abner had held under Saul. Then, without loss of time, David took measures for securing his new possession. He enclosed the whole city with a wall, and connected it with the newly captured fortress, and there took up his abode, and thus the Jebusite stronghold became the city of David." The effect of the conquest of this celebrated fortress was very great. The news no sooner reached the court of Hiram, king of Phoenicia, than he dispatched messengers to David with offers of artificers and materials for constructing a palace, which was accordingly built, and hither David removed his wives from Hebron and increased his already numerous household. Second Samuel chapter 5, verses 13-16 through 16. In other quarters the news was very differently received. The Philistines made two distinct attempts to crush the new king, of whose powers they were well aware. On the first occasion, they came and encamped their numerous forces in the Valley of Rephaim, or the Valley of Giants, southwest of Jerusalem, and stretching thence halfway to Bethlehem. After duly inquiring of the Lord, David marched out against them and swept them away as though with a burst of waters, whence he named the spot Baal Perazim, the Plain of Bursts, or Destruction. Second Samuel chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. A second attempt of the same pertinacious foe met with no better success. They were entirely routed, and the fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all the nations. First Chronicles chapter 14, verse 17. 
His next care was to consecrate his new capital with religious associations. After consultation with the chiefs of the nation, he assembled thirty thousand from all Israel. Second Samuel chapter six, verse one, First Chronicles thirteen, verse one, and went to Kirjath Jerim, the village of the forests, where the ark seems to have remained all through the reign of Saul in the custody of the Levite Abinadab. First Samuel chapter seven, verses one and two. The sacred coffer was placed in a new cart drawn by oxen, and with Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, preceding it, was escorted towards Jerusalem amid great rejoicings and the sound of psalteries, cornets, timbrels, and cymbals. On reaching the threshing floor of Chidon or Nachon, First Chronicles thirteen verse nine, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark. In a moment he fell dead. Second Samuel. Chapter six, verse seven. This untoward event filled David with alarm. The spot itself was henceforth known as Perez Uzzah, the breaking or disaster of Uzzah. First Chronicles, chapter thirteen, verse eleven. And it was resolved to desist from any further attempt at present to remove the sacred coffer. Accordingly, it was carried aside to the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. That is probably a native of Gath Rimon, a town of Dan, allotted to the Kohathite Levites. Of whom Obed Edom was one, where it remained three months. Second Samuel chapter six verses ten and eleven. First Chronicles thirteen verse thirteen. Meanwhile, David prepared a new tabernacle at Jerusalem, and hearing that the presence of the ark had brought a blessing to the house of Obed Edom, he assembled the Levites and Zadok and Abiathar, the two representatives of the Aaronic family, and bade them prepare for the duty of removing the sacred symbol. Solemn purifications neglected on the previous occasion. First Chronicles fifteen verses twelve through fourteen were now performed, and the Levites arranged in orderly divisions with singers and musicians, the elders of Israel and captains of the host set out for the house of Obed Edom. On this occasion, the Levites, as enjoined in the law, lifted it with the long staves passing through the rings of the ark and raising it upon their shoulders, commenced the joyous procession. First Chronicles chapter fifteen verse fifteen. When they had advanced six paces. Second Samuel chapter seven verse thirteen. It was clear that the Lord was this time helping them, and the procession paused to offer a sacrifice of seven bullocks and seven rams in token of thankfulness for this proof of the divine favor. Then the march was resumed amidst shouting and the joyful sounds of all kinds of music, headed by David himself in an ephod of linen and by the singers and Levites arrayed in white vestments. As they ascended the path leading upwards toward the ancient fortress of the Jebusites. The king, carried away by the associations of this great day, not only played on a stringed instrument but accompanied the music with leaping and dancing. At length, the city was reached, and the gates of the ancient fortress lifted up their heads as the symbol of the presence of Jehovah, the King of Glory, the Lord strong and mighty, entered in. Psalm twenty-four, verses eight and nine, and was placed within the awnings of the new pavilion tent that had been prepared for it. A series of burnt offerings and peace offerings were then celebrated, and the king blessed the people and dismissed them to their homes with ample presents. A single untoward incident marred this, the greatest day in David's life. As the procession passed under the windows of her apartments, Michal, the daughter of Saul, deeming David's dance undignified, despised him in her heart. Second Samuel chapter six verse sixteen. And when, at the conclusion of all the gorgeous ceremonial, he entered his house to bless his family. Second Samuel chapter six verse twenty, she came out to meet him, but in place of congratulations, taunted him with his indecorous appearance that day. David replied with great bitterness to this untimely scoffing, and Michal had no child unto the day of her death. First Samuel chapter six verse twenty three, the construction of his own palace and the reception of the ark within the folds of a new tabernacle in Zion, the desire to build a more ample and permanent temple for Jehovah. The design received the divine approval, but it was intimated to him by Nathan the prophet that, as he was a man of war and blood, First Chronicles twenty-eight verse three, so peaceful a work would be better reserved for another. The refusal, however, was accompanied by a promise of the permanence of his dynasty. The mercy of Jehovah should not be taken from him, as it had been taken from Saul. A son of his own should carry on the work, and his throne should be established for ever. Second Samuel chapter seven verses twelve through seventeen, First Chronicles seventeen verses three through fifteen. End of book nine, chapter two. Recording by Olivia.
Book 9, Chapter 3 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 9, Chapter 3. David's Army, His Conquests, His Sin. Second Samuel chapters eight through twelve, First Chronicles chapters eighteen through twenty, ten forty to ten thirty three B.C. Thus assured of the continuance of his kingdom, David began by a series of conquests to extend his power beyond the immediate boundaries of his own people, and to found an imperial dominion, which for the first time realized the prophetic description contained in the promise made to his forefather Abraham. Genesis 15, verses 18-21 through 21. As instrumental to these conquests, the military organizations of the Israelites was now materially developed, and David was enabled within ten years after the reduction of the fortress of Jebus to push his conquests far and wide, and to get him a name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. 2 Samuel 7, verse 9 1. On the southwest he turned his arms against his old enemies the Philistines and subdued them, capturing Gath with its daughter towns. First Chronicles 18, verse 1. Second, on the southeast, the Edomites felt the weight of his arms. Together with Joab, he carried on a campaign of six months against them. Compare Second Samuel eight fourteen with First Kings 11, verse 15, during which period he put vast numbers to the sword, established garrisons in the country, and thus became master of the eastern arm of the Red Sea and the caravan routes to the marts and harbors of Arabia. Compare Genesis 27, verses 29, 37, and 40, and Psalm 60, verses 6 through 12. Third, on the northeast, the kingdom of Zobah had acquired considerable influence under Hadadazer, son of Rehob. David attacked him as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates, Second Samuel 8, verse 3, and defeated him with a loss of 1,000 chariots, 700 cavalry, and 200 infantry. Had Adazer's allies, the Syrians of Damascus, then marched to his assistance, but they were routed with a loss of 22,000 men and became David's vassals. The wealth of Zobah was considerable. Several of Hadadazer's officers carried shields of gold, Second Samuel 8, verse 7, that is, probably, iron or wooden frames overlaid with plates of the precious metal. These David brought to Jerusalem, as also large stores of brass from other Syrian cities. First Chronicles 18, verses 7 and 8. Fourth, on the east of Jordan, he had hitherto maintained the most amicable relations with the king of Moab. First Samuel's 22, verses 3 and 4. But now, from some unexplained cause, he not only attacked and defeated, but well nigh extirpated the nation. Two-thirds of the people were put to death. The rest were reduced to bondage and paid regular tribute, while the spoils were treasured up in Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 8, verse 2, 1 Chronicles 11, verse 22. This campaign, in which the valiant Benaiah greatly distinguished himself, 2 Samuel 23, verse 20, fulfilled the prophecy of Balaam, a scepter had risen out of Israel, and smitten through the princes of Moab, and destroyed the city of Ar, that is, Rabath Moab, the capital of the children of Lot, Numbers 24, verse 17. Fifth, it was, however, from the kindred people of Ammon, that the royal conquests experienced the greatest resistance. During the period of his wanderings, David had received much kindness from Nahash, the king of Ammon, and on his death he sent a royal embassy to offer his condolences to the new king, Hanun. But Hanun's courtiers persuaded him that this embassy was really dictated by a wish to spy out his land, and probably add it to the many others that David had conquered. Accordingly, on the arrival of the ambassadors, Hanun treated them with the utmost indignity. He shaved off one half of their beards, cut off their garments in the middle, and so sent them away. Second Samuel 10, verses 1 through 3, First Chronicles 19, verses 1 through 4. As soon as David was informed of this aggravated insult, he bade his ambassadors remain at Jericho till the traces of the indignities they had suffered were removed, and then made preparations for sending Joab with the mighty men and the host to take summary vengeance on the Ammonites. Truly divining the consequences of their folly, the latter prepared for the impending war by raising a mercenary force of 32,000 men from the Syrians of Beth-Rehob and Zobah, from those owning fealty to the king of Maacah, 
a region in the valley of the Jordan south of Zobah, and from the land of Tob. Aided by these allies, the Syrians awaited the onset of the Hebrews. On his arrival, Joab, perceiving that he was confronted by two very considerable armies, divided his forces and assigned to his brother Abishai the task of assaulting the Ammonites, while he himself, with a picked body of troops, attacked the Syrians, situated a little to the south of Heshbon. At Medabah, the latter were quickly routed, and the Ammonites, in alarm at their speedy defeat, fled to their capital, Rabah, now called Ammon, situated on a very advantageous position and well supplied with water. Meanwhile, the Syrians beyond the Euphrates, under the command of Shopak, or Shobak, a general of Hadadazer, assembled their forces with the intention of avenging the repulse sustained by their kindred, the allies of the Ammonites. Crossing the Euphrates, they joined the Syrians at Halam, the site of which is unknown. The occasion was deemed of sufficient importance to justify the personal interference of David. Gathering all Israel and passing over Jordan, he attacked the Syrians and defeated them with great slaughter. Shobak himself was slain, and the allied princes quitted the Syrian confederacy and became tributary vassals of the Hebrew monarch. Second Samuel 11, verses 15 through 19, First Chronicles 19, verses 10 through 19. Early in the following year, the campaign against the Ammonites was resumed, and the command of the forces, including the royal bodyguard, Second Samuel 11, verse 1, and the troops of Ephraim and Benjamin, as well as Judah, Second Samuel 11, verse 11, was again entrusted to Joab and the army was, for the first time since the disastrous battle of Apek, accompanied by the ark and its Levitical guard. 2 Samuel 11, verse 11. On this occasion, Rabbah was the main object of the attack, and after ravaging the country, Joab drove the Ammonites into their citadel and commenced a regular siege, which lasted very nearly two years. 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. Meanwhile, critical as was the nature of the campaign, instead of accompanying the ark, David lingered behind at Jerusalem and there wrought that deed of shame, which has left so dark a blot upon his character, and which threw a gloom over all the rest of his life. One day, on arising from his afternoon repose, he saw from the roof of his palace a woman of extraordinary beauty, for whom he instantly conceived a most violent passion. On making inquiry, he discovered that her name was Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, or Amiel, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite, who was at that time serving in the army against Rabbah, as one of the famous thirty, Second Samuel 23, verse 39, First Chronicles 11, verse 41. The fact that she was the wife of one of his most distinguished officers did not make David hesitate. He sent for her and committed adultery with her. As the time went on, he found it would no longer be possible to screen her from the death punishment of an adulteress. Accordingly, after vainly trying other and most unworthy expedients to cover his own guilt, he sent a letter to Joab, bidding him expose this chivalrous and high-minded officer where the conquest was hottest so as to ensure his death. The unscrupulous Joab did as he was told, and Uriah fell, happily unconscious of his wife's dishonor. Joab then sent a trusty messenger to David to inform him that Uriah was dead, and the days of mourning for her husband were no sooner over than the king sent for Bathsheba, and she became his wife. 2 Samuel 11, verses 14-27 through 27. But though David had done all this secretly, an all-seeing eye had watched each step in this dreadful crime, and punishment quickly appeared at the door. The prophet Nathan was sent to him, and with wonderful tact, roused the royal attention by the well-known parable of the rich man and the poor man's ewe lamb. Unsuspecting its purport, David's wrath was kindled, and he denounced death as the penalty of the rich man, and the restoration of the property fourfold. Then, turning to the king, the prophet sped his winged arrow, saying, Thou art the man, and announcing the awful penalty. As David had measured unto others, so should it be measured to him. Evil was to rise up against him out of the bosom of his own family, and the sword should never depart from his house. Second Samuel 12, verse 10. Unlike other kings of Israel and Judah, unlike any common eastern despot, David did not slay or ill-treat the messenger of judgment. He acknowledged his sin and the justice of the sentence. On this, Nathan went on to tell him that the Lord had put away his sin, and he himself was not to die, but an earnest of future judgments soon appeared. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto him, and it died. But in the midst of judgment, God remembered mercy, and in the course of time, a second son was born to Bathsheba, whom Nathan named Jedidiah, beloved of the Lord. But David himself called him Solomon, the peaceful one. 2 Samuel 12, verses 15 through 25. 
Meanwhile, Joab had been pushing toward the siege of Rabah, and eventually succeeded in capturing the city of waters, that is, the lower town, which contained the perennial stream, which rises in and still flows through it. But the citadel, a place of great strength, still held out. The possession of the perennial stream was, however, the next step to the capture of the stronghold, and Joab sent messengers to David, bidding him gather the rest of the people and come himself, unless he wished him to have the honor of capturing the place and calling it after his own name. Accordingly, the king set out, and the fortress was speedily taken. Enraged, it is not improbable, at the obstinacy of the siege, he wreaked a terrible vengeance on the inhabitants. Some were decapitated, others sawn asunder or crushed beneath iron instruments, Others were passed through the fire in brick kilns, Second Samuel 12, verse 31. The royal crown, the crown of Milcom, weighing a talent of gold, with the precious stones, was then placed on David's head, and he and his army returned in triumph to Jerusalem with abundant spoils. End of Book 9, Chapter 3《Book Nine, Chapter Four of a Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book Nine, Chapter Four The Rebellion of Absalom. Second Samuel thirteen through twenty, BC ten thirty two to ten twenty two. The reduction of Rabbah was the last of David's conquests. His kingdom had reached the limits foretold to the patriarch Abraham, and vied in extent with some of the great empires of that age. But from this point, dark clouds began to gather round his own personal history and the doom denounced by the prophet found its fulfillment. The terrible secret of his adultery and murder may at first have been known only to a few, but its results were soon proclaimed upon the housetops. Out of the numerous harem, which in defiance of the law of the kingdom, he had multiplied to himself, out of his own household, came the instruments of his punishment. First, his daughter Tamar, was outraged by her half-brother and his eldest son, Amnon. Two years afterwards, Amnon fell a victim to the wrath of Tamar's own brother, Absalom, father of peace, who caused him to be murdered at a sheep-shearing festival, and then, apprehensive of the resentment of David, fled to the court of Talmai, his grandfather, the king of Jeshur, a district on the east of the Jordan, south of Mount Hermon. Second Samuel 13.36. Here he remained secure in its rocky fastness for three years, during which time the soul of David was consumed, Second Samuel 13.39, margin, with longing for his favorite son. Perceiving this, Joab availed himself of the services of a wise woman of Tekoa, who sought an interview with the king and addressing him in an apologue similar to that which Nathan had employed, succeeded in obtaining permission for the exile's return. Joab, therefore, went to the court of the king of Jeshur, and thence brought back the young prince, who took up his abode at Jerusalem, but was not suffered to see his father's face. Twice he sent a message to David's general, begging him to intercede in his behalf with the king, but Joab deemed he had done enough, and would take no further steps in the matter. Thereupon Absalom caused a barley field belonging to Joab, which was near his own estate, to be set on fire, and the latter, probably fearing further outrage, informed the king, who consented to see his son, and gave him the kiss of peace. Second Samuel 14:23 to 33 but the ungrateful son was no sooner thus restored than he began to form plots against his father. First he surrounded himself with a small bodyguard, with chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. Then, to ingratiate himself with the people, he took his stand by the way of the gate, a duty which David appears to have neglected, and conversed with suitors coming up to the city for judgment.
lamented the delays they would encounter in obtaining a hearing of their causes, Second Samuel 15, 3, and insinuated how different would be the aspects of affairs if he was made judge in the land. Young, handsome beyond compare in Israel, Second Samuel 14, 25, sprung from a royal house both on his father's and his mother's side, Second Samuel 3.3. 3. He made a deep impression on the people, and his insinuating manners and unusual condensation stole away their hearts, Second Samuel 15.6. Since the dark sin of which he had been guilty, the hold of the king upon the nation appears to have been weakened and he had become less fitted for the more personal and more energetic duties of his position. And now the powerful tribe of Judah, fretting, it has been suggested, under their absorption into one great kingdom, or looking for some greater degree of power under the supremacy of a prince like Absalom, showed signs of a want of confidence in their sovereign, and in the course of two years Absalom perceived that matters were ripe for a revolt. Under pretense, therefore, of a vow which he had vowed to the Lord, Second Samuel fifteen seven through 9 he succeeded in obtaining from David permission to go to Hebron, the old capital of the tribe of Judah, and repaired thither accompanied by two hundred men from Jerusalem, probably of the chief families, who were, however, entirely ignorant of his designs. To the same place also he summoned Ahithophel the Gilonite, the familiar friend and counselor of his father, whose advice was deemed to have the value of a divine oracle. While Absalom was taking these measures, news of the conspiracy and of the popular feeling reached the royal palace. Instantly, without offering any resistance, or striking a single blow in defense of his crown, David resolved on flight. Accompanied by the royal bodyguard and the six hundred Gittites, and a vast concourse of people, he left Jerusalem, and early in the morning crossed the brook Kidron. As far as the city boundaries, he was also followed by the Levites, and the high priests Zadok and Abiathar with the ark. But David had no wish to expose the sacred symbol to any risk, and the two chiefs in the Levitical tribe might do him better service at Jerusalem. Accordingly, they were bidden to turn back. Then, crossing the ravine of the Kidron, with head covered and unsandaled feet, his retinue manifesting every sign of profound sorrow, the king ascended the slopes of Olivet and as he went received intelligence that his privy counsellor, Ahithophel, had gone over to the ranks of his rebellious son. In the defection of this man, his equal, his guide, his own familiar friend, he instantly saw his danger, and prayed that the counsel of Ahithophel might be turned into foolishness. Second Samuel 15.31 Reaching the summit of the hill, he encountered Hushai the Archite, the king's friend, with torn robe and dust upon his head. In him David saw a fitting instrument for counteracting the influence of Ahithophel, and persuaded him to return to Jerusalem, and undertake the dangerous task of pretending a devotion to the cause of Absalom. Well, really, in conjunction with Zadok and Abiathar and their two sons, he kept a strict watch over all that occurred. Hushai accordingly turned back, and David descended the further slopes of Olivet. Here he met Ziba, the wily servant of Mephibosheth, the son of his old friend Jonathan, with welcome supplies of wine, bread, and fruit. Ziba represented that his master was staying behind at Jerusalem, awaiting any change in his fortunes which the rebellion might bring and as a reward for his services obtained a steady grant of his estates. At Bahiram, a little further down the hill, David encountered Shimei, a Benjamite of the house of Saul, who flung stones at the royal retinue, and imprecated them on the most furious curses, in which he perhaps expressed the long pent-up hatred of the family of Saul, as well as the popular feeling against the author of Uriah's death. The impetuous Abishai would have instantly cut off his head, but David stayed his hand. 
Let him curse, said he, for the Lord hath bidden him. Second Samuel sixteen ten through 12 The way now led into the Jordan Valley, and for the first time a weary retinue halted, and refreshed themselves with Ziba's welcome supplies. Meanwhile Absalom, with Ahithophel and a numerous retinue, had reached Jerusalem. There he met Hushai, who saluted him with the words, Long live the king! Even Absalom was startled, and reproached him for his apparent treachery, but kept him by him. The first step of the usurper, suggested by Ahithophel, was to take possession of his father's harem, and so render all reconciliation impossible. The course to be next taken was anxiously debated. Ahithophel was for instant measures, and offered with twelve thousand men to head a pursuit after David that very night, while he was weary and weak-handed. If he smote the king, he felt sure the whole people would side with Absalom, and his triumph would be complete. The advice found favor with the usurper, and the elders about him, but first he resolved to call in Hushai, and ascertain his opinion. Hushai pronounced the plan imprudent in the extreme, to attack the king while surrounded by his mighty men, all chafing in their minds as a she-bear robbed of her whelps, was very dangerous. From a partial defeat the prince had everything to fear, and the king everything to gain. He counseled, therefore, delay, and the mustering of the entire national forces from Dan to Beersheba. Absalom approved of this plan, and Ahithophel, probably seeing the certain effects of such delay, and chagrined at the adoption of another's counsel in preference to his own, retired to Gilo, put his household in order, and hanged himself. Second Samuel 27.23 Without a moment's delay, Hushai now sought out Zadok and Abiathar, related all that had occurred in the council, and urged that a messenger should be instantly sent to David, to bid him not linger in the Jordan Valley, but cross the river with all speed. The two sons of the high priests were in concealment at the fountain of Enrogel, ready for such an errand. A female slave was sent thither to bid them instantly carry the message to David. They forthwith started, but narrowly escaped detection. At Bahiram a lad saw them and conveyed the news to Absalom, and it was only by hiding in a well that they escaped the vigilance of their pursuers, and announced their errand to David. Though it must have been midnight, the king instantly crossed the river, and before the dawn of the following day not one of his retinue remained on the western side of the Jordan. Mahanaim, the former capital of Ishbosheth, now became his headquarters, and here he mustered his forces, and placed them under the command of Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, and received a welcome supply of provisions from the Shobai, the son of his old friend Nahash of Rabbah, from Mashir of Lodabar, and Barzillai, a wealthy Gileadite. Meanwhile Absalom also had mustered his forces, and having entrusted the command to Amasa, the son of Ithra, or Jether, by Abigail, David's sister, Second Samuel, 17.25, he too crossed the Jordan. The decisive engagement, which was not long delayed, took place not far from Mahanaim, in the dense forest of Ephraim, a region still covered with thick oaks and tangled bushes and thorny creepers growing over rugged rocks and ruinous precipices. Here the army of Absalom was utterly routed, entangled in the thick undergrowth, crushing each other in remediless ruin. Upwards of twenty thousand perished in that fatal wood, which devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Second Samuel 18.8 Amidst the crowd of fugitives, Absalom also fled, and as he rode on his mule, where the strong arms of the trees spread out so near the ground that one cannot walk erect beneath them, his long hair caught in an oak, and he hung suspended from the tree. A man chanced to see him, and forthwith told Joab. 
he himself had forborne to touch the prince, having heard the strict injunctions of the loving David to his three captains before the battle, to deal tenderly with the young man. But Joab had no such scruples. With three darts in his hand he went to the spot and transfixed him while yet alive. A great pit was then dug, and into it the corpse was flung, and covered with a great heap of stones. With the death of the usurper, Joab knew the rebellion was at an end. He therefore sounded the signal of recall, and the battle closed. Meanwhile, David, who had been sitting at the gate of Mahanaim, anxiously awaiting tidings of the battle, no sooner heard that his son was dead than he gave way to the most violent grief. Joab alone dared to confront him, bidding him bestir himself if he would not see another popular revolt. Roused at last, the king consented to present himself at the gate, but he could not forget who had given the death-blow to his favorite son, and even vowed to transfer the chieftaincy of the troops to Amasa, though he had led the forces on the other side, and in this was laid the lasting breach between himself and his powerful nephew, which neither the one nor the other ever forgave. The rebellion ended, the rightful monarch could return to his kingdom. With a self-control rare in Western, no less than Eastern history, every step in his progress was marked by forgiveness. Shammai was forgiven. Mephibosheth, proved to have been faithful, was partially reinstated, and Barzillai rewarded with ample gifts. Second Samuel fourteen sixteen through forty three, but the danger was not yet over. In bringing about the king's return, his own tribe of Judah had the largest share. This provoked the old jealousy of the other tribes. Well, the Benjamites even took up arms and placed themselves under the leadership of Sheba, son of Bishri, a man of Mount Ephraim. Many others also rallied round him, and when Amasa, the new general-in-chief, failed within three days to muster the forces of Judah, David was afraid, lest more harm should come of this fresh rising than had come from that of Absalom. Accordingly, Abishai, with the mighty men, was dispatched to quell the insurrection, and to pursue after Sheba before he reached any fortified towns. Taking with him the royal bodyguard, Abishai, accompanied by Joab, set out, and at the great stone of Gibeon encountered Amasa. Joab's robe was girded round his waist, and in the folds was a sword, which by accident or design protruded from the sheath. Art thou in health, my brother? He saluted Amasa, and took him by the beard as if to kiss him. The other rushed into his embrace, and was instantly stabbed to the heart, his blood spurting out upon his cousin's girdle and sandals. Leaving the body in the road, Joab hurried on after Sheba, who, rousing the tribes as he passed, had made for Abel beth Makah, a town of some importance, far up in the north by the waters of Miram. Thither Joab rushed in pursuit, threw up an embankment, and battered the walls. A wise woman saved the town from destruction. Approaching the wall, she gained a parley with the angry general, who promised to leave the place if Sheba was put to death. Thereupon she returned to her people, and the head of the rebel was soon flung into Joab's camp, who straightway sounded a trumpet, and with his troops returned to Jerusalem. Second Samuel twenty twenty two. End of Book Nine, Chapter Four. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. Book Nine, Chapter Five of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 9, Chapter 5. Close of David's Reign. Second Samuel 21-24, 1 Kings 1 and 2, B.C. 1022-1015. 
Shortly after David's restoration, his kingdom was visited for three years with a grievous famine. Enquiry was made of the divine oracle, and it was discovered to be a punishment for an act of faithlessness on the part of Saul, who had broken the solemn covenant made by Joshua with the Gibeonites. Joshua 9, 3-27 in a fit of sudden zeal for the children of Israel and Judah, he had killed some of them, and devised a general massacre of the rest. Second Samuel 21, 2-5 The Gibeonites were now asked what atonement they were willing to receive for the wrongs they had suffered. In reply they demanded neither silver nor gold. Blood had been spilt, and blood they would have, and nothing would satisfy them but permission to take seven of Saul's sons, and hang, or rather crucify them, at Gibeah. Accordingly, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, and the five sons of Michael, whom they had borne to Saul, were delivered up, and the Gibeonites crucified them on the hill of Gibeah. This was done in April, at the beginning of the barley harvest, Second Samuel 22, 9. And there the bodies remained till the periodical rains in October dropped upon them out of heaven, Second Samuel 22, 10. All this while, spreading on the rock a coarse sackcloth robe, Rizpah watched over the blackening corpses, and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the fields by night. The tale of her devoted love at length was conveyed to David, who had the remains removed, and at the same time directed that the bones of Saul also and of Jonathan should be taken from Jabesh-Gilead and buried in the ancestral sepulchre of Kish, after which God was entreated for the land. 2 Samuel 21.14 Meanwhile, in consequence, probably of the intestine feuds of the Israelites, the Philistines had recovered sufficient strength to venture on once more attacking them. David himself went with the host to battle, and in mortal combat with another descendant of the giant race, was near falling a victim to his rashness, when he was succored by the valiant Apishai, and the people, fearful lest the light of Israel should be quenched, Second Samuel 21.17, prevailed upon him to desist from accompanying them to battle in future. Other attempts were afterwards made by the Philistines, but the valor of David's captains served to keep them in check. Second Samuel 21, 18-22 The Hebrew kingdom had now attained its farthest limits, even those which God had revealed many centuries before in vision to Abraham. Genesis fifteen eighteen. Not only had David given a capital to his people, but he had conquered all the nations on the immediate frontier of his realm. His kingdom had become like one of the kingdoms of the world. It had its court, its palace, its splendor, its tributaries. In this hour of his prosperity the monarch was tempted, First Chronicles 21, 1, to yield to pride and self-exaltation, and gave directions to Joab to carry out a general census of the people from Dan, even to Beersheba. His object, it has been supposed, was either the levying of a poll tax or the formation of a standing army, with a view to foreign conquests. Whatever was his precise motive, it excited the repugnance of the captains of the host, and even of Joab himself who not only warned the king against being the cause of a trespass in Israel, but regarded the royal proposition as actually abominable. First Chronicles 21, 6. When, however, he found that nothing would turn the king from his fixed purpose, he set out, and after the lapse of nine months and twenty days, reported eight hundred thousand in Israel as fit for military service, and five hundred thousand in Judah. But before he had numbered Benjamin or Levi, Second Samuel 24.10, David's heart smote him, and Gad the seer was commissioned to offer him the choice of seven years' famine, or three months' defeat before his enemies, or a three days' pestilence. David chose to fall into the hands of God rather than into the hands of man. Therefore the plague began, and during three days swept off upwards of seventy thousand. 
But when the hand of the destroying angel was uplifted over Jerusalem, the Lord, whose mercies are great, Second Samuel 24.14, repented of the evil, and on the intercession of the king, the angel desisted, when he was by the threshing floor of Ornan or Arana, a wealthy Jebusite. By the advice of Gad, David now bought the site of the threshing floor and a yoke of oxen, erected there an altar, and offered thereon burnt offerings and peace offerings. Fire descended in testimony of the acceptance of the sacrifice, and with the cessation of the plague consecrated the rocky site of the future altar of Solomon's temple on Mount Moriah. Second Chronicles 3, 1 the remaining years of David's life were spent in amassing treasures and materials, and making preparations for the erection of the temple, First Chronicles 22, 5, and 14. But even now the truth of the prophet's words was forced upon him, that his foes should be those of his own household. The three eldest of his sons, Amnon, Chiliab, and Absalom, being dead, the fourth, Adonijah, resolved to put forth his pretensions to the kingdom. Like Absalom, whom he resembled in personal beauty, he began by surrounding himself with chariots and horsemen, and succeeded in drawing over to his side not only the high priest Abiathar, but even Joab, the commander-in-chief, whose loyalty at last wavered. Confident in the support of such old servants of the king, the pretender proclaimed a great sacrificial festival at the stone of Zoheleth, south of Jerusalem, near the fountain of En-Rogel, and invited to it all the royal princes, except Solomon, and not a few of the captains of the royal army, First Kings 5-9. through nine. While they assembled at Zoheleth, Nathan the prophet persuaded Bathsheba to seek an interview with the king, and inform him of what was going on. Bathsheba did so, and had hardly concluded her tale, when Nathan himself entered, confirmed her account, and demanded to know whether Adonijah's actions had the royal approval. Though old and feeble, David had sufficient energy to rise to the present emergency, and solemnly assured Bathsheba of his unalterable determination that Solomon should succeed to the throne. Then, summoning Zadok and Benaiah, he bade them, together with Nathan, convey Solomon in state down to Gihon, and there formally anoint and proclaim him king. Accordingly, these officers, accompanied by the royal guards, escorted Solomon thither, mounted on the royal mule, 1 Kings 38, and there Zadok anointed him with oil from the sacred horn of the tabernacle, amidst the sound of trumpets and loud shouts of God save the king. Thence the new monarch was escorted in triumph back through the city, and sat on the royal throne amidst general applause in the sight of his aged father, who blessed God that during his own lifetime he had been permitted to behold his successor, First Kings 45-48. through 48. Intelligence of these transactions was conveyed to the conspirators in the midst of their festivities at Enrogal by Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. They had already heard the noise of the people shouting as Solomon passed in procession through the city, and no sooner learnt the cause than, seized with alarm, they instantly dispersed, and every man went his way. First Kings 49 Dreading the vengeance of the new king, Adonijah now fled to the tabernacle, put himself in the sanctuary by grasping the horns of the altar, and refused to quit the spot till Solomon had promised with an oath to spare his life. The young and politic monarch, on being informed of this, abstained from binding himself by any oath, and simply assured Adonijah of safety, so long as he showed himself a worthy man, but threatened him with death if wickedness should be found in him. 1 Kings 49-52 through 52. On these conditions he quitted his place of refuge, and, having made obeisance to the new king, returned to the privacy of his own house. 1 Kings 53 The days of David were now rapidly drawing to a close. He therefore convened a solemn assembly of all the chiefs and elders of his people, the royal princes, the captains of his army, 
and his public officers, and, standing up, aged as he was, gave them his last charge, and exhorted his son to constancy in the service of Jehovah. He then solemnly delegated him to the accomplishment of the desire of his life, the erection of the temple, and committed to him, in trust, the abundant materials he had amassed for this purpose, as well as a pattern of the building and of everything belonging to it. This address, confirmed as it was by the sight of the gold and silver, the brass and iron, and precious stones, which the royal prudence had collected, had a great effect upon the people, and they also joyfully contributed to the execution of their sovereign's design. Then, in language of unequal pathos and beauty, the aged monarch solemnly thanked God for all his goodness, and prayed that he would bestow upon his son a perfect heart, enabling him to keep his testimonies and statutes, and build the temple for which he had made provision. Amidst sacrifices of unusual abundance and great feastings and rejoicings, Solomon was then for the second time anointed king, and received the formal submission of all the royal princes and the chiefs of the nation. In another and more secret interview, David gave his son his last counsels, not only concerning his own deportment as ruler, but also respecting Joab and Shimei, who were committed to his vigilance, and Barzillai the Gileadite, who was entrusted to his regard. Then, after a reign of seven and a half years at Hebron, and of thirty-three years at Jerusalem, in a good old age, full of years, riches, and honor, the son of Jesse, the shepherd, the warrior, the king, the psalmist, was gathered to his fathers, and buried in the city which had been once the fortress of the heathen Jebusites, but was now the capital of an empire that realized the loftiest ideal of prophecy, stretching from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates, and from the range of Lebanon to the Gulf of Aqaba. End of Book 9, Chapter 5 Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio Book 53 of A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear Book 53 David's Work and Character The life of David admits of a five-fold division. 1. His shepherd life at Bethlehem. 2. His courtier life with Saul at Gibeah. 3. His life as an outlaw. 4. His kingly life at Hebron during seven and a half years, and 5. At Jerusalem during thirty-three years, in all forty. His history will be ever memorable, whether we regard the work he achieved or his own personal character. 1. His work. He had succeeded to a kingdom distracted with civil dissension, environed on every side or occupied by powerful and victorious enemies, without a capital, almost without an army, without any bond of union between the tribes. He left a compact and united state, stretching from the frontier of Egypt to the foot of Lebanon, from the Euphrates to the sea. He had crushed the power of the Philistines, subdued or curbed all the adjacent kingdoms. He had formed a lasting and important alliance with the great city of Tyre. He had organized an immense disposable force, every month 24,000 men, furnished in rotation by the tribes, appeared in arms, and were trained as the standing militia of the country. At the head of his army were officers of consummate experience, and what was more highly esteemed in the warfare of the time, of extraordinary personal activity, strength, and valor. He had also given especial attention to the management of public worship as the most efficacious means of promoting religion and morality, and consequently obedience to the invisible supreme monarch. The solemn transfer of the Ark of the Covenant 
at which almost all the people were present, had made a deep impression on their minds, and had awakened them to a sincere adoration of Jehovah. These favorable dispositions he had upheld and strengthened by suitable regulations in the service of the priests and the Levites, and especially by the instructive and animating psalms, which were composed partly by himself and partly by other poets and prophets. In comparison with the hymns of David, the sacred poetry of all other nations sinks into mediocrity. They have embodied so exquisitely the universal language of religious emotion that they have entered, with unquestioned propriety, into the ritual of the holier and more perfect religion of Christ. The songs which cheered the solitudes of the desert caves of En Gedi, or resounded from the voice of the Hebrew people as they wound along the glens or the hillsides of Judea, have been repeated for ages in almost every part of the habitable world, in the remotest islands of the ocean, among the forests of America, or the sands of Africa. 2. His Character Obedience to the divine commands was ever with David, the axiom of his life, and in every step he took he showed the greatest anxiety to act as God's servant. Second Samuel 2, 1, 1 Samuel 23, 2 and 4. All deliverance from danger and all victories from first to last he ascribed to the divine aid, and neither in the hour of danger nor the more trying hour of prosperity did he go after strange gods or introduce any idolatrous rites. It was probably to this feature of his administration that God referred when he described him as a man after his own heart, First Samuel 13.14, Comp Acts 13.22, rather than to his private virtues. And yet these were of no mean order. Shepherd, soldier, poet, king, the romantic friend, the chivalrous leader, the devoted father. He was eminent alike for his exalted piety and his noble patriotism. During a war of seven years he never lifted his sword against a subject, and at the end of it he punished no rebels, and remembered no offense but the murder of his rival, Second Samuel 4, 10-12. The adultery with Bathsheba, the murder of Uriah, the numbering of the people, with a view probably to foreign conquests, are the deep blots on his fame, and the chief instances in which he forgot alike himself and his God. And yet when we look at the piety of his youth, the depth of his contrition, the strength of his faith, the fervor of his devotion, the loftiness and variety of his genius, the largesse and warmth of his heart, his eminent valor in any age of warriors, his justice and wisdom as a ruler, and above all his adherence to the worship and will of God. We may well regard him as a model of kingly authority and spiritual obedience. Moreover, not only was he the ancestor of Christ after the flesh, not only was the blessing of the promise expressly transferred to his family, but in his humiliation and exaltation, as the king of the people of God, and as the vanquisher of heathen nations, he was a type of him whose coming he foretold in many of the Psalms, and who is not called the son of Abraham, or of Jacob, or of Moses, but the son of David. Kurtz's Sacred History, page 189, article David, in Smith's Biblical Dictionary. End of Book 53, recording by Lawrence Trask. Mount Vernon, Ohio.